Welcome to the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate. Did you know that industries worldwide depend more on technology now than ever before? That's because more people are using technology in their everyday lives, including working remotely, taking online classes, and even having health checkups with a doctor via webcam. With a worldwide increase in demand for technology comes an increase in need for user support for all technology-related needs. Who will provide technical support to individuals, companies, and organizations? Professionals who are knowledgeable in the fundamentals of computer hardware, operating systems, software, networking, storage, cybersecurity, and cloud computing. According to the most recent U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics report, about 70,400 computer support jobs are posted annually in the U.S. alone, and job growth in the computer support industry is projected to increase 9% through 2030. At the time of this course publication, the median U.S. computer support specialist salary is $57,910 U.S. dollars annually, and per hour pay is almost $28 U.S. dollars. Technical support jobs are also a great way to start on your path to a high-paying career in information technology. This certificate consists of several engaging and informative courses designed to introduce you to the fundamentals of technical support as well as information technology fundamentals. Additionally, this professional certificate can help you prepare for the CompTIA IT Fundamentals Certification Exam. This is a beginner-level certificate, which means that anyone, even if you're new to IT, can take this course. You don't need prior experience in IT or technical support. No college degree is required. All you need to get started with this certificate is a willingness to learn and a basic computer literacy to take online courses through your web browser or mobile app. The courses in this certificate will introduce you to the essential parts of IT. You will learn about hardware, software, networking, and cybersecurity, cloud computing, ticketing systems, and careers and pathways in IT. Throughout the courses, you'll hear from IT insiders as they share their experiences and what they've learned as they've progressed through their careers. Some of the experts you'll hear from are Aditya Pundir, an IT manager, Michelle Sanchez, an instructional designer who started in Help Desk, Mike Schwartz, who works in IT support, and Amy Taylor, an enterprise support technician. You will learn in this course through guided instructional videos that walk you through key concepts with essential need-to-know facts. Interactive exercises will reinforce what you've learned in videos. Insider viewpoints allow you to learn from professionals working in many fields of IT. And practice assessments and graded assessments will help you gauge your knowledge and prove what you've learned. Upon completing all of the courses, you'll learn a shareable badge and the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate. Why do you need a professional certificate? A professional certificate is beneficial for you because it's proof of your knowledge and accomplishments. The IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate has been specifically created to focus on the core knowledge you will need to possess to succeed in technical support and beyond. The courses work together to familiarize you with the elements of IT, introduce you to hardware and software, help you build your IT skills, and provide you with hands-on labs to practice using what you've learned in the course. When you've completed the courses in the certificate, you will receive a professional certificate so that you can share your hard work and accomplishment with potential employers and your professional network. One of the many benefits of the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate is that all of the courses are online and ready to start when you're ready to take them. The courses have flexible schedules, meaning you can complete the course at whatever time is most convenient for you and at your own pace, even if you have only two to three hours a week to spare. Or you could even complete the entire professional certificate in as little as three months if you've spent five or more hours per week on the courses. Financial aid is available for those who qualify. So if you are not sure this program is right for you, you can try a free seven-day trial or you can audit the courses. These options give you the opportunity to sample the content and determine if the courses are right for you. And remember that we're here for your success. If you have any questions about the courses or the professional certificate, just ask. So what are you waiting for? Let's get started.
Welcome to the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate Overview of Courses. This certificate includes introductory courses on technical support, hardware and operating systems, software, programming and databases, networking and storage, cybersecurity essentials, and cloud computing. The certificate also includes the final course, Technical Support Case Studies and Capstone, to apply your knowledge and skills. The course, Introduction to Technical Support, describes many support essentials, including the roles and responsibilities of technical support professionals, career pathways and progressions in information technology or IT, support tools, ticketing systems, technical skills, and soft skills, all of which are needed to succeed in IT support. In Introduction to Hardware and Operating Systems, you'll learn about internal hardware computer components, including motherboard components, central processing units or CPUs, hard drives, and expansion slots. You'll also learn the essentials of basic workstation setup, commonly used operating system settings, screen capture commands, and effective troubleshooting practices. In the Introduction to Software Programming and Databases course, you'll learn about software, web browsers, software development, programming languages, and database management. In Introduction to Networking and Storage, you'll learn how to diagnose and repair basic networking and security problems. You'll also learn about network types and standards, wired and wireless connections, and common network storage and network sharing options. In Introduction to Cybersecurity Essentials, you'll learn about the fundamentals of cybersecurity. You'll also learn how to recognize common security threats and risks, examine the characteristics of cyber attacks, and explore methods for securing and managing confidential information. In the course Introduction to Cloud Computing, you'll discover the many elements of cloud computing and how cloud computing is changing the world of technology. You will identify various cloud service models, deployment models, and key components of cloud infrastructure. You'll also learn about cloud security, monitoring, emerging trends, and job roles in the cloud industry. And finally, in the Technical Support Case Studies and Capstone, you will apply your knowledge and skills to practical IT support scenarios. You will also complete a final exam designed to prepare you for the CompTIA IT Fundamentals Certification Exam. Are you ready to begin your journey toward becoming a technical support professional? Start on your first course today. Welcome to the course Introduction for Technical Support. Did you know that worldwide demand for technology is increasing? This means that support for technology is also increasing. In order to keep up, organizations and their clients must have fast, accurate resolutions for technical issues. And they will need people like you for jobs in technical support. According to the most recent U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics report, over 70,000 computer support jobs are posted annually in the U.S. alone. And job growth in the computer support industry is projected to increase 9% through 2030. At the time of this course publication, the median U.S. computer support specialist salary is almost $60,000 U.S. dollars annually, and per hour pay is almost $28 U.S. dollars. Technical support jobs are also a great way to start on your path to a high paying career in information technology. Many others, like you, start in entry-level positions in technical support and then find careers in IT that are just right for them. Michelle Sanchez started her career in technical support as a help desk technician. That path led her to where she is now, an instructional designer for an information technology company. Rav Ahuja spent the early part of his career in technical support for database software. Now he's a program director for technical content and strategy at IBM. Whether you're looking to start in IT or thinking about switching to a new career in IT, technical support is a great place to start, regardless of whether you have a college degree or not. Technical support can offer a career with flexible work options like remote and hybrid work and alternative schedules. And it offers multiple career paths, both within technical support and in IT-related jobs. 
If you enjoy making a positive difference for others, technical support can be a rewarding career. This course is the first in a series of IBM courses intended to help you develop IT fundamental skills and knowledge. When you complete this course, you'll be able to describe technical support and its roles and responsibilities, develop a customer support mindset, recognize technical support career paths and progression, identify support tools and systems in technical support, and explore the features and benefits of ticketing systems. Additionally, this course can help you prepare for the CompTIA IT Fundamentals Certification Exam. In this course, you will learn with guided instructional videos that walk you through key concepts with essential need-to-know facts, interactive exercises to reinforce what you've learned in videos, insider viewpoints that enrich your understanding of IT support work, practice assessments to help you gauge your knowledge, and finally, graded assessments to prove what you've learned. Upon successful completion of this course, you'll earn a shareable badge and certificate that you can show to prospective employers. During this course, you'll be hearing from several professionals who have worked in technical support. Let's meet them. Hi, this is Mike Schwartz. I retired 39 years ago from IBM as an IT specialist. Currently, I'm the office manager and IT support for Rosa and Rosa Law Office. Michelle Sanchez, Instructional Designer at SkillUp Technologies. Hello everyone, myself Aditya Pundir. I take care of IT support and operations globally in SkillUp Technologies. Hi, uh, my name is Amy Taylor. I am an Enterprise Support Technician for Meta. Hi, I'm Brad Bahucha, and I'm a Global Program Director at IBM. I started off my early career in technical support. We are here to support your success. If you have any questions for the course staff, or if you want to connect with your peers in the course, please feel free to post on the course discussion forums. We are excited that you're here, so let's get started. Welcome to Becoming a Technical Support Professional. After watching this video, you will be able to define technical support, discuss the importance of technical support, and list reasons for choosing technical support as a career. So what is technical support? Technical support professionals have many names for the same or similar roles. Sometimes they are referred to as tech support, IT support, or computer support professionals, just to name a few. In this course, we'll use the name technical support. Professionals in technical support discuss technology-related topics and problems with clients and customers ranging from computer networking issues to reading emails. They might also be responsible for installing and configuring hardware and software. Technical support professionals also troubleshoot, diagnose, and then resolve technology-related issues, usually with people who have less knowledge about technology and need assistance. Successful technical support professionals are good at listening to problems and offering support, answering questions about technical issues, understanding technical terms and concepts, and resolving issues for others using non-technical terms. What is the difference between a customer service representative and a technical support professional? A customer service representative is trained to listen to customers with empathy while attempting to understand the customer's confusion or frustration. They deal with general product experience, payment, delivery, and customer account-based queries. They also focus on friendliness and customer experience as they are assisting the customer. They may focus more on making the customer feel better about a problem. Technical support professionals may need to do all that a customer service representative does, plus more. While they listen to understand a problem, they also work to solve and resolve an issue. They focus on resolving technical issues quickly and effectively. Sometimes they provide steps for customers to take, or they deliver bad news, like a piece of technology might be beyond repair. Why do companies use technical support? Businesses use technical support in the following ways. Troubleshooting and fixing technical issues, setting up accounts for new users and employees, repairing and replacing computers and tools, 
assisting companies with network security and firewalls, training users on how to use hardware and software, logging and tracking reported problems and actions taken, and fostering positive relationships with clients and potential customers. Who uses technical support services? Different kinds of companies, from large to small, use technical support to assist their customers. Businesses that offer technology and telecommunication services, professional associations like medical offices, financial groups, and legal organizations, and retailers and manufacturing companies. Why is technical support important? It is important because it allows companies to provide helpful solutions to their customers. When companies provide support to customers, they are viewed more positively, which can mean an increase in business. Additionally, companies with helpful technical support are viewed as trustworthy by customers. As a result, these customers are more likely to stay with the company. Technical support also helps companies track and troubleshoot their technology. This can, in turn, lead to product improvement, which results in helping companies develop more desirable products. Technical support is a good profession for people who, like problem-solving, enjoy helping resolve technology issues, like working towards solutions with others, and want to make a positive impact on others. A technical support career might be right for all the following reasons. You'll learn a lot about technology, especially technology specific to your company. You will learn effective techniques for solving problems, or you'll refine the skills you already have. You will develop your professional skills using technology like phones, email, live chat, social media, and online community forums. You might also build transferable skills like sales, marketing, and product development. You will learn how to network in your company and how to seek out the help you need. And you will open the door to many other opportunities and paths in technology-related careers. In this video, you learned that Technical support is working with clients and customers to solve technology-related issues. Technical support professionals resolve issues while making a positive impact on customers and clients. And a career in technical support can help you learn more about technology, develop your professional skills, and open the door to many other opportunities. Can someone with no IT experience start a career in technical support? What is your advice to someone with no IT experience and wanting to start a career in technical support? How do they get started? Oh, absolutely. Anyone can get started in technical support. What you have to have is a natural curiosity for how things work. Um, I've always had that trait ever since I was a kid, wondering how things worked and why they worked the way they did and going around the house and trying to fix things that were broken. Yes, I think you can have a position in IT support without uh, prior experience. Um, my suggestion would be to learn uh, all you can about the products that you'll be supporting. Um, some products will be easier with less experience, um, more, some more difficult. Hardware generally will be more difficult, especially large systems, um, which I have a background in. So technology support or tech support is a great career, whether you have any prior degree or IT experience in the field. Um, you essentially require two sets of skills, the information technology skills, as well as customer support skills. And you can, if you already have some background in either of these, that's great. You can become a technical support worker with any degree. Employers prefer applicants to have an IT related qualifications. But apart from that, I personally feel that a technical support executive must do the certifications in the domain they are into. And my background was originally in finance and a friend of mine suggested, you know, why don't you try getting a job as a help desk technician or an entry level technical support job and that'll help you get your foot in the door and get some hands on experience working with IT. So, um, I think the best way to sort of get into this career and kind of do that is 
if you can fiddle around with computers in general and just learn what you can about them, that was a great start. Um, but like the very basics of learning what you can about them via the web or books, reading, that kind of stuff. Um, for just starting out, trying to get a uh, CompTIA is a very, very big start. So studying for that and getting that experience under your belt. You can develop these skills by taking courses by getting certifications or completing diplomas and i think you know an entry into technical support is a great way to start a any type of it or tech related career i had no experience no technical experience at all other than you know the machines that we use at the bank to accept customer deposits and you know run reports and, and that type of thing and if i can make it with you know no skills and i started in it when i was 30 so i'm a lot older than some people that are just you know getting out there um you know and uh, trying to figure out what they want to do in their career so i think if i can do it anybody can do it Welcome to Career Opportunities in Technical Support. After watching this video, you will be able to identify opportunities in technical support careers and discover technical support career paths and advantages. So why is a career in technical support a good idea? More technical support professionals are needed to support the rising use of technology. When demand increases, compensation increases too. Median wages for technology occupations are 89% higher than median national wages. Healthcare and social assistance industries are increasing their need for technology. And more remote work opportunities for all kinds of occupations means more companies need more technical support. Maybe you're wondering, what is the technical support work environment like? Technical support professionals work in many different environments. They may work on-site, at a call center, answering calls and resolving technical issues. Entry-level technical support professionals could also work in business offices and professional spaces. Some companies may even offer remote work, allowing employees to work from home. Technical support professionals may support clients and customers by answering questions on the phone or through email or they may provide support by resolving technical issues through live chat, social media, or discussion forums. Depending on the company you work for, your work environment may be formal, casual, or somewhere in between. What does the future of jobs in technical support look like? According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics Employment Projections Program, there will be significant increase in technical support jobs over the next 10 years. Demand for computer user support specialists is projected to go from 650,000 to more than 700,000 in the United States alone. And demand will increase for computer support specialists by over 72,000 jobs, increasing from 2020's total of 840,000 jobs to over 916,000 jobs in the United States. Jobs for computer network support specialists are projected to increase by over 7% by 2030. Jobs for computer support specialists are projected to increase by 8.5%. And computer user support specialist jobs are projected to increase by almost 9%. Collectively, demand for computer occupations are projected to go up 13% in the United States by 2030. Someone with little to no experience might start a technical support job at an entry level. However, on-the-job training allows workers to specialize in technical support roles. With experience, more opportunities lead to advancement in various roles. A lot of companies use a tiered approach for job roles in technical support. A lower tier employee would be at the entry level as a technical support representative. A lower tier to mid tier employee could be a technician. Mid tier specialists might earn more than lower tiers, and mid tier engineers have more experience and usually focus on a specific path in technical support. And upper tier employees are usually the managers or analysts. 
Current jobs in technical support vary slightly in title and salary, but most have similar titles. According to CompTIA, technical support representatives and specialists made a median salary of $33,500 U.S. dollars, with almost 8,000 job postings for 2020. Help desk or desktop support technicians earned a median salary of $42,900 U.S. dollars, with almost 15,000 job postings in 2020. And IT support technicians and specialists had a median salary of $46,900 U.S. dollars, and there were almost 10,000 job postings for 2020. Additionally, PC support associates earned a median salary of $38,000 U.S. dollars, with almost 2,700 job posts for 2020. Field service technicians had a median salary of $40,000 U.S. dollars and almost 2,500 jobs available in 2020. And service desk technicians and analysts earned a median salary of $42,000 U.S. dollars with almost 3,000 job postings for 2020. Now, what are the advantages of a technical support career? Well, you do not need a college degree to get started. Many entry-level positions are available. Workers are in demand to fill technical support jobs, and on-the-job training allows professionals to acquire skills for the job while being paid. And finally, a technical support career offers a path forward to many other information technology professions. In this video, you learned that demand for technical support professionals is increasing. Technical support professionals can work in many different environments, remotely or in offices. Many jobs are available in different areas of technical support with varying pay ranges. And a technical support career offers a path forward to many other professions in technology. In this video, we will listen to several data professionals discuss how they started in technical support and what you should consider if that is your goal. I didn't plan on being a technical support engineer when I started my career in IT. What I really wanted to do was be a network engineer and, you know, design and deploy enterprise uh, type networks and so forth. I studied computer science in university and I was offered a position working in a systems application support group. Uh, in addition to supporting the actual application code, I helped, had to help the clients use the system. From there, I moved into systems programming, but I was still supporting clients on various tasks and various applications. Next, I became a webmaster in a small organization, so once again, I was still providing uh, client support when needed. And finally, as a project manager, um, I still always had my hand in either desk side support, helping people build uh, or fix problems on their workstations? Um, basically, it started out when I was little. I just like to take things apart. I like to fiddle around. And then we finally got our first computer, and it was really cool, and I just like playing with it. And it started out as just like video games, stuff like that. But the more I played with it, the more I found all these cool little things you could do, stuff like that. And then eventually, I went to college for programming which I ended up not liking, but I really like the sysadmin side of stuff. So I started off in technical support because I wanted to develop customer skills and experience working with customers um, where, you know, I already had some technical background and technical skills using doing software development. But for me, I, what was really important for me was to develop the um, human skills, the interpersonal skills. And that is the opportunity that customer support gave to me in order for me to be able to grow my career. Um, my journey essentially um, was initially in online technical support. And gradually, as I got comfortable working with and dealing with people, I started um, uh, doing live technical support as well.
Welcome to Technical Support Roles and Responsibilities. After watching this video, you will be able to discuss technical support roles, identify various technical support careers, and describe technical support responsibilities. Technical support roles go by many different names. One company might identify a role as a technical support representative. Another company might call the same role computer support representative, or the terms for technical support technicians and IT support technicians might be used interchangeably. There are also different levels and tiers for technical support roles, such as desktop support technician, IT help desk support specialist, and desktop or IT support analyst. When considering the role you are interested in, look closely at the descriptions, responsibilities, and qualifications. The primary role of a technical support professional is to help clients and teammates. People who succeed have good customer service skills, strong critical thinking skills, a deep interest in new and developing technology, the ability to get to the root of customers' problems quickly, and the patience to help customers through a series of actions to resolve a problem. There are many career paths in technical support, even if they begin in the same place. You might not know what path you want to be on until you've started your journey, and that's okay. But keep in mind that each job in technical support can be a gateway to a variety of other jobs. So, where do people start? Many start at the help desk and desktop support. These technicians specialize in diagnosing and resolving computer and software issues, installing new technologies and training users on how to effectively use the technology, providing remote and on-site technical support to clients, customers, and even coworkers, backing up and restoring database files, and maintaining and updating operating systems. Technical support specialists and engineers are often responsible for testing and maintaining equipment and software, trying out new systems and programs, communicating with clients about technology use, training users on how to use new hardware and applications, and using ticketing systems to document hardware and software changes and solutions. IT support analysts and specialists offer higher level support by providing IT assistance to staff and customers, developing procedures for reoccurring problems, evaluating and resolving complex problems, troubleshooting more complicated hardware and software issues, and maintaining databases and ensuring system security. Service desk technicians and analysts perform some of the following, answering IT support requests, resolving IT issues and concerns, communicating with clients on updates and resolutions, documenting and maintaining service desk processes, and performing system installations and updates. So what would your day look like in a technical support role? You start your workday by signing in to work and starting all applications and programs that you support. You read messages and notifications and check for issues for critical problems. You learn about new technology, updates, and any possible changes. You help customers through phone, email, live chat, discussion forums, or social media. You assist with password resets, walkthroughs, installations, or reinstallations, and escalations if needed. And you use your company's ticketing system to log and track your solutions. In this video, you learned that Technical support roles provide valuable technical support to clients and customers. Some technical support careers are help desk, desktop support, IT support, and service desk. Technical support responsibilities include diagnosing and resolving issues, providing IT assistance to clients, and documenting and maintaining processes. And finally, technical support professionals complete daily tasks like checking messages and assisting customers. Welcome to Introduction to IT Infrastructure. After watching this video, you will be able to define IT infrastructure, and describe the essential elements of IT infrastructure. 
Technical support professionals spend a lot of time working within what is called the information technology or IT infrastructure. The phrase IT infrastructure refers to the parts needed to run and manage an IT organization. IT infrastructure contains both physical and virtual spaces for transferring, storing, managing, and analyzing information. It also provides critical services or resources to customers. IT infrastructures also allow businesses to reduce issues related to connectivity, cyber safety, and productivity. The essential components of a solid IT infrastructure are hardware, software, and network. Hardware refers to the physical machines and devices that help the infrastructure run correctly. Hardware includes personal computers, mobile devices, servers, data centers, hubs, and routers, and switches. Software refers to the applications and programs used by a company both for the company and for its customers. Software includes Content Management Systems, or CMS, Customer Relationship Management, or CRM, Enterprise Resource Planning, or ERP, Additional Collaboration, Productivity, and Business-Specific Apps, Web Servers, and Operating Systems, which are critical for connecting a company's hardware to the network. Now, the network refers to everything needed for the company to communicate both within and outside of the company. It is the system that links all information technology elements and the connected devices. The network includes routers, servers, data centers, hubs, and switches. And these work together with security software to reduce the threat of data breaches or damage to company information. Two main types of IT infrastructure are traditional and cloud. Traditional infrastructure is located on site and is designed to be used by a company or private organization. It is made up of hardware like computers, data centers, and software. Traditional infrastructures usually require more resources like power and physical space. Cloud infrastructure contains components that are accessed in the cloud and are not stored in one physical location. It is similar to traditional infrastructure, but it allows users to access services over the internet. Understanding the IT infrastructure will help you as a technical support specialist troubleshoot issues. You may encounter any of the following issues that need quick solutions. A customer's computer isn't working and you need to identify why. The client needs a password reset. So the next step is to go through the process of setting a new password. Customers are unable to access their data and you must get their network back up and running. Or a cyber threat comes to your attention, so you isolate the threat to protect the company's IT infrastructure. An effective IT infrastructure allows technical support to communicate within the company to quickly identify issues and implement solutions. In this video, you learned that Hardware refers to the physical elements of IT infrastructure. Software consists of the apps used by companies both internally and externally. The network is the system that links all information technology elements and the connected devices. Two types of IT infrastructure are traditional, like data centers, computers, and business software solutions, and cloud, like cloud computing. And finally, effective IT infrastructure systems allow technical support to work more quickly to identify issues and implement solutions. Welcome to Technical Support Soft Skills. After watching this video, you will be able to define technical support soft skills and discuss how to improve your soft skills. What are soft skills? They are positive behaviors and attitudes that you use every day, and they enable you to communicate and collaborate effectively with your team and with clients to avoid conflicts. Why are soft skills important? When used well, these skills can enable you to actively listen to clients, work with others to resolve problems, and diffuse stressful situations. When you have strong soft skills, you have a customer service mindset. 
your top priority is providing customers with a positive experience with your company. You also use strong communication skills to share information clearly, ask the right questions, and be concise. And your strong written communication skills will help as you take notes and document interactions with clients. You can get organized by using notes, messages, emails, and by developing a system to organize your work and access it quickly. You have leadership skills, even if you're not a manager. You motivate, encourage, and resolve conflicts within your team. And you can solve problems. You are the type of person who uses critical thinking skills to figure out a problem, and you explore the problem until a resolution is found. You can be flexible and adaptable by being open to new ideas, changing direction quickly, and learning new strategies. So how does it all add up? Knowledge of technology is only one part of the equation in technical support. Another part is being able to work with others and manage social situations. Add to that positive behaviors and attitudes, and you can communicate, collaborate, and manage conflict with confidence. How do you set yourself up for success in technical support? Use your soft skills. Start by asking questions of your peers and supervisors. Take good notes and write down directions that are repeated and ideas that are important. Stay organized. Know where your notes are and discover what organizational style works best for you. And remember that it's okay to say, I don't know, but follow it with, I'll find out. Then be ready to find the answers and add them to your notes. How do you build a customer support mindset? Be empathetic and emotionally connect with your customer. Be customer-centered by encouraging interaction and remaining positive even if you have to deliver bad news. And be patient by actively listening. After a negative experience, reset and start over again with the next client. You can learn how to improve your soft skills on the job. The best way to learn is to document your notes on everything as you work so you can learn what went right and what didn't. Next, read suggestions and notes from your supervisors to get better. You will have times when you're under pressure and stressed. Try to learn new techniques to withstand pressure and reduce stress. You might question whether your experience is enough. Lack of work experience does not mean that you lack interest or passion in technology. Use your passion for technology to boost your self-confidence. Remember that success in technical support isn't just based on knowledge of technology. Your positive behaviors and attitudes can help you succeed, so be ready to level up your soft skills. Where do you learn to fine-tune your soft skills? Well, you can learn from additional online courses, search for podcasts and audiobooks about developing soft skills, and reach out to your peers and social groups to practice and refine your soft skills. In this video, you learned that soft skills are positive behaviors and attitudes that are used to effectively communicate, collaborate, and manage conflict. Soft skills include having a customer service mindset, communicating, being organized, leading, solving problems, and being flexible and adaptable. A customer service mindset is being empathetic, customer-centered, and patient. And finally, Learning to improve soft skills is important to succeeding in technical support. In this video, technical support professionals will discuss the importance of a customer support mindset. Why is a customer support mindset so important to have in technical support? For me, customer support mindset is something that I didn't really consciously thought about when I started off in technical support. Uh, but that is something that I came to a realization that it is crucial to have a customer support mindset. At one point early on in my um, job, we were all given customer t-shirts that had customer success, those two words on it. And, and I think it's only after wearing that t-shirt and realizing what those words meant and why they were important, did I really start developing the customer support mindset. 
The customer support mindset is so crucial because, you know, put yourself in, in the shoes of someone who's calling you, is having a problem, is, you know, you're, you have a particular problem and you call a technical support helpline or you open up a ticket, how would you like to be treated? So that is the attitude that you want to have as a technical support specialist. Patience is critical to being an effective technical support professional. Uh, most clients are frustrated when they first contact you. Uh, it's important to present a calm approach while doing problem determination so they're able to give you the details you need and not feel rushed or overwhelmed by the, uh, by the problem. It is extremely important to be empathetic, customer-centered, and patient when you're working as a technical support engineer. Because if you think about it, technical support is the image of your company. When people are calling your company, they're not calling to talk to the CEO or to sales and marketing or QA or anything like that. They're calling customer support or technical support for a reason. They need help and that's why they're calling you. And all it takes is for one customer to have a bad experience with a support organization to potentially tarnish the image of your company, no matter how good your company's products are. So it is very important for a technical support worker to understand the client's customer situation as they would be working on various IT, ERP business softwares and apps which are crucial and has productivity and financial revenue implications too. Thus, ideally tech support must develop the mindset to think beyond the technology and understand user pain and the intensity of the incident a user is experiencing. It helps a lot to establish a healthy support environment between a support agent and a customer, which ultimately enhance agent performance and, and customer relation too, resulting a good customer satisfaction which is an end goal for a technical support executive. Welcome to Basics of Technical Skills. After watching this video, you will be able to define technical skills and discuss the importance of technical skills in technical support. Imagine this scenario. You have a job interview and one of the first things you're asked is what your technical skills include. You panic because you're not quite sure what they mean by technical skills. You're able to talk your way through the question, but you're not clear and direct about what your technical skills include. At the end of the interview, you're told they'll get back to you, which doesn't sound promising. What do you wish you could have done differently? Well, next time, you will be ready to discuss your technical skills. What's your strategy to improve your technical skills? If you're taking this course, then you've already taken the first step in your plan. You are interested in technical support and you're interested in technology. So let's turn that into an asset that you can add to your resume for your next job interview. First of all, what are technical skills? Technical skills are the abilities and aptitudes needed for you to successfully work in a technical support environment, and technical skills need training and experience. Let's break down the technical skills needed for technical support roles. As we do, think about what skills you already have and think about the skills you can build up. You don't need to have a deep knowledge of technology at first, but you do need some basic technical skills. Acquiring more technical skills is something you can do on the job. What should you know about basic programming and coding? Know that machine code is the computer's language, and developers speak to computers using source code. Source code includes compiled programming languages and interpreted programming languages. Basic programming skills include knowing the foundations of compiled languages like Java and the C languages, and interpreted languages like HTML, Python, and JavaScript. Being able to code even at a basic level will give you more of an advantage over other job applicants. Technical skills also include familiarity with both PC and Mac computers. Know how to identify the different computers and know the hardware, and be familiar with operating systems too, like Windows, Mac OS, Android, and Linux. 
If you don't have a lot of experience with these operating systems, use virtual machines and sandboxes to learn about them and improve your skills. You can also use free resources like your library to learn about different computers. Beginner level knowledge of SQL basics and no SQL basics is important. Be familiar with the differences between them. SQL databases are relational databases with rows and tables of data, and we use SQL queries to retrieve information from the databases. No SQL databases are non-relational databases with unstructured data. As a technical support professional, you may need to provide support services for databases. Your responsibilities will include database application and deployment services, user management, security and access, scheduling database backups, updates and monitoring, database optimization, and running batch jobs in a database. Application logs provide information about events that have occurred in a software application. You should also be able to read and analyze application logs, read tracking information about the application, find timestamps to track any issues, and know where to find application logs that display levels of issues with labels, such as information, warning, or error. You also need to understand what servers are and how they work. You should be comfortable with setting up and configuring a server and the software that runs on it, updating the server software, monitoring the server and maintaining it, maximizing server uptime, and managing virtual servers. Knowing about servers and showing that you are willing to learn more goes a long way in demonstrating your technical skill. And you should also know about support ticket workflow. Support tickets allow a company to create, track, manage, and resolve client queries. Some popular support ticket systems are Zendesk, Jira Service Management, and LiveAgent. Most systems will have similar workflow processes. A simplified example of the support ticket workflow is a ticket is created. Next, technical support starts work on the issue, noting important details in the ticketing system. Then, necessary steps are taken to resolve the issue, and finally, when the issue is resolved, the ticket is marked as closed. Knowing how a support ticket moves through the system is more important than being a master of a single support ticketing system. Another technical skill you need is being able to use a knowledge base. A knowledge base is a collection of a group's knowledge about topics, like technical information, for example. Being able to search a knowledge base is an important skill that you already have. When you researched career opportunities in technology, you probably searched the internet and read about technical support. By doing so, you used a knowledge base to understand more about this topic. Do you enjoy trying out new hardware and applications? Your passion and interest in new and emerging hardware and applications goes a long way to demonstrate your technical skills and abilities. However, be aware that you'll also need a broad knowledge of these additional tools. Virtual machines, or VMs, are virtual computer systems within a physical computer, and multiple VMs can exist on one computer. A virtual private network, or VPN, allows a computer or device to establish a secure connection to the network in order to access sensitive data stored on servers. Network security protects networks and data from breaches, intrusions, and other threats. Network security includes access control, security software, network analytics, and more. IT infrastructure monitoring software collects and analyzes data from the IT infrastructure, systems, and processes, and it uses that data to provide information about availability, performance, and efficiency. And enterprise hardware refers to the servers, data storage devices, networking equipment, and other hardware that are part of a company's IT hardware resources. In this video, you learned that Technical skills are abilities and aptitudes that are needed for professionals to successfully work in a technical support environment. Technical skills include familiarity with programming, operating system basics, application logs, servers, support ticket workflow, knowledge bases, and more. And lastly, additional skills include familiarity with 
virtual machines, VPNs, network security, enterprise hardware, and monitoring software. Welcome to Performance Evaluations of Technical Support Professionals. After watching this video, you will be able to identify the purpose of performance evaluations, describe technical support evaluation parameters, and explain the benefits of technical support evaluations. What is the purpose of a performance evaluation? A performance evaluation is a chance for your supervisor to review how you, the employee, are doing on the job. It defines what the company's expectations are for you. Your supervisor will make notes to record your performance. Then your supervisor will evaluate you. After the evaluation, you will receive feedback about your job performance. Once complete, the evaluation cycle will repeat itself. Your performance evaluation will then be used to define or redefine the company's expectations of you. So, what should you expect? Your managers will most likely be looking at your ability to accomplish your responsibilities, your decision-making abilities, your productivity, including your strengths and weaknesses, customer service abilities, work attitude, communication skills, and goals you have set and achieved. Let's start by looking at your work responsibilities. Your supervisor will evaluate if you possess the technical knowledge and skills necessary to perform your job, understand company policies and procedures, and complete required records, documents, and tickets. Your evaluator will also be looking to see that you have good decision-making skills. You can effectively evaluate technical issues and make the right decisions. You work on your own effectively, and when you encounter problems, you recognize them and that you are willing to make decisions about them. Your evaluator will also measure your productivity, meaning how much work you're getting done. It should show that you complete tasks in a timely and efficient manner, and it shows how long it takes you to resolve tickets. It will show that you work according to instructions, and your evaluator will note that you ask for help when you need it. Your performance evaluation will most likely include how you provide customer service. It will measure that you show a strong commitment to customers and that you are eager to assist customers and work towards a solution with them. Your supervisors might also look at and review call recordings, customer ratings, time to resolve measurements, first contact resolution and how many contacts per customer, and the average number of tickets handled. You may also be evaluated on your work ethics. Your supervisor might check that you display a positive, collaborative team attitude toward work assignments and responsibilities. You establish effective working relationships with coworkers, clients, and supervisors, and that you display a positive attitude toward criticism and suggestions. Your communication skills will also be reviewed. You should be able to write clearly and effectively and show you understand written and spoken communication. Goal achievements will also be measured in your performance review. If your supervisor doesn't mention them, you should include your certifications and any new skills you've acquired. Your evaluation should show that you have set professional goals for yourself and that you are striving to achieve them. And in your next performance evaluation, be prepared to show how you have improved since your first review. Performance evaluations can be a benefit to you. They are an opportunity for you to know how you're performing in your role, ask questions, and make any corrections if there was a misunderstanding about the role. It's also your chance for recognition. Be ready to advocate for yourself and share your accomplishments. You can also use performance evaluations as a chance to share with your supervisor good job emails or messages from clients and coworkers. And you also have a chance to talk about your goals and discuss what you're doing to meet those goals. Ultimately, a good performance evaluation will provide opportunities for advancement in your career. In this video, you learned that performance evaluations provide valuable feedback to you, the employee, about how you are meeting your role expectations. 
your managers will most likely be evaluating you on your ability to accomplish your responsibilities, serve customers, have a positive work attitude, and set goals for yourself. And performance evaluations benefit you by showing you how you are performing in your role, by providing an opportunity for recognition of your accomplishments, and by setting you up for opportunities for advancement in your career. In this video, technical support professionals will discuss how feedback from customers encouraged them and helped them improve. What feedback did you receive after making a positive impact on customers? And how did it help you improve or encourage you to keep working hard? So there was this one time I was working at, in the technical support department for a company that did online backup and recovery and also disaster, uh, disaster recovery planning. And I was on call one weekend and I got a call from a lady who was absolutely frantic. She worked at a small jewelry store chain down in uh, uh, Atlanta, Georgia in the United States and their exchange server had gone down. They weren't able to send or receive email at any of their stores um, internally or externally. And they had a small IT department, but their main IT person who was familiar with Exchange was on vacation. And I had to walk this lady through uh, reinstalling the operating system on the server. It had just been completely corrupted, reinstalling Exchange. And anybody who's worked with Exchange knows how complicated it is and to restore from a backup. I kept in touch with her. I'd call her every couple hours just to see if the restore was still running, and it was. And eventually the server was uh, fully restored. We rebooted it and we tested it. We send internal and external email, and um, it was functional again. She was, the whole company was very pleased with that. And uh, two weeks later, I received a delivery of fresh flowers uh, from this company. You know, it just kind of reinforced, you know, my belief in what I was doing was right and the way that I was helping customers customers and, you know, having patience, explaining an exchange server <laughs> recovery to somebody who had no technical skills whatsoever made me feel pretty good. A few weeks into my uh, tech support job, my manager came to my desk and said he wanted to see me in the office. And I went there and uh, a bit scared. Uh, but he sat me down and showed me an email that he had received from one of the clients that I had been working with. And that email had a lot of positive things to say about the support that they received from me and how I helped solve a problem that had been nagging them for several weeks. So to me, it was a great encouragement. You know, I was just doing my job, you know, and I helped um, resolve an issue. Um, and that encouraged me to work you know better um, help other customers more develop skills deeper skills in technology and in support and um, and i continue to get similar feedback from other customers and i think that really helps you and encourages you to move forward and continue to grow um, in your technical support role Almost every time you help a client with an issue, it's a positive impact. When you hear the excitement and joy in their voice when the issue is resolved, oftentimes quickly, it's very satisfying. They often say things like, what will we ever do if you leave? Makes it all worthwhile in the end. At the very beginning of the uh, web, the World Wide Web, I ran a project to convert our hard copy how-to manuals into PDFs and make them available to our customers on the web. At the time, many web professionals were anti-PDFs because they were big and slow to download. Um, they called them evil. Uh, I showed them that when properly built, they performed very well and customers absolutely loved them. Can you tell us about a project that you were proud of completing and why are you so proud of it? My favorite project I've done was uh, at my previous job. It all had to deal with our ESET internet security system. Basically, prior to this um, project, uh, we just use a typical, uh, we use a hardware that was for a firewall for stuff, but then every computer just ran uh, Windows firewall and that was basic. And then we also had just plain ESET security or uh, antivirus. Uh, talking with the CTO, he really wanted to upgrade it. So I started working with him on trying to look at uh, implementing an entire internet security suite, taking over the whole firewall and 
um, antivirus stuff. So from there, uh, he started just kind of like having me investigate stuff. And then from there, I kind of just took over the whole thing and just ended up finding out everything I could about it, different ways to implement it. And then going from there, I was just ended up being the lead on the project. And so it became, we got the entire thing set up. I created all the rules for it. And so we had different subsets for everything. It was really, really fun. And I learned very much about the internet security and firewalls and stuff. And so from then on, if anyone ever had a question with it, they came directly to me. The CTO would just kind of refer him over to me. It was really fun overall. Welcome to Career Paths and Progressions in Technical Support. After watching this video, you will be able to identify various career paths in technical support and discuss career progression in technical support. So where does your technical support career path start? You might start as an IT support specialist, IT technician, help desk technician, or desktop support specialist, or you could start as a field service technician. You might also be wondering what skills you should have for these entry-level roles. You need to know how to access data and share with those who need it, actively listen to clients and their descriptions of computer-related issues, ask questions to determine the problem, guide customers through steps to resolve problems, train users on new computers and software, document changes, updates, and issues, and share information with other team members and managers. While some companies don't require any IT experience or a degree to start, some will require basic customer service experience and knowledge of technology. You can increase your chances of getting a better job with professional certificates and a computer science or related degree. Some mid-tier technical support roles are help desk analyst, technical support specialist, and tier two support. But what skills are you expected to have in a mid-level role? testing and maintaining equipment and software, trying out new systems and programs, communicating with clients about technology use, training users on how to use new hardware and applications, communicating on proper use of technology, and training new technical support team members. For a mid-level role like a level two technical support specialist, you will need at least one to three years of experience with on-the-job training. Also, you might be required to have certifications from Cisco, Microsoft, and CompTIA, like A+, Network+, and Security+. Once you've gained experience in Level 2, you might advance to Technical Support Level 3, which usually requires three to five years of experience, advanced on-the-job training, and certifications similar to Level 2. In upper-level roles, you'll find Technical Support Leads and Managers, IT support team leads, and field engineer supervisors. Similar to the mid-level role, upper-level roles will manage systems and capabilities, research and explore new systems, software, and processes, train users on standard usage practices for hardware and software, manage ongoing issues in projects, communicate changes and policies to organization management, and manage and train teams. For upper-level roles, you'll need on-the-job training in leadership and more than five years of experience. And certifications needed include ITIL, Six Sigma, and other relevant certifications related to your role. A career starting in technical support does not need to end in technical support. Experience within one area of the information technology field can be used in other areas of information technology. Some roles develop cross skills, meaning what you've learned and practiced in one role can be used in another role you're more interested in or more passionate about. Think about the required tasks you enjoy doing and look at other positions that require similar skills. Interview for roles that fit your strengths and require skills you wish to learn more about. You can also use your cross skills to advance to better roles that allow for more responsibilities and offer more pay and benefits. You can also level up your skills to help you reach higher level roles in technical support. 
Roles that are related to technical support that you could move into are Network Administrator, Network Security Analyst, Database Administrator, Cloud Developer, QA Engineer, and Software Developer. In this video, you learned that Career paths start at the entry-level technical support roles, move to mid-level roles, and then progress to upper-level roles. Technical support skills required for most roles are setting up and managing computers and devices, testing and researching new hardware and software, managing issues in projects, working with teams and clients, and troubleshooting and resolving technology-related issues. You can develop your cross skills to move to other roles you're more passionate about. And you can level up your skills to move up to more opportunities in the IT field. In this video, technical support professionals will discuss areas of tech support and how they found their niche. What career paths were available to you as a technical support professional, and how did you find your niche? For me, I had a background in databases and working with databases. So the field in technical support that I chose was become a um, level two specialist for a database product. And um, so it, you know, I was able to leverage my prior background and skills and at the same time grow in technical support by developing some interpersonal and customer support skills. After I graduated, um, I ended up getting just a basic call center job doing tech support for Subway. And for the most part, I ended up really liking a lot of what I was doing, stuff like that. And so when I moved out here to Bellevue, I tried to jump really hard into it. And I ended up getting a job at a nonprofit where I started out as a low tier, just IT technician. I would help the people in the company. It was great. But over time, I was there for almost six years and it ended up being just a, I did everything. And so I took over like the servers. I would run specific programs. I was our net sec uh, or security person. Um, I would go to different sites to install hardware and basically just kind of did everything. And so at this point, um, I moved over here to Facebook and it's been great doing a lot more of that stuff. And I interact with customers a lot and I still do all the hardware and stuff too. So I started my uh, career in technical support as a contractor working at a help desk for a really large credit card company in the United States. And I stayed there for a couple years, you know, learning how everything worked. And after a couple of years, I decided to broaden my you know, horizons. And so I applied for and, and accepted a position at a company that specializes in virtualization and virtual server clusters and, and things like that. And um, I found it fascinating. You know, I stayed there for seven years and, uh, you know, um, imp increased my, uh, my skill set and so forth. And then I made another move to another technology company that manufactures laptops and desktop computers and servers and so forth. And I worked as a, a tier three tech support engineer for that company for one year and then was recruited into a technical training position for their enterprise customers, which I did for about 10 years. And that was really fascinating. You know, I, I really enjoyed doing that and then um, I left that company and uh, went to work for a company that manufactured storage um, as an enterprise or tier three uh, senior technical support engineer and so that's a little bit about my journey in uh, my career as a technical support engineer Welcome to Industry Certifications for Technical Support. After watching this video, you will be able to define technical support industry certifications, describe the benefits of technical support certifications, and identify industry-specific certifications. Okay, so what are industry certifications? They are awarded after a person passes an exam that certifies he or she meets industry standards for skills and knowledge. Certifications prove that an individual has learned strategies and concepts that are essential in the technical support field. 
Certifications also validate an individual's knowledge about information technology, or IT. They also certify that the individual has the skills required. And a certification shows that someone has a specialization in the field, even if he or she doesn't have on-the-job experience. Some benefits of certifications to you and your employer are more effective customer service. You will be able to troubleshoot more quickly and effectively because you have a broader understanding about various technologies and methods of working through problems. Increased productivity and resource management. You will be able to maintain your computer and understand more about security, networking, and software troubleshooting. And improved quality of support. You will be more familiar with common issues, customer situations, and ways to resolve those problems. For those interested in a career in technical support, a certification is a great way to get started. Some beginner-level certificates are available through CompTIA, Microsoft, Apple, the ITIL Foundation, and Cisco. So, if you want to work in technical support, the CompTIA IT Fundamentals, or ITF Plus certification, is one of the first certifications you should consider. It is for those who are trying to decide if an IT career is right for them, or for those who are just starting out. If you want to progress your career further in IT, CompTIA A Plus is the next certification you should consider. Getting your A-plus certification demonstrates that you've mastered hardware, software troubleshooting, networking, operating systems, device and network troubleshooting, security for devices and networks, mobile devices, virtualization and cloud computing, and operational procedures. Another certificate is the CompTIA Network Plus. If you're interested in the networking path, then getting the Network Plus certificate shows that you have the essential skills required for troubleshooting, configuring, and managing networks. Microsoft certifications, like Microsoft 365 Certified Fundamentals, is an introduction to Microsoft 365 and cloud services. Microsoft also offers role-based and specialty-based certifications and exams that professionals starting out their career can take to enhance their resume. The Apple Certified Support Professional, or ACSP, certification is for technical support and related IT roles for Mac users. The certificate shows that you understand Mac OS, can troubleshoot issues, and are able to support Mac users. Next, the ITIL Foundation certifications range from beginner levels to advanced levels, but you can start at a Support Center course and develop your skills in supporting customers, in IT role functions, and in troubleshooting methods. And the Cisco Certified Network Associate, or CCNA, certificate is for those wishing to further their knowledge of networking. The CCNA helps professionals highlight their skills in administering network maintenance, creating secure network access, and improving network connectivity. But you do not need to gain all of these certifications before starting in technical support. Begin by studying for just one of the certifications. Once you start in technical support, you can continue your learning by getting certified in more areas. And sometimes, employers are willing to offer some financial assistance or incentives to employees who wish to earn more certificates in their field. In an interview or at your job, be sure to ask what certification opportunities are available for you. In this video, you learned that certifications show that you have learned strategies and concepts that are essential in the technical support field. Some benefits of certifications are improvement in customer assistance, in productivity, and in support quality. Many beginner-level certifications are available through CompTIA, Cisco, Microsoft, Apple, the ITIL Foundation, and finally, certifications can be gained before you start in technical support and as you work in the field. In this video, technical support professionals will discuss skills critical for success in technical support. What skills are critical for success in technical support? I think the most important skill is patience. It's not always easy to explain over the phone what the client should be seeing and then interpret what they are seeing. 
they are often embarrassed at their lack of skill and you need to assure them that all is well and, and you'll help them work out all of the issues. Next is the ability to do problem determination and work out solutions. Proficiency in the technical domain is must, but apart from that, experience in the help desk software is which is needed. They should have strong problem solving skills plus interpersonal skills. Of course, they should be creative thinking thinker too. They must have previous experience in tech support or a similar job. A technical support executive should be very attentive towards the detail. And of course, a good team worker too. Although you can be, you can become a technical support worker with any degree. Employers prefer applicants to have an IT related qualifications. But apart from that, I personally feel that a technical support executive must do the certifications in the domain they are into. For example, if somebody is security professional or data information security professional, they should have got the, so they should be certified with information system security professional uh, certifications. The skills that I needed or that anyone needs to be a good technical support engineer or to be successful in a role as a, a technical support engineer, number one is listening. You have to listen to the customer. Listen to what they're saying, repeat it back to them so you have a solid understanding of the problem that they're trying to describe to you so you can take the appropriate steps to get it resolved. The second skill that you need is a soft skill, but not everyone has it, and that is patience. I always think that you can be taught the technical skill, but what you can't teach some people is solid customer support skills. You know, empathy, patience, you know, being a good listener, being able to, to listen to what they're saying, how to calm down an irate customer. Those are some of the things that are critical to being successful in technical support and enjoying your position and being really good at what you do. You can work with a customer. So like customer service skills um, are really fantastic because you got to be able to engage with the person, find out exactly what they're meaning because um, you'll meet very many different people of high skill, low skill. And so sometimes they'll give you a very generic thing of this doesn't work, fix it. And you have to ask the right questions to figure exactly what they're asking, what's actually wrong. <laughs> Welcome to Overview of Support Channels. After watching this video, you will be able to list various types of channels available to perform technical support, discuss factors that influence choice of support channels, and identify the most appropriate support channels for a given problem or scenario. All right, imagine it's 30 minutes before your assignment is due and you're ready to submit your file to your online course. However, you keep getting an error message you can't sign in. What do you do? Don't freak out yet. You have support channels that you can use to help resolve your issue. After troubleshooting a few things on your own, you try searching online and your school's website support pages. You've just used one of the channels of technical support. Support pages are designed for self-help and you can often find information like FAQs, documentation about services or products, wikis, and a knowledge base. You can also browse discussion forums for posts from other users who have experienced similar problems. But for your problem, your school support pages make no mention of it. Hmm. Now, email is for issues that might not need immediate resolution. Usually, companies provide their email addresses for support on their websites or in product emails and documents sent to their customers. If you have a question or an issue that isn't time sensitive, you can email support and they can respond to you when they get to your email in their queue. This is one kind of asynchronous support. Organizations can also provide asynchronous support on social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. People who have an issue with a larger organization may choose to post on social media to get the company's attention. Public posts on social media allow customers to identify or tag the company and share their issue. 
Social media allows an asynchronous interaction between customers and companies. Customers can have their issues resolved, and companies can show they care about supporting their product. Now, phone support is synchronous, meaning the support happens live and in real time. It's good for those with urgent issues, like they can't submit their assignment online. Phone support is also for those who need to discuss sensitive information, like details about finances or health. And the phone is ideal for customers who prefer live, real-time conversations with someone who can assist them with their technical issue. Live chat also gives you access to technical support in real time through an app on a device or through a website. Through live chat, technical support can walk you through your issue to resolution. And some live chat tools will even indicate where you are on the company's website, so support can better assist you. If your device or hardware is the problem, video chat is helpful because it allows technical support to see what you are seeing. You can show the support person through video chat the steps you are taking to sign in to your college's website. Video chat can also be helpful if you have a hardware issue. Say, if you have a problem with your printer not working, you can show through video chat what's going on. Video chat can provide virtual hands-on help. And remote support is another form of synchronous support. Using remote software, a host device for technical support connects to a customer's device. Both need to be connected to a program for remote support, and both need to be connected to the internet to connect remotely. Remote support is also helpful if there is a setting on your device or if an update is needed and you need someone else to make those changes on your computer for you. And when all else fails, you can always use in-person support. This is when you need hands-on troubleshooting, preventative maintenance services, and hardware-related support. So, now you're down to only 15 minutes until your paper is due. This is urgent, so you decide to call the technical support phone number. After only a few minutes of chatting with someone on the phone, you discover the problem. The site hosting your online course was offline, but it's back up again. Your issue is now resolved, and you are able to log in and submit your assignment. Congratulations! You probably didn't realize that a lot was going on with your school's technical support while you were trying to submit your assignment. Before you realized you couldn't sign in, another user encountered the same issue and connected to technical support through one of the school's many support channels. Once technical support was notified, a ticket was created and support began working through the issue. Ticketing systems are also essential support tools and they document, track, and manage customer issues to resolution. Organizations can convert incoming emails into tickets, log phone sessions like yours, or provide an interface where users can submit tickets directly. For your issue, the organization used internal support channels to identify and resolve the issue. All of this is so the school's many students can submit their assignments on time. But you're not the only one who has benefited from having many different support channels available. A Zen Desk survey of its customers found the following. For simple service requests, customers surveyed preferred email over phone support, live chat, SMS text, and social media. But for complicated service requests, more of the customers surveyed preferred phone over live chat, email, SMS text, and social media. The results show that customers use a broad mix of channels to contact customer support. In this video, you learned that businesses and organizations often need to provide multiple support channels to address different problems and customer needs. Technical support can be provided through many channels using self-help, synchronous, and asynchronous tools. Ticketing systems are support tools that document, track, and manage customer issues to resolution. And customers use a broad mix of channels to contact customer support. Welcome to Remote Support Tools. After watching this video, you will be able to define remote support tools, identify the types of remote support, 
and discuss features and benefits of using remote support. Remote support software in technical support is a tool that allows technical support to access and control another computer that is in another location. Remote support software enables technical support to troubleshoot, install software, and provide instant support remotely. Why is remote support necessary? It can save a lot of time for both a customer and technical support. Instead of spending a lot of time with emails and trying to determine what a user's issue is, a remote support technician can access a user's computer and identify problems faster, which means that issues are resolved sooner. Remote support also means that technical support is available immediately when customers need help. Some common issues that technical support resolves using remote tools are connectivity or software issues with email, internet, Wi-Fi, and virtual private network or VPN connections, slow computer operations, printer connections, necessary programs that are not working correctly or not at all, video conferencing issues, and security issues including unwanted adware and malware. There are two main types of remote support, attended and unattended. Attended remote support is when a customer is at a device and needs support, the problem needs to be solved as soon as possible. Attended support allows for hands-on support. This expedites resolution times and increases customer satisfaction. Now, unattended remote support is for maintenance support of groups of users and servers. The software does not require permission from users to access their computers, and users do not need to be at their computers for support to provide maintenance and support devices. Unattended remote support is ideal for installing updates, managing the IT infrastructure, and troubleshooting issues on many devices. So, how does remote support software work? Remote support needs two devices, a host device for technical support and a customer device. Both need to be connected to a program for remote support, and both need to be connected to the internet in order to connect remotely. Technical support shares a passcode or identifier to the customer, who will then enter the code in the application on their device. This grants technical support access to be in control of the customer's display, pointer, and all functions. Technical support can install and uninstall programs, modify settings, and troubleshoot issues. Some examples of commonly used remote software are ConnectWise, TeamViewer, Dameware, Beyond Trust, and Zoho Assist. And some applications, like Windows Remote Assistance, come pre-installed with the computer's operating system. Some common features and benefits of remote support tools include the following. With remote control and screen sharing, technical support can remotely view and fully control a user's computer. File sharing is a feature that allows technical support to resolve issues that relate to bad files on a user's device. File sharing through remote support ensures that files are kept secure, which keeps the user's device secure. Technical support can also transfer support sessions to another person in technical support if the first technician is unable to resolve an issue. And multiple monitor navigation and support allows technical support to view and navigate multiple screens and monitors for customers. In this video, you learned that Remote support software allows technical support to access, control, and provide support to another computer. Attended remote support software is used by technical support when a customer is at a device. Unattended remote support does not require users to be at their computers. And some features of remote support software are remote control, file sharing, transfer support sessions, and multiple monitor support. In this video, technical support professionals will discuss how they provide remote support to clients. What are some steps you go through when preparing to remote into a client's computer, and how do you prepare them and talk them through the steps you're taking to help solve their issues? So here at Meta, the main thing we do as that is we connect in a lot of the time. Um, we're moving away from the way we interact with people on a certain level, but basically we try to let them know like, hey, is it all right if we share your screen? And for some places it's not as easy, but we can just click a button after they say yes, 
and we just kind of take over and they, they're happy with it. At previous places, it's we have to request an entire number to enter in the system to remotely connect. And typically we will uh, want to ask them to like, hey, close anything you don't want me to see. I, and then I will take over. Gaining remote access into a customer system can be very difficult at times. Um, you know, sometimes they're calling, they're just looking for a quick answer, a quick fix, and they think that uh, getting into a remote session is just going to prolong you know, their call and they don't have time to do that. Um, oftentimes, too, it depends on who the customer is. You know, if it's somebody, you know, if your company is making products that are consumed by, you know, other companies and you're used to dealing with folks that work in IT, um, it's a lot easier because they understand remote access and are often uh, quick to allow you into their system because they know that they can get their resolution potentially that much faster. But if it's, um, you know, let's say it's a consumer product, uh, you know, it's a USB drive or, you know, replacing a hard drive or a camera that they purchased and it's not connecting to their laptop, they can be really hesitant um, to allow you to connect to their machine, which is completely understandable. They may have things like their tax returns stored on there or other sensitive types of information. And they also seem to think that after we hang up the call that somehow magically we can just get back into their machine when, whenever we want to. So the first thing that you want to do is allay any fears that you know your customer might have with you know a remote uh, connection. You want to explain to them why you're, you know you would like to access their machine remotely and how much time it could save them and that they'll be able to see everything that you're doing while the remote session is in progress and that you won't do anything without their permission. So if you're patient and you gently explain these, to, uh, these things to them, you'll probably have a better experience. Remote uh, technical support is both a, um, a great benefit um, as well as it can be um, can be pressurizing for the agents. Um, it can be helpful because a lot of times you're trying to walk um, um, a customer into a particular, you know, walk through a particular solution and they might be doing something different from what you're telling them. So being able to try things out yourself uh, makes it a lot easier uh, with access to uh, the desktop. Uh, but at the same time, the customer is watching you do certain things. So you need to uh, be good at what you're doing. You need to really understand and make sure you have good skills in, uh, in the system or the application that you're trying to um, debug or resolve a problem for remotely. Welcome to Levels of Technical Support. After watching this video, you will be able to describe the need for tiered support, recognize the different levels of technical support, and identify support procedures and skills required at each level. What is the need for tiered or leveled support? Having tiered support has the following advantages. Strategically route issues to different levels of support based on the product, issue complexity, and severity. Having a timeline and protocol for solving issues helps the organization as it grows. For a growing organization, tiered support helps handle a large volume of issues effectively by using resources appropriately. Customer satisfaction is improved by reducing their wait time. And tiered support provides an opportunity for training tech support professionals and gives them a chance to broaden their skill sets. There are five levels of technical support, ranging from levels 0 to 4. Level 0 support is the self-service level where users can find help with FAQs or a knowledge base. Level 1 support is usually basic help desk service. Level 2 support is more in-depth troubleshooting of issues. Level 3 support includes support specialists and skilled engineers and Level 4 is support provided by third-party businesses that might supply some parts of the components that are not directly supported by the organization. Let's look at the levels a little closer. Level 0 contains self-service support, like FAQs on a web page or product documentation that users can retrieve online for themselves. It also includes chatbots for simple queries, discussion forums for help from other users, and knowledge bases for support. 
The next level is Level 1 support, which includes Help Desk. Common issues may involve support helping users navigate new applications and menus. Using phone, email, or social media support, Level 1 generally involves basic user and password issues, hardware and software installation, and setup issues. If unable to address the issues, Level 1 support escalates the issue to Level 2. Level 2 support deals with harder and more specific tasks than Level 1. They review the steps documented by Level 1 technicians and start troubleshooting issues escalated to them. They have in-depth product knowledge, technical skills, and excellent communication skills to help resolve issues and communicate the same to customers. If an issue isn't resolved by them, customers are escalated to the Level 3 support tier. Next is Level 3 support. Level 3 technicians are skilled specialists and analysts with a wide range of experience and wide access to resources needed to recreate the issue in a lab environment. The technicians attempt to determine the root cause of the issue, and this may lead to product changes and solutions passed down to Level 1 and 2 technicians. And the last level of support is Level 4 support, though it exists outside the organization. It includes contracted support for products sourced from other manufacturers. This may consist of support for printers, computers, software, machine maintenance, and other outsourced hardware and software. Level 3 or Level 2 support may forward some queries for review by Level 4 support. Now, IT support levels usually describe the skills and access levels the IT support personnel have. This table shows the skills required at each support level. At level zero, users can browse and retrieve support information from the web or app-based platforms, including product details, FAQs, technical information, manuals, and search functions. Level one requires staff to have a basic level of technical knowledge. They are trained to resolve known problems and fulfill service requests by following documented standard operating procedures, SOP, or scripts. Level 2 requires support personnel having deep knowledge and a good understanding of the product or service. They may or may not be the programmers or engineers who designed and created the service or product, but they should have adequate knowledge and experience of the specified product or service. At Level 3, subject matter experts, or SMEs, and specialists typically have the highest level of skills and are often called product specialists. This group must have experience in solving complex problems and may include the actual creators, engineers, programmers, or chief architects who designed and developed the product or service. And the final level, that is, Level 4, prefers suppliers and business partners providing support and services for products or components that are not directly supported by an organization, but are essential for customer service. In this video, you learned that tiered support is needed to route technical support issues correctly based on product complexity and severity, and to improve technical support training and upskilling opportunities for tech support professionals. Tech support levels range from 0 to 4, of which levels 1, 2, and 3 are the main levels of tech support. And level 0 is a self-service tool for customers, while level 4 is usually provided from outside the company. Welcome to Service Level Agreements, or SLAs. After watching this video, you will be able to define service level agreements, or SLAs, in technical support, discuss the key differences between response and resolution SLAs, and identify how priority levels with SLAs are interconnected. So, what are service level agreements, or SLAs, in technical support? SLAs are legal agreements or contracts between businesses and customers. SLAs ensure quality, timeliness, and availability of technical support. They enable businesses to manage and meet customer expectations. And they can be time-based, especially in technical support, when a customer might need rapid resolution to an issue. Okay, imagine this scenario. 
you downloaded and installed free software for an e-book reader. You find on the FAQ page for the company some information about the help offered by their team if you run into problems using the software. They also detail how to contact them. Additionally, they state how fast their support can handle your queries based on whether you are using the free version of the software or the paid version. So when you installed and used their software, you accepted their contract and agreed to the business's SLA. SLA contracts will include the following, an agreement summary with definitions, SLA measurements, and metrics used, goals of the business and users, for example, what needs does the user have that the business can provide, consequences of violations, like financial penalties or incentives, so the business and the customer can continue to work together, and point of contact, so customers know who is involved, what their roles are, and the escalation of issues. There are three types of SLAs. Customer-based SLAs, which are customized for different customers. Service-based SLAs are for groups of customers who use a service the same. Every customer receives the same service. And multiple SLAs for different types of customers, like premium or VIP, allow for variation within the SLA to meet different needs for different parts of a business. But how are SLAs and priority levels interconnected? SLA priority levels can be adjusted based on the impact that the issue has on the business. The higher the impact is on the business, then the more urgent the priority is. In the example shown here, level 1 has a high priority and high impact. The issue has most likely resulted in stopping business. Level 2 means the business has been disrupted. Level 3 priority indicates that maybe the issue is an inconvenience for customers, but it doesn't stop the business from operating. And level 4 is the lowest priority level in this example. It might represent routine services, like updates or changes. SLAs will also include details about how long support has to respond to issues and resolve issues. Response times are how long technical support teams have to acknowledge and start work on an issue. For example, a low-priority issue may have a response goal of two business days. However, an urgent issue that extensively impacts business may have an immediate response goal. Resolution SLAs state how long the team has to resolve the issue from start to finish. Resolution SLAs might also have priority levels but the time to resolve the issue may be different from response SLAs. Whatever your role is in technical support, you will most likely be using some form of ticketing system to manage SLAs. Ticketing systems will help you track, monitor, prioritize, automate, and report on SLAs for your organization. In this video, you learned that ticketing systems help you and your organization manage SLAs. SLAs are legal agreements between businesses and their customers that ensure quality, timeliness, and availability of technical support. SLAs identify priority levels depending on the urgency of issues and establish response and resolution times. And finally, three types of SLAs are customer-based, service-based, and multiple SLAs, which can be a combination of customer and service-based SLAs. Service level agreements, or SLAs, are undeniably a huge part of technical support. What are SLAs? Why are meeting these contractual obligations important to the success of a tech support professional? So another important uh, tip is that you should always implement SLA, or service level agreements. So most of today's ticketing software system comes equipped with service level agreements, tracking and management capabilities. SLAs lay out an agreement between you and your customers. This function defines a response and resolution time times customer can expect. Moreover, it helps agent to deliver service targets. Setting SLAs ensures that your customer service team answers each ticket request. Therefore, handled within a reasonable time frame so customer 
never wait for too long. The SLAs are important because not only they set an expectation for the customer on when they can expect a response or an issue to be addressed on, in, uh, but also it helps the support team prioritize their workload and resources. So um, a service level agreement is sort of an agreement with uh, typically with contract stuff, um, but basically it's that you are going to, um, it's with like a ticketing system. So people will uh, report that they have an issue, it, they create a ticket, it goes to you. Now there's different uh, categories. So there's a low, medium, high priority. Typically the higher priority means you have will have to answer and respond to the issue within a certain amount of time. And so lower tier um, will end up having a much higher opening. So it'd be like six hours versus 15 minutes of both response time and sometimes fixing the entire issue. There was a time in when I was working in tech support where our level one team was short staffed and there was a risk that we might not meet our severity one SLA of um, response within one hour. So several us, of us from level two were asked to help out and um, uh, you know, on, and go onto the help desk to help address any urgent issues, severity one issues that might be coming in. Welcome to the Escalation Matrix. After watching this video, you will be able to identify escalation and its types, discuss the escalation matrix, and describe handoffs and their importance. Imagine you just received your new printer and you're excited to try it out, but it isn't connecting to your computer. You need help, so you immediately contact the company's technical support line. After trying a few things and not resolving the issue, support tells you they will need to escalate your case. But what does that mean? An escalation in technical support is when the first support person you contact is unable to offer an answer or solution to the problem. You must be transferred to the next point of contact in support. When an issue is escalated, it moves through the levels of support until it reaches resolution. So why do companies need escalation? Escalation is an effective method of building trust and support for an organization. It allows better communication between the organization and its customers. Escalation improves businesses because issues and problems can be identified and fixed. And escalation boosts customer satisfaction when an organization supports its products. Now, whether the escalation process goes through a service desk, through product engineers, or automatically through a tracking system, there are typically three paths escalation policies follow. Functional escalation, hierarchical escalation, and automatic escalation. Functional escalation is when an issue is escalated to a team or person with the skills and knowledge to resolve the issue, not the person with the most seniority. For example, the first person to respond to the issue may be a senior developer from one team who isn't familiar with the problem. The incident then gets escalated to a junior developer on another team who has more knowledge of the issue. Through the functional escalation process, the issue gets identified and corrected more quickly. The second path is hierarchical escalation. When an issue does not have a clear path to resolution, support may escalate the issue until the customer is satisfied with the resolution, even if it's not the outcome they wanted. The issue is escalated through the support hierarchy. For example, the issue might start with a service desk technician, then be escalated to the team lead or manager, and then is escalated to a supervisor or a specialist. And the final path is automatic escalation. Ticketing systems can automatically escalate an incident. If, after the issue has been submitted, the primary on-call person doesn't respond in time to the ticket or another similar issue occurs, the issue is automatically escalated to another level of support, like another person in support or even a chatbot. So what is an escalation matrix? 
an escalation matrix is made up of a series of increasing levels based on severity and priority. It includes whom to contact based on the specific problem the customer is experiencing. What an escalation matrix looks like and how it's used varies depending on the company. This is an example of one type. Typically, the escalation matrix will include contact information for support and what the contact's role is. It also states the timing of when issues should be escalated to the next level. Sometimes the technical support person you were talking to transfers you to someone else to resolve your issue. This is called a handoff. Handoffs are important because they help support teams resolve an issue. Additionally, they encourage support teams to share knowledge with each other. They prevent incomplete documentation about problems and fixes. And handoffs can lead to faster and more satisfactory resolution of issues. Okay, back to that scenario with your new printer. You've turned it on and off and checked all the cables, but it still isn't connecting to your computer, so you contact technical support. A first-level representative walks you through basic troubleshooting steps with no resolution. Your issue is escalated to a level 2 technician who is more familiar with your printer. After more troubleshooting, the level 2 technician mentions a possible software issue. The level 2 technician hands off your issue to a level 3 software engineer. You answer a few questions, and the software engineer suggests, of course, a software fix. And the fix is a success, and finally your printer is working properly. So, using the escalation matrix, technical support has resolved the problem. In this video, you learned that an escalation in technical support is when one support person is unable to offer an answer or solution to the problem and transfers the issue to a higher level for support. Three paths followed by escalation policies are functional, hierarchical, and automatic escalation. An escalation matrix is made up of a series of increasing levels of support based on severity and priority. And a handoff is when one support person transfers an issue to another person to resolve the issue. Welcome to What Are Ticketing Systems? After watching this video, you will be able to indicate what a ticketing system is and what it's used for, describe how ticketing systems work, and identify the use of ticketing systems by IT professionals. A support ticket is an electronic document used to record the interaction between a customer and a service representative. It contains a record of communications and resolution efforts for a particular problem and is useful to manage issues, questions, requests, and problems your customers might have. A ticket may also be referred to using terms like issue, case, or incident. A support ticket is managed using a ticketing system. These systems may also be called help desk software, customer support software, ticketing software or app, and case management system or customer care management system. What is a ticketing system? A ticketing system is software used to systematically document, track, manage, and resolve customer issues. Functionally, a ticketing system facilitates the creation of tickets, allowing support agents to manage, collaborate, and coordinate resolution efforts. A ticketing system contains a central data hub designed to streamline communications between agents, team members, and customers. Most ticketing systems, in addition to basic ticket management, also provide the following capabilities. Some automation, for example, the routing of a web ticket to an appropriate resource. Collaboration, allowing all agents and resources to freely access information to increase efficiency. Easy integration with other or future IT management processes and applications. Multiple channels of customer access, such as by telephone or online forms. And reporting system performance of metrics, such as response time, volume, and customer satisfaction. Here is a typical life cycle of a ticket. The ticket is created when a customer walks in, calls an agent, enters relevant information in an online form, sends an email to a customer support email address, 
or posts on social media. The ticket is assigned to a customer support agent, or a queue, monitored by multiple agents. This agent categorizes the ticket and assesses priority and severity. The ticket is resolved by the resource, which may include validation, requests for further information, or escalation. And finally, once the issue is resolved, the ticket is closed by the agent or customer. However, if needed, the ticket can always be reopened. Tickets can be created from the customer online or using an app, as shown here, the customer's use of a text session, such as an SMS or email, to contact the support agent, or a link in social media to contact the support agent. Initially, tickets contain basic information, such as the customer's name, the date of the request, the email address used to contact the customer, the category of the problem, and a brief description of the issue. Also, maybe some additional relevant details, such as a model number. The ticketing system may automatically assign a ticket to a specific agent based on some business rules or logic, like the time of day, who the customer is, problem category, agent availability, etc., or may be placed in a queue from which available agents can pick a ticket and assign it to themselves. In some cases, a supervisor may assign the tickets in a queue to specific agents manually. As the agent receiving the request, you open the ticket. Note that if an online source is used, the provided information automatically appears in the ticket. In the case of a phone call, you would obtain and enter this information yourself. Also note that each ticket will be assigned a ticket number. This number will identify this ticket through its life cycle. The agent working on the ticket communicates with the customer to resolve the issue. When reviewing the information provided, you, in some cases, may be allowed to reassign or forward it to a specialist or to a more appropriate queue. As part of this process, you may require additional details to troubleshoot the issue. For example, you may get into a live chat session with the customer. You verify the issue and instruct the customer how to resolve the problem. Once the issue is resolved, you close the ticket and change the status in the system. In this video, you learned that a ticketing system is software used to systematically manage and resolve customer issues. The life cycle of a ticket includes ticket creation, assigning and starting the ticket issue, resolving the ticket issue, and closing the ticket. And IT support agents create tickets, start the ticket process, and resolve issues using a variety of communication methods. Welcome to Insider's Viewpoints, Handling Difficult Situations. In this video, you will hear a technical support professional describe a real-world difficult situation and what strategies she uses to approach the problem. Hi, my name is Michelle and I'm an instructional designer for SkillUp Technologies. But prior to joining SkillUp, I spent over 20 years of my career working as a Tier 3 technical support engineer for various different companies. So I became an expert at handling difficult situations and difficult customers alike, ranging from home users using retail products all the way up to Fortune 500 and Global 1000 customers too. So I'm here to share with you today a real-world example of a case I handled while working at one of my previous employers. We had an enterprise-level customer purchase several dozen very expensive enterprise-class products for use in his organization. However, after a period of time, they began failing one by one until eventually they all failed. So our customer reached out to us um, and filed a support ticket for technical assistance. However, due to various reasons, that ticket remained in a queue untouched for over seven months. Now, during that seven months, his organization experienced weeks of downtime. Um, and they also had to go out and purchase several dozen more very expensive enterprise class products from one of our competitors to get their division operational again. So our inability or our failure to handle his case correctly resulted in a significant financial loss for his company, and he wanted to know 
what we plan to do about it. So not only was it a very difficult situation, um, it was also a very delicate one and one that required me to walk a very fine line to try to get it resolved, which ultimately I did. So sometimes folks ask me, you know, Michelle, how do you remain calm in situations like these? And how do you calm a customer down when they're calling you and they're very upset? So not much, really. I take a deep breath and I try not to let the situation impact my senses or my emotions. I try not to get caught up in the moment emotionally along with the customer. And that helps keep things calm. Um, I know that angry customers aren't mad at me personally, so I try not to take things, you know, personally, ever. Um, they're mad at what happened to them. They're mad at the situation, and they want somebody to help them to get it resolved. And, you know, further to that, they may be experiencing additional pressure coming at them from, you know, their daily lives, or perhaps it's pressure coming from upper management and breathing down this person's neck, you know, regarding the case for which they're calling you about, Right. So when I try to diffuse a situation like this, the first thing I do is let the customer speak. No matter how well versed I am with the history of the case, I let the customer get everything off their chest because I have learned to realize that this is the first step in calming down the customer. Right? I speak in a very calm and reassuring and very respectful tone using affirmations to let that customer know that I am paying attention and that I am listening to everything that they have to say. Right, And I think the second most important thing for de-escalating or defusing an issue like this is gaining the customer's trust. If you can gain their trust and instill in them the confidence that you're the one that's ultimately going to resolve their issue, that is very helpful towards de-escalation and getting the case moving in a forward direction. Um, you know, you may not be able to resolve the issue, you know, in terms of fixing things that are broken, but you may be able to take a very negative situation and turn it around so it will have a positive outcome. Okay. Some folks ask me, how do I get in the right mindset for handling difficult situations? So I always ask myself two questions. The first one is, does the customer have a legitimate reason for being this angry towards me. And so, um, you know, if the answer is yes, then what that does is it raises my level of empathy towards the customer, which they can hear in my voice, which helps de-escalate the situation. And the second thing that I do to prepare is I ask myself, is the, is the, is the customer being unrealistic in the amount of anger that they're, you know, displaying in this particular call? Because the truth about working in technical support is there are customers that will do that. They know that if they yell in the right ears for the right amount of time, they may walk away with something free or an appeasement item. And then, you know, by the same token, sometimes you get folks who are just abusive. You know, that's their nature. That's their personality. And no matter what you do, they're going to hang up that phone just as angry as they were when they called you in the first place. So let me leave you with some final tips if you're considering a career in technical support. And firstly, that's to remember that a difficult call is not the end of the world, whether you had a hand in it or not. Um, if you've done the best that you can, you've done a good job. You've done all you can do. And the only thing that you can do is get through it, you know, the best that you can. And um, also remember that difficult situations don't last forever and that they can also be a very valuable learning experience, you know, as it was for our company. Um, accept the fact that difficult situations and difficult customers come with the territory. It's part of working in the technical support industry. And finally, you know, remember that time and experience will give you all the skills that you need to be able to su successfully handle difficult situations and difficult customers, just like it has for me. So I wish you all the best in your career as a technical support engineer, and I hope that this information was helpful to you. Thank you. Welcome to features and benefits of ticketing systems. After watching this video, you will be able to define common features of ticketing systems, describe how tickets are tagged and routed, 
and describe how automation is critical in a ticketing system. Comprehensive IT ticketing tools can include a number of features. Common features of ticketing systems include omni-channel support, the ability to generate tickets from different channels, ticket routing, the ability to assign tickets to agents or departments, ticket categorization, and tagging, where the ticket can be classified and sorted by issue to enable routing to a particular specialist, tracking and management, where the ticket contains a processing trail, knowledge base management, where issues solved in past tickets can be used as a resource for addressing similar new tickets, and automation, the ability of the system to automatically perform tasks like route tickets, send emails, or create alerts. Customers can contact your help desk organization from many channels, email, social media, live chat, and phone. Many times, the resolution of a ticket can involve more than one channel, so consolidation of these communications in one place is important. This preserves issue specifics, customer conversations, and customer profiles in one ticket document. Requests can come from different sources and are collected in the ticketing system. John has a problem with a network setting. John calls and talks with a support agent who creates the ticket. Sarah emails customer support with a printer issue. A support agent receives the request and enters it into the ticketing system. And Marvin texts with a problem downloading software. A support agent receives the message and collects specific information about the problem. All these requests are consolidated into a common dashboard where agents can collaborate with team members all in one place. A ticketing system has specific capabilities to manage the life cycle of the ticket. Tickets can be categorized based on date, ticket type, customer, and issue specifics. Tickets are then tagged with this information. This becomes part of the ticket and may trigger automatic processes such as routing and customer communication. Based on categorization, tickets are then routed to the appropriate agent. For example, if one agent is more knowledgeable about IBM authoring, the ticket is routed to that person. But if the agent that first receives the ticket can resolve the issue, they work to do so. As the ticket is worked, all customer and internal communication and other notes about the process resolution are captured by the ticket system. This will provide information about ticket status, which can be reviewed by agents or rolled up into a daily report. A well-organized ticket system can help provide good customer service by resolving issues quickly with minimum customer back and forth. As a ticket contains information about its management through the system, tracking the history of the ticket is as easy as looking at the ticket itself. A key for constant system improvement relies on analytics. The ticketing system provides analytics for the organization to see how the tickets are spread out, for example, by alert level, by ticket status, or by the group requesting the help desk support. With the ability to aggregate and report ticket information, you can also investigate what works and areas of improvement in process improvement, performance metrics, and resource management. Many customers are fully capable of serving themselves and may prefer to do so if that option is available to them. A knowledge base system allows customers and agents to research issues. Knowledge base systems help customers by summarizing and storing large amounts of information in searchable linked databases. Knowledge bases can also assist agents to find resources for customers. And knowledge bases require updates to keep content relevant. Knowledge base access can include questions to agents through messaging or chat, searching for answers to common questions without direct agent support, discussion groups for specific products or process types, and product documentation and demonstrations. Automation is a critical part of a ticketing system. It helps tickets get to the right person at the right time. The logistics of managing tickets can get complicated quickly. Automation can help in assigning tickets, sending responses to customers and team members, escalating issues based on severity, and pulling customer data to address specific needs. 
automation reduces time spent on repetitive tasks and media work, making agents more engaged and productive. In this video, you learned that common features of help desk ticketing systems include omni-channel support, ticket routing, tagging, and automation. Ticketing systems knowledge bases contain large amounts of information and can be accessed by customers or help desk agents during issue resolution. And automation can manage ticket flow and reduce time spent on repetitive tasks. Welcome to Popular Ticketing Systems. After watching this video, you will be able to indicate what to look for in a ticketing system, describe types of ticketing systems, and list popular ticketing systems. What should companies look for in a ticketing system? The system should be straightforward to use to make the most of an agent's time, enrich the quality of customer interactions by providing customer information and history in the system. Be available to provide reportable metrics you can use to evaluate customer service performance. Provide tools for agents and managers to identify repeated problematic issues. And enable and foster internal team collaboration. Hosting types of ticketing systems include cloud-based systems, which are hosted on a vendor server, and self-hosted systems, which is licensed software that runs on your company's server. Licensing types include open source systems, which are basic code that is easily modified by your developers, and enterprise systems, which are generally used by large companies and offer many advanced features. Cloud-based systems are hosted on a vendor server, and the benefits are setting up and maintaining the system is easy as the vendor does most of the work. They are highly scalable, the vendor handles the required growth. And cloud-based systems are also available to anyone connected to the Internet. Concerns about cloud-based systems include the following. You must rely on the vendor to address malfunctions or bugs. An Internet connection is always required. And customization is limited and must be performed by the vendor. A self-hosted system is licensed software that runs on your company's server. The benefits include complete control of data and security, and in running your own instance of the software, it can be more flexible to meet business needs. The concerns include the initial investment in servers, infrastructure, and developers. Server maintenance is also an in-house cost. Your company's developers must perform system updates and fixes, and your company must back up the system. Open source systems are basic code that is easily modified by your company's developers. Their benefits include the cost of the software is free or mostly free, access to the code base makes it more customizable for your needs, and open source software often has a sizable developer community. The concerns include your company's developers need to be knowledgeable about setting up and maintaining the software. The timeline for initial development and rollout can be extended, and your company has total responsibility for updating and maintaining the system. Enterprise systems are the big guns used by large companies and offer managing system assets and advanced reporting capabilities, 24-hour availability of vendor support for your company or your customers and a high level of customization by the vendor to meet the needs of larger enterprises. The concerns include cost. These systems can be very expensive, and a more capable system is necessarily more complex and may require additional operator training. Okay, now you will learn about five popular ticketing systems. Zendesk, Jira Service Desk, Freshdesk, LiveAgent, and ServiceNow. There are many other ticketing systems available, and the company you work for might be using a different one. Each of these products have common features meeting the basic requirements for a ticketing system. Omni-channel support, the ability to field requests from email, live chat, and call center agents. A degree of automation, including capturing, logging, and initial routing of incoming requests. 
a basic set of collaboration tools enabling support agents to work together, a basic knowledge base capability available to agents and customers. Each vendor charges monthly based on number of service agent users and product features, and all systems offer a free trial with limited use. Zendesk is a cloud-based ticketing system with pre-built integrations for a large number of popular apps, internal and external collaboration tools you expect, a knowledge base with self-service portal, interfaces for WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Twitter, live chat, or email, creation of macros for responses to basic tasks, and Zendesk pricing is highest among those reviewed here. Jira Service Desk is available as a cloud or self-hosted solution. It is built on the Jira workflow engine. It is expandable by purchasing add-ins or upgraded service levels. A Confluence account is required to create a knowledge base. Chat is limited to a few business-oriented apps, like Slack or Teams. Complex automations are available, including sending events to third-party applications by using webhooks. And the core Jira Service Desk per user pricing is the lowest of systems reviewed here. Next, Freshdesk is an AWS cloud-based ticketing system with customizable ticket views, enhanced tracking time of agent interactions and ticket completion, AI-powered chatbots to offer relevant resolutions to service agents and customers, a training solution for system users called Freshworks Academy, and Freshdesk is moderately priced. Live Agent is a cloud-based ticketing system that emphasizes live chat along with traditional call center and email capabilities, includes integration with more than 200 applications including email, Facebook, WordPress, Jira, Twitter, and Slack, has a chat widget that can be embedded in any web page, includes the creation of unlimited email addresses, and is moderately priced. And finally, ServiceNow provides a comprehensive IT and workflow automation management platform, which includes a cloud-based ticketing system. ServiceNow embraces the IT service management or ITSM philosophy that IT should be delivered as an efficient service, providing a higher value for customers. It focuses on custom, repeatable workflows for simple to complex tasks. ServiceNow is also an integrated system, featuring change and release management, service level management, request management, and systems configuration management. ServiceNow includes custom apps for mobile devices integrated directly into the system, and the cost of ServiceNow is based on configuration. In this video, you learned that the criteria for choosing a ticketing system includes one that promotes agent productivity, customer interactivity, metrics, reporting, and collaboration. Ticketing systems can be cloud-based, self-hosted, open source, and enterprise. And popular ticketing systems include Zendesk, Jira Service Desk, Freshdesk, LiveAgent, and ServiceNow, but there are many others available. Ticketing systems are the heart of a tech support organization. Why are they so important? And what ticketing systems are commercially available? I come across in numerous uh, ticketing systems, and, and they might be called by different names in, by different companies or in different organizations. They might be called help desk systems. They might be called incidents response systems, etc. Uh, but they, but um, they play a very similar role, uh, pretty much all of them. Uh, in, that, um, in that respect, I've used custom-built ticketing systems, in-house ticketing systems, as well as off-the-shelf off uh, software and cloud-based or service-based ticketing systems. Uh, so including uh, Zendesk, ServiceNow. Um, I've used open-source ticketing systems such as OS Ticket. Uh, I've used user voice um, and, and several others. So in my experience, I have worked in multiple ticketing softwares or platforms. 
in my past experience. So few of them are like ServiceNow, Sherwell, Sapphire, Summit, etc. So each company um, has a different ticketing software for the most part. Um, everyone kind of just picks their own. Sometimes they'll have their own developed and created for their, their business purposes. Um, the majority of it comes down to do they have one that's web-based or as a program itself? Um, then the other guard is, do they have a knowledge base uh, connected to it at all so where you can easily search for issues or whatnot? But few companies also prefer to have their own custom built ticketing software to meet their exceptional business needs. Ticketing systems play a vital role in tech support ecosystem as it helps determining type and number of issues tickets history, real-time tracking of service requests with their priority set, agent performance, and most important thing, which is maintaining SLAs. What are best practices for using ticketing systems? And what are some ways or methods you use to help you manage ticketing systems more effectively? For me, uh, the best practice is always to get the user's name, write down exactly what the issue is, and then verifying that like that's what is the issue. And then from there, it's making sure to get all the relevant information for details um, beyond just like what how you fix and stuff, um, stuff that you've tried and failed to do, and then along with the information on the actual computer and software, like software version, um, OS version things like that. Is it even a Mac or a Windows computer? And the big thing that comes down to is making sure you detail everything in the ticket itself, um, what the issue was, what um, what you saw, and how to fix it. With If you can make it step by step, that's great. But basically, it makes it able for many of the past cases and stuff like that to look up uh, what had happened or search for something related to what other people have with that issue and how that tech fixed it. And so that way you can proceed with making it much easier. Whereas if you can't search for stuff like that, it makes it much harder. And it's like, oh, has someone dealt with this before or not? Ticketing systems can vary from one to the other. Um, so it's really important that you, you know, whichever ticketing system that your organization wants you to work on, that you get the right training for it. Get familiar with the various uh, features uh, within that ticketing system and learn about tips and tricks. You know, talk to some of the other agents in your organization to, to see how they're using what kinds of best practices that they've established or tricks that they've learned over time. So, uh, you know, uh, any software that you're, you're, you know, end up using, uh, make sure you become intimately familiar with its uh, various features and capabilities. Welcome to Introduction to Troubleshooting. After watching this video, you will be able to define troubleshooting, list the steps in the CompTIA troubleshooting model, and explain the CompTIA troubleshooting model. Troubleshooting is a systematic approach to problem solving that is often used to find and correct issues with computers. Troubleshooting is a significant part of an IT tech support professional's work. The industry standard troubleshooting model comes from the Computing Technology Industry Association, or CompTIA. Let's look at the process and some specifics applicable to the IT support specialist. The CompTIA model includes the following steps. Identify the problem. In this step, you research the knowledge base, or internet, if applicable. Establish a theory of probable cause. In this step, you test the theory to determine the cause. Once the theory is confirmed, determine the next steps to resolve the problem, and if the theory is not confirmed, establish a new theory or escalate the problem. Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and identify potential effects. Implement the solution or escalate as necessary. Verify full system functionality and, if applicable, implement preventative measures. And finally, document findings or lessons learned, as well as actions and outcomes. Let's look at these steps in more detail. In the first step, you identify the problem. Start by gathering information. 
This may come from a telephone call, a ticket submitted online, or other sources. Next, contact and question the user who submitted the issue. Try to understand what is happening, including hardware, software, and system settings involved, and what the user was doing when the issue occurred. Based on the information collected, clearly try to identify the symptoms. Let's say in this scenario, the user sees an access denied message when trying to print on a network printer. Determine if anything else has changed. For example, are all servers up and running? Have any servers been updated recently? Does the user's account allow access to that printer? If an answer is not immediately apparent, try to duplicate the problem. If there are multiple issues, it is good practice to address each problem individually. For example, if the user also reports his monitor is also too dim, approach that separately from the printer issue. If the problem is not yet solved, it is time to do some research. If your company has maintained a knowledge base, search that for similar issues that have been resolved before. An internet search may also provide useful information. So, based on the information you have collected and your research, establish a theory of probable cause. One important starting strategy may be to question the obvious. For example, is the printer plugged in and turned on? Also, consider more than one approach. For example, could this be a user machine configuration problem, or is this a network issue? Next, test your theory to determine the cause. You may work with the user to verify the computer is appropriately configured, or review network accounts and policies to see if the issue can be found there. Did you solve the problem? Sometimes the answer is not obvious and may require more research and testing. If you discover the root cause of the issue is complex or systemic, establish a plan of action. Keep in mind that some fixes may require reboots or downtime or require downloading software or patches. Perform testing in a staging environment if available. There may be change management processes in your IT department to perform tests. Back up any data that may be affected by the change and remember, any systems changes may require approval by other IT staff members. The next step is to implement the solution or escalate the issue. This may involve running scripts to correct a programmatic issue. The solution may require updating systems or software. The answer may also involve updating configuration files or a change in firewall settings may be required. After implementing a fix, verify full system functionality and implement preventative measures as appropriate. Often, users are more knowledgeable about how their systems are supposed to work. Consider asking users to test the functionality of the fix. Also, consider if the solution may also need to be applied to other servers or devices. An important part of the problem resolution process is to document your findings, lessons learned, actions taken, and outcomes of the changes. Be sure to fully document your research, theories, changes, and updates. If you have a knowledge base, add this information so other support professionals can reference it in the future. Documentation is particularly useful if the solution later causes unintended consequences. In this video, you learned that the Computing Technology Industry Association, or CompTIA, has the industry standard troubleshooting model. The CompTIA model involves identifying and researching the problem, establishing and testing a theory, planning, implementing and verifying a solution, and documenting the process and results. And finally, CompTIA troubleshooting steps are useful to tech support professionals to solve problems for their customers. Welcome to ITSM Methodologies and Frameworks. After watching this video, you will be able to define IT Service Management or ITSM, identify ITSM frameworks and standards, and discuss the benefits of ITSM frameworks. What is ITSM? 
ITSM, or Information Technology IT Service Management, includes all of the processes, activities, technologies, and people that are part of an organization. ITSM is the strategy that organizations use to manage IT services for their clients. IT services can include things like your computer, the programs and applications installed on it, and technical support for these services. Organizations can use ITSM to structure how to deliver IT as a service and to increase their productivity and performance. ITSM includes the tools to manage IT services, which allow control and oversight of an organization's IT infrastructure. A successful ITM strategy adds structure and value to IT. To implement these best practices and standards of ITSM, organizations often use predefined frameworks. ITSM frameworks are guides with a formalized structure of standards, processes, and best practices. Popular ITSM frameworks for many businesses include these common elements. Strategy, which includes assessing and planning services for an organization. Design, including creating and structuring IT services. Management, which is implementing the management of projects, knowledge, and assets. Operation, which includes managing issues and problems with services. And improvement, which involves continuously reviewing and evaluating of services and processes. Some important frameworks include ITIL or ITIL, COBIT, LEANIT, MOF or MOF, and ISO IEC 20000. And these can work together to set IT service standards and optimize business effectiveness. ITIL or the Information Technology Infrastructure Library is a standardized set of detailed processes and practices for IT activities that focuses on aligning IT services with business objectives. ITIL stages include service strategy, which focuses on the service lifecycle, like how to design, develop, and implement ITSM. Service design, which focuses on designing services and processes. Service transition, which focuses on how to balance new or changing services. Service operation, which focuses on ensuring services are running smoothly and reliably. And continual service improvement which focuses on the continuous, iterative, agile process of product and service improvement. COBIT is a framework for governance and management of IT, and the framework focuses on aligning business goals to IT processes. It does not provide a map for best practices for implementation of IT or information security, but it is a framework using the processes contained in ITIL and other frameworks. Lean IT is an extension to IT that establishes a framework for applying lean manufacturing principles to developing and managing IT products and services. It is designed to cut out excess or waste, such as poor technical support that doesn't add value to a business. MOF, Microsoft Operations Framework, also known as MOF, provides a series of best practices guides for IT to establish reliable and cost-effective services. MOF provides guidance for the IT lifecycle structured this way, the plan phase, deliver phase, operate phase, and manage layer. ISO IEC 20000 is an international standard for IT service management systems, or SMS and it sets guidelines for service providers for how to establish, implement, operate, and maintain an IT service management system. Common ITSM metrics that organizations measure are customer satisfaction, or CSAT scores, first contact resolution, first level resolution, cost per ticket, and mean time to resolution. The benefits of ITSM processes for IT services are Assurance of consistency in IT services, simplified processes and efficiency, better incident management, reduced risk and downtime, lower operational costs, and greater standardization and accountability. These benefit organizations by reducing IT costs, improving the quality of service and customer satisfaction, increasing an organization's competitive advantage and allowing more agility for new IT services. So why should you learn about ITSM methodologies? 
in technical support, you and your team are a critical part of ITSM. Services and support that technical support provides are based on ITSM processes. Your success in technical support depends on a well-organized standard for managing IT services. IT solutions and knowledge is a main part of the technical support roles. And the feedback technical support professionals provide to an organization is an important part of the Agile process. In this video, you learned that ITSM, or IT Service Management, is the strategy including processes, technologies, and people that organizations need to deliver IT services to their clients. To implement best practices and standards of ITSM, organizations often use predefined frameworks. And the benefits of ITSM include assurance of consistency, lower operational costs, and greater accountability in IT services. In this video, technical support professionals will discuss emerging trends in technical support. How long have you been working or did you work in technical support? And what has changed since you've started working in technical support? So I've worked um, in tech support, I'd say for about, wow, well, I guess eight years now. Um, I started out working uh, just for like typical subway and I worked from then on. Um, and that's not including any of my like volunteer sort of stuff where that kind of not work sense. But basically from there, I've noticed that technology always changes. So you, there's always something new to learn and progress. With that in mind, one of the big things I've noticed is people have been moving more to, uh, how do I describe it? Uh, when uh, Office 360 based for a majority of stuff. And so like the Exchange server is moving to the cloud, everything in general is moving to the cloud with Office 365 or other products. And so it's more of a, uh, what is it called? A uh, product as a service type thing. And so it's all very heavily online. So it gives you, you can describe, change the products as you want, but it's something new to learn. And it's very similar, but still different. I worked in technical uh, support role for a little over two and a half years. And this was almost uh, 20 years ago. Um, I think technol technical support has evolved significantly in the last uh, couple of decades. Some of the things have remained the same in that there are ticketing systems and that there are agents. Uh, what primarily used to be uh, phone-based based support or um, ticket-based support, there are a lot more channels now. It's becoming a more omni-channel um, support, you know, using uh, email, using social media, using um, uh, chatbots and other automated uh, support mechanisms. I think, in a way, technical support has become harder because um, the customer who you're talking to, they can Google an answer probably quicker than you can. So um, you need to be on top of your game. You need to have the right skills. I've been involved in technical support in one way or another since 1981, believe it or not. Uh, by far the greatest improvement is the ability to either screen share or remote into a client's workstation. Uh, today, with more focus on security, it's sometimes difficult or even not allowed to do that. Welcome to Effective Documentation and Communication. After watching this video, you will be able to define effective documentation and communication for technical support, identify documentation and communication best practices, and discuss the benefits of effective documentation and communication. Many IT professionals agree that in order to succeed in technical support, you need to have an interest in technology. If you have a curious mind and are willing to seek solutions to technical problems, you'll do well in IT. 
However, your success also depends on your ability to write clearly and effectively. You must be able to communicate technical information clearly with clients and with your team. Effective communication in technical support is informative communication. In your IT role, you will expect clear information from customers and clients about what the problem or issue is. More detailed and relevant explanations will enable you to resolve problems more quickly. Imagine this scenario. You've just received a support ticket from a client through email. The subject line says, Printer Issue Help. You open the ticket to see that the client has not provided any further details. They only tell you that the printer isn't working. Where do you start with a ticket like this? You can start by asking the client questions. This will involve several emails and going back and forth between you and the client until you finally obtain the information you need to work on the issue. If the client doesn't communicate enough information from the start, you will take longer to resolve issues. Now imagine this scenario. You've received an email from a client with a subject line that says, Printer not connecting to Wi-Fi. You open the email and it provides more details about the printer, what steps the client has taken before contacting you, and other relevant information. Because the client has communicated detailed information to you in one email, you're able to quickly run through the troubleshooting steps to help identify the issue for the client. Email is just one way that you will be communicating with others to resolve issues. Ticketing systems and direct messaging could also be involved. Other communication tools include online collaboration software like Google Docs and Sheets, Slack, and Microsoft 365 and Teams. These online collaboration tools allow you to create, use, and update documents with your teams and clients. But be aware that the tools only enable communication they don't write for you. You must be able to explain in writing your technical knowledge. Even technical support roles that require you to talk over the phone or in voice chat will also require you to document your conversation. Another part of technical support is keeping notes and documentation for yourself, which means you might encounter an issue with a client that you've resolved before, and you can return to your notes and repeat the process that worked to resolve the issue quickly. You could use Notepad or other notes apps, word processing apps like Google Docs, and spreadsheets like Microsoft Excel. Remember that you'll always need to keep your audience in mind. Are you writing for yourself or are you writing for your supervisor? Are you communicating with a client or are you escalating an issue to someone with less technical knowledge than you? Decide what and how much information is essential to share so your audience may better understand your findings. But what if you aren't able to resolve an issue for the client? You would need to escalate the issue. Now it's your turn to communicate clearly with your team about the issue. Documenting what the problem is and what steps you have taken is crucial for the next level of support. One way to document your steps for the next level of support is to list the order of what you have tried. You can state it chronologically. For example, saying, first we tried reinstalling the printer, and then we tried updating the driver. Another option is to list steps in order of most important to least important. It doesn't matter as long as you have a clear, consistent order. Another method of documentation includes an analysis of the problem, which includes the following. State your understanding of the problem and why it's happening. If you don't know, you can state what you know the problem is not. By thinking through the problem and working towards a solution, you are making progress with the issue even if you're not solving the problem. You should also include what actions led to the issue. And you can include what might have worked for clients in the past, but didn't work for this client. Another way to document is by listing the essential details. For the other two methods, you included details, but these details might be more technical. You might not have a set order or an analysis of the issue. The details might be simple, and you could use a list. Also, remember that your notes might include all of these methods, and maybe some other ones too. The good news is that you don't have to be the best writer to succeed in technical support. 
Remember to keep it simple, ask clear questions, and model your writing from others who have proven to be successful communicators. In this video, you learned that you should use simple, clear, and proven methods of communication and documentation in technical support. Effective communication is informative communication, and it allows you to understand issues and resolve them more quickly. Clearly explaining problems and documenting issues enables faster resolution for you and clients. And finally, documentation can include ordered steps to resolution, an analysis of the problem, detailed lists of issues, or other various methods. Welcome to a day in the life of an IT support technician. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe the daily tasks an IT support technician may perform. Describe how an IT support technician may receive requests. And identify the use of ticketing systems by IT professionals. This is Leticia, a Level 2 IT support technician working for Glone Star IT Services. She works to support internal customers with their day-to-day -day problems. Let's see what Leticia does during a typical day. Leticia starts each morning with a cup of tea and reviews the condition of all equipment and hardware. This includes making sure all managed client networks and servers are running smoothly and that all overnight backups have successfully run. Earlier this morning, a gateway server went down. Leticia needs to address this immediately so she corrects the problem and runs a backup. Now Leticia's day really starts. She checks new tickets and reviews any leftover from yesterday looking for red tickets, those of the highest priority. Today, there are none of those, but it's still early in the day. Leticia looks at the remaining open tickets and prioritizes them. There are low, medium, and high priority tickets. One high priority ticket was sent over Instant Messenger. It seems a router in another building has stopped working. Leticia calls Samuel, who sent the ticket, and gets more information, then logs into the managed router, a quick reboot, and all is well. Leticia reviews the remaining tickets and looks for the ones that can be handled quickly, like adding server access for one user and another unable to access a network printer. Server access is easy. Leticia logs onto the server and sets the appropriate permissions. When she closes the ticket, the ticketing system automatically sends an email to the requester indicating access is now available. She then text chats with John, who is having the printer problem, and leads him through the process of removing, then reinstalling the printer through Windows. Now John has access to the printer, and Leticia closes the ticket. She completes a few more easily addressable tickets. It's good to finish a few jobs in the morning. Later, Leticia is working a request for Janice, who is having a printer problem with Slack. Janice sends Leticia a screenshot of the error message. Leticia hasn't seen this before. She does some research and finds a couple of older tickets with details of the same issue. Leticia calls Janice and connects to her computer remotely. She checks some settings and restarts Slack. It is now working correctly and the ticket is closed. Today, Leticia is assigned setting up a new laptop for an external client. She will install Windows and configure it to connect to the client's network. She also installs and configures software as requested. Meanwhile, another ticket comes in about the network router she reset earlier. Samuel reports that it is down again and seems to be running hot. Okay, time to replace the router. Leticia provisions a new router and configures it. She then walks to the other building to replace the one that is broken. She picks up more tea on the way back. Once the afternoon starts, there's often an increase in requests. The phones don't stop ringing, the email inbox starts filling up, and the IM keeps chirping. Leticia receives an email and helps a client install software. The ticket is closed. Next, there's a problem with one exchange server unable to connect to another. She looks at the settings and does some research. It's still not working. Hmm. Leticia troubleshoots by changing and testing some settings. She finds the problem, and now they connect. 
a ticket is assigned to Letitia to create a new user, which she does. Letitia answers a phone call for a user that cannot log in, so she resets the account. And so it goes. At the end of the day, Letitia checks all her assigned tickets, making sure that each has been closed or the status updated. Some need more information from a client, and some will be scheduled for tomorrow. What Letitia does each day requires curiosity and problem solving. And that's okay. She likes to fix things. Now it's time to go home. In this video, you learned that an IT support technician may perform daily tasks including hardware support, software support, and computer maintenance. An IT support technician may receive requests by phone, email, and text. And IT support technicians use ticketing systems to document, research, and solve end-user problems. In this video, technical support professionals will discuss what makes technical support a great career choice. Why was starting your career in technical support the right choice for you? And why might this be the right time for others to start down this path? Technical support turned out to be a great uh, stepping stone for me into uh, helping me evolve and grow my career to what I am today. You know, it gave me the confidence and uh, skills to deal with people, to work with people, to understand their issues, to communicate better with them. And that helped me a lot in my next job, which was a product management role, and then subsequently a technical evangelism role, and currently in a um, role around content uh, strategy and growth, um, where I am a program director for IBM. Starting my career in technical support was a great idea for me um, just because, you know, my curiosity, you know, about how things work and I'm kind of a little bit geeky and nerdy and I like gadgetry and things like that. But it afforded me um, a better quality of life. You know, I made a lot more money and it opened a lot of doors for me um, and helped me better support my family. So for me, I really love technology. I'm very much the early adopter. If something comes out, even if it's in the beta phase, if it looks interesting and exciting, I'm one of the first people to like try it out. I want to get hands-on with new stuff. I like to learn about it all. It's great. On the same regards, I love fixing stuff and helping people. So it's been very natural for me to just get into it. I'm very good at what I do, and so it makes me proud. If you really enjoy technology and troubleshooting stuff, it's a great career. Um, it can be uh, hard at times, but it can also be very fun at times. You'll get really great people that are very sincere when you get to help them, and it's something that always really brightens my day when I do that. I think that any time is a good time to start a career in, in uh, technical support, even at the entry level, because over time it's going to expose you to so many other paths that you can take in the IT industry. And it's kind of cool. It's like a try before you buy. I mean, you see what your other colleagues are doing in IT. They may not necessarily be tech support engineers, but you can see what a DBA does, a DB admin, database admin, or you know what a system administrator does. You know, whether it's, you know, the field that you're in or, you know, whether it's medicine or healthcare, or biotech, everybody needs good technical support engineers. I mean, there are never enough. And you come up with one or two or three possible solutions and you solve that problem for that customer. You know, maybe they've been grinding on that problem for a week or two weeks or a few days and, you know, you help them resolve it and now you're happy and you're happy and they can move on to the next thing. There's a really deep satisfaction that a lot of us in this field really get from that job and, you know, from those results. And that's what keeps us working as technical support engineers. With um, uh, technical support, you're able to develop the skills to ease into a kind of a tech technology role that you're interested in. And, and I think it's also really, um, there's so many opportunities out there in technical support that um, the possibilities are endless. So I think it's a great time to be in technical support, regardless of your background, regardless of whether you have a degree or not. And I wish you uh, good luck in your endeavors.
Welcome to Introduction to Hardware and Operating Systems. According to Statista.com research, global IT spending on PCs, tablets, mobile phones, printers, data center systems, enterprise software, and communication systems is expected to total about 4.45 trillion US dollars in 2022. Who will install, configure, manage, and program these IT assets? The most recent US Bureau of Labor Statistics report indicates about 667,600 annual job postings and projected job growth of 13% through 2029. At the time of this course publication, the median U.S. IT salary was $112,161, more than double the U.S. median salary of $41,950 for all jobs. An IT role is right for you if you like change and enjoy ongoing learning. Computing technology is always evolving, and there's always new technology or a new feature to learn. If you're balancing work-life commitments, many companies offer on-site work, remote work, hybrid work environments, and flexible shifts. Employers need coverage 24 hours a day and 7 days a week. IT careers offer multiple paths for career growth, and if you enjoy making a positive difference for others, an IT role can be rewarding. When you complete this course, you'll be able to describe and apply operating system fundamentals and identify, classify, and describe computing devices and peripherals, interfaces and connectors, and internal computer components. Then gain job-ready skills and certification-ready insights when you learn about recommended workstation evaluation, setup, and troubleshooting processes and practices. This course is the first in a series of IBM courses intended to help you develop IT fundamental skills and knowledge. In addition to gaining valuable skills in introduction to hardware and operating systems, this course, along with other IBM IT courses, can also aid in your preparation for the CompTIA IT Fundamentals Certification Exam. Especially for beginners, Guided instructional videos walk you through key concepts with essential need-to-know facts. Interactive activities reinforce what you've learned in videos. Forums provide connections where you can introduce yourself to others, provide feedback, and get support. Practice assessments help you gauge your knowledge, and graded assessments prove what you've learned, leading to a shareable badge and certificate that you can show prospective employers. We're here to support your success and we're excited that you're here. Let's get started. Welcome to Introduction to Computing Fundamentals. After watching this video, you will be able to define what a computer is, classify computers based on their size and their uses, List the four functions of computing and the parts of a computer associated with those functions. And describe the benefits of computing. A computer is a device or system that includes hardware, operating system software, application software, and peripheral devices. Hardware is the platform that processes data based on the provided instructions and stores data. Software includes the operating system software that enables and configures hardware capabilities and the application software that enables the computer to perform tasks. Peripheral devices, such as keyboards and monitors, enable user input and output. And finally, computers need users who provide instructions. A fast way to classify computers is by their size and speed. Supercomputers are the fastest computers and are used for the most complex mathematical and analytical computations. Mainframe computers function at the speed of business and are used to perform transactions and more. Next in size and speed are mini computers, which enable more than one person to access the same data. Finally, the smallest computers are microcomputers. This category includes personal computers, laptops, smartphones, and other single user devices. Another way to classify computers is by use. General purpose computers perform functions such as creating documents, saving files, web conferencing, working online, financial analysis, data analytics, coding, and other multifunction capabilities. Even smartphones can be considered general-purpose computers. 
Special purpose computers, which perform defined limited use functions, include IoT devices, such as sensors that report water quality, lights that activate during occupancy, sensors that report building occupancy, and IoT devices that monitor manufacturing processes. Other types of computers include Wi Fi enabled appliances, weather stations, alarm systems, and both wired and wireless gaming consoles. Computers perform many tasks but we can simplify and categorize those tasks into four easy-to-remember functions. Input, processing, output, and storage. Let's learn more. Input is the function or action of getting data into the computer. Input happens when you type or tap on a keyboard, use a touchscreen, or speak a voice-to-text command. Clicking the Send button for an email is also input. Input is also the information and instructions a programmer provides to perform calculations using a set of programs. Next, processing happens when the computer receives the input and then converts the data into a format or action that a user can recognize and use. Examples include downloading an app, document, or photo, and moving data from one drive to another. Processing also occurs when the computer performs programming instructions, such as data calculations, or even instructions to fly a rocket to the stratosphere and back. Technically, processing happens when raw data changes into usable formats, such as email, documents, and photos. Processors, also called central processing units, or CPUs, are located inside computers on a system board, also called a motherboard. These boards and their processors are usually located centrally within the devices. Next, the computer delivers the processed results to the default or configured output devices, including monitors, speakers, and printers. Output, meaning what you see, hear, or understand, is what makes the data apparent and valuable. At the same time or just after the processing function completes, and while output is happening, computers can use the storage function. Storage is the saving of data to disk space on your computer, an external hard drive, or on network or cloud storage for an indefinite or undefined time unless you explicitly specify a data expiration date or delete the data. Storage saves data for reuse. Server, desktop, and laptop computer storage is usually located inside of the case and to the side of the case. Storage is often welded onto the system board for phones, IoT, and gaming devices. So, what are the advantages of using computers? Manual entry errors are eliminated by using capabilities such as copy and paste and data duplication to reuse data or content. Communication is sped up by using network, wireless, cellular, and other communication technologies. Exponential and complex computations, such as those used for medical research, civil engineering, and space exploration are enabled by processors, memory, and programming languages. Computers enable the saving of documents and data to disk storage, eliminating the extra storage space needed for stacks of paper. Businesses thrive on digital data storage, and whether it's medical images, car claims, research records, or family photos, saving digital images provides durable and long-lasting access to that information. Finally, editing capabilities eliminate the time-consuming drudgery of having to erase and rewrite work manually. In this video, you learned that, based on size and speed, Supercomputers are the fastest, followed by mainframes, then mini computers, and finally microcomputers, which include PCs, laptops, smartphones, and others. Computers can perform general functions or specific functions. The four functions of computing are input, processing, output, and storage. And the benefits of computing include reducing the number of tasks humans need to do, enhanced data storage, the ability to perform complex mathematical tasks, and faster communications. Welcome to Common Computing Devices and their platforms. After watching this video, you will be able to Categorize common computing devices and describe their main features and benefits. 
and identify frequently used operating platforms associated with these devices. Common computing devices include stationary computing devices, mobile computing devices, and Internet of Things or IoT devices. Stationary devices, which include workstations, servers, and tabletop gaming consoles, remain on a desk or rack or other fixed location. These devices consist of a box that includes processors, memory, and input and output connections that connect to networks, keyboards, monitors, mice, printers, speakers, microphones, webcams, and other devices. In some instances, you can update the device's memory, storage, or video cards. Let's explore workstations. Workstations, used both at the office and at home, are what most people think of when they think about a desktop computer. Also categorized with personal computers, these devices are typically in a box that contains a system board with a processor, memory, storage, and slots for add-on cards for additional functions. Their motherboards have ports that support monitors, keyboards, mice, microphones, printers, speakers, and other devices, as well as onboard cards for wireless connectivity. Many newer devices enable memory, storage, and graphic card upgrades. These devices use Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, and Linux operating systems. Next, servers are generally installed as standalone units or in stacked racks on networks enabling shared access to media, such as movies, videos, and sound clips and web pages for websites. Servers also manage print requests, enable shared data and document access, store email, and more. On the network, multiple servers can contain the same data, so that if one server fails, users can keep working using the same data from other servers. The ability for work to continue if a shared computing resource is malfunctioning is known as fault tolerance. Server hardware offers robust capabilities that often support multiple processors, memory, graphic cards, storage, and port connections within the same box. Servers use network operating systems geared towards optimizing data distribution. Popular operating system software vendors include Microsoft Windows Server, Linux, Unix, Mac OS X, and FreeBSD. Desktop gaming consoles are also known as tabletop gaming consoles. Gaming console system boards contain processors, memory, graphics processors, storage, input ports, output ports, and a memory controller that exists separately between the other function blocks and the system memory. In times past, many of these functions existed separately as multiple chips on the motherboard, but today these functions exist in a single functional block. Gaming consoles, such as those made by Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo, are similar to desktop computers but use upgraded memory caching and graphics processing to enable smoother game playing experiences. Gaming consoles used to require cable connections to monitors and gaming controllers. Today's gaming consoles provide wireless connectivity. Gaming consoles are not usually upgradable. Mobile devices, including laptops, tablets, mobile phones, and portable gaming systems, have transformed how we live, work, and play. Let's first check out laptops. Many laptop computers run versions of Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, and Linux operating systems, while others use Google Chrome's lightweight operating system. Laptop system boards include processors, memory, video cards, ports for connecting to other devices, and Wi-Fi capability. Many laptop manufacturers allow upgrades to storage and memory. Tablet devices are usually less powerful than laptops, but that is beginning to change. Tablets built in very tight cases include most laptop components, but don't include a keyboard. Tablets generally use operating systems such as Microsoft Windows, iOS, and Chrome. The system board includes the device's processor, memory, a video card, sound card, a limited number of ports, a Wi-Fi card, and limited hard drive storage. Tablets are usually not upgradable. Mobile phones include onboard components with specialized processors, memory, sound, and video capabilities. Phones can include a slot for a SIM card that links the phone to a cell phone access provider and a slotted port for additional storage. All phones include one multifunctional port primarily used to recharge the phone's battery. 
Mobile phone operating systems built for speed are specifically designed to support multiple communication spectrum capabilities, including the designated cell phone frequencies, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, near-field communications, and other connectivity options. Android and iOS operating systems dominate the market, but with practically all components welded onto the board, you can only upgrade the software, not the hardware. Portable gaming devices use specialized processors, storage, and memory, and include battery and multi-use ports for power, Wi-Fi, and other connectivity options. These devices use operating systems specially configured for mobile use, and many of those operating systems are Linux-derived. Gaming software is usually on-board or downloadable, and the hardware is generally not upgradable. Internet of Things, known as IoT devices, describes physical objects that have sensors, processing ability, software, and other technologies that enable these devices to exchange data with other devices and systems over the Internet or other communications networks. IoT devices communicate via Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC, Zigbee, and other protocols. They can receive software updates, but generally, the hardware within a limited space is soldered to the board and is not upgradable. Let's learn more. Widely available consumer IoT devices include smart speakers, TVs, wearable devices such as fitness trackers, and appliances such as automatic floor vacuums, stoves, and others. Light bulbs, toys, thermostats, and medical devices are also part of today's IoT world. Enterprise IoT devices enable organizations to offer consumers more targeted features and manage costs. For example, utilities install smart meters to help both residential and commercial customers manage their energy usage. Occupancy sensors and IoT-enabled security systems help businesses prevent losses and enhance worker and customer safety. Similarly, industrial IoT devices help organizations monitor the weather, operate robots, assess water and air quality, and more. In this video, you learned that common computing devices currently fit into three categories, stationary devices, mobile devices, and IoT devices. Desktop computers, mobile computers, and IoT devices feature a processor and input and output ports or capabilities. Desktop machines usually offer the most upgrade capabilities, while IoT devices are generally not upgradable. And desktop operating systems include Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, Linux, or Unix, while Google Android, Google Chrome, and Apple's iOS operating systems dominate the mobile operating system market. Welcome to Understanding How Computers Talk. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe three widely used notational systems Convert numbers between notational systems Identify common data types And identify the two most widely used character types. In computers, a notational system, also called a numeral system, is a system of symbols that represent numbers. The three most widely used notational systems are decimal, binary, and hexadecimal. Decimal notation is base 10, as in numbers 1 through 9, then 10, 20, 30, and so on. Decimal notation uses a decimal mark, usually a period, which identifies the numbers to the right of the period as a fractional amount. Decimals with negative values display a minus symbol immediately left of the number. Binary notation is the base system for computer speak and programming in bits, but more commonly referenced in bytes. Binary uses only two numbers, 0 and 1, and combinations of those two numbers. Binary notation represents 0 as an off state and the number 1 as an on state. A single digit is known as a bit and is the smallest piece of computing information computers process. The next size of computing information is a byte. Eight adjacent bits, or digits, create a byte. To convert decimal numbers to binary numbers, divide your starting number and each subsequent quotient by two until the quotient equals zero. For example, start at the top of the column with the decimal 25. 
divide 25 by 2 and note the remainder. Now, divide the quotient 12 by 2 and note the remainder again. Repeat these steps until you get 0 as the quotient. For your final step, write the remainders so that the last remainder, 4, 1 divided by 2, is written first, followed by the other remainders, reading from bottom to top. So, the binary equivalent of 25 is 11001. Here's how to change a number from binary to decimal using the doubling method. Let's start with the binary number 010010. Start with the leftmost digit, which is 0. Since you are starting from the leftmost digit and there is no previous digit to the leftmost digit, we consider the double of the previous digit as 0. Double the previous number and add the result to the current digit. Continue the same process for the next digit, which is 1. Now double the previous digit and add the number to the current digit. In this example, you get 0 times 2 plus 1, which is 1. Repeat the process for each number moving to the right one digit at a time. The result of converting the binary number 010010 to a decimal using the doubling method is 18. Next, the hexadecimal notation system, often shortened 2 hex, is made up of 16 symbols using the numbers 0 through 9 and the letters A through F to represent decimal numbers 10 through 15. Hex offers compact notation for large numbers. Hex is used for MAC addresses, which identify where the device resides on the network, similar to your home address, color values, IP addresses, which are website addresses, and memory addresses, which identify where data exists within the computer's storage. The first column displays decimal numbers from 0 to 10. The second column displays the decimal numbers hex equivalent. The third column displays the decimal and the hex numbers binary equivalent. In this example, reading left to right, you can see that the decimal 10 is equal to A in hex and 1010 in binary. Many websites offer conversion tables where you can quickly convert numbers to their decimal, hex, and binary equivalents. To convert a hex number such as 123A into binary, follow these steps. First, note the hex number and represent each hex digit by its binary equivalent number. Next, add insignificant zeros to the left if the binary number has less than four digits. For example, write the decimal 10 as 0010. Then string each of the converted binary numbers together working from left to right. This process is called concatenation. Your fourth and final step is to discard any leading zeros at the left of the concatenated binary number. For this example, let's use the hex number 123A. Use the table to convert each hex digit in 123A to binary, adding zeros to the left of the number if necessary to make the number a four-digit number. Then string all four groups of four-digit numbers together. On the leftmost binary number, discard any leading zeros. So 0001 becomes 1. Your result is 1001000011010. The binary equivalent of the hex number 123A. Computers follow sets of instructions to perform tasks such as calculations, word processing, and web browsing using the following data types to process and present that information. Characters represent single letters. Strings show combinations of characters. Integers display whole numbers such as the number 8. Floats represent decimals and fractions and Boolean values provide yes or no and true or false statements. ASCII, first published in 1963, is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange format that translates computer language into understandable text. To save on transmission costs, ASCII was originally a 7-byte system, representing 128 binary characters. The system expanded to 8 bytes, providing another 256 characters. The displayed chart shows binary, ASCII, and hex equivalent numbers. You'll find similar charts online. Unicode includes ASCII characters, characters from languages worldwide, as well as emojis.
More than 95% of the world's web pages use Unicode 8 bit encoding, commonly called UTF 8. Programming languages tend to use Unicode 16 bit, referred to as UTF 16, and a few programming languages use Unicode 32 bit encoding. Unicode provides a unique hexadecimal value for each character, called code points. The default encoding format is usually shown as U plus HHHH, where the HHHH is the character's hexadecimal value. You'll find numerous conversion services online. In this video, you learned that bits and bytes are the base language of computer communications, and 8 bits equals 1 byte. MAC addresses, colors, IP addresses, and memory addresses use hexadecimal notation. Programs can read ASCII character text, strings, integers, floats, and Boolean data. And Unicode text, namely UTF-8, is used to display character sets on web pages. Welcome to an introduction to operating systems. After watching this video, you will be able to describe what an operating system is and describe the functions operating systems manage, classify types of operating systems, describe operating system generations, and describe the history of Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and Chrome OS operating systems. Operating systems provide standardized backbone code for managing input, output, processing, and storage. These efforts help keep data error-free and mitigate data loss. Operating systems can have more than one environment. The first environment, the Command Line Interface, or CLI, is an environment where the user can type commands. The second environment is known as a Graphical User Interface, or a Graphic Shell. These environments provide menus, links, buttons, and fields that help users manage the operating system. History groups operating systems into four generations. The first generation was from 1945 to 1955. The second generation happened from 1955 to 1965. The third generation lasted 15 years from 1965 to 1980. And 1980 ushered in the fourth and current generation. During the first generation of modern computing from 1945 to 1955, operating systems that worked for multiple computers did not yet exist. Each computer's parameters were uniquely created for every job or task using machine language. However, some of the code developed during this era became the basis for future operating systems. During the second generation of operating systems, mainframe computers became available for commercial and scientific use. Tape drives, a relatively new invention, provided input and output storage. In 1956, General Motors Research produced the first single-stream batch operating system, notably for its IBM 704 computing system. Subsequently, IBM became the first company to create operating systems to accompany computers. Embedded operating systems developed in the early 1960s and still in use focus on a single task, providing split-second response times, also known as low latency. In case of a system error, these operating systems can restart where the task needs to resume. Real-time operating systems are a type of embedded operating system. Airplanes, air traffic control systems, and space exploration were among the first to use real-time operating systems. As time passed, satellite systems, robotics, and even our cars implemented real-time operating systems. Then, during the third generation of operating system development, additional companies began creating batch file operating systems specifically for their large computing needs. This generation of operating systems saw the development of network operating systems that provided scalable, fast, accurate, and secure network traffic and communications, and enabled each workstation within the network to operate independently. In 1969, the Unix operating system offered a new innovation, an operating system that was installable on multiple computer systems and featured processor time-sharing. Processor time-sharing enabled multiple users with different programs to interact nearly simultaneously with a central computer, such as a mainframe. 
the fourth and current generation of operating systems brought computing into a new age with multitasking operating systems, including Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and Chrome OS operating systems that enable computers to perform multiple complex tasks simultaneously. Mobile operating systems, including Android, Windows, iOS, and Chrome OS, which is also considered a mobile operating system, fit the definition of multitasking operating systems. Let's learn more about some of these operating systems. In 1991, Linus Torvalds created a small open-source operating system for a PC, releasing version 1.0 of Linux in 1994. In 1996, the version 2.0 release, with support for Network-Based Symmetric Multiprocessing, or SMP, provided a serious technical benefit for commercial and scientific data processing, evolving Linux into a powerful network and server operating system. Throughout the next 10 years, Linux gained market acceptance and its distributions continued to mature. In 2013, Google's Linux-based mobile operating system, Android, took 75% of the market share. When evaluating the value of Linux, consider that in 2018, IBM acquired Red Hat for $34 billion U.S. dollars. The operating systems PC-DOS and MS-DOS once existed, with MS-DOS launching in 1981. In 1985, Windows offered the consumer market a graphical user interface version of the Windows operating system, written in variations of C language. In 1995, the debut of Windows 95 catapulted Microsoft's dominance in the consumer operating system software market, with Microsoft holding about 70% of the consumer desktop operating system market share in 2021. Microsoft also offers network, server management, mobile, and phone operating systems. Apple, with its OS X and Mac OS based on Unix, began its foray into the operating system market in 1999 with PowerPC-based Macs. In 2006, Apple began selling Macs using Intel Core processors. In 2020, Apple began the Apple Silicon chip transition using self-designed, 64-bit, ARM-based Apple M1 processors on new Mac computers. Apple also offers the iOS operating system for its tablet and smartphone devices. In 2011, Google debuted Chrome OS built atop Linux. Chrome OS offers a lightweight operating system for mobile devices, including laptops. Laptops and tablets running Chrome OS require less local storage and cost less, making them ideal for students, and this operating system is currently used by about 10% of the laptop market. In this video, you learned that operating systems provide standardized code that eliminates the need to manually recreate all the possible code necessary for input, processing, output, and storage for every computer action. In 1956, GM Research created the first operating system that is also credited as being the first single-stream batch operating system. Linux evolved into a powerful operating system for networks and servers. With the creation of Windows 95, Microsoft began its domination of the consumer operating system market. And Chrome OS, built on top of Linux, is a lightweight, primarily browser-based operating system. Welcome to Getting Started with Microsoft Windows 10. After watching this video, you will be able to identify four Windows login methods, describe how to use the Windows desktop, explain how to find the Settings app, explain how to resize Windows and switch programs, and identify Windows keyboard shortcut commands. Microsoft Windows 10 provides four easy methods to log into a machine. You can log in using a PIN, a password, by drawing over a photo that you previously set up, or by scanning the fingerprint that you previously paired with the computer. Next, let's check out parts of the Windows desktop. Click the Windows icon to view the Start menu and Productivity pane. 
On the left side of the Start menu, you can see which user is logged on and shortcuts to documents, pictures, settings, and power management options. Available programs are organized alphabetically. If you right-click a program's icon, you can see menu options to uninstall the program, pin the program to your taskbar, run the program with administrator rights, and open its file location. To the right of the Start menu is the Productivity pane, which consists of a mixture of live and static tiles. Static tiles are shortcuts to favorite and frequently used programs, and live tiles provide a quick view of information such as news, weather, and sports. Right-click any tile to remove the tile, uninstall the program, or perform other tasks. At the bottom of the screen, the Windows taskbar provides access to the Windows Start button where you can open the Start menu. Next is the Taskbar search box where you can search for files, settings, and programs on the computer or perform a quick web search. The circle icon provides a shortcut to talk to Cortana and the film strip icon provides access to Windows Task View. Next, access File Explorer. Settings lets you access an app that customizes the toolbar. On the right side of the taskbar, you can see the current weather, an upward carrot that you can click to display the news, the Windows Meet Now icon that opens a video conferencing program, access to OneDrive, shortcuts to Wi-Fi and wired network access, speaker volume settings, time and date settings, and notifications. When you have time, explore taskbar customizations by using the Settings app, selecting Personalization, and selecting Taskbar. Notifications are a convenient way to view the news you want to see, receive app notifications, and more. On the Taskbar, click the Notifications icon to display your notifications. Click Manage Notifications to customize the notifications you see. Clicking Manage Notifications opens Notifications and Actions, which is located within the Settings app. Here you can set notification preferences, including getting app and vendor notifications, showing notifications on the lock screen, allowing notifications to play sounds, and other settings. Next, let's learn about the control buttons used to resize, maximize, and minimize windows on the desktop. To resize a window, hover over the edge of the window to display the double-headed arrow. Then drag the double-headed arrow to resize the window. You can quickly maximize a window by clicking the rectangle. And if you need to minimize the window, click the underscore button. To close a window, click the X. You'll see the X shaded in red to remind you that you are about to close an active window. Now, you can quickly locate and switch windows by pressing the Alt and Tab keys. Your screen will display windows using a carousel format. Keep the Alt key pressed and repeatedly press the Tab key each time you want to switch to the next window. Then click and hold to display the selected window. Let's check out more keyboard shortcuts. Keyboard shortcuts save valuable time and reduce errors, resulting in productivity gains to benefit the business. Windows provides numerous keyboard shortcuts, many more than are listed here. Often, new users become confused when they see the first key and the second key with a plus sign in between, so we've shown them here as the first key, the second key, and, if needed, the third key. To copy your file or content, press Ctrl-C. To paste or insert a file or content, press Ctrl-V. To delete a file or delete content, press Ctrl-D. To repeat an action, such as inserting rows or columns, or a series of words, press Ctrl-Y. To undo the previous action, press Ctrl-Z. To edit the file name, press Ctrl-O. To restart the computer, press Ctrl, Alt, and Delete. And to capture a screen image, you can use the print screen button displayed as PRTSCR or the Windows Start key and the print screen button. In this video, you learned that you can log in to Windows using a PIN or a password by drawing over a photo that you previously set up, or by scanning your fingerprint. The Start menu provides shortcuts to documents, pictures, settings, and power management options. If notifications are interrupting your workflow, open the Notifications panel, click Manage Notifications, and then turn off notifications. To resize a window, 
hover over the edge of the window to display the double-headed arrow, then drag the double-headed arrow to resize the window. Using the Alt and Tab keys is a fast way to locate an open window that you're not currently viewing. And finally, Windows keyboard shortcuts save you valuable time performing frequent tasks. Hello and welcome to using your Windows Lab workspace. We're excited for you to take these next steps in your skills journey. The labs in this course and other courses provide you with a virtual, hands-on lab environment where you can boost your skills by practicing what you've learned in your course videos and readings. Your lab space, also known as a guided project or the MyCloud workspace window, contains all the software you need to successfully complete your lab tasks. You'll also open a lab instructions file. For your best experience, we recommend displaying your lab space and instructions side by side. To access your hands-on lab, first open the item in the course for the hands-on lab. If the lab instructions display in a new tab, hover over the tab and pull the tab down onto the desktop. You can drag the window edges to resize the window to about one-third of the screen size. You'll return to this window later. Return to the course screen and scroll through the displayed course lab instructions. Select the checkbox to accept the Coursera on our code conditions. Then click the Open Tool button. Next, you'll see the Coursera Guided Project window. This window may take a moment to display. The displayed MyCloud Workspace window is divided into two panes. The left pane is named the Cloud Workspace window and the right pane is named the Instructions window you won't use this instructions window. Now, you can expand the Cloud Workspace pane on your screen's left side using one of two methods. Drag the vertical slider between the Cloud Workspace and the Instructions pane to the far right side of the screen, or click the Expand Cloud Workspace window button displayed on the top right of the left pane. Take a moment to view your lab window. You can click the Lab Window Resolution drop-down arrow to adjust the size of the on-screen icons in the Cloud Workspace. And next, let's adjust your browser windows to see your Cloud Workspace and Lab Instructions side-by-side. Side. On the Cloud Workspace Lab Window, hover over the double box icon located in the top right of the browser window to reduce the size of your window. Move the window to the left side of the screen. Now, drag the window's right edge so that the Cloud Workspace Lab window uses about two-thirds of the available desktop space. Next, select the browser window that displays your lab instructions. Drag the instructions window so that the window is to the right of the Cloud Workspace Lab window. Now, you can perform the lab tasks in the Cloud Workspace window while using the lab instructions. After completing the lab, select Leave Session to close the Cloud Workspace window, then close your lab instructions using the option available for your browser. Also, before you begin, here's some extra information you need to know. Each time you connect to these labs, Coursera creates a fresh new environment. Data or files you saved in a previous session are no longer available. To avoid losing your data, plan to complete your lab tasks in a single session. These labs are time to provide enough time to complete lab tasks, but if you leave the lab session unattended, your lab may time out or end. Now, these setup instructions used a Chrome browser within Microsoft Windows 10. Other browsers and web browsers on Mac or Linux computers may use different navigation. You're now lab ready. Let's get started. Welcome to Identify Hardware Components and Peripherals. After watching this video, you will be able to explain the difference between internal and external components, describe what a peripheral device is and what it does, and apply your learning to contrast, an interface, a port, and a connector. What is a computer component? It's a physical part needed for computer functioning, also called hardware and each component performs a specific task. Components can be internal or external, 
external components connect via ports, which are openings on the sides of a computer. Without a given component, such as a CPU, a computer system cannot function as desired. An internal component is a piece of hardware inside the computer. Examples include random access memory, or RAM, which is the computer's working memory and is temporary, storing items you are working with as long as the power is on. If you are working on a document and the power goes off, the document is lost. The hard drive is permanent storage that you can save a file to. A file stored on the hard drive is permanently stored and will not be lost if the power fails. And the CPU does all the math calculations in a computer. It's often called the brain of the computer. The faster the CPU, the more things the computer can do at a given time. A peripheral is a device which connects to a computer to provide extra functionality. It is used in the transfer of data to or from a computer. Peripherals can be easily connected to and removed from a computer system. Peripherals attach to the computer through a connector, and the type of connector varies with the peripheral. Examples include a mouse, keyboard, and printer. There are three kinds of peripherals. Input devices, which send commands and data to the computer. Output devices, which receive commands from the computer. And storage devices, which are a type of permanent memory for files you want to keep indefinitely. A connector is the unique end of a plug, jack, or the edge of a card that connects to a port. For example, all desktop computer expansion cards have an internal connector that allows them to connect in a slot to the motherboard. A universal serial bus, or USB connector, at the end of a cable is an example of an external connector. A connector plugs into an opening on a computer called a port. A port is the jack or receptacle for a peripheral device to plug into. Ports are standardized for each purpose. Some common ports are universal serial bus or USB ports and high-definition multimedia interface or HDMI ports. The HDMI port pictured here could be used to connect a monitor. In this video, you learned that a component of a computer is a physical part needed for computer functioning. Examples of internal components include memory and a hard drive. Examples of external components include ports and connectors. The end of a plug or cable is called a connector. Connectors fit into one specific type of opening called a port. And a peripheral device can connect externally or internally. Hello and welcome to Input and Pointing Devices. After watching this video, you will be able to compare input devices, identify which devices use a touchpad, and define a pointing device. A pointing device, such as a keyboard, mouse, joystick, touchpad, or trackball, is used to move the cursor on a computer screen. All pointing devices send a command in the form of data to the computer. Keyboards are used primarily to input data. Keyboards typically attach to the computer via a universal serial bus or USB port. Although older machines may use an IBM Personal System 2 PS2 port. To add a new keyboard layout on Windows 10, use these steps. Open Settings, select Time and Language, select Language. Under the Preferred Languages section, select the default language. Select the Options button. Under the Keyboard section, select the Add a Keyboard button, and select the new keyboard layout you want to use. You can repeat these steps to add even more layouts. The most used input device, used primarily to input data and move the cursor, is the mouse. A mouse generally connects to a computer via a USB port, which is a wired connection. You can also connect a mouse via a wireless Bluetooth connection. You can change the mouse settings, such as the size of the cursor in Windows settings. Touchpads are most often used on laptops. Touchpads are built into laptops and don't need to be connected externally. However, you can purchase an external touchpad for a laptop and connect through USB or Wi-Fi. The camera is another input device that produces a digital image on the computer. A camera generally connects to a computer via a USB port, which is a wired connection. 
you can also connect a camera via a wireless Bluetooth connection. Cameras are typically built into laptops and don't need to be connected externally. However, you can purchase an external camera for a laptop and connect through USB or Wi-Fi. A joystick sends commands to the computer. It moves the cursor and is often used to play games. You can connect it to the computer through a USB cable or wireless Bluetooth connection. Trackballs also send commands to the computer, although they have been largely replaced by computer mice. People with mobility issues might find the trackball to be a more comfortable alternative to a mouse. A pointing device is a type of input tool. As such, you can use it to move the cursor and additional commands to the computer. A pointing stick, or stylus, is usually used on tablets. Most styluses work via capacitive technology, which is about heat and pressure. When you push the stylus onto the screen, it senses the heat and pressure and elicits a response. In this video, you learned that Input devices move the cursor and send commands to the computer. Common input devices include the keyboard, mouse, touchpad, joystick, and trackball. A touchpad acts like a mouse. It's usually built in and found on laptops. And a pointing device or stylus is used for navigation and to send commands. Welcome to Hard Drives. After watching this video, you will be able to identify an internal storage device, describe the characteristics of a hard drive, and apply knowledge of hard drive performance to choose the best one. A storage device is hardware that can be used to store digital data in the form of images, video, audio, and text. There are two kinds of internal storage, ROM and RAM. ROM stands for read-only memory. It is non-volatile, which means it can retain data even without power. It is used to start or boot up a computer and for permanent data storage. RAM, or random access memory, is the opposite of ROM. It is volatile or temporary storage. The hard disk drive, or HDD, is one type of internal storage device, but external hard drives exist. Hard drives are available from several vendors in both formats. Hard drive and hard disk drive, or HDD, are used interchangeably. Hard drives work by a drive head reading and writing data to magnetic platters. The 2.5-inch hard disk drive is used in notebook computers and mobile devices. They trail the 3.5-inch desktop drives in capacity. Standard hard drives for desktops run from 500 gigabytes or smaller to as large as several terabytes or TB or larger. But given the accessibility of cloud storage, the everyday user doesn't usually need a large capacity hard drive. Serial Advanced Technology Attachment, or SATA, is the most common hard drive type for modern computers, though many motherboards support Parallel Advanced Technology Attachment, or PETA drives, which are slower than SATA drives. To evaluate disk storage capacity and availability in Windows 10, on the taskbar, type This PC and press Enter. Select Open. The window for This PC displays. Then, within Devices and Drives, view the available disk space. Hard drive performance is measured by spin speed, access time, and transfer rate. Spin speed, or RPM, is how quickly the magnetic platters rotate. The platters need to spin faster to increase performance in a hard drive. So, the faster the platters spin, the better the performance of the hard drive. The two most prevalent speeds in hard disk drives, or HDDs, are 5400 rotations per minute, or RPM, and 7200 RPM. Access time refers to how quickly the hard drive can find stored data on one of the magnetic platters. Access times of fast hard disks are typically from 5 to 10 milliseconds. And the transfer rate, sometimes called media rate, is the speed at which data is transferred to and from the disk media, or actual disk platter. It is described in megabytes per second, or MBPS. Follow these steps to install an internal hard drive. First, be sure to back up your data before connecting an internal hard drive. 
Transfer the hard drive enclosure to the new hard drive if present. Some computers use a special enclosure to secure the hard drive. If your hard drive has an enclosure for the hard drive, remove all the screws and pull the old hard drive out. Place the new hard drive in the same enclosure and secure it. Insert your new hard drive in the hard drive slot. Then secure the hard drive using the screws that came with it. Ideally, you should use two screws on each side of the hard drive. If the hard drive is loose, it can rattle and lead to physical damage. Now, attach the drive to the motherboard using the SATA or PETA cables. SATA cables can be connected in either direction. And finally, connect the power supply to the hard drive. To configure a hard drive in Windows, you must log on as an administrator or as a member of the administrator's group. Right-click on My Computer, then select Manage, and in the console tree, select Disk Management. To customize how you view your disks and volumes in the upper and lower panes of the window, point to top or bottom on the View menu, select the view that you want to use, and make your choice of appearances. In this video, you learned that hard drives are a repository for images, video, audio, and text. Hard drives are read-only memory, or ROM, which is permanent storage. Hard drives have distinct characteristics and performance measurements, such as spin rate, transfer speed, and data capacity. You should evaluate how much storage space you need before installing a new hard drive. And you should follow the correct procedure when installing a hard drive. Data should be backed up before connecting a new hard drive, and finally, hard drives can be configured in the device management window. Welcome to Optical Drives and External Storage. After watching this video, you will be able to identify how an optical drive records data, describe an external storage device, and apply knowledge of expansion devices to choose the best one for your needs. Data is written to optical devices through a laser pressing, or burning the disk. This creates recessed areas, known as pits, and raised areas, known as lands. The laser reads and writes data on the reflective surface of the disk. Single-sided disks have one recordable layer to write data to. Storage capacity is usually 4.7 GB for a DVD-ROM and 700 MB for a CD. Double-sided disks have two layers on which to record data. They hold twice as much data as a single-layer disk. There are many types of optical drives. These include CD-ROM, CD-RW, DVD-ROM, DVD-RW, and Blu-ray, which has a data capacity of 50 GB, or 50 GB. CD and DVD writers, such as CD-R and DVD-R drives, use a laser to read and write data on the disks. A solid-state drive, or SSD, uses integrated circuit assemblies to store data, typically using flash memory and functioning as permanent secondary storage. It is also sometimes called a solid-state device, or a solid-state disk even though SSDs lack the physical spinning disks and movable read-write heads used in hard disk drives, or HDDs, and floppy disks. An external hard drive is an excellent medium to back up and transfer files. They can store large amounts of data, including documents, spreadsheets, presentations, music, and videos. Most external hard drives connect to a computer through a USB or eSATA connection. Many draw power from the computer's USB port. External SATA, or eSATA, is a SATA connector accessible from the outside of the computer to provide a signal but not power. If the external hard drive requires a power cord, connect it to the back of the hard drive. The end of the power cord that connects to the hard drive is usually a small round connector. Connect the other end of the power cord to a power outlet, if no power cord is required, skip to the next step. Connect the USB cable to the external hard drive and plug the other end of the USB cable into a USB port on the computer. 
after connecting the external hard drive to the computer, it should be recognized automatically by your computer's operating system. Your computer should find and install any necessary drivers. In Windows, File Explorer may automatically open, displaying the contents of the external hard drive. If File Explorer does not automatically open, manually open File Explorer and locate the drive. An expansion drive provides extra storage for an ever-growing collection of files. It typically attaches to the computer with a USB connection. Expansion drives consolidate files into a single location and freeze computer space. The drive is automatically recognized by the Windows operating system, so there's no software to install or configure. One example of an expansion drive is a USB or thumb drive. These drives have a storage capacity of up to 2 terabytes or 2 TB. A USB flash drive is an expansion device that includes flash memory with an integrated USB interface. It is typically removable, rewritable, and much smaller than an optical disc. Most weigh less than one ounce. Since first appearing on the market in late 2000, as with virtually all other computer memory devices, storage capacities have risen while prices have dropped. As of 2018, two terabyte flash drives were the largest available in terms of storage capacity. Some are thought to last 10 to 100 years under normal circumstances or shelf storage time. A memory card is used to store digital information, typically using flash memory. These are commonly used in portable devices, such as digital cameras, cell phones, laptop computers, and portable media players. The card is stored inside a device. This differs it from USB drives. Memory cards are available in both Secure Digital, or SD, and Micro Secure Digital, or MSD, formats. Common digital capacities are 32GB, 64GB, and 128GB. Some of the latest generation memory cards offer 512GB memory card capacities. Portable media players and smartphones are other types of storage devices. A portable media player is any type of electronic device that is capable of handling digital media. Depending on the device, the types of media files that can be played include digital music, audiobooks, and video. A mobile media player is often part of a smartphone. It is important to understand the difference between internal and external or expandable memory. Internal memory is the manufacturer-installed storage space usually 16, 32, or 64 gigabytes, where the operating system, pre-installed apps, and other system software are installed. The total amount of internal storage cannot be increased or decreased by the user. So if your phone has only 16 gigabytes of internal storage and no expansion slot, this is all the storage space you will ever have. And remember, some of this will already be used up by the system software. External or expandable memory refers to a removable micro SD card or similar format, but not all phones will have this extra storage capability included. If storage for music, images, or other user added files is important to you, the ability to add another 32 gigabyte or even 64 gigabyte card should be an important consideration. In this video, you learned that Optical drives record data using a laser on a reflective disk. An external storage device, such as an external hard drive, often connects to a computer via a universal serial bus or USB connection. External hard drives and USB drives are solid state, which means they've got no moving parts. They're faster and more expensive than traditional hard drives. The best storage option for you will depend on your needs and your budget. Smartphones and media players offer portable storage as well as extensive functionality. And solid-state drive or SSD media, such as external hard drives, USB drives, and memory cards, increase the storage capacity of a system. Welcome to Display Devices. After watching this video, you will be able to 
Define and identify types of display devices. Enumerate how to adjust display properties and identify the installation and removal of display devices. A display device is a hardware component for the output of information in visual form. Visually impaired people can choose a tactile monitor that presents the information in a fingertip readable format. Common applications for display devices are television sets and computer monitors. A cathode ray tube, or CRT monitor, is an analog device that creates an image on the screen by directing three electron beams over millions of phosphor dots to light them up. CRT monitors were commonly used in televisions and computer monitors throughout the mid to late 1900s. By 1990, IBM's Extended Graphics Array, or XGA display, boasted 16.8 million colors in 800 by 600 pixel resolution. Flat screens are also known as liquid crystal display, LCD, or thin film transitor, TFT monitors. A digital signal drives the color value of each picture element or pixel. They replace the larger and heavier analog CRT monitors. Touch screens use a touch panel on an electronic display. Their capacitive technology measures heat and pressure. They are often found on smartphones, laptops, and tablets. Projectors are output devices that can take images from a computer and display them on a screen, wall, or other surface. The surface projected onto is usually large, flat, and lightly colored, such as a wall or whiteboard. The projected images are either still, like slides, or moving pictures. Screen resolution refers to the clarity of the text and images displayed on your screen. At higher resolutions, such as 1600 by 1200 pixels, items appear sharper. Older CRT monitors generally display a lower resolution of only 800 by 600 or 1024 by 768 pixels. You can change your screen resolution by selecting Settings, then System, and then Display. Windows uses plug-and-play installation. Windows locates and installs a device driver when you connect the device. Hot swappable devices, such as monitors, do not require a system restart to connect or disconnect. If you need to manually install a driver, locate the driver setup program from the vendor's website and then download and run it. To enable your PC to recognize multiple monitors in Windows 10, make sure your cables are connected properly to the monitors, press Windows key plus P, and select a display option. Your choices include duplicate, this will copy your display to both monitors, or extend, and this will project your display equally over two monitors. To uninstall a device in Windows, launch Device Manager by selecting the Start button, typing Device Manager, and pressing Enter. Then follow these steps. Open the View menu and select Show Hidden Devices. Expand the node that represents the type of device you want to uninstall, then right-click the device you want to uninstall, and select Uninstall. In the Confirm Device Removal dialog box, if you wish to remove the driver package in addition to uninstalling the device, select the Delete the Driver software for this device option. When ready to complete the operation, select OK. With some devices, if the device is still plugged in when it is uninstalled, the device might continue to function until the system has been restarted. In this video, you learned that a display device is a hardware component for the output of information. Types of display devices include flat screen and CRT monitors. The display resolution can be adjusted by using Device Manager. To install a plug-and-play display device, you need only attach it to the computer. And to remove a display device, use Device Manager to uninstall it. Hello and welcome to Printers and Scanners. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe what an output device does Install a printer in Windows and identify types of printers used by a computer Input to the computer is processed as data and shown or output via an output device An output device is any piece of hardware that converts information into a human-readable form That output can be text 
graphics, tactile, audio, or video. Examples of output devices include monitors, printers, speakers, headphones, and projectors, as well as GPS devices, sound cards, video cards, optical mark readers, and braille readers. A speech synthesizer produces verbal output like human speech. A computer can function without an output device. However, without an output device, there is no way to determine what the computer is doing. There is no indicator of errors nor the need for additional input. For example, if you detach your monitor from your computer, the computer will still function, but you won't be able to see anything. A printer is simply a machine for putting text or pictures onto paper. There are four main types, laser, LED, inkjet, and thermal. Laser or thermal printers use a heated unit to fuse ink onto paper. LED printers, like laser printers, have a photoreceptive drum that surfaces positively charged with static electricity by a high-voltage wire. The paper then passes between two heated rollers, fusing the toner to the page before it comes out the printer. Inkjet printers have a print head containing thousands of tiny holes. These openings put microscopic droplets of ink onto paper very quickly. Inkjet machines use a liquid ink produced by either a colored dye or a liquid that contains solid pigments. And thermal printers heat specially coated paper to turn sections black and is used in point-of-sale terminals and fax machines. A networked printer is connected to a network using Ethernet or Wi-Fi, the latter being the more popular choice. Whereas a local printer would be cabled to the device that requires it, a networked printer can be accessed by multiple devices simultaneously on the same network. An IP-based printer is part of an IP network. It often refers to Unix computers that use a specific protocol for printing. Like an IP-based printer, a web-based printer can receive documents through a network and via the internet, rather than a direct connection to a computer. To install or add a local printer using Windows, follow these steps. Select the Start button, then select Settings. Then choose Devices and select Printers and Scanners. Select Add a Printer or Scanner. Wait for it to find nearby printers. Then choose the one you want to use and select Add Device. An image scanner or scanner optically scans images, printed text, or an object and converts it from an analog format to a digital image. This creates an electronic version of the document that can be viewed on a monitor or screen and edited on a computer. Commonly used in offices are variations of the desktop flatbed scanner, where the document is placed on a glass window for scanning. Flatbed scanners have been replaced by multifunction devices. More on those coming up next. A fax machine is a device that is used to send documents over a telephone network. The transmissions can be between two fax machines, or between a fax machine and a computer, or an online fax service. Often the functions of a printer, scanner, and fax machine are combined in one device, known as a multifunction device, or MFD. In this video, you learned that an output device is hardware that converts information into a human-readable form. Installing a printer in Windows 10 takes only a few steps. Printer types include inkjet, LED, laser, and thermal. Output devices display data from the computer in one or more formats. Scanner output can be selected in different formats, including a PDF. And multifunction devices, or MFDs, can be used instead of standalone printers, scanners, copiers, and fax machines. Welcome to Audio and Visual Devices. After watching this video, you will be able to define audio and visual devices, explore the usage of speakers, microphones, and headphones with computers, and evaluate the usefulness of webcams. On its own, your computer can't make a sound. Digital data from audio and video files need to be turned into something that our ears can hear, and this requires specialized hardware and processing in the form of audio devices. Audio devices refer to components that reproduce, record, or process sound. 
This includes microphones, CD players, amplifiers, mixing consoles, effects units, and speakers. Visual devices are units capable of presenting images electronically on a screen. Typically, such devices have a display greater than 4 inches when measured diagonally. Images can be displayed on smartphones, computer monitors, and laptop computers. A computer speaker is an output hardware device. It connects to a computer to generate sound. The signal used to produce sound is created by the computer's sound card. To configure your speakers in Windows 10, right-click the speaker icon in the taskbar's notification area or system tray and select Open Sound Settings to go straight to the Sound Settings screen. Locate the Output section on the Sound screen and in the drop-down menu labeled Choose Your Output Device, select the speakers you'd like to use as your default. A microphone, sometimes abbreviated as mic, is a hardware peripheral and input device. A microphone allows computer users to input audio into their computers. To install a new microphone using Windows 10, follow these steps. First, make sure your microphone is connected to your PC, then select Start, then Settings, System, and Sound. Scroll to Input, choose your input device, and select the microphone or recording device you want to use. Sometimes referred to as earphones, Headphones are a hardware output device that plugs into a computer line-out or speaker port. Headphones allow you to listen to audio without disturbing the people around you. To use a headset, you must connect it by one of two means. Attach one end of the headset to an available port on a PC or link it via wireless. If you plan to use a wired connection, you might use a 3.5 mm jack. Older and more affordable headsets usually have the cable split at the end with two 3.5 mm jacks, one for audio out and the other for the microphone. These connectors are green for the headset and pink for the microphone. The next option, if you plan on using a port, is to use a universal serial bus connection. USB-powered headsets offer enhanced experiences thanks to inline amps, controls, and other features that affect sound quality or you can use a wireless connection. Bluetooth headsets remove all the cables between the headset and your computer, allowing you to sit more comfortably without fear of creating a tangle of cables. A webcam feeds an image or video in real time to a network such as the internet. Webcams can be used during a video chat and offer a compact video recording device. Once of very low quality, modern webcams are usually high resolution with 1080p or pixels or high definition HD. They can be built into laptops or attached using a universal serial bus or USB. Here's how to set up a webcam in Windows. Press the Windows key or click Start. Type Camera in the search box and select the Camera app. The camera app opens and the webcam is turned on, displaying a live video of yourself on the screen. You can now adjust the webcam to center your face on the video screen. In this video, you learned that audio and visual devices, such as webcams and speakers, add multimedia functionality to a system. The sound quality of a speaker depends on the sound card. Headsets are available in a variety of connections and sound quality. Newer webcams offer HD or 1080p quality, and such webcams are useful in video chats. Welcome to Identifying Ports and Connectors. After watching this video, you will be able to define a port and a connector, differentiate between a port and an interface, and identify common ports and connectors. Devices connect to a computer using ports and connectors. A port is a hole or a slot that receives a connector and allows a device to physically connect to a computer. A connector is the distinctive plug at the end of a cable, jack, or electronic card that can be physically plugged into a port. Each port has a unique function and accepts only the connector designed specifically to fit into it. Common examples of physical ports and connector pairs include the USB port, HDMI port, display port, and speaker port. 
An interface is the point of communication between two or more entities. An interface can be either hardware or software-based. Examples of hardware-based interfaces include the point where a port or card connects to the computer motherboard, the point where a peripheral device connects to the computer, or a touchscreen device that records human inputs. Software interfaces provide routes for communication between software applications, the operating system, and hardware. For example, drivers are software interfaces that enable communication between the operating system and the computer's hardware components. Let's take a deeper look and learn to identify commonly used interfaces and connectors. The Universal Serial Bus, or USB, was built by a consortium of seven companies to replace the many varieties of connectors available in the market with a common, simple-to-use, and fast standard that could be used across devices and peripherals. Since its launch in 1996, the USB connector has gone through several iterations. When USB was first launched, it supported speeds of 1.5 to 12 megabits per second. It also supported four different connector types, Type A, Type B, Mini A, and Mini B. USB 2 was launched in 2001 to increase data transfer speeds up to 480 megabits per second. It also added support for the Mini AB connector and introduced the Micro A, Micro B, and Micro AB connectors. The USB 3 series of updates saw speeds increase to 5 gigabits per second, with USB 3.0 in 2008. The Type-C connector was launched with USB 3.1 in 2014, with speeds of 10 gigabits per second. It was made backward compatible with all versions of USB, up to USB 2. USB 3.2 was released in 2017 with speeds of 20 gigabits per second. The mini connector types were discontinued in this version. USB 4, based on the Thunderbolt 3 and 4 protocol specifications, was released in 2019 and continues to be the latest and greatest version for USB devices. It supports speeds up to 40 gigabits per second over a Type-C connector. The Type-A USB port has an elongated rectangle shape with four pins and carries both data and power. It is typically used for keyboards and mice. The Type-B port is almost square with beveled outside top corners. These also have four pins and are mostly used with printers, scanners, and similar devices. Mini USB ports were introduced for use with smaller devices, such as digital cameras, mobile phones, and tablets. They have nine pins and are smaller than Type-A or B and twice as thick as micro USB ports. Micro USB ports are similar width as mini USB, but much thinner with only five pins. These were designed to replace mini ports on smaller devices. And finally, the 24 pin Type C with a reversible connector is designed to be future proof and to replace various Type A and B connectors. Thunderbolt is a commonly used hardware interface developed by Intel and Apple. It was originally marketed under the name LightPeak but was later renamed to Thunderbolt. The Thunderbolt interface is very versatile, combining data transfer, display, and power into one cable. It allows up to six peripheral devices to be connected through a daisy chain. Thunderbolt interfaces have four versions. Versions 1 and 2 use the same connectors as a mini display port, or MDP. Versions 3 and 4 reuse the USB-C connector. While Thunderbolt 3 doubled the data transfer rate to 40 gigabits per second, Thunderbolt 4 has support for USB 4 protocol and data rates, and dual 4K displays. It also supports Thunderbolt Alternate Hubs USB, and not just daisy chaining. All Thunderbolt ports are identified using the Thunderbolt symbol to differentiate them from regular MDP and USB-C ports. Before Thunderbolt, FireWire was a popular interface on Macintosh computers and is comparable to the modern USB interface. It comes in various shapes. The 400 is a slimmer connection with one rounded side, and the faster 800 connector looks like a thicker version of the USB. FireWire ports use a serial bus architecture to transfer information one bit at a time. 
This makes them lighter and cheaper than parallel buses that use a number of different physical connections. Firewire interfaces have been replaced with Thunderbolt and USB interfaces on modern computers. However, users with older computers, as well as the automobile and aerospace industries, still use these ports. PS2 ports were developed by IBM for their IBM Personal System 2 series of computers and are named after them. They are round and have six pins for connectivity. These ports were specifically designed to connect the keyboard and mouse to the computer. Although the two PS2 ports look identical, they are not interchangeable and they are identified by different colors and symbols. And although the PS2 port is considered a legacy port, modern PCs may still carry them as they are preferred by gaming enthusiasts, legacy users, and industrial applications. eSATA is the most popular port to connect external storage devices, such as external hard drives, to computers. eSATA allows hot swapping, which is the replacement or addition of external devices, without stopping, shutting down, or rebooting the host system. Since 2008, eSATA has been upgraded to the eSATA P interface that allows for both eSATA and USB devices to be connected through the same port. eSATA has been through three main revisions, and data transfer speeds have doubled with each revision. In this video, you learned that a port is a hole or slot that receives a connector and allows a device to connect to a computer. A connector is a plug at the end of a cable, jack, or electronic card that can be physically plugged into a port. An interface is a hardware or software-based point of connection between two or more entities that enables communication. And common ports and connectors include PS2, Thunderbolt, Firewire, eSATA, and USB. Welcome to Identifying Graphic Devices. After watching this video, you will be able to describe how graphic devices operate on a computer, list characteristics of the display system, and recognize the different types of display connectors and their use. Computers communicate with a display unit, such as a computer monitor, using display cards called the Graphics Processing Unit, or GPU. Generic graphic cards are built into a computer's motherboard and are good for everyday computing requirements. Graphic-heavy tasks, such as multimedia editing and 3D gaming, require specialized high-end graphic adapters. Radeon chipsets by AMD, GeForce and NForce chipsets from NVIDIA, and other adapters from SIS, Intel, and VIA are popular products on the market. When selecting a computer display, the resolution, refresh rate, and bit or color depth all play an important part. The resolution is the number of horizontal and vertical pixels, which determines the clarity of an image or text. The refresh rate, based on how fast the screen refreshes to show a new image, governs the video playback quality while the bit depth, which describes the total number of supported colors, dictates how close the colors are to real life. Higher resolutions, refresh rate, and bit depth result in higher quality images, smoother video playback, and true color displays. The display quality is directly linked to the amount of processing power required from the graphic processing unit, or GPU. It is, of course, possible to display low-resolution images and video on a high-end display, thereby reducing the need for graphic processing power. Initial displays used cathode ray tubes, or CRTs, with a 4x3 screen width to height aspect ratio. These displays supported video graphic array, or VGA, standards. The earliest VGA standard supported 640 by 480 pixels with a 4-bit, 16-color display at 60 Hz. This was superseded by the SVGA standard, supporting 800 by 600 resolution and 4 or 8-bit color. The next iteration, using XGA standards, supported 1024 by 768 pixel displays, 16 or 32-bit colors, and a higher refresh rate. 
All of these displays used a 4x3 screen width to height aspect ratio. With the advent of LED technology, widescreen monitors supporting 16x9 aspect ratios are common. These monitors support high-end resolutions from between 1280 pixels by 720 to 1920 by 1080 for a full HD display. Larger devices use even higher resolutions such as 3840 by 2160 for 4K or Ultra HD displays and 7680 by 4320 for 8K displays. Different display and graphic adapters come equipped with different ports that support different connectors and cables. Sometimes the same adapter may have more than one type of connector. Each connector represents an advancement in display technology and brings its own benefits. Let's take a look at each of these in greater detail. High Definition Multimedia Interface, or HDMI, is the latest and most widely used interface for digital audio and video for televisions, Blu-ray players, computers, and other consumer electronics. Beyond just data transfers, HDMI also provides remote control or CEC support and digital content protection or HDCP. The HDMI connector has a proprietary 19-pin connector in three sizes. HDMI 2.1 for regular connections, HDMI Mini for portable electronics such as DVD players, and the Micro HDMI for GoPro action cameras, smartphones, and so on. The newer versions of HDMI offer greater bandwidth and can therefore support higher quality resolutions up to 8K. Developed by the Video Electronics Standards Association, or VISA, DisplayPort is designed to complement HDMI and offer a royalty-free alternative. It improves upon the DVI interface and is the first to use packetized data transmission. This allows DisplayPort to transmit higher bandwidths over fewer pins, thereby resulting in almost lossless data transmission. The DisplayPort connector has 20 pins, where 12 are for the main link, 3 pins for the auxiliary channel, 1 for the hot plug detection, 2 for power, and 2 additional ground pins. It can support 7 different transmission modes for progressively increasing bandwidth. Intel and Apple developed the Thunderbolt interface, and this interface remains popular on Apple computers. This versatile cable type functions both as a display and as a peripheral interface. The initial version of Thunderbolt used the Mini DP interface. Thunderbolt version 3 and the current Thunderbolt version 4 both use a USB-C interface. However, it is important to know that a Thunderbolt device plugged into a standard USB-C interface does not support Thunderbolt features, and a USB-C cable plugged into a Thunderbolt interface does not support Thunderbolt features. Developed as an industry standard for digital video content transmission, DVI connects a video source to a display. It transmits uncompressed digital video and can support both analog and digital devices in various formats. The DVI-I interface supports integrated digital and analog equipment on the same connector, while DVI-A supports only analog equipment and DVI-D supports only digital equipment. The digital connectors come in single and dual link formats where the dual link provides higher bandwidth for resolutions higher than HD TV or 1920 by 1200. This interface was very popular but has since been replaced by HDMI and Thunderbolt or DisplayPort interfaces. One of the earliest interfaces, the VGA, was developed for analog video transmission. Considering that most of the modern graphic devices handle digital content, the VGA is now considered legacy, although some PCs continue to support it. The VGA has a distinctive 15-pin array distributed into three rows. The connector can be secured to the port using screws. There are several other connectors used commonly that are worth mentioning here. Apple provides a free license for the mini display port and it can support up to 4K resolutions, so users can connect their computers to HD TVs starting from the 2010 version. 
Many popular laptop models ship with the mini display port interface. Some displays use USB to connect. Universally, cameras use USB ports to connect to computers. Some display monitors also use USB Type A connectors. And some older televisions, VCRs, and computer monitors use S cables to connect using the S video port. Component RGB is used to process analog video signals. These interfaces typically split video into three signals and usually have one or more additional cables for transmitting the audio signal. In this video, you learned that computers need a display unit connected to a screen in order to display graphics and video. Quality of display is based on resolution, bit depth, and refresh rates. And higher quality display requires high-end specialized adapters. The current display systems use 16 by 9 aspect ratio with LED displays, while older models use CRT displays featuring a 4 by 3 aspect ratio. And there are different graphic connectors available, and each has its own features and benefits. Welcome to Identifying Audio Connectors. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe how audio devices connect to a computer List the different types of audio connectors And identify audio connectors based on the connection type Computer programs use an internal expansion audio card, also known as the sound card, to transmit audio signals into and out of a computer these cards have a digital-to-analog converter to help external analog devices connect and communicate with the computer. Depending on the sound card, it can have ports to connect a variety of devices, such as headphones, speakers, microphones, video projection devices, and more. Sound cards are commonly used to listen to music, record and edit audio or video, play computer games, make presentations, and conduct teleconference calls. Audio input and output devices use different types of connectors, such as sound cards, Bluetooth, game ports, or USB ports, and external audio interfaces. Let's take a look at each of these in more detail. The number of connectors or ports on a sound card depend on the requirements. These ports accept a 6.35 mm tip, ring, and sleeve, or TRS jack, or a 3.5 mm TRS mini jack. The ports are usually labeled, but are also color coded for easy identification. At a minimum, a sound card offers a light blue analog line in, a pink microphone in, and a lime green audio line out connector. Sound cards with advanced features may also provide additional outputs, including black for left and right rear surround speakers, and orange for mid surround. Built-in Bluetooth connectors use a wireless interface to connect audio devices like headsets and speakers. Modern computers and laptops come with built-in Bluetooth adapters. However, external Bluetooth dongles are also available. These connect through the USB port to receive and transmit Bluetooth signals. Until the late 1990s, game ports used MIDI interfaces with the standard 15-pin connector. The two redundant pins, 12 and 15, were repurposed to transmit audio and enhance the gaming experience. Modern computers and gaming controllers use the USB port for both connectivity and audio, and the game port is now obsolete, except for backward compatibility with outdated devices. A single external audio interface can connect to multiple input and output devices, such as amplifiers, microphones, speakers, and so on. Professionals and studios use external audio interfaces for better quality and amplified sound. These external audio interfaces then connect to the computer via USB, Firewire, Thunderbolt, or similar digital connectors and require specific drivers to work. In this video, you learned that computers use internal expansion cards, called audio or sound cards, to send and receive audio signals. There are a number of ways a computer can connect to audio devices through the sound cards. 
and the most common connectors are sound card ports, Bluetooth, game ports or USB ports, and external audio interfaces. Welcome to Wired and Wireless Network Connections. After watching this video, you will be able to describe network communication types, give examples of wired and wireless connections, and contrast wired and wireless connections. Today, hardly any device operates in isolation, unless that's what you want. Communication technology allows components to communicate over a network by converting information into data packets that are sent from one smart object to another in dialogue. Like papers in an envelope, each data packet contains information about the sending and receiving device, along with the message that needs to be transmitted. This ensures that only the designated device receives the information. As such, devices built to talk over a network can communicate with each other. A finite number of devices can be connected in a closed network or to an unlimited number of devices over an open network, such as the Internet. For example, your phone could be used to control your humidifier on your home network. Either type of network connection can be wired or wireless, such as Bluetooth. An RJ, or registered jack connector, is used for landline telephones. There are two types of RJ connectors. An RJ11 is used to plug a phone into a wall outlet and for connecting a handset to a telephone. RJ45 connectors are used for connecting computers and other internet-enabled devices, such as wired credit card readers, servers, modems, gaming consoles, and smart TVs, to Ethernet-based local area networks or ELANs. The RJ45, like the RJ11, has a plastic tab to prevent misconnections between the connector and the port. Wired connections allow faster data transmission. This connection offers speeds up to 5 gigabits per second, while wireless connections have a speed of only 1 gigabit per second. They're more reliable than wireless connections because they have consistent speed and connectivity. Wired connections are not impacted by weather conditions and are immune to signal drops and dead zones. Wired connections are less prone to radio interference, so there are fewer dropped packets that need to be retransmitted. This translates into greater network stability and speed. As devices need to be physically connected in a wired connection, they are more secure and less likely to be hacked. Wireless connections use different technologies based on connection requirements. For example, wireless fidelity, or Wi-Fi, is used to connect computers, phones, tablets, smart TVs, and other devices to the Internet. It works by connecting a wireless router directly to an internet modem. The router acts as a hub for all wireless-enabled devices within a range to connect to a home network and the internet. Note that newer modems have built-in routers to avoid the need for connecting a separate device. Bluetooth technology, available since 1998, uses ultra-high-frequency radio waves to connect devices in a one-on-one -on -one connection over short distances. The connection between a sending and receiving device is established through a process called pairing, where both devices send a passkey to recognize each other. Radio Frequency Identification, or RFID, is used to identify and track objects using tags. RFID devices can operate over several hundred meters. RFID is used in the automatic collection of road tolls through tags affixed to vehicle windshields. Other uses of RFID tags can include implanting them in pets and livestock to enable easy identification, tracking pharmaceuticals through warehouses, preventing theft, and expediting checkout in stores. NFC, or near-field communication, is an evolution of RFID technology that works over extremely short distances. Near-field communication transmits data through electromagnetic radio fields to enable two devices to communicate with each other. To work, both devices must contain NFC chips. The short range makes NFC power efficient and increases security by eliminating accidental triggers. Common implementations of NFC include key cards for hotels and office access, 
digital wallets, and chip-enabled credit cards. Wireless networks are becoming increasingly commonplace because of their advantages over wired connections. For example, there's the increased mobility. Users can easily move from one location to another without losing connectivity most of the time. Wireless connections are extremely quick and easy to set up. On the other hand, wired networks require extensive cabling and equipment that must be installed and tested before the network becomes operational. As your networking requirements evolve, it is very easy to make updates and scale up in a wireless network. A wireless network can be easily extended to reach a wide area, including places where you cannot install network wires and cables. And wireless networks are more economical, as they require less equipment and are easier to scale and maintain than traditional wired networks. In this video, you learned that Devices connect with each other using wired and wireless networks. The main types of wired connectors are the RJ11, which is used in telephony, and the RJ45, used to connect computers and related peripherals. Wireless networks use different technologies based on usage requirements. Wi-Fi connects devices to home networks and the Internet. Bluetooth has a short range but transmits large streams of data. RFID uses a tag and receiver model to collect identifying information. It is useful in tracking products, livestock, and pets, and for collecting tolls on highways. And NFC is an evolution of RFID and operates over extremely short distances. It often requires physical contact between devices to transmit data. Welcome to Peripheral and Printer Connections. After watching this video, you will be able to list common methods for connecting to and installing printers and peripherals, describe how to connect printers or peripherals using serial ports and parallel ports, and describe how to connect printers or peripherals via a local or network connection. How does a computer recognize a peripheral device or printer? Computers require software that enables peripheral or printer device recognition and communication. Computers use onboard pre-installed plug-and-play software designed as generic software that can work with multiple printers, scanners, or other specific peripherals. For example, a generic printer driver could enable the installation of various brands of printers. If the device doesn't successfully install when trying a plug-and-play installation, your next step is to visit the manufacturer's website to locate and install the device driver that works with your operating system. Often, by installing the driver software, you can use the device's basic features. However, for example, if you have a peripheral device, such as a multifunction printer, and you want to use its additional features, such as scanning and faxing, manufacturers generally require that you download and install their device application software. To save time, check the manufacturer's instructions before starting your installation. Initial standalone peripheral installation often still requires a wired connection or network connection. You'll connect the printer to your computer using a cable, then turn on the printer. Frequently used standalone peripheral and printer connections include USB cable connections and wireless connections, including Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and near-frequency communications, or NFC. And you might encounter three other printer connection methods, including a serial port connection, a parallel port connection, or a network connection. Serial connected printers are less common these days. Serial connections transmit data more slowly. RS-232, a recommended standard protocol, remains in use. RS-232 data signals can travel longer distances with better noise immunity and compatibility among manufacturers. And RS-232 cables commonly feature 9-pin connections, as shown here, and two screws to secure the cable to the device and the computer. Parallel port connections are less common, but do still exist. In many instances, they have been replaced by USB and other connections. 
Parallel ports can send and receive multiple bits of data simultaneously, processing data faster than serial ports. Parallel port cables feature 25-pin connections and include two screws that help keep the cables connected to computers and devices. Peripheral and printer network connections can be wireless using Wi-Fi or wired using an Ethernet connection. Before adding a connection to a network-based peripheral, verify your connectivity. Here's how to connect and install a printer using a serial or parallel port. These instructions also apply to other peripheral devices. If needed, locate and install the driver or software using the manufacturer's instructions. Next, locate the serial port or parallel port on your computer. Serial port cables usually have nine pins, Parallel ports have 25 pins. Attach the cable connection to the computer's port. These cables include side screws that attach to the computer body so that the cable remains connected to the computer. Power on your printer and configure the printer. Printer connections are available within the Settings app. Using the Settings app, select Devices, Printers and Scanners, and then select the plus Add a Printer or Scanner option. Windows often automatically detects connected printers. If the printer's software is installed, select Open Printer App to configure the printer. If you don't see the printer that you want to add, select the link for The Printer That I Want Isn't Listed. This option is beneficial for older style printers and network connected printers. Follow the prompts to find a printer using other options, including older printers, network printers, Bluetooth printers, or any printer needing a manual connection. In this video, you learned that printers require software known as drivers for the computer and the printer to be able to communicate with each other. In some instances, to use all the printer's capabilities, you need to install the manufacturer's software. Both serial and parallel port cables include side screws that attach to the computer body so that the cable remains connected to the computer. And to add a network printer, verify your computer's network connection, locate your operating system's printer and scanner settings, and search for an available network printer. Welcome to Installation Types. After watching this video, you will be able to define hardware and software installation, evaluate the advantages of plug-and-play over driver installation, and explain the similarities of IP-based and web configuration. Installation is the process of making hardware and or software ready for use. Different systems require different types of installations, while certain installations are straightforward and can be performed by non-professionals, others are more complex and may require the involvement of specialists. The types of installation can be broken down into two categories, plug-and-play and driver installation. Plug-and-play, sometimes abbreviated as PNP, describes devices that work with a computer system as soon as they are connected. The user does not have to manually install drivers for this device or even tell the computer that a new device has been added. Examples of PNP devices include mice and keyboards. If a PNP device doesn't function in Windows, the user should look in Device Manager for an indication of a problem with the device. Device Manager is part of the Windows operating system. It allows users to view and control the hardware attached to the computer. When a piece of hardware is not working, that hardware is highlighted with a yellow icon for the user to deal with. One cause of device malfunction is an outdated driver. A driver is the software that allows a device to talk to the operating system. Updating the driver may restore proper function to a device. To update a device driver in Windows 10, follow these steps. First, Open Device Manager by typing Device Manager in the search box and selecting Device Manager. A list of names of installed devices will display. Click the arrow to the left of the device you're looking for to expand the list. Right-click the device you'd like to update and select Update Driver. An IP-based peripheral is hardware that is connected to a transmission control protocol, Internet Protocol, or TCP IP network. 
Examples of IP-based peripherals are wireless access points, wireless routers, IP security cameras, network print servers, and networked printers or multifunction devices. These devices must be connected to a local area network or LAN or the internet for installation and functionality. When you install a device, you get it ready for use. But when you configure a device, you're setting it up to work according to your preferences. Web-based configuration is used for networking devices, such as routers. This makes the setup process easier. All your work is done on a web page, which is generally found on the manufacturer's website. In this video, you learned that hardware and software installation is a prerequisite for functionality. One of the advantages of plug-and-play over driver installation is the speed with which a device can be installed. The alternative is to install drivers manually, which is more time-consuming. And IP-based and web-based configuration both require an internet connection for installation and functionality. Welcome to Internal Computer Components. After watching this video, you will be able to recognize several internal computer components, explore the role of a motherboard, and evaluate the importance of data flow. A motherboard is the main printed circuit board, or PCB, in computers and other expandable systems. Motherboards contain significant subsystems, such as the chipsets, input, output, and memory controllers, interface connectors, and other components integrated for general use. Motherboards allow communication among many crucial electronic components, such as the central processing unit, or CPU, and memory. And motherboards also provide communication pathways for peripherals, such as keyboards and other components. A chipset is a set of electronic components in an integrated circuit that manage data flow among the processor, memory, and peripherals. A chipset has two parts, the north bridge and the south bridge, which manage communications among the CPU and other parts of the motherboard. A north bridge chip, or host bridge, is one of the two chips in the core logic chipset on the motherboard. Unlike the south bridge chip, the north bridge chip connects directly to the CPU via the front side bus and performs high performance tasks. The south bridge chip, the second chip of the chipset, generally implements slower performance tasks, and a south bridge chip is usually not directly connected to the CPU. A bus is a high speed internet connection embedded as printed circuits on the motherboard. A bus sends control signals and data among the CPU and other internal components. It's like the information superhighway of the computer. A front side bus is a computer communication interface that carries data between the CPU and the memory controller hub, or the north bridge. Now a socket is the array of pins and the securing mechanism that hold a processor in place and connect the processor to the motherboard. Socket pin connections differ depending on which generation of CPU your motherboard supports. Older sockets use a pin grid array, or PGA, that uses short, stiff pins on the CPU that align with the holes on the socket. When installing a CPU, do not force the CPU into the socket. If the CPU and socket are correctly matched, the CPU should fit. Newer motherboard sockets, called LAND grid arrays, or LGAs, have built-in pins and the CPUs have contact points on them. A power connector is a device found on a motherboard that allows an electronic current to pass through it to provide power to a device. Not all power connectors look alike. An ATX-style connector is one of the larger power connectors inside a computer. These connectors join the power supply to the motherboard. In this video, you learned that internal computer components include everything connected to the motherboard. A motherboard provides a communication pathway for peripherals. Buses send control signals and data between the CPU and other components. Components not directly attached to a motherboard connect via sockets. And sockets are the architecture of pins that allow CPU installation.
Welcome to Data Processing and Storage. After watching this video, you will be able to recognize the role of memory in a system, differentiate between memory slots and expansion slots, and evaluate the importance of the BIOS and CMOS. The CPU is a silicon chip in a special socket on the motherboard. CPUs contain billions of microscopic transistors on a single computer chip. These billions of transistors enable the computer calculations needed to run programs available in your system's memory. A 32-bit CPU is a processor architecture that can transfer 32 bits of data per clock cycle. Think of a 32-bit CPU as a two-lane information highway. 32-bit processors are found in laptops, workstations, and servers. A 64-bit CPU is comparable to a four-lane information highway, enabling twice the amount of data to move compared to a 32-bit CPU. 64-bit processors are also found in laptops, workstations, and servers. Random Access Memory, or RAM, temporarily stores working data and machine code. Because RAM is volatile, any data existing in RAM is lost when power is terminated. RAM is cold pluggable or cold swappable. Cold pluggable or cold swappable means that the hardware is off or that the hardware is in a state of being without power. RAM speeds are measured in megahertz or millions of cycles per second. Currently, RAM speeds can range from 1333 megahertz to speeds of 2133 megahertz. RAM is available in several forms of varying speeds and storage capacities, depending on your type of motherboard and needs. The memory you use depends on your motherboard type. Common forms of memory include the following. Dynamic random access memory, or DRAM, stores each bit of data in a memory cell, usually consisting of a tiny capacitor and a transistor. SDRAM, or Synchronous Dynamic Random Access Memory, is a form of DRAM semiconductor memory that can run faster than DRAM. Double Data Rate Synchronous Dynamic Random Access Memory, or DDR SDRAM, is faster than SDRAM because it fetches data twice per clock cycle. Double Data Rate 3 Synchronous Dynamic Random Access Memory, known as DDR3 SDRAM, is faster than DDR SDRAM and Double Data Rate 4th Generation, or DDR4, is a faster, more reliable replacement for DDR3 SDRAM that uses less power. And Small Outline Dual Input Memory Module, or SODIMM, chips are commonly used in notebooks since there is a lack of space. SODIMM slots take half the space of desktop slots, but they draw more power. A memory slot holds a RAM, random access memory stick in place, on a computer's motherboard. Only memory chips can fit into these dedicated slots. Memory slots allow the system to use RAM by enabling the motherboard to communicate with memory. And depending on the motherboard, there will be two to four memory slots, sometimes more on high-end motherboards. The memory slots on the motherboard determine the type of RAM that's compatible with a computer. Older machines used the original Peripheral Component Interconnect, or PCI, expansion slots. Newer motherboards use the PCI Express, known as PCIe. These slots hold expansion cards designed to provide additional features to a computer, such as enhanced sound, memory, high-end graphics, and network interfaces, which can be wired or wireless. The computer's motherboard determines which additional capabilities are available based on the additional slots. The disk controller is a circuit that enables the central processing unit, or CPU, to communicate with a hard disk, floppy disk, or other kinds of disk drives. The Integrated Drive Electronics, or IDE, disk controller was a standard created for communications between the CPU and hard drives in computers. An IDE controller exists as a small circuit board on the motherboard, with chips that guide how the hard disk drive stores and accesses data. Most controllers include some memory that boosts hard drive performance. The BIOS, Basic Input-Output System, manages your computer's exchange of inputs and outputs, mostly when you're booting up your computer. Every computer has a BIOS pre-programmed into its motherboard. 
It's different than an operating system that can be installed, uninstalled, and updated long after you've bought the computer. When your computer is unplugged, the BIOS remains operational and relies on a battery for power. Such batteries exist in laptops and desktop PCs, but it's used more frequently in a laptop because laptops are usually unplugged longer than desktop PCs. You can update a BIOS through a process called flashing. To do this, you need the BIOS version number. You can find the BIOS version number in the System Information window. In Windows 10, press the Windows key plus R, type MS Info 32 into the Run box, and press Enter. The BIOS version number is displayed in the BIOS version date field. The directions on how to flash the BIOS differ among motherboard manufacturers, so check the manufacturer's website for their procedure and proceed with caution. CMOS is short for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. A CMOS battery is a coin-sized battery similar to a watch battery that is installed on the motherboard to power the CMOS memory chip. The CMOS memory chip stores a computer's hardware settings. Like all batteries, CMOS batteries expire, and when the battery expires, the system clock resets, and you'll need to replace the battery to restore the computer system time, date, and hardware settings. In this video, you learned that Internal computer components include everything connected to the motherboard. A motherboard provides a communication pathway for peripherals. A memory slot holds RAM in place on a computer's motherboard. The computer's BIOS is pre-programmed into the motherboard and uses CMOS to store configuration settings. And you can replace the CMOS battery to restore configuration settings. Welcome to Internal Storage. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe general hard drive characteristics Identify characteristics of PETA drives, IDE drives, SATA drives, SCSI, and SSD drives Describe the general characteristics of optical drives And identify expansion slots Introduced by IBM in 1956 Internal hard drives provide non-volatile, long-term data storage, fast access time, and fast data transfer rates. Traditional hard drives contain a platter, or disk, with a magnetic surface where data is stored. The platter rotates on a spindle, which controls the speed of the platter spin. The metallic head floats just above the platter, where it can read and write magnetic data. The head is at the end of an actuator arm that positions the head to read or write data on the platter. Together, the spindle, actuator arm, and head are controlled to read and write a specific task on the disk. Data that is read or to be written reaches the drive using a combination of power connectors, data connectors, jumpers, and other technologies that trigger the actuator arm. The actuator arm positions the head to read and write data from the disk. The power connector provides power to the hard drive. The data connector provides the connection to pass input and output to the drive. And in some cases, the drive can be configured with jumpers to enable specific types of settings. Advanced technology attachment hard drives, known as ATA drives, including Integrated Drive Electronics, or IDE drives, and Parallel Advanced Technology Attachment, or PETA drives, originated in the 1980s and were popular until about 2003. The early ATA drives processed data at 33 megabits per second. Later, ATA drives processed data at 133 megabits per second. In 2003, Serial Advanced Technology Attachment, or SATA drives, which communicate using a serial cable and bus, advanced data processing to 1.5 gigabits per second, more than 10 times faster than an ATA. Currently, SATA drives can process data at 6 gigabits per second. SATA drives are available in multiple sizes, known as form factors. SATA drives typically spin at 5,400 or 7,200 revolutions per minute or RPMs, with capacities from 250 gigabytes to over 30 terabytes. 
SATA drives still dominate today's desktop and laptop market. Each SATA port supports a single drive. Most desktop motherboards have at least four SATA ports. Small computer system interface, pronounced SCSI hard drives, joined the storage market in 1986. SCSI drives were fast, working at 10,000 or 15,000 rotations per minute or RPM. At the time, SCSI drives accessed data much faster than standard ATA drives. SCSI drives began to be discontinued around 1994 and are no longer used. Solid-state drives, known as SSDs, which store data on non-volatile flash memory, joined the hard drive market in 1989. SSDs provide significantly more reliability and are faster than traditional drives. SSDs operate at speeds of 10 to 12 gigabytes per second. Speeds vary by manufacturer and form factor, and SSD drive capacity ranges from about 120 gigabytes to 2 terabytes. SSDs cost more than equivalent SATA drives. However, SSDs provide significantly more reliability than traditional platter-style hard disk drives. SSDs are also available as external drives and hybrid hard drives. As part of a hybrid drive configuration, the SSD serves as a cache and the SATA drive functions as the storage disk. Hybrid drives tend to operate slower than SSD drives. Next, optical drives, which use compact disks or CDs and digital versatile disks, known as DVDs, were invented in the 1960s and came to market in 1992. These drives, like SSDs, provide non-volatile storage. Optical drives use low-power laser beams to retrieve and write data, encoding data for storage onto the laser disk in tiny pits arranged in a spiral track on the disk's surface. CDs are suitable for small capacity storage, up to 750 megabytes. DVD storage ranges from 4.7 gigabytes to 17.1 gigabytes. CDs and DVDs can be read-only or read-write compatible. CDs are single-sided, but DVDs can be either single or dual-sided. CDs are created using universal read-write formatting. DVD player formatting happens by region. Media providers can encode DVDs to match the players located in the regions where the content is licensed. Blu-ray discs, as media for movies and video games, provide high-resolution and digital surround sound content. Blu-ray discs exist in single-sided formats, from single-layer up to quad-layer, storing 25 gigabytes per layer. Writable Blu-ray discs also exist in triple-layer 100GB and quad-layer 128GB formats. These require BDXL-compatible drives for writing and reading. Expansion slots, when available on the motherboard, are locations where you can add additional storage capabilities. In this video, you learned that Internal hard drives provide non-volatile, long-term data storage, fast access time, and fast data transfer rates. SATA drives still dominate today's desktop and laptop market, providing larger volumes of less expensive data storage. SSDs comprised of non-volatile flash memory provide fast data access but are more expensive than traditional SATA drives. Optical drives provide portable non-volatile data storage. And Blu-ray discs meet the demands for high-quality video and audio and can be copyright protected by region. Welcome to Display and Sound Cards. After watching this video, you will be able to define what a video card does, explore the function of sound cards, and evaluate the use of a MIDI controller. A video card is either an expansion card in an empty slot on the motherboard or a chip built into a system's motherboard. It allows the computer to send graphical information to a video display device, such as a monitor, TV, or projector. A video card is alternatively known as a display adapter, graphics card, video adapter, video board, or video controller. 
A graphics processing unit, or GPU, is a specialized processor originally designed to accelerate graphics rendering. GPUs can process many pieces of data simultaneously, making them useful for machine learning, video editing, and gaming applications. Although GPUs are normally associated with the realistic graphics found in top-quality video games, several industries rely on their powerful processing capabilities. An audio card is also known as a sound card. It's an integrated circuit that generates an audio signal and sends it to a computer's speakers. The sound card can accept an analog sound, as from a microphone or audio tape, and convert it to digital data that can be stored in an audio file. Conversely, it can accept digitized audio signals, as from an audio file, and convert them to analog signals that can be played on the computer's speakers. On personal computers, the functions of a sound card are usually directly integrated into the motherboard. But for users who desire higher quality audio, a sound card is a separate circuit board that is plugged into the motherboard. A MIDI controller is a simple way to sequence music and play virtual instruments on your PC. It works by sending MIDI, Musical Instrument Digital Interface Data, to a computer or synthesizer, which then interprets the signal and produces a sound. MIDI controllers are frequently used by musicians. In this video, you learned that video cards, also known as graphics processing units or GPUs, display data. Audio cards process sounds input into the computer and send signals to internal and external speakers. For most users, integrated audio is all that's needed for meetings and listening to podcasts, videos, and music. Dedicated sound cards allow for more than one input, enabling the computer to process Musical Instrument Digital Interface, or MIDI, controller input. And musicians use specialized MIDI sound cards to record sounds from digitally enabled musical instruments onto computers and process those sounds as output. Welcome to Network Interface Cards. After watching this video, you will be able to define a network interface card or NIC, explore the types of NIC, and apply your understanding of how a modem functions. A network interface card or NIC is a hardware component without which a computer cannot connect to a network. It is a circuit board installed in a computer that provides a dedicated network connection to the computer. The card receives network signals and translates them into data that the computer displays. Originally, network controllers were available only as expansion cards that could be plugged into a computer port, router, or USB device. A NIC, or Network Interface Card, provides a connection to a network, usually the Internet. Onboard NICs are built into the motherboard, and add-on NICs fit into an open expansion slot on the motherboard. In terms of function, speed, and quality, there's no significant difference between the types of NICs. Wireless NICs rely on an antenna to communicate through radio frequency waves on a Wi-Fi connection. Wired NICs rely on an input jack and a wired LAN technology, such as fast Ethernet. On a basic level, your modem gives you access to the Internet. From Wi-Fi routers to mobile devices, the components that make up your home network all speak different digital languages, but your modem is the translator. It translates the signals coming from your Internet Service Provider, or ISP, into an Internet connection for your Wi-Fi router to broadcast. The modem receives information from your ISP through the phone lines, optical fiber, or coaxial cable in your home, depending on your service provider, and converts it into a digital signal. Your router and ISP can't communicate directly because they speak different languages, or rather, they transmit different signal types. So the modem digitizes those signals and sends the now usable signals to the router. Before you know it, you're online. In this video, you learned that a network interface card, or NIC, is a hardware component that can be built in or added to a motherboard. 
A NIC connects a system to a network, often the internet. NICs can be wired or wireless. Onboard network cards are built into the motherboard, whereas add-on cards are placed into an expansion slot on the motherboard. And a modem transforms digital information from your computer into analog signals that can be transmitted to a network, and it translates incoming analog signals back into digital data that your computer can understand. Welcome to Cooling and Fans. After watching this video, you will be able to define system cooling, explore the methods of cooling a computer system, and evaluate the effectiveness of liquid cooling. Computers generate heat. Excessive heat can damage internal components. You should never operate a computer without ensuring there is a proper cooling system, air or liquid, installed. Central Processing Unit, or CPU, coolers are designed to dissipate heat produced by the processor that sits at the heart of your PC. The fans, radiators, and other elements in these cooling components allow the accumulated heat energy to flow away from vital internal parts. There are many cooling methods available. Passive cooling slows the speed at which a component, such as the processor, is operating. This approach contrasts with active cooling, which involves using powered fans instead. Fans in the computer case draw cool air through front vents and expel warm air through the back. In this process, the fans are used to dissipate warm air from delicate internal components. In forced convection, the hot air around an object, such as the central processing unit or CPU, is moved away by a fan blowing air across a heat sink. Thermal paste and a base plate rest between the water block and CPU to help improve the heat transfer properties. One approach to system cooling is to use a heat sink. First, add a heat sink compound to fill gaps between the CPU or central processing unit and other heat generating components and the mechanical heat sink. Then place the heat sink, which is a passive component made of a conductive metal, over the CPU. Now excess heat is drawn from the CPU through the heat sink to its fins, where a fan blows air to dissipate the excess heat. This method dissipates warm air before it can harm components inside the computer. Liquid cooling works very much like a radiator in your car or home. It's quieter and more efficient than using fans to cool your system. Liquid cooling circulates liquid through water blocks, which rest on top of the chip that is being cooled. The relatively cooler liquid circulating through the water block pulls the heat away from the chip, cooling it. The heated fluid is pumped to the radiator where fans expose it to cold air. The recooled fluid is then returned to the water block to be heated and the cycle repeats. Sometimes liquid cooling is a necessity. PCs used for high-end gaming and places where the ambient temperature is high require augmented cooling measures. Liquid-based cooling methods help in these cases. In this video, you learned that System cooling refers to one of several methods of keeping the internal components of a computer from overheating. Those methods include use of a heat sink and thermal compound, the transfer of heat away from internal components by convection, the use of fans, and liquid cooling. And liquid cooling is quieter and more efficient than fans, but it costs more and comes with the risk of water leaking inside your computer. Welcome to installing the Microsoft Windows 10 operating system. After watching this video, you will be able to list Windows Operating System installation prerequisites and identify Microsoft Windows 10 Operating System installation steps. Before you begin the installation process, you'll want to confirm the base Windows Operating System is available on the computer's hard drive. You'll also want to connect the computer to an electrical source. Let's get started. First, select the installation language, time, and currency format 
and keyboard or other input language settings and click Next. Then click Install Now. Skip the activation step by clicking I don't have a product key and click Next. You will need a Windows activation key to receive operating system security updates and bug fixes. Select Windows 10 Pro to include all the operating system features and click Next. Click the checkbox to accept the license terms and click Next. Select Custom Install Windows Only Advanced. This option installs Windows for the first time or removes all previously installed operating systems. Accept the default disk partitioning settings and click Next. Now, you have to wait for this part of the installation process to complete. The computer may restart at the end of this process. Scroll the drop-down list to locate the region where the computer will be used. In this demo, we select the United States as the region and click Yes. Now, select your keyboard layout. We'll choose the U.S. keyboard and click Yes. Bypass adding a second keyboard layout and click Skip. Next, you'll choose between setting up Windows for an organization or for personal use. In this video, we'll select Setup for personal use and click Next. Now, you can associate a Microsoft account with the computer, but we're going to bypass this step and select Offline Account. Then, click Next. Windows will remind you to opt in for a Windows account to access apps and services. For this installation, select Limited Experience to stay offline and click Next. Now, type a username that specifies who will use the PC and click Next. Create a password for the user. In this demo, we set password spelled PA$ W0RD as the password for the account. In real life, however, follow good password practices to create passwords that are not easily guessed. And click Next. You'll type the password again to confirm the password and click Next. But don't worry, if you forget the computer's password, you can recover use of the machine by answering the security questions. Using the drop-down options, create three security questions for the account and click Next each time. Now, set the toggle switches to Yes to permit Microsoft capabilities. These capabilities include speech recognition, device location, linking and typing, access to the user's geographic location, diagnostic data, and tailored experiences. Click Accept. Microsoft offers the option to synchronize activity history across devices, such as sharing information between a workstation at the office and a workstation at home. Click Yes to accept this feature. Next, you'll see an opportunity to enable the use of Cortana, Microsoft's digital assistant. You can click Not Now or Accept. After completing the prior installation steps, your workstation will take several minutes to complete the remainder of the steps. Then the workstation will shut down and restart. The next time you access the computer, you'll enter the username and password you specified during installation. And congratulations! After logging back in, you'll see the default Windows 10 desktop. In this video, you learned that before beginning the installation process, confirm that the computer is connected to an electrical power source. During the installation process, you may need to confirm which version of Windows you are installing. By selecting Offline Account, you can bypass associating your Microsoft account with the computer. You'll create a username and password and configure three security questions and their answers as part of your setup process. And after installation, you'll need to log in using the username and password you previously specified. Welcome to Microsoft Windows 10 Operating System Configuration. After watching this video, you will be able to describe how to create user accounts, and use the Settings app to configure frequently updated operating system settings. Most operating systems allow the configuration of multiple levels of users with specific security settings. These include Administrator with full permissions, Standard User with most permissions except for system configuration changes, and Other Users with limited access. In this course, we will assume you have Administrator permissions. 
Depending on the organization's rules, you might want to add one or more additional user accounts that do not include administrator permissions. This task is usually more conveniently completed before delivering the computer to the user. On the Settings window, select Accounts. Follow the on-screen prompts to add additional other users. You can even add users who do not have Microsoft accounts. You'll add the user's name, password, and answers to three security questions. Select Next, and the user account is automatically added. You'll want to show your user how to sign into their machine using their ID and password or PIN. Some organizations may have protocols for the user to change their password. Then, begin adjusting operating system settings with the user present. As an IT support person, you may prefer to unbox the computer before its delivery to the user. You'll use the Settings app, a central location for many Windows configuration and management tasks, to personalize and customize the computer. One of the fastest ways to access Settings is to select the Windows Start button and select the gear icon, which opens the Settings app. The Settings app is also hub for many user-facing operating system settings. Communication protocols enable computers to communicate with each other, including internet communications, document sharing, and more. Standard protocols include Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, which displays web pages, Transmission Control Protocol, known as TCP, a network protocol that enables software applications to communicate with each other, User Data Protocol, or UDP, which helps keep communications from chaining out, kind of like a dropped phone call. Internet Relay Chat, known as IRC, a historical text messaging platform, and communication permissions that allow computer users to talk to each other. The first question almost every user asks is, am I connected? To join a wireless network, first select the wireless icon, then select your wireless network and enter the password. Your mobile devices can also use your computing device's internet connection as a mobile hotspot. Simply select the mobile hotspot icon within your wireless settings, then on the mobile device, select your PC's mobile hotspot name. In addition, you can set connectivity using the Settings app. Select Network and Internet. Depending on how you opened the Settings app, the left pane may or may not display. Both views enable you to verify the computer's current connection status. To discover new networks, select Show Available Networks. To connect to a different network, select Connect and enter the network security key. Then select Next and the workstation automatically adds and, if needed, connects to the network. View the status to confirm the workstation's network connection. You can also select the Wi-Fi icon on the taskbar to view current connections and add new connections. Here's how to adjust monitor display settings. Using the Settings app, select System. Scroll the display options to display the screen brightness, scale and layout, and screen orientation. If starting from Settings, select System. On the System window, scroll the left pane and select Sound. Here, you can choose your speakers, set the default speaker volume, and set the microphone settings. To add a printer or scanner, on the Settings app window, select Devices. Then select Printers and Scanners, and existing printers and scanners are displayed. If needed, you can select the Plus Add a Printer or Scanner, where you'll see additional connection options. Review the time and language settings with your user. Here, you can set region, language, and speech settings. If you have a user who wants to use speech recognition, you'll need to set up this capability here in addition to configuring ease of access accessibility settings. On the Settings window, select Ease of Access to configure capabilities that help accommodate the needs of blind, colorblind, low vision, and deaf users who need computing enhancements. In this video, you learned that some organizations may require setting up additional user accounts that do not have administrator capabilities. You can use the Settings app to configure regional preferences, printers, networks, video, audio, accessibility options, and more. And ease of access capabilities accommodate the needs of blind, colorblind, low vision, and deaf users.
Welcome to Microsoft Windows 10 Management and Performance. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe disk configuration and management Explain storage and file and folder management basics Explain how to access the health report And describe how to locate system maintenance Preferred disk configurations vary by operating system platform. Windows computers generally use FAT32, NTFS, or HPFS configurations. Linux workstations use EXT4, and Mac workstations use HFS+. Storage management goals are about optimizing performance, minimizing data loss, and maximizing disk use. You can quickly access storage management options via settings and storage. But remember, always back up your data before changing your disk configuration. Storage management capabilities include viewing storage usage on other drives, changing the storage destination, managing storage spaces, optimizing hard drives, and viewing data backup options. Disk management enables hard drive formatting and partitioning. Here's how. In the Windows taskbar box, type Disk Management and open the Disk Management app. Use the Disk Management app to perform disk formatting, partitioning, compression, and cleanup. To see the rules for how files are indexed, within the Settings app, select Search and select Searching Windows. Here you can set rules for how users find their files and which folders to exclude when users search for files. With the rules set, to search files and folders, open File Explorer. Within File Explorer, the ribbon bar displays commands to perform tasks such as opening, editing, copying, and moving, known as pasting and deleting files. Primarily managed through File Explorer, your hard drive configuration determines the allowable number of files and folders. The average user will not encounter limitations. Now, in the Windows taskbar box, type File Explorer options to open File Explorer. Here you can set file and folder options to open folders within an existing or in a new window, to use a single click or a double click action to open a file, and to display recently accessed files and folders. A user might not need a program or a program may not be permitted on the user's computer based on company policy. You can select settings and then apps and in the Apps and Feature section, locate the program and right-click on the program to select the Uninstall option. Most software originates from online sources, so before downloading software, verify that the website is legitimate. In most instances, to install the software, click the designated .exe file. Windows will request your permission to install the software. Simply follow the manufacturer's installation instructions. Now, Windows manages most operating system software updates automatically. To check the update status, using the Settings app, select Update and Security where you can view your Windows update status. If your user mentions that they're having issues with the system performance, open the Settings app, enter the word Performance, and select Device Performance and Health. When viewing Device Performance and Health, the Health Report displays the status of Windows Time Service, storage capacity, battery life, and apps and software. If needed, use the Settings app, search for System Maintenance, and select the second option to troubleshoot and help prevent computer problems. Then, follow the on-screen instructions to help maintain the computer. In this video, you learned that Windows computers generally use FAT32, NTFS, or HPFS configurations, while Linux workstations use EXT4 and Mac workstations use HFS+. The Disk Management app enables disk formatting, partitioning, compression, and cleanup. You can go to Settings and select Storage to change storage destinations, optimize drives, set access data backup options, and more. And you can use File Explorer to set folder options, such as whether to open folders within an existing or new window, whether to single-click or double-click to open a file, and whether to display recently accessed files for quick access. You also learned that the Health Report displays the status of the Windows Time Service, Storage Capacity, 
battery life and apps and software. And system maintenance provides troubleshooting capabilities to help keep your computer running smoothly. Welcome to Managing Files and Folders. After watching this video, you will be able to define files and folders, explore the basic options for files and folders, and evaluate security permissions for files and folders. A computer file is a resource for recording data in a storage device primarily identified by its file name. Just as words can be written to paper, so can data be written to a computer file. A file is created first by writing data into temporary memory, or RAM. Saving data involves using permanent storage, usually a hard disk drive. All files are either binary or text in nature. While text files contain only textual data that can be read easily, binary files contain textual and custom binary data. Data in binary form can be interpreted by supporting programs, but will show up as garbled text of ones and zeros in a text editor or word processing program. Files and folders have similar naming rules. Both should be named so the file or folder you want is easy to find. Names should be short but descriptive, 25 characters or less. Avoid using special characters or spaces in a file name. Use capitals and underscores instead of periods, spaces, or slashes. And to make names easier to remember, you can use a date format such as four-digit year, two-digit month, and two-digit day, and or include a version number. A folder is a container for data written to disk. While drives store files, folders are used to organize those files by creating distinct logical areas with different security privileges. Folders separate the operating system, or OS, and application files from user data. Folders also organize user data belonging to different accounts. In Windows, there's no limit to the number of folders within folders or subfolders you can create. A file path is also known as the path name. It's the precise location of a computer, file, device, folder, or web page. For example, see Windows System32 tells the user that the System32 folder is in the Windows folder in the C drive. In Windows, you can choose from these commands. Edit to create an updated file or folder. Save to preserve a copy of the file or folder to disk. Cut to place a file or folder temporarily onto the clipboard, and from there the file or folder can be copied or moved to a new location. Copy, similar to the cut command, also places a file or folder temporarily on the clipboard, and from there the file or folder can be copied to a new location. And move to place a file or folder in a new location. An extension is the final part of the file name that follows a period. For example, letter.docx. The extension .docx indicates the file letter is a MS Word document. The file extension shows the file type and which applications can be associated with different actions, such as open, edit, and print. In this case, the related application is MS Word. Additional file extensions can be researched using the Internet. To create a file, right-click inside a folder or on the desktop. Select New, and then select the application you want. But you'll have to name the file to complete this brief process. Opening a file is just as simple and quick. Either double-click it or right-click it, select Open With, and select the appropriate application. When you create a file, you'll need to choose where you want to save it, for example, the desktop. To do so, select File, then Save As. Choose the location for the new file, and once you've saved a file to the proper location, just select the Save icon or File, then Save. To open or launch a program, just double-click the icon associated with it. Another option is to select the icon and press Enter. Deleted items are kept in the recycle bin and can be recovered by right-clicking an item in the recycle bin and selecting Restore. A file or folder typically can't be recovered if the recycle bin has been emptied or if you press Shift plus Delete when removing something. 
there's no recycling for items on flash drives or network shares, although a server administrator might be able to recover those files. To select multiple files and folders, click and drag the mouse to highlight them, press the Control key and select items individually, or press the Shift key and select the first and last file you wish to affect. All files between the first and last selected will become highlighted. To find folders and files, follow these steps. Right-click the Start button and type the item name in the search field. Or use Cortana to find matching files, programs, apps, messages, and web pages on your system. Alternatively, you can use Windows Explorer to search by file name, file contents, file date, or size by selecting the folder icon on the taskbar. Windows Explorer, or Explorer, is a tool that you can use to manage your files on OneDrive and your PC. To rename a file or folder, right-click it and select Rename. Do not change the extension unless you mean to do so, as that can render the file inoperable. The File Properties dialog box has options for a file or folder. To access the properties of a file or folder, right-click it and select Properties. The window will give you information about and additional control over a file or folder. For security purposes, files and folders have attributes that can be set to read-only, system, hidden, or archive. Read-only allows you to view but not edit a file or folder. The read-only attribute prevents changes from being saved back to the file. You will be prompted to create another file containing the modified data. The system attribute specifies that the file should not be accessible to ordinary users. A Windows system file is any file with the system attribute turned on. Windows depends upon system files to operate properly. The hidden attribute specifies whether the file is visible in the default view. It is possible to adjust Windows to display hidden files and folders, though. And the archive attribute shows whether a file has been changed since the last backup. Compression, or zipping, saves disk space by reducing the size of an item. Here's how to do it. Right-click the file or folder, select Send To, and then Compressed or Zipped Folder. A new zipped folder with the same name is created in the same location. You can use encryption on files and folders for security purposes. Right-click the folder or file you want to encrypt and select Properties. Select Advanced. Under Compress or Encrypt Attributes, check the box for Encrypt Contents to Secure Data. Then click OK and click Apply. Setting permissions is another means to control what can be done with a file or folder. To change these permissions, right-click any folder or file and select Properties. Then switch to the Security tab and make your selection. In this video, you learned that files are organized data in a specific format. That data may exist in memory, a permanent storage capacity, or both. Folders are digital containers for files. Folders are used primarily for file storage and organization. Files have numerous extensions that identify the file type and which program or programs can open them. Files and folders have a variety of options to manage them. And files and folders have native encryption options in Windows for security purposes. Welcome to Evaluating Computer Performance and Storage. After watching this video, you will be able to Identify the four key processor performance criteria. Evaluate random access memory, known as RAM availability. Assess a computer's storage capacity. And evaluate network speeds and identify common connectivity issues. The following four components contribute to performance. The processor's speed, the number of cores, the bus types and speeds, and the presence of cache. Processor speed, a primary computing measurement, is measured based on electrical clock speed in units of time referred to as hertz. Older devices measured processor speed in megahertz, but today's computing resources measure in gigahertz and even greater speeds. Faster processor speeds usually mean faster task completion. 
Cores located in the center of the CPU can process data together or separately. While current CPUs can have up to 64 cores, most processors offer between 2 and 8 cores. Core speeds, called clock speeds, are based on the speed the CPU runs internal processes and accesses its cache. Next, processors can have multiple cores. The presence of more than one processor or core on the same physical platform is known as symmetric multiprocessing, or SMP. Multiple cores can process tasks together or independently, and many current personal computers offer four or more cores. More cores can equal faster computer performance, but that outcome is task-dependent. Next, buses located on the CPU's perimeter act as the data highway from the processor to the components. Historically, computers had three bus types. The address bus, which transports memory addresses from the processor to memory and sends and receives memory address information from the CPU, primary storage, and input-output devices. The data bus, which transports data to and from the processor, the CPU, and input-output devices. And the control bus, which transports control signals from the processor to memory and input-output devices. New technology such as QuickPath Interconnect, PCI and PCI Express, HyperTransport, and others are replacing traditional buses. When available on the CPU, cache memory buffers information and speeds tasks, which can help offset slower processor speeds. Many desktop computers and many laptops support traditional hard disk drives, solid state drives, portable flash memory, and hybrid hard drives. In this chart, you can see that solid state drives are the fastest storage option. Hybrid storage drives new to the market promise greater capacity while maintaining speed. To evaluate disk storage capacity and availability in Windows 10, on the taskbar, type this PC and press Enter. Then click Open. The window for this PC displays, and within Devices and Drives, view the available disk space. Next, Random Access Memory, known as RAM, provides temporary memory that enables computers to install software, display websites, display files, and process edits for files in memory before those changes are saved to storage. Upgradable on some computers, RAM is currently available in gigabyte increments. When machines run out of RAM, you'll experience screens that freeze or stop working, browser tabs that error and close, out of memory and other on screen errors, corrupted files, computer beeping sounds, and other errors, including the infamous blue screen of death. When RAM errors happen, you'll want to check RAM usage. On Windows 10 computers, in the search box on the taskbar, type Task Manager. Select the Performance tab and view the Memory section. You'll also want to check the computer for hardware failures. In the Windows taskbar search field, type Windows Memory Diagnostic. Follow the prompts to run the diagnostics. When the diagnostic tool runs, hardware-related memory errors, if they exist, are displayed on screen. If indicated, upgrade or replace the RAM. Network speed, known also as throughput rate, is commonly measured in bits per second, although sometimes you will see measurements in bytes per second. Most network processing is measured in megabits per second or gigabits per second. A speed test is one of the fastest ways to determine connectivity. Open a web browser, search for speed test from your internet provider or from a trusted organization, such as Ookla at speedtest.net. Follow the on-screen instructions to test and view your results. What if the machine is not connected to the internet and you want to determine if the machine is connected to a wireless network? Click the wireless icon in the taskbar tray, click Properties to view your wireless network connection and scroll to the Properties heading and view your link speed. If the computer is connected to the network using an Ethernet cable, you can check its connectivity via Ethernet settings. In the Windows Taskbar search box, type Ethernet settings and click Open. Scroll the Settings window to the Properties section and view your link speed. In this video, you learned that evaluating processors is a four-part process based on the processor speed the number of cores, 
bus types and speeds, and available cache. Determining used and available storage space is a fast process on Windows computers. When evaluating RAM, check its usage and check the computer for hardware errors. An online speed test is a fast network speed assessment method. And a computer's Ethernet settings is a quick method of checking a connected computer's network access and speed. Welcome to Workstation Evaluation and Setup. After watching this video, you will be able to identify the user's computing needs, evaluate computers based on their hardware specifications, and perform basic hardware setup tasks. Let's begin evaluating the user's workstation requirements. First, identify the user's job location. Does the user work on-site at an office, work from home, work mobile from a job site or a client site, or work at multiple locations. Once you know where the user works, what are their workspace conditions? Do they have access to a desk and chair? How many electrical connections are available? What kind of lighting does the workspace have? How will the user secure the computer? And finally, does the user have accessibility needs that require additional hardware? Today's work relies on connectivity. If the job function is highly confidential or is moving large amounts of data, a wired network connection might be required. Most users can use a Wi-Fi connection, but users who are away from an office and need to maintain connectivity will need access to a cellular network. Next, will your user store their data on their local machine, within an on-site network of servers, or using hybrid cloud? Applications have memory and storage requirements. Based on the cumulative number of applications, what are the storage, RAM, connectivity, and backup requirements? To meet company or job requirements, or to accommodate user accessibility requirements, users might need peripheral devices, including additional keyboards, mice, monitors, speakers, headphones, microphones, and scanners, among others. You'll need to know what connection types these peripherals require before shopping for the user's new computer. Desktop units generally provide the most versatile and powerful computing solutions. However, laptops are powerful enough for most tasks, including some big data-related tasks. For users who work for multiple locations or work primarily with cloud-based applications, laptops and two-in-one laptop-tablet combinations often are more appropriate and cost-effective. This table displays some minimum specifications you'll want to keep in mind when shopping for your user's new workstation. In most instances, 16 gigabytes of RAM is adequate. However, power users may need an upgradable solution, and web and cloud-based users may be able to work with a minimum of only 8 gigabytes of RAM. Users who work with big data and graphic-intensive design processes usually need a machine with a more powerful and possibly upgradable GPU and storage, adequate ports and peripheral connections, connectivity options, and the ability to physically secure and lock the computer. Purchasing decisions then weigh four important considerations. User requirements, business requirements, available technology, and the company's budget. After the purchasing decision is made and your user's new workstation arrives, the following six-step process facilitates successful workstation setup. First, reassess your user's physical environment. Next, follow the instructions to unbox the workstation and any peripherals. Then, follow recommended cable management practices. Connect the workstation and peripherals to the appropriate electrical outlet or a power strip. Recheck the user's ergonomics and complete the workstation setup by configuring the workstation hardware and software. When you arrive with the new workstation, begin by assessing the user's environment, including the sturdiness of the desk and chair, the availability of work-appropriate lighting, electrical outlet access and outlet amperage, and the ability to physically secure the computer. When unboxing, read the instructions and follow the manufacturer's practices. 
As you unbox the equipment, move boxes and packing materials into a safe location out of the user's workspace. A part of environmental safety, cable management also reduces support calls. Here are three easy to remember practices. Install shorter cable lengths when possible. If you have an extra long cable, loop the cable and use a zip tie to secure the cable into its shorter length. Securely attach and identify each cable as you work and collect and tie multiple cables together out of the way of the user. Electrical management is about safety for you and your user. Label each electrical cable connected to each computing device for peripherals. Then verify that the electrical connections are away from the user and are accessible for later IT support. Connect power supplies to their assigned wall or power strip location, and remember to note the wall outlet number. New computers often require ergonomic adjustments so that the user can work comfortably. Check the user's foot placement, monitor height, arm placement, shoulder placement, lighting, and cord and cable placement. Next, it's time for workstation setup. Power on the workstation and peripherals. Then set up the user's operating system options, including user logon credentials, keyboard options, monitor resolution, printer connections, sound options, security options, and network connections. Next, select the user's default browser. Uninstall unnecessary software. Install and configure additional productivity software, and if the user requests, modify their desktop productivity pane and set up backup options. In this video, you learned that job needs, location, connectivity, and accessibility are essential user considerations. Ranking user requirements, the company's requirements, current technology offerings, and the company's budget are factors that determine which device is purchased. And workstation setup can be summarized as a six-step process. Welcome to Screen Captures and Tools. After watching this video, you will be able to describe three keyboard commands you can use to create screen captures on a Mac OS computer, identify three keyboard commands you can use to create screen captures on a Windows 10 computer, and name two keyboard commands used when capturing screens using a Chromebook. There are three ways to capture a screen on a Mac OS computer. Command plus shift plus three, command plus shift plus four, and command plus shift plus five. To capture an entire screen, select command plus shift plus three. To capture just part of a screen, select command plus shift plus four. You'll also need to apply a drag and release motion when you've included the screen portion that you wish to capture. Note that these first two screen capture options automatically save images in a PNG format to the desktop folder. Options and capabilities for Command plus Shift plus 4 include the following. To create a screenshot with a white border around the window with a bit of a drop shadow, press and release the spacebar and release the mouse or trackpad. To adjust the location of the screen capture area, Press and hold the spacebar and drag the capture area to where it's needed. Then release the mouse or trackpad when the screen capture area is in the correct location. To adjust the bottom edge of the capture, hold down the shift key as you move the bottom edge to the desired location, then release the mouse or trackpad. To capture part of a screen or an entire screen as a photo or video, select Command plus Shift plus 5. The displayed options enable you to select the entire screen, a window, or a part of the screen and capture it as an image or a video. After recording, select the location to save your image or a video capture. Microsoft Windows 10 provides the following screen capture capabilities. To capture an entire screen, select Windows key plus print screen. The Windows key may have the Windows logo or say Win short for Windows. After you use this keyboard shortcut, Windows automatically saves your image in a PNG format to the Pictures slash Screenshots folder. To capture only your active window, select Alt plus Print Screen. 
The screen capture exists on the clipboard. Next, open an image editor to view and save the image. The default screen image format is PNG. For more screen capture options, select Windows key plus Shift plus S. This keyboard shortcut opens the Snip and Sketch tool. The displayed options enable you to select the entire screen, a part of the screen, or your active window. To capture an entire screen, select Control plus Show Windows. Note that the Show Windows key looks like a rectangle with two lines on the right side. To capture a partial screen using the keyboard, select Control plus Shift plus Show Windows. Click and drag the crosshair icon until the part of the screen you want to capture is highlighted, then release the mouse or trackpad. Note that each of these screen capture methods saves your image in a PNG format. Depending on the installed Chrome operating system version, your image might display in a pop-up window. Clicking on the notification will open the Chrome OS Files app. But if you don't see your image display, all screenshots are saved as PNG files and stored in the Downloads or Google Drive folder. In this video, you learned that each operating system platform provides full and partial screen capturing capabilities through keyboard commands. The default image file format for all three platforms is a PNG file format. And the OSs differ in how they save screen captures. Mac OS saves images by default to the desktop. Windows 10 automatically saves images to the Screenshots folder. And Chrome saves images in the Downloads folder or to the online Google Drive of the logged in account holder. Welcome to Introduction to Troubleshooting. After watching this video, you will be able to describe basic computer support concepts, describe troubleshooting procedures, leverage sources of support, and summarize the CompTIA troubleshooting model. Effective computer support involves three basic concepts, determining the problem, examining the problem, and solving the problem. It's hard to fix something if you don't know what's wrong, so you first need to determine the problem. Ask users questions and discover if the hardware or software has been changed in any way. Next, try to reproduce the problem and note symptoms. If there is more than one problem, then you should address each problem separately. Do not let yourself get overwhelmed or off track. Do what you can to collect information about the reported problem, including common symptoms. Once you've determined the problem, examine it more closely. The better you understand the problem, the easier it will be to choose the best solution. Here are some tips for examining the problem. Consider the simplest explanations, such as improper settings or even incorrect use of the hardware or software. For example, the source of the problem may be as simple as the power cord being unplugged. Consider all the possible causes of the problem and address them one at a time. Try different troubleshooting methods until you find one that works. And once you have a theory, test it. And if necessary, bring the problem to a higher level support person or another department. Okay, now that you are familiar with the problem, you can solve it. At this stage, you should create a plan for addressing the problem and document the process for carrying it out. Documentation will help you track the steps that you follow and how effective they are. Once you have decided if you will solve the problem by repair, replacement, or both, carry out the solution. Let your documentation guide you so that you do not repeat steps. Record each step you take and include the results it produces. After you've carried out your solution, confirm that the system is fully operational, then update your documentation. Troubleshooting is a systematic approach to problem solving that is often used to find and correct issues with computers. The first step in troubleshooting is gathering information about the problem. Identify any undesired behavior or lack of expected functionality. Other steps in the troubleshooting process include duplicating the problem, triaging the problem, identifying symptoms, researching an online knowledge base, establishing a plan of action, evaluating a theory and solutions, 
implementing the solution, and verifying system functionality. To restore functionality, check the following. Check for signs of activity, such as LEDs, the power light, and the typical sounds computers make when running. Check for the cause of two or more beeps. This step requires using the internet. Check the monitor controls and power if the screen is dark. And check connections on peripheral devices. Many issues occur regularly on a personal computer. Some examples include the following. Loose cables or connections, power issues, physical damage, boot up problems at the BIOS level, or during the power on system test, or POST. POST is a program which runs on startup and verifies that everything the computer needs to properly boot up is there. Blue or black screen, operating system or OS problems, and software errors. Fortunately, many of these problems have simple solutions that you can quickly implement. If you need additional support, consider consulting the Internet. A search engine such as Google, Bing, or DuckDuckGo can be an invaluable tool in your tech support kit. You can also look for online support such as driver downloads as well as technical support community groups. Often, manufacturer-provided documentation is also available online. If you cannot find the help you need online, consider contacting the manufacturer's technical support. You can often find the contact information in the computer's manual. Before contacting support, ensure you have all documentation on the machine. You will likely be asked to provide them with the name of the hardware or software currently experiencing the problem, the device model and serial number, the date of purchase, and an explanation of the problem. The industry standard troubleshooting model comes from the Computing Technology Industry Association, or CompTIA. The CompTIA model includes the following steps. Identify the problem. In this step, you gather information, duplicate the problem if possible, question users, identify symptoms, determine if anything has changed, and approach multiple problems individually. Research the knowledge base or internet if applicable. Establish a theory of probable cause. In this step, you question the obvious, consider multiple approaches, and divide and conquer. Test the theory to determine the cause. Once the theory is confirmed, determine the next steps to resolve the problem. Or, if the theory is not confirmed, establish a new theory or escalate the problem. Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and identify potential effects. Implement the solution or escalate as necessary. Verify full system functionality and, if applicable, implement preventative measures. And finally, document findings or lessons learned, as well as actions and outcomes. In this video, you learned that computer support concepts are specific and sequential. Troubleshooting procedures often begin with looking for common problems. Sources of support include online resources and the manufacturer's technical support and the Computing Technology Industry Association, or CompTIA, has the industry standard troubleshooting model. Welcome to Advanced Microsoft Windows 10 Management and Utilities. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe essential workstation management tasks. Describe the purpose of drivers and how to update them. And identify five useful Windows utilities. Policy management applies rules for passwords, password retries, allowed programs, and other settings specific to the machine or group. Here's how to access policy management. Type group policy in the taskbar search box. The Edit Group Policy Control Panel option displays, click Open. Select the User Configuration Settings to view its details and edit policy settings. Windows automatically schedules processes and allocates resources most of the time uneventfully. Sometimes, though, a task might stall and you need to end the task and stop the process. Open Windows Task Manager to view apps and their background processes. 
When you locate the troublesome software or process, select End Task to stop the process. Perhaps you want to verify the installation and performance of a new hard drive, or that the computer recognizes memory, or recognizes another computer component, such as an add-on card, which includes interfaces. In the Windows Taskbar field, type Device Manager. Select Open to launch the Device Manager app. Scroll the list and you'll see the computer's hardware, components, and interfaces, such as the Intel Management Engine Interface, number one. Double-click to view the interface's properties. Here, on the General tab, you can confirm that the interface is working properly. You can also view events, evaluate resources, set power management options, update driver software, which works with the computer for external capabilities, update firmware, which is onboard device software, and view additional device details. Windows uses RAM for frequent memory tasks and virtual memory for less frequent tasks. If the computer's performance is slow or the computer is displaying low on virtual memory errors, it's time to take action. To evaluate memory performance based on the installed RAM hardware, open Task Manager and view the memory resource usage. If needed, run the Windows Memory Diagnostic. Sometimes an installed program needs more virtual memory. To manage virtual memory, select Settings and About, then begin typing the word Performance. Select the option to Adjust the Appearance and Performance of Windows. The Performance Options window displays. In the Virtual Memory section, select Change. In most instances, Windows automatically adjusts virtual memory. If you do find that you need to adjust virtual memory, such as for a memory-intensive application, this is the Windows operating system location where you can adjust those settings. Service management automatically handles background tasks. However, sometimes a program just won't close, or perhaps you see a program using so much memory that other programs can't run. Service management enables you to troubleshoot and manage these situations. Capabilities include stopping the service, restarting the service, running a program, taking no action, and restarting the computer. Drivers are software components that enable communications between the operating system and the device. If a device suddenly stops working aside from a power issue or other hardware issue, it's possible that the driver is outdated. Perhaps a printer suddenly stopped working because the printer needs a new driver to communicate with the computer. To update or configure a new driver, access Windows Device Manager, Locate your device and right-click to view the device's details. If needed, select Update Driver. Utilities help you administer and manage the operating system. Windows Diagnostics locates hardware memory errors. Windows Performance Monitor provides performance details for processes, applications, and hardware. Windows Event Viewer provides detailed activity logs to diagnose errors, installation problems, and other issues. Windows Registry Editor enables the correction of embedded software registration information, such as the disk location for a program's files. And Windows Task Manager enables the viewing and management of machine tasks that help you troubleshoot errors and enhance performance. In this video, you learned that policy management decisions enhance security. You can use Windows Task Manager to view apps and their background processes and select End Task to stop software processes. Windows Device Manager helps you verify that computer devices, components, and interfaces are working correctly. Service Management automatically manages background tasks and enables advanced troubleshooting of performance issues. And five useful Windows utilities include Memory Diagnostics, Performance Manager, Event Viewer, Registry Editor, and Task Manager. Welcome to Introduction to Business Continuity Principles. After watching this video, you will be able to describe the importance of business continuity, evaluate a fault-tolerant system, and explain the importance of disaster recovery plans. In today's technology-reliant world, 
You must understand some basic risk management strategies to deal with disruptions so productivity issues are minimized. That's where something known as business continuity comes in. Business continuity is having a plan to deal with difficult situations so an organization can continue to function with as little disruption as possible. Whether it's a business or charity, all organizations must know how they can keep going under any circumstances. Business continuity is built upon fault tolerance. That's the ability of a system to continue operating without interruption when one or more of its components fail. Fault tolerance anticipates disruption and develops contingency plans. Fault tolerance designs systems without single points of failure, so if one part of a system goes down, it doesn't take down the entire system. The cost of a system outage is a crucial consideration of a business continuity plan. So is having a strategy to minimize the effects of system outages. This is known as redundancy. The broad categories of redundancy include system, network, and hardware. System redundancy augments the fault tolerance levels of the existing system. Network redundancy allows data to be rerouted to an alternate path until all systems are functional. And hardware redundancy serves as a solution to a disabled server. Redundancy, or replication, refers to the additional capacity of a computer network above what is needed for normal operation in the case of an outage or other disruption of operation. Think of it as a safety net for the almost inevitable system or component failure. It's having a backup system at the ready. There are five common types of redundancy. The first type of redundancy is data redundancy. It's implemented through backups. Data redundancy occurs when the same piece of data exists in multiple places. Unfortunately, data redundancy can cause data inconsistency, which can provide a company with unreliable and or meaningless information. One example of this is to have multiple versions of the same file on a network. As such, real-time syncing of the data across all its backups is vital for all copies to be consistent with one another. The next type of redundancy is known as Redundant Array of Independent Disks, or RAID. RAID has three varieties and provides server hardware failover redundancy. RAID 0 allows a storage system to tolerate individual disk unit failures as the data is simultaneously written to more than one disk. In a RAID 1 system, there's an exact copy or mirror of a set of data on two or more disks. And in a RAID 5 group, there are a minimum of three hard disk drives, or HDDs, and no maximum. RAID 5 is considered one of the most secure RAID configurations. Network redundancy is the process of adding additional network devices and lines of communication to help ensure network availability and decrease the risk of failure. Some of the features of network redundancy are multiple adapter cards and or ports for individual hosts, and load balancing in which a networking solution is used to distribute traffic across multiple servers in a server farm. There are multiple network paths between nodes and routers can detect failed links and choose to reroute data by finding alternate paths for it. Site redundancy is the ability to lose an entire site without losing signaling or application state data. It guards against total loss of operations due to a natural disaster or major network failure. This type of redundancy employs the process of replication to synchronize data among multiple sites and ensures data access. And power redundancy is having two independent power sources. If one power source has an interruption, the other source activates. This eliminates downtime from the loss of the primary power source. One way to augment a power redundancy scheme is to use an uninterruptible power supply, or UPS. A UPS adds a layer of protection if something as expensive as a backup power generator is not feasible. The point of backups is to create a copy of data that a business can restore from when a primary copy is damaged or unavailable and have a specific and sequential strategy for backups that identifies key backup concerns 
and selects appropriate backup types based on needs and resources. Backups restore data. Backup methods include the following. Full, which creates copies of all files. Incremental, which copies only those files that have been altered since the last full backup. Differential, which saves only the difference in the data since the last full backup. And Daily, which keeps a backup of just those files that have been modified the same day the backup is done. A backup storage device is used to make copies of data that is actively in use. Backup media provide redundancy of data residing on primary storage. Should the primary storage medium, such as a hard disk drive or HDD, fail or become corrupted, the original data can be recovered from copies on the backup hardware. Examples of backup devices include a USB drive, an external hard drive, a local area network or LAN, and tape. A backup strategy must balance these considerations. Costs, you may have to buy hardware and software, pay for a maintenance agreement and train your staff, and location. Many businesses back up to the cloud, but consider keeping a copy of your data in an additional location too, as cloud outages do happen. Businesses need to know the requirements of each backup approach in storage, cost, and time. These factors impact the length of the backup procedure and the recovery. Disaster recovery is an organization's strategy for restoring functionality to its IT infrastructure. This plan must explain the actions to be taken after a disaster. It involves strategies for specific scenarios to ensure continuity. A swift recovery depends on plans that are specific, imaginative, and comprehensive. And the choice of disaster recovery methods depends upon needs and resources. In this video, you learned that business continuity in the wake of unexpected outages relies heavily on planning. Fault-tolerant systems can continue operation despite outages. The choice of redundancy option and backup system depend on a business's needs and resources. And disaster recovery plans aim to resume operational functionality to a business after an outage. Welcome to the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate. Did you know that industries worldwide depend more on technology now than ever before? That's because more people are using technology in their everyday lives, including working remotely, taking online classes, and even having health checkups with a doctor via webcam. With a worldwide increase in demand for technology comes an increase in need for user support for all technology-related needs. Who will provide technical support to individuals, companies, and organizations? Professionals who are knowledgeable in the fundamentals of computer hardware, operating systems, software, networking, storage, cybersecurity, and cloud computing. According to the most recent U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics report, about 70,400 computer support jobs are posted annually in the U.S. alone and job growth in the computer support industry is projected to increase 9% through 2030. At the time of this course publication, the median U.S. computer support specialist salary is $57,910 U.S. dollars annually, and per hour pay is almost $28 U.S. dollars. Technical support jobs are also a great way to start on your path to a high-paying career in information technology. This certificate consists of several engaging and informative courses designed to introduce you to the fundamentals of technical support as well as information technology fundamentals. Additionally, this professional certificate can help you prepare for the CompTIA IT Fundamentals Certification Exam. This is a beginner level certificate, which means that anyone, even if you're new to IT, can take this course. You don't need prior experience in IT or technical support. No college degree is required. All you need to get started with this certificate is a willingness to learn and a basic computer literacy to take online courses through your web browser or mobile app. The courses in this certificate will introduce you to the essential parts of IT. 
You will learn about hardware, software, networking, and cybersecurity, cloud computing, ticketing systems, and careers and pathways in IT. Throughout the courses, you'll hear from IT insiders as they share their experiences and what they've learned as they've progressed through their careers. Some of the experts you'll hear from are Aditya Pundir, an IT manager, Michelle Sanchez, an instructional designer who started in Help Desk, Mike Schwartz, who works in IT support, and Amy Taylor, an enterprise support technician. You will learn in this course through guided instructional videos that walk you through key concepts with essential need-to-know facts. Interactive exercises will reinforce what you've learned in videos. Insider viewpoints allow you to learn from professionals working in many fields of IT. And practice assessments and graded assessments will help you gauge your knowledge and prove what you've learned. Upon completing all of the courses, you'll earn a shareable badge and the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate. Why do you need a professional certificate? A professional certificate is beneficial for you because it's proof of your knowledge and accomplishments. The IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate has been specifically created to focus on the core knowledge you will need to possess to succeed in technical support and beyond. The courses work together to familiarize you with the elements of IT, introduce you to hardware and software, help you build your IT skills, and provide you with hands-on labs to practice using what you've learned in the course. When you've completed the courses in the certificate, you will receive a professional certificate so that you can share your hard work and accomplishment with potential employers and your professional network. One of the many benefits of the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate is that all of the courses are online and ready to start when you're ready to take them. The courses have flexible schedules, meaning you can complete the course at whatever time is most convenient for you and at your own pace, even if you have only two to three hours a week to spare. Or you could even complete the entire professional certificate in as little as three months if you spend five or more hours per week on the courses. Financial aid is available for those who qualify. So if you are not sure this program is right for you, you can try a free seven-day trial or you can audit the courses. These options give you the opportunity to sample the content and determine if the courses are right for you. And remember that we're here for your success. If you have any questions about the courses or the professional certificate, just ask. So what are you waiting for? Let's get started. Welcome to the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate Overview of Courses. This certificate includes introductory courses on technical support, hardware and operating systems, software, programming and databases, networking and storage, cybersecurity essentials, and cloud computing. The certificate also includes the final course, Technical Support Case Studies and Capstone, to apply your knowledge and skills. The course, Introduction to Technical Support, describes many support essentials, including the roles and responsibilities of technical support professionals, career pathways and progressions in information technology or IT, support tools, ticketing systems, technical skills, and soft skills, all of which are needed to succeed in IT support. In Introduction to Hardware and Operating Systems, you'll learn about internal hardware computer components, including motherboard components, central processing units or CPUs, hard drives, and expansion slots. You'll also learn the essentials of basic workstation setup, commonly used operating system settings, screen capture commands, and effective troubleshooting practices. In the Introduction to Software Programming and Databases course, you'll learn about software, web browsers, software development, programming languages, and database management. In Introduction to Networking and Storage, you'll learn how to diagnose and repair basic networking and security problems. You'll also learn about network types and standards, wired and wireless connections, and common network storage and network sharing options. In Introduction to Cybersecurity Essentials, you'll learn about the fundamentals of cybersecurity. You'll also learn how to recognize common security threats and risks, 
examine the characteristics of cyber attacks, and explore methods for securing and managing confidential information. In the course Introduction to Cloud Computing, you'll discover the many elements of cloud computing and how cloud computing is changing the world of technology. You will identify various cloud service models, deployment models, and key components of cloud infrastructure. You'll also learn about cloud security, monitoring, emerging trends, and job roles in the cloud industry. And finally, in the Technical Support Case Studies and Capstone, you will apply your knowledge and skills to practical IT support scenarios. You will also complete a final exam designed to prepare you for the CompTIA IT Fundamentals Certification Exam. Are you ready to begin your journey toward becoming a technical support professional? Start on your first course today. Welcome to Exploring Linux Operating System Essentials. After watching this video, you will be able to explain why companies adopt Linux, describe how to create a local system account and confirm its settings, explain how to view system information, describe how to use the Ubuntu file system, and explain how to monitor system performance. As an open source operating system, multiple vendors offer Linux operating system, or OS, versions. Some OS versions include user-friendly graphical user interfaces similar to Windows, while others focus on command line interfaces and capabilities. But no matter which vendor or version, Linux is often the operating system that organizations and their programmers prefer because of its stability, security, and efficiency. Linux versions are known as distributions, or distros. Popular vendors include Debian, Red Hat, Linux Mint, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, and others. Canonical distributes Ubuntu, a Linux version with a lightweight, easy-to-use graphical interface, and Canonical reports more than 40 million users as of 2021, making Ubuntu's graphic interface a widespread Linux distribution. Linux is available pre-installed on servers and laptops, but you can also download a base Linux operating system and install the system to the workstation using a thumb drive, CD, or network drive. And after you connect to the web to finish your installation, you can complete your workstation setup. Let's begin with an installed version of Ubuntu. To set up a local account, you need to first log in as the administrator. Next, you'll create a local system account that doesn't have administrative rights. Local accounts are typically shared with computer users and do not permit administrative rights. Next, click Activities, and in the search bar, begin typing the word User and then select Settings. In the Settings pane, select Users and then select Unlock. Type the administrator password. Next, you'll add the user's local account information. In the Users window, select Add User. In the Add User dialog box, select the Standard tab, type the user's full name and username. In this example, you see the new user shown as New User 1. Select the Allow User to Set a Password when they next log in option and click Add. Next, locate the Power Off Logout option. Click the Expander arrow and select Switch User. Select New User 1. Now type the new password, change me, exclamation point, 234, and press enter. Again, click Activities. Then in the search bar, type the word User and select Settings. Select Users in the Settings pane, then select the New User 1 tab to confirm the account information. And you'll see the user's account settings below the user's name. Next, let's learn how to locate system hardware and operating system information. You can quickly locate system hardware and operating system information, including the operating system version and build number. Here's how. Select Activities. In the search bar, type About and press Enter. Then click the Settings option, About, View Information About Your System. You'll see the device name, hardware module, memory, processor graphics card, disk capacity, OS name, OS type, genome version, windowing system, 
virtualization and software update status. Let's now quickly access folders and files by selecting either the Files icon in the left navigation pane or the Home folder on the desktop. On the home screen, you'll see an easy-to-navigate familiar folder structure. This file structure includes pre-configured folders for desktop, documents, music, pictures, templates, videos, and other categories of files. To create a new folder, on the home screen, within Folders, right-click and select New Folder. And name the new folder Test Folder 1, for example. Next, double-click Test Folder 1 to view its contents. In this empty folder, let's create a file. Select the LibreOffice document icon, and a document opens. Add some text to the file, for example, test colon creating a file. Select File and Save, or Save As. Then select the Destination folder and save this new file in that folder. Now close the document. Finally, confirm that your file is in the correct folder. On the home screen, double-click Test Folder 1 and you'll see the Test1.odt file. Next, let's look at where you can find system performance information. To monitor system performance, view the Activities screen and click Activities. Within the search bar, type System and select the System Monitor app. The System Monitor app provides essential CPU, RAM, disk, and priority performance information to help you troubleshoot performance-related issues such as applications that stall or lag. The app organizes this information in the Processes, Resources, and File Systems tabs. In this video, you learned that organizations adopt Linux because of its stability, safety, and efficiency. You first log in as an administrator to create user accounts, and you can set a user account so that the assigned user sets their password the first time they use the workstation. You also learned that you can select About and click About View Information About Your System to view your computer's name, memory, installed version of Ubuntu, as well as verifying operating system updates and more. To locate files and subfolders, select the Folders icon within the left navigation pane on the home screen. And finally, the System Monitor app organizes system performance information in the Processes, Resources, and File Systems tabs. Welcome to Getting Started with Mac OS. After watching this video, you will be able to explain why companies invest in Mac OS computers, list Mac OS setup steps, describe Mac OS desktop features, describe how to view users, update user settings, and add and remove users, and explain how to use the Finder for folder and file management. So, why do companies invest in Mac OS computers? Apple pre-installs macOS, providing users with simplified setup and migration. Built on Unix, macOS computers can also run Linux in dual mode or as a virtual machine. And Mac users are less likely to need on-site help desk support, reducing support costs. Apple's rigorous application testing process is built for both security and ease of use. Mac OS applications include business productivity vendors such as Microsoft, Adobe, Slack, and many others. And Apple provides online help and in-person support at the Apple Store and designated vendors. Organizations, including IBM, report lower total ownership costs after factoring in hardware, software, security, and support costs. Users reported improved ease of use, and organizations, including IBM, have reported significant worker productivity gains. So, let's get started and explore Mac OS. The initial Mac setup process provides a guided walkthrough excluding data migration. This process takes about 15 minutes, but options and timing can change with each new operating system release. First, specify the computer's displayed language, country, or region. You can optionally configure vision, motor skills, hearing, and cognitive accessibility settings. Then it's time to configure your network access. 
Next, accept Apple's mandatory data and privacy terms. When migrating from one Mac to another, you can transfer your apps and data to the new machine. When migrating from a Microsoft Windows machine to a Mac, you can bring your data. You'll create a new Apple account or log in with an existing Apple account. An Apple account is required for machine setup and email, app store purchases, and cloud backups. Next, opt in for machine usage analytics. Then enable Apple's Assistant, Siri. If you didn't already, set up Apple Pay. Then set up a Touch ID and create your first user account, which includes administrative machine rights. And finally, allow location services. With this initial setup complete, let's explore the desktop. The dock is where you find applications. You can keep frequently used applications attached to the dock. Next is the contextual menu at the top of the screen, which displays the active applications menu options. For example, with the Safari web browser open, you'll see that application's menu. You'll also see the logged in user's name, the battery level indicator, the spotlight search, and frequently adjusted options, including screen brightness, speaker volume levels, Siri, and date and time information. The desktop is the area between the menu bar and the dock. You can locate applications using the launch pad and open the application for use on the desktop. Next, user management is one of the first post setup tasks. You need to determine who can use the machine and install software on the computer. Here's how. Open System Preferences and type User in the search bar. Then select Users and Groups. You can view all computer users at a glance. Click the lock icon and enter your password to open the lock to add or remove users, configure user capabilities, change user passwords, and allow users to reset their password using their Apple account ID. When adding a new user, you can create an account with administrator rights or a standard account. Type the user's full name, name the user account, create the password and its hint, and click Create User. Click the key icon to enable automatic password generation. Mac OS can generate passwords with letters and numbers, numbers only, random characters, and U.S. federal government compliant passwords. To remove users, confirm that the lock icon is unlocked. Select the user, click the minus symbol, decide whether to keep or remove the user's data located in the home folder, click delete user, and click the lock again to close the lock and prevent unintended changes. Next, let's learn about Mac OS file management. You can use the Finder to locate, move, store files locally and in the cloud, and show and hide folders. Start by clicking the Finder icon displayed in the dock. The left pane displays available top-level folders and the iCloud remote storage location. You can see your files in the central pane. Within the Finder, you can view files by list, icon, or gallery, and provide other options such as grouping files by kind. Mac OS supports dragging files from one location to another. If a user asks, why can't I see my files and folders? Try these steps. Click Finder, and then click Preferences. Now, click the sidebar icon. To display folders on the sidebar, select the checkboxes. To remove these folders from the sidebar view, clear the checkboxes. Next, check the settings within Preferences and the general icon. These settings also control which storage locations are visible and the location a user sees first when searching for a file. To display data sources on the desktop, select the Data Sources checkbox. You can also specify the data storage location displayed when a user opens the Finder and choose whether to open folders in tabs or new windows. A user might also ask, why do I see these warnings before I empty the trash? Or why are my files and folders missing? To help answer these questions, look within the Finder Preferences and click the Advanced icon. Select checkboxes to receive a warning before changing a file extension, removing a file from an iCloud drive, and emptying the trash folder. You can also set default folder view options and search locations. In this video, you learned that 
Companies appreciate Mac OS's easy migration, user satisfaction, and reduced support costs, which result in lower total cost of ownership. During Mac OS setup, a user creates an Apple account for email, cloud storage, and purchases, and creates a separate user account for computer access and management. You can manage users, their passwords, and machine permissions within users and groups. You can use the Finder to access folders and files. And finally, if folders or files are not visible, open Finder preferences and adjust the general, sidebar, and advanced settings. Welcome to Networking and Performance Mac OS Essentials. After watching this video, you will be able to explain how to locate system level hardware, network, and software information, update the computer's network connection, and use the activity monitor to evaluate system performance. Here's how to locate and connect to new wireless networks. Within System Preferences, begin typing the word Wi Fi. Apple uses predictive text, so you should quickly see the word Wi-Fi. Then select the network app. Select an available network and enter the network password. After you enter the password, you'll be able to click Join. Optionally, you can display the network password while typing, and you can choose to have the computer remember the network for automatic login when you're near this network. Next, let's learn how to view system information. To view system information, click the Apple logo and select About This Mac. You'll first see the Overview tab. Here, you can quickly identify the Mac OS version, the MacBook model, processor, installed memory, graphics type, and the computer's serial number. Select Software Update to determine if the operating system files are current. You can opt in for automatic operating system updates. Next, select the Displays tab to view basic display information. Select Displays Preferences, and you can adjust the resolution, brightness, color profile, universal control, and night shift settings. Now, let's view the Storage tab. You'll first see an overview of the onboard storage. Click Manage to see an overview of what's being stored, view iCloud storage options, optimize storage, empty the trash automatically and review and remove files that are no longer needed. So, now that you've seen the overview information, it's time to select System Report. The System Report provides a detailed look at the system's hardware, networking, and software. You'll first see the default hardware view that includes the computer's model name, identifier, processor name, speed, cores, RAM, serial number, and additional essential information for support. You can expand the view and click any of the items, such as power. Click Network and let's check out the Wi-Fi information. You'll first see the system networking hardware-related information, including the machine's MAC address. Then view information about wireless networks and other network-specific details as you scroll the page. OK, next let's check out the Software category. Select Software and review the System Software Overview. You'll see operating system version information, the computer's name, the logged in user's name, and the time elapsed since the computer's most recent restart. And next, within software, select Applications. Here, you can view application names, versions, sources, dates last modified, and software kind or type, such as if the application is a universal app for all Mac devices. Next, let's check out the Support tab. Select the Support tab and use the displayed information to find out if the machine is still in warranty, find service locations, and obtain help via chat and phone support. Next is the About This Mac Resources tab. Here you'll find links to online documentation and support for the Mac OS operating system and Mac hardware. So next let's explore the Finder for folders and files. Use the Activity Monitor app to monitor system performance. Press the Command key and spacebar to display the spotlight. 
Then type Activity Monitor in the search bar and click the Activity Monitor icon to open the app. You'll first see the CPU tab where you can identify which applications and processes are using CPU resources, what percentage of the CPU's capacity is in use for each application, how much of the total CPU power is in use, and how much of the total CPU power is idle. Next on the Memory tab, you can see the amount of memory each application is using, the total physical memory installed, how much total memory is in use, the number of cached files, the amount of memory used by apps in total, and the wired memory or the memory needed for the machine to run. When you view the Energy tab, you'll be able to determine how much energy each application is using and whether the application is using the graphics card, the type of graphics card installed, the amount of battery charge available in both percentage of battery and time formats, and the most recent amount of time on battery. The Disk tab view provides disk performance information. You'll see how fast data is read and written for each application and as a total, and you'll also know the amount of data transferred per second. The Network tab displays the number of data packets sent and received individually and in total. You'll also see total data sent and received measured in megabytes based on the amount of data transferred per second. And what if you need system diagnostics? Select the drop-down arrow where you can run a spin dump. A spin dump report helps troubleshoot why programs are crashing. You can also run a systems diagnostic test for hardware issues, and you can run a spotlight diagnostics report to focus on evaluating system processes. In this video, you learned that you can click the wireless icon to locate and configure login information for new networks. You can view the computer name by selecting System Preferences, System Report, and then the Network Overview. And selecting System Preferences and then selecting Network displays the computer's name, IP address, related networking information, and the computer's MAC address. You also learned, within System Preferences, System Report, you can view hardware, network, and software overview details. Press the command key and spacebar to open the spotlight. Using the spotlight, you can type Activity Monitor and click the icon to open the app. Activity Monitor provides you with performance information organized by CPU, memory, energy, disk, and network. And finally, a spin dump report helps troubleshoot why programs are crashing. Welcome to Chrome OS Operating System Essentials. After watching this video, you will be able to explain the pros and cons of Chromebooks, describe Chromebook setup essentials, describe parts of the Chromebook desktop, explain how to adjust frequently modified settings, and describe how to locate essential operating system and hardware information. Chromebooks, known for being lightweight and portable, are suitable for web-based work and storage and run Android apps available on the Google Play Store. Chromebook hardware typically includes less powerful processors, less RAM, and less local storage than standard computers. With reduced hardware needs, Chromebooks are generally more affordable than laptops and desktops running other operating systems. Chromebooks tend to be popular with students and web-based workers in small to medium-sized businesses. Around 2020, Chromebooks incorporated additional capabilities. Chromebook users could now mirror programs from their desktops and laptops and run mobile Android versions of Microsoft Office 365 products. So why doesn't everyone use a Chromebook? Chromebooks require an internet connection for access to web-based apps and functions. Google Apps and some other apps are available for offline or asynchronous work. However, many business apps and tasks require a network and internet connectivity. Chromebooks also offer a strict automatic expiration date. After that date, the operating system is no longer guaranteed to work with hardware. 
So, after you press the Start or Power button, you'll select your preferred language and click Let's Go. Next, join a Wi-Fi network. You'll enter the network name, specify the security type, and enter the network's password. You can also allow others to use the Chromebook to access the same network. Then, sign in with an existing Google account or create a new Google account. Next, let's learn about setting up Google Assistant. You'll be prompted to enable Google Assistant. Google Assistant integrates with Google devices, including lights, music, and other devices configured in Google Home. You can use both voice and keyboard input capabilities to ask Google questions or ask Google to perform tasks, and you can adjust these settings at any time. You can also find Google Assistant using the Settings pane. Select Search and Assistant, and Google Assistant settings appear. Click the toggle to enable Google Assistant. You can also click the OK Google toggle to use Google Assistant with your voice. If you want to use your voice instead of the keyboard, click the preferred input toggle. To talk with your assistant, say OK Google and ask your question. Also, on your keyboard, you can press the search key or the assistant key. Next, let's learn about another Chromebook essential how you can configure your Chromebook to use a preferred wireless network. In the Settings pane, select Network. In the Network section, click to toggle Wi-Fi. To automatically connect or reconnect to a specific network, click the Automatically Connect to this network toggle. To set the connected network as the preferred network, click the Prefer this network toggle. Now it's time to learn about installing apps. To install additional apps, use the shelf and select the Google Play Store app. You'll find apps for gaming, productivity, navigation, shopping, social sites, education, movies, and books. But after your apps are installed, how do you find them? Let's check out the desktop, the shelf, and the launcher. The desktop is your workspace. You can access programs and shortcuts using the shelf and you'll use the open space to view open programs. You can also select the launcher to find and open programs. When viewing an app in the launcher, you can right-click an app to pin or anchor the app to the shelf. The desktop is also where you access frequently adjusted settings, such as speaker volume and screen brightness, locate the settings app, and, although not enabled here, view notifications. When connected to the internet, Chromebooks can automatically check for, download, and install operating system updates. And within Settings and About Chrome OS, you can manually check for updates. You'll also be able to see which version of the Chrome operating system your Chromebook is running. After downloading the update, Chrome OS prompts you to select Restart to finish the update process. Chromebooks have a date when they will no longer receive Chrome OS updates. View update schedule details to see the expiration date. Some Chromebooks may also have a device name, but a search of this Chromebook device did not supply a name. To monitor your system performance, click Settings, then About Chrome OS, and select Diagnostics. Select System to view the battery health and a CPU usage graph. Scroll the system view to see more CPU details, and then view memory usage details. Next, select Connectivity, where you can view network performance. In this video, you learned that you need a Google account to use a Chromebook. Google Assistant, with both voice and keyboard command capabilities and notifications, provides functionality that integrates additional Google capabilities. You can use the launcher to locate files, and, within Settings, select About Chrome OS to update the Chromebook operating system. You'll use the Google Play Store app to download apps, and within About Chrome OS, you can check the operating system update status, find the Chromebook's expiration date, and view system diagnostic information. Welcome to Introduction to Mobile Devices, iOS. After watching this video, you will be able to explain why companies support iOS devices, describe iOS setup essentials, including Siri, Apple's Assistant, 
identify iOS screen types and navigation, explain how to adjust frequently modified settings, and describe how to locate essential operating system and hardware information. Apple, who owns iOS, provides a track record of security, extensive data privacy practices, interoperability with Apple desktops, laptops, and tablets, user satisfaction with the operating system, extensive app availability, extended employee availability, and corporate device controls. So before you begin setting up an iOS device, plan ahead and have the following items ready. Wi-Fi access, the SIM card if needed, the existing Apple ID if available, a debit or credit card, and the prior device if migrating apps and data. After you press the Start or Power button, you'll choose the language and click Let's Go. Select your location and then connect to a Wi-Fi network. Accept the data privacy agreement and then set up security such as facial recognition, a password, or a PIN, and select whether to migrate apps and data. Next, you'll sign in with an existing Apple ID and password or create a new account. Then, set up iCloud Storage, the keychain, and accept Apple's terms and conditions. Next, decide whether to set up Apple's Assistant, Siri, and whether to share app analytics. Then, you'll configure screen display options to reduce blue screens at night. And finally, choose a standard or zoomed screen view. Now, let's check out the iOS device screens on an iPhone. With your iPhone set up, swipe up and display the home screen. Swipe right to display the leftmost screen, known as the Today View. Then swipe left until you see the final screen showing the app library. Whenever you see an app, such as the Calendar app, shown here on the home screen, you can tap to launch the app. By default, the Settings app is located on the home screen, and with more than 50 categories, the Settings app is the central location for customizing your iOS device. You'll also find additional application-specific settings for App Store installed items. Now, when you're ready to activate cellular service, within Settings, tap Cellular. On the Add Cellular Plan screen, scan the QR code provided by your carrier or type Enter Details manually to type the setup information provided by the carrier. Tap Next to continue the setup process. To adjust how you see notifications, within Settings, tap Notifications, and choose whether you will see notifications on a schedule, see notification previews, and see notifications when screen sharing. Also, decide which apps can suggest shortcuts when the screen is locked. For iOS devices, you'll get apps from Apple's App Store. By default, you'll usually see the App Store displayed on the home screen. Tap the App Store to view available apps by category or search for a specific app. And when you locate your app, tap Get to download and install the app. Connecting to Wi-Fi networks usually saves on mobile network charges and could be workplace policy. Within Settings, tap Wi-Fi. View the available networks and tap the network name or tap Other to enter network details and connect to a network that's not visible. Next on the Enter Password screen, enter the password in its field and tap Next or Join as displayed. Siri, Apple's digital assistant, works with voice and keyboard input. Siri is compatible with Apple HomeKit and integrates with other iOS and macOS devices. You can adjust Siri settings at any time. To use Siri, you can say, Hey Siri! or you can press and hold the button on the right side of the phone to speak your request to Siri. Accessibility is built into iOS, with currently more than 20 accessibility categories and the ability to add apps and customize per app or individual app settings. Users frequently customize the on-screen display and brightness. Within Display and Brightness, you can adjust the screen display from light to dark, change the light tone from blue to yellow, Schedule display changes, change the text size, and more. Let's now check out important device information you'll need to know. Within Settings, tap General and then tap About. You first see the device name, which you can edit. Then you'll see the current iOS operating system, device model name, device model number, and the device's serial number. 
Scroll to view the system storage capacity and available storage capacity. Then you can see the device's current Wi-Fi address, Bluetooth address, and modern firmware version. The SE ID is the secure element identifier, a near-frequency communication chip. Next is the EID, which is the acronym for the electronic SIM card, but not all iPhones have an electronic SIM card. Scroll again to find out if the device is locked to a specific cellular carrier. Then see who the current cellular carrier is and view the following identifiers. First is the IMEI, a unique 15-digit number assigned to every cellular device. IMEI numbers are internationally registered. Next is the ICCID, the identifier associated with the SIM card. And the MEID is a 14-digit PIN code assigned specifically to mobile devices. For example, an IoT device might have an IMEI, such as an electric meter, but since it's not a mobile device, the meter won't have an MEID. And finally, some phones may have a second IMEI 2 slot. This second IMEI enables iPhone users to keep one cellular plan for business and a separate personal plan on the same phone or use a local carrier when traveling internationally. You can set iOS to automatically check for, download, and install operating system updates. Within Settings, tap General and Software Update. Set Automatic Updates to On. When Apple releases a new iOS version, you'll see a message providing you the opportunity to upgrade. In this video, you learned that organizations appreciate Apple's security, data privacy practices, and seamless interoperability with other iOS and Mac devices. The Settings app is where you can adjust iOS settings and check storage and performance-related information. The three main iOS device screen names are the Home Screen, the Today View, and the App Library. Siri, Apple's digital assistant, works with both voice and keyboard input. And the About Settings page provides device, communication, and cellular identifying information. Welcome to Introduction to Mobile Devices, Android. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe why organizations support Android devices Describe Android setup essentials, including Google Assistant, Google's Digital Assistant Identify Android screen types and navigation Explain how to adjust frequently modified settings And describe how to locate essential operating system and hardware information Android currently holds a global market share of 77%. Android is an open source operating system supported by Google. Android supports development by multiple vendors, providing opportunities for innovation and multiple price points for devices that help extend employee availability and provides corporate programs with device controls. So before you begin setting up an Android device, you'll want to have the following items ready. Wi-Fi access, the new SIM card if needed, the Google account ID and password if existing, payment options for the Google Play Store, and the prior device if migrating apps and data. With Android devices, setup processes will likely vary based on the device manufacturer. Connect your phone or device to a power source. After you press the Start or Power button, you'll choose your language and install your SIM card if needed. Then connect to Wi-Fi. You'll then sign into the device using your existing Google account or create a new account. Next, set the device date and time. Set up security, such as a PIN, drawing, passcode, fingerprint, or facial recognition. Then begin downloading apps and data. Now let's check out some Android phone screens. If you set up your phone security, the lock screen displays when you first power it on. After you enter your security information on the lock screen, you'll see the first home screen. Whenever you see an app, such as Google One Storage app, shown here on one of the home screens, you can tap to launch the app. Next, let's view the Settings app. The Settings app is your central location for customizing your Android device. 
You can find the Settings app on one of your home screens or by searching for the app and typing in the predictive text, SET. Now tap the Settings app icon. Organized into about 20 categories, you can use the Settings app to manage network and internet settings, view battery life, check your device's storage capacity, update the display, configure accessibility and security options, configure application-specific settings, and much more. So when you're ready to activate cellular service, within Settings, tap SIMS. If your device is capable of an eSIM, you can download your eSIM or digital SIM card number from your cellular provider, referred to here as your network or network provider. Confirm your network. Now, with your provider confirmed, scan the QR code provided by your carrier and complete the setup process. Next, tap the top of the home screen and swipe down to view notifications. To adjust how notifications are experienced, within Settings, search for Notifications. Here, you can see some of the notification settings, such as configuring notifications based on the app, viewing notification history, how conversation notifications are seen, and numerous other settings. For Android devices, you'll obtain apps from the Google Play Store. When you tap the Google Play Store, you will see suggested apps, available apps by category, and you can search for a specific app. When you locate your app, such as the IBM security software shown here, tap Install to download and use the app. Next, let's learn about connecting to Wi-Fi networks. Within Settings, tap Wi-Fi. View the available networks and tap the network name or tap Add Network to enter network details and connect to a network that's not visible. For the new network you selected, enter the password and tap the checkmark icon. Now, Google Assistant, Google's digital assistant, works with both voice and keyboard input. Google Assistant, compatible with Google Home, also works with an ecosystem of other Android-compatible devices. You can adjust Google Assistant settings as needed. To use Google Assistant, you can say, Hey Google, or you can press and hold the button located on the right of the phone. You can then speak your request to Google Assistant and you'll see or hear a response. You can customize Google Assistant to ask questions, control devices, plan events, and more. Within Settings and Accessibility, you can activate an accessibility menu, adjust accessibility shortcuts, update visual settings, and configure the time you have to respond to apps. Users frequently customize display settings. Tap Settings and type Display. Tap Display Size and Text. And on this screen, you can adjust the size of icons, the text size, and set text to bold and high contrast. Now, let's check out important device information you need to know. Within Settings, tap General, and then type About and View About Phone. You can view the device name and model number, and you can also view the IMEI, a unique 15-digit number assigned to every cellular device. IMEI numbers are internationally registered. This device has one physical SIM card slot and a second eSIM slot. A second SIM card slot is often used for travel or when using a phone both personally and professionally. Next, you can see the device's current IP address, Wi-Fi MAC address, and Bluetooth address. Also, selecting About Phone displays important information about the operating system including its baseband version, kernel version, and build number. This information is helpful for troubleshooting operating system issues should they happen. Android usually provides monthly operating system security updates. Each device manufacturer pushes updates to its branded devices. Android device owners receive a notification that an update is available and can choose to install the updates immediately or later. If the device is corporate managed, the administrator can choose when to push operating system updates to their devices. Here is how to check if your version of Android is current. Within Settings, type System and then tap System Updates. Then tap System Update. You'll also see the Android version your device is running and when the system most recently checked for updates. 
Note that you can also manually check for updates at any time. In this video, you learned that organizations appreciate Android's security, data privacy practices, and seamless interoperability with an open ecosystem of providers and devices. The Settings app is where you can adjust Android settings, configure cellular service, view essential device information, and update the operating system. You can manually check for Android security updates at any time. And Android device owners receive a notification that an update is available and can choose to install the updates immediately or later. Welcome to Introduction to Software, Programming, and Databases. Are you interested in learning the basics of software programming languages? Does finding out more about software development, cloud computing, web browsers, and their security features appeal to you? Would you like to get more information about databases and their fundamentals? Ever wonder how to organize code in the easiest, simplest, and most efficient way possible? If so, this course is for you. During this course, you will learn about the basics of software development technologies and programming languages. This course introduces the basic concepts of cloud computing, and you will gain hands-on experience identifying file formats and installing and uninstalling browser extensions and plugins. During the course, security and development related to web browsers, applications, and content will be discussed. You will also discover how to identify types of databases, how to access and manage data, and identify the four types of backup methodologies. In addition, you will learn how to organize and plan software programs using flowcharts and pseudocode. This course is divided into four modules, Computing Platforms and Software Applications, Fundamentals of Web Browsers, Applications, and Cloud Computing, Basics of Programming, and Fundamentals of Databases. The Computing Platforms and Software Applications module provides information about computing platforms, including single and cross-platform software. You will discover the differences between commercial and open source software while also exploring software versions, compatibility, different types of software, and file formats. In the Fundamentals of Web Browsers, Applications, and Cloud Computing module, you will learn about common web browsers and browser settings, security, extensions, and plugins. You will examine cloud computing and learn about application architecture, delivery models, and software development life cycles. The Basics of Programming module will give you a solid foundation of basic programming concepts and programming language categories. You will explore basic programming logic components and how to organize software using flowcharts and pseudocode easily and quickly. Throughout the Fundamentals of a Database module, you will learn about basic database concepts, types of databases, and how to use and manage databases. You will also learn about interfacing with a database and backing up a database. To successfully complete this course, you should be familiar with basic computer operating skills and terminology. Additionally, knowledge of how to use a modern web browser like Google Chrome is required to complete this course and the hands-on labs within it. Finally, you will need to create a free trial account for IBM Cloud. We're here to support your success, and we're excited that you're here. Let's get started. Welcome to Computing Platforms and Compatibility. After watching this video, you will be able to define computing platforms, identify single and cross-platform software, and identify cross-compatibility issues. What are computing platforms? A computing platform is the environment where the hardware, like your personal computer, and the software, like your operating system or OS, work together to run applications. Hardware refers to the type of computer or device, such as a desktop computer, a laptop, or a smartphone. Software, in this instance, refers to the type of operating system, such as Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Android, and Linux, and also includes the programs and applications that run on the OS. 
Here are three types of common computing platforms. The desktop platform includes devices like personal computers and laptops that run operating systems like Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. The web-based platform includes browsers like Firefox and Chrome that function the same in various operating systems, regardless of the hardware. The mobile platform includes devices like the Pixel and the iPhone that run operating systems like Android OS and iOS. When planning applications, software developers must consider if they will be designing for one platform or across platforms. Depending on who the primary users of an application will be, software developers design either single-platform software, meaning that the programming code only works on one kind of computing platform, or cross-platform software, meaning that the programming code will work on multiple platforms. Here are some of the differences. Single-platform software is written for a particular OS or version of OS. It may also be written in a programming language like Java or Objective-C, which is specific to the platform. Additionally, single-platform software is designed to run only in the target OS and most likely won't run as intended on other platforms. Some developers use applications like Xcode for iOS and Android Studio for Android to code single-platform software. However, cross-platform software is different from single-platform in several ways. It is written for more than one type of OS. Applications across devices and operating systems operate the same or similarly regardless of the computing platform. Performance of the software varies due to platform differences. And some developers use applications like React Native and Xamarin for cross-platform software development. Before creating a single-platform or cross-platform application, developers must weigh the pros and cons. Let's look at some single-platform pros first. An advantage of single-platform software is that the software has a smaller, more focused app user base. Single-platform applications have better performance and faster speeds because they are running on their native platform. Also, the programs are normally easier to use because the user interface is designed for one specific OS. However, there are also some cons. With single-platform software, there is a higher cost of development because the application must be made specifically for one OS. Single-platform software also has a longer development time since the code must be uniquely written for the platform. Additionally, more specialized programming expertise is needed, which means higher costs for the software development. And updates and maintenance are higher due to the unique programming knowledge needed. Now let's look at cross-platform software. Some pros are lower cost of software development, which can happen over a shorter time. Another advantage is a wider app user base and market reach because the app is available on more devices. Additionally, programming expertise is more generalized because developers do not need to learn specialized operating systems and they are able to use the same coding. Also, updates and maintenance are more readily available and affordable. Cons include the following. Cross-platform applications have design challenges for making the software function similarly and correctly in different operating systems. Performance and speed may vary due to differences in platforms. And the user interface may also vary and be less reliable across platforms. So these are only a few of the key factors that developers should weigh when deciding what is best for their software and for their user base. When considering cross-platform software, it's important to realize that there are some compatibility concerns. Be aware that cross-platform software acts differently depending on the platform and may even have limited usability. It's important to remember that cross-platform software is created by different developers most of the time. This means that programs may interpret the code differently in each application. Functionality and results can differ between platforms. Sometimes these differences can mean undesired results and errors. Other times, it can just mean a difference in appearance or how the software is accessed. This could happen 
When a document is created in Microsoft Word on a desktop PC, then the document is edited in Google Docs through a web browser, and then it is opened on a mobile device. As the document goes through this process, several different applications are being used. This results in a change in appearance in the document and sometimes a change in how the document is used. In this video, you learned that single platform software is developed for one particular operating system. Single platform programs are more focused on the user base, are faster, and have a better user interface. However, single platform programs are also more expensive and take longer to develop, require more specialized programming expertise, and need more ongoing maintenance. Cross-platform software is developed to be used across different platforms, and it should function the same or similarly on different platforms. Cross-platform programs are less expensive to develop, have a wider user base, require more generalized programming knowledge, and have more readily available updates. However, cross-platform programs also have more design challenges, have varying performance and speeds, and sometimes have user interface issues across platforms. And compatibility concerns arise when a software does not function similarly or correctly across platforms, and when the same options and commands are not available across platforms. Welcome to Commercial and Open Source Software. After watching this video, you will be able to define commercial software, define open source software, and identify differences between commercial and open source software. So what is commercial software? Commercial software, also sometimes referred to as proprietary or closed source, is copyrighted software. When individuals or companies purchase the software, they must acknowledge the software developer's copyright, which is identified in the End User License Agreement, or EULA. Commercial software source code is private, and users are prohibited from copying, modifying, or redistributing the software or any part of the source code, except parts of the source code that may be open source. It is usually developed for commercial profit and can include open source code bundled with private source code. When commercial software is installed, a product key or serial number is issued to certify that the software is original. Some commercial software is free, but upgrades and updates may cost extra or the software may contain ads. Some examples of commercial software are Microsoft Office, Adobe Photoshop, and Intuit QuickBooks. Software licenses are also required for most open source software. Open source is also referred to as free and open source, or FOSS. Open source software is free and can be downloaded, installed, and used without limits or restrictions. Note that free software is not always the same as freeware, which is free to users, but is not always open source. Open source software contains free source code, which can be freely copied, modified, and redistributed. It also gives developers and users open access to the functions of the software and source code without the cost or restrictions. A benefit of open source software is that developers and users can contribute to the source code and work together to improve the software and its functionality. Even though open source software is free and open, Users are still required to agree to an end-user license agreement, or EULA, in order to use the software. Some examples of open-source software are Linux, Mozilla Firefox, and Apache OpenOffice. There are some important differences in open-source and closed-source software. With open-source software, the source code is available to be edited, modified, and redistributed. Users don't have to pay to download, install, or use the software. Open source code can sometimes be used in commercial software, which is usually developed for profit, but can also include freeware. With closed source software, developers keep private the source code and how it works. Additionally, with closed source, a company or individual owns the rights to the source code and software, like with Microsoft Edge web browser. 
Freeware, like the Edge browser and commercial software, can be closed source, regardless of whether it is available for free or for purchase. The Chromium web browser is an example of open source software, and the source code is free and openly available to everyone. The basis for the code in the Microsoft Edge web browser is from the open source code in the Chromium web browser. While some of the source code in Edge is open source, most of the source code is closed source and proprietary. The Microsoft Windows OS is both closed source and commercial, and users pay for the software. Note that for all software, whether it is open source or closed source, Anyone who wants to use the software must agree to the end-user license agreement. So, how can you tell the difference between open source and closed source software? Most software has an About section located in the details of the software. If there isn't an About section, look for details or some terms that are similar. In this example from the Microsoft Edge web browser, you would select the three dots in the right corner. Next, from the list, you would select Help and Feedback to open more options. Then, you would select About Microsoft Edge for more details. So, how do you know if the application is open source or closed source? Once you select About Microsoft Edge, the details show that Microsoft Edge uses Chromium open source code and other open source software. While the steps for determining open source or closed source will not be the same for every application, you can follow similar steps to find more information, or you can search trusted websites for more information about source codes for most software. In this video, you learned that commercial software is also known as proprietary or closed source software. Commercial software is copyrighted software. Individuals and companies can purchase commercial software as long as they comply with the specified conditions listed in the software license. Commercial software contains private source code that is often not accessible to users and competing companies. Users may not copy, modify, or redistribute private source code from commercial software. Additionally, you learned that Open source software is also known as free and open source software, or FOSS, and it can be downloaded, installed, and used without limits or restrictions. The source code in open source software is free and can be copied, modified, and redistributed. Users and developers have open access to the software functions and source code. There is overlap between open source and commercial software because open source code can be used in commercial software. All open source software is available for free, and some commercial software can be available for free. And finally, you can find out whether software is open source or closed source in the about details of the application or program. Welcome to Software Licenses. After watching this video, you will be able to define software licenses, identify types of software licenses, and identify product keys for activating software licenses. What is a software license? A software license states the terms and conditions for software providers and users. It is a contract between the developer or group who created the source code and the end user of the software. It specifies who owns the software, outlines copyrights for the software, and specifies the terms and duration of the license. It states where software can be installed, how many copies can be installed, and how it can be used. It can be lengthy and full of definitions, restrictions, and penalties for misuse. Agreeing to the licensing terms is required for use of most software. If you want to install and use software, you must agree to the terms and requirements, which is called an End User License Agreement, or EULA. Agreeing to the EULA means that you accept the terms of the license, such as how many computers the software can be installed on, how it can be used, and what the limitations on developer liability are. Different software programs and applications have various ways of presenting their EULAs. Let's look at some common examples of types of licenses. 
single-use licenses allow a single installation on one computer, or, depending on the software, the license may allow a single user to install the software on any machines that belong to the user. A group use, corporate, campus, or site license allows multiple installations for a specified number of users. It also allows installation on many computers or devices. This kind of license is ideal for use with computers and devices that are registered to a group, such as a computer lab on a college campus or a writing team at a newspaper. Concurrent licenses allow installation on many computers, but they can only be used concurrently, meaning at the same time by a lower number of users. It allows many users to have access to the software, but it is not used often by a lot of people at once. Concurrent licenses are ideal for companies that do not have all workers using the software at the same time, such as nurses and doctors who work different shifts. Now, there are some differences between open source and proprietary software licenses. Open source licenses, also referred to as free and open source, or FOSS, are still necessary for open source software to protect developers and contributors. Proprietary software licenses are more restrictive and are designed to strictly protect the software developer and those who invested in the software. An open source license means free software which can be downloaded, installed, and used without limitations or restrictions, free source code which can be freely copied, modified, and redistributed. However, open source software will still require users to sign a licensing agreement even though there are no limits or restrictions. Proprietary software licenses aim to protect the developers and the companies who own the software. Proprietary licenses cover copyrighted software with specified conditions listed in the license. Proprietary licenses also protect private source code, which users are not allowed to copy, modify, or redistribute. Users are also required to sign an end-user license agreement, or EULA. How much does a software license cost? Costs vary depending on the type of software, how it will be used, and how much was spent to develop the software. Remember that the cost is for the software license, which allows you to use the software. Several options are available, such as trial, subscription, and one-time purchase. Trial licenses are available, usually for free and for a limited time, to allow a user to decide if they like it and want to purchase the software. Subscription and one-time license purchases are also available. The software description will identify whether it is either subscription or one-time. Subscription licenses require recurring payments and users are billed regularly on a set schedule such as monthly or yearly. Software developers and companies often prefer subscription-based models because they generate more income, and they allow developers and companies to control the cost and updates for the software licenses. Subscription-based license software can be used offline, but online access is needed from time to time for updates and upgrades. Also, online access allows users to verify with the vendor that the subscription is still active. Users can access the software for a limited time as long as their subscription is valid. If users do not verify their subscription, the software might not be available to them. Conversely, with one-time license purchases, users pay just once for the software. A one-time purchase of a software license also means that the application or program can be used without interruption for the life of the software. However, a drawback to a one-time purchase is that updates or upgrades to the software may not be available, and the user will need to purchase newer versions or upgrades separately. Both have their advantages and limitations. It is up to the user to determine which purchase is the most appropriate. To ensure that the software that you are using is licensed, developers and vendors will issue a product key when software is purchased. Product keys are unique long sequences of numbers that certify that the copy of the software is original. Product keys are usually included on a physical copy of the software or sent through email when the software is downloaded. Some programs and applications automatically register the product key when you install the application. 
For subscription software licenses, serial numbers or license IDs may be used. When software is activated, the product key is locked to a specific computer, which helps prevent piracy of software. In this video, you learned that a software license states the terms and conditions for software providers and users. It states where software can be installed, how many copies can be installed, and how it can be used. When installing software, users are asked to agree to the End User License Agreement, or EULA. Single-use licenses allow a single installation on one computer. A group-use, corporate, campus, or site license allows multiple installations for a specified number of users. Concurrent licenses allow installation on many computers, but the number of users at the same time is limited. Additionally, open source software or free and open source software, otherwise known as FOSS, is free software which can be downloaded, installed, and used without limits or restrictions. Open source software contains free source code, which can be freely copied, modified, and redistributed. Proprietary commercial or closed source licensed software indicates that the software is copyrighted with specified conditions listed in the license. Proprietary software source code is private, and the license prohibits users from copying, modifying, or redistributing the software or any part of the source code. Costs for software licenses vary depending on the type of software, how it will be used, and how much it costs to develop the software. Product keys are unique sequences of numbers that certify the copy of the software is original. Software licenses and product keys are in the program or application after it is installed on your computer. And a product key locks with a specific computer, which helps prevent piracy of the software. Welcome to Software Installation Management. After watching this video, you will be able to discuss installing and uninstalling software on various computing platforms and identify software installing and uninstalling best practices. Consider the following before installing software. Read the application details and be selective about what you're installing. Be aware that some software may also install ads or other unwanted software. Avoid downloading software that contains malware designed to steal personal information on your device, encrypt your files, require you to pay a ransom for decryption, or monitor your device. Review permission requests to access other apps and hardware on your device. And be selective when allowing application privileges to items such as your device's camera, contact lists, location data, and similar sensitive information. Before installing software, you should consider what will work best with your project and what will work optimally on your device. You should consider minimum system requirements, such as minimum processor speed, minimum amount of RAM, the minimum amount of hard disk space available, and compatible operating system versions. Additional requirements may be a specific display adapter, the amount of display adapter RAM, and an internet connection to use the software. Windows desktop software will usually have an installer. To install software from physical media, such as a USB or CD, insert the disk or drive and wait for a prompt to run the installer. Sometimes the installer will run automatically. If the installer does not start automatically, browse the file system for the software. Locate the installer, usually an EXE or MSI file, and then double-click to start the installer program. When installation is complete, the application should start. You can also download and install software for Windows. Software downloads are available through Windows-compatible websites or from the Microsoft Store. When installing software from a website, be sure to verify that the site is trustworthy and read installation prompts. Do not install any software from a site that looks suspicious. Many installers, when started, will automatically begin installing the program or will guide you through the installation process. And programs available for download are available as compressed files, .exe files, or ISO files. You can also install software from a disk in macOS. 
To install software from a disk, insert the disk in the computer, and the setup utility should start automatically. If setup does not start, you can use Finder to browse for the disk to start the setup. In Finder, locate the setup file. To start the setup, select the file and then follow any prompts. To install macOS software that you have downloaded from online, open the downloaded file and then follow the installation prompts. Locate the file you have downloaded, which may sometimes appear in the bottom corner of your browser after the download is complete. If you did not download the software from the Apple App Store, you might receive an alert that says the application cannot be opened. If you're sure the software is safe, then select Open to continue the software installation. Mac installation files have several different file formats, including zip, pkg, and dmg. For a zip file, double-click the file to install it into its own folder. Within that folder, you will find a PKG or DMG file. PKG files will install the software automatically, and DMG files may need to be moved into the application's folder. Most operating systems have their own online store from which you can download and install programs. In the vendor store, you can browse for applications, select one, and then select Install, and the application will start downloading from the online store. Be sure to read the prompts from your device before uninstalling any programs and applications. Here are some reasons you might want to uninstall software. The software slows down your device. The software version on your device is outdated, or there is not enough available storage space on your device. Follow these steps to uninstall software in Windows. Navigate to Settings on your computer, and then select Apps. From the Apps and Features list, select the application and then select Uninstall. And if prompted, verify that you want to uninstall the program. If you are using a more modern version of the Windows OS, such as Windows 10, you can uninstall a program or application from the Start menu by selecting the app tile and selecting Uninstall from the menu. Be sure to read any warning messages or prompts about uninstalling the software. Steps for uninstalling software on macOS devices depend on which version of macOS you are using. However, most uninstalling processes require the same or similar steps. To uninstall software in macOS, move the file or icon from the Applications folder to the trash which is located on the dock, and be sure to empty the trash to make sure the application is removed. In this video, you learned that you should read the application details and be selective about what you're installing. You should view your minimum system requirements to determine which software and versions will work best for your project and what software will work optimally on your device. The process for installing software varies depending on your devices and operating systems. You should read and follow the setup instructions when installing new software. And for some software, you might need to perform several steps before uninstalling the software. For most modern software, you might only need to select the app and then uninstall. Welcome to Software Versions. After watching this video, you will be able to discuss software versions on computing platforms and identify software versions and numbering. Software versions tell us a lot about programs and applications. Users can determine what software version they are using, and developers can provide useful information with version numbers. Software version numbers vary in length and meaning. However, most version numbers follow a similar format and represent similar information. Version numbers indicate when the software was released, when it was updated, and if any minor changes or patches were made to the software. Software versioning is how software developers keep track of new software, updates, and patches for programs and applications. Version numbers can be displayed in several ways. Version numbers can be short or long, depending on the software and the preference of the developer, with two, three, or four number sets. Each number set is divided by a period. 
the first release of an application or program might have a 1.0 as the version number to indicate no updates, patches, or fixes to the software. Note, a version still in beta or testing could have a version number lower than 1, such as 0.9. A program or application with many releases and updates will have a longer number, sometimes four different number sets within the version number. Some software developers may use dates for their versioning. For example, Ubuntu Linux version 18.04.2 was released in 2018 April. The third number set, .2, designates an additional change or update. What do these numbers mean? Some version numbers follow the semantic numbering system and have four parts separated by a period, but not all numbering systems follow this four-part example. In semantic numbering, the first number indicates major changes to the software, such as a new release. The second number indicates that minor changes were made to the software. The third number in the version number indicates patches or minor bug fixes. And finally, the fourth number indicates a build number or build date, and it can indicate less significant changes made. Software version numbers are identified in the About or Help section of software. You can practice identifying your version number in a web browser. This example illustrates how to view the version number in the Google Chrome desktop web browser. However, if you are using a different web browser, you should be able to follow the same or similar steps. To view the web browser version, first, select the three dots or three lines in the top right corner of your browser. Next, select the menu item, Help, then select About to view the version information. The version of your web browser will display. Are newer versions of software compatible with older versions? Lack of compatibility between old and new versions of software is a common problem. You can troubleshoot compatibility issues by viewing the software version to determine if you are using an outdated version of the software. Sometimes updating software to a newer version will resolve compatibility issues. Some software is backwards compatible. If a program or application is backwards compatible, then the older versions of files, programs, and systems will work properly with newer versions. In this video, you learned that Version numbers indicate the history of changes, updates, and patches to software. Some version numbers follow the semantic numbering system and have four parts separated by a period. Compatibility with old and new versions of software is a common problem. And you should view the version of the software you are using to determine software compatibility. Welcome to Productivity, Business, and Collaboration Software. After watching this video, you will be able to identify productivity software, define business software, and recognize collaboration software. Four of the main types of software are as follows. Productivity software enables users to be productive in their daily activities. Business software is related to work tasks and business-specific processes. Collaboration software enables people to work together and communicate with each other. And utility software helps manage, maintain, and optimize a computer. It's important to note that a program or application can be categorized as multiple types of software. For example, most business software also falls into the productivity and the collaboration software types. What is productivity software? Productivity software is made up of the programs and applications that we use every day. This software can help manage activities and complete daily tasks. There are many types of productivity software, and here's a list of a few of them. Word processing software is employed to create, use, and edit documents. Some common examples are Microsoft Word, Pages on the Mac OS, and Google Docs. Spreadsheet software is used to create worksheets that perform calculations on data, such as statistics and financial information. Some common software examples are Microsoft Excel, Numbers on Mac OS, and Google Sheets. Presentation software helps users create slides for presentations, meetings, and gatherings. 
Most people are familiar with Microsoft PowerPoint, but Keynote and Google Slides are also common. Web browser software includes Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Mozilla Firefox, and Safari. Web browsers connect users to content on local networks or on the internet. You're probably watching this video, taking this course on a web browser right now. And finally, visual diagramming software helps users with creating, using, and editing visual files such as drawings, artwork, and photos. Examples of visual diagramming software are Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, and Microsoft Visio. What is business software? Programs and applications that help businesses complete tasks and function more efficiently are considered business software. Some business software is uniquely designed to meet industry-specific needs. Some of the common types of business software are as follows. Database software can help businesses create, manage, and maintain databases. Some examples of database software are Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, IBM DB2, Oracle Database, and Amazon RDS. Project management software is useful to help build, implement, track, and manage projects. Examples are Microsoft Project, Oracle NetSuite, Rike, and ZenHub. Business-specific software applications are created for businesses depending on their specific needs. Some companies might need a special application to perform essential business duties. Examples are Salesforce and Oracle NetSuite, which are Customer Relationship Management, or CRM systems, and WorkWise and SAP HANA, which are both Enterprise Resource Planning, or ERP, applications. Another business software type is accounting software, which is used to track and manage financial transactions and records. Examples are Intuit QuickBooks, Xero, and FinSync. What is collaboration software? Collaboration software helps people and companies communicate and work with each other. Some collaboration software can be classified as business software also, but the two are not interchangeable. The primary purpose is to help users create, develop, and share information collaboratively. There are five common types of collaboration software. Email clients are used to send and receive emails. Common examples are Microsoft Outlook, Mail for Apple devices, and Gmail. Conferencing software connects users through video call, chats, screen sharing, and file sharing. Cisco WebEx is a popular example, but recently Microsoft Teams and Zoom have become a lot more common. Instant messaging software connects two or more users in real-time texts and sometimes video. Examples are Facebook Messenger, Snapchat, and Skype. Online workspaces provide an online space for services and applications, for file saving and sharing, and for working together. Examples are Microsoft Office 365, Slack, and Google Docs. And document sharing software hosts private and shareable file storage by cloud-based services. Examples are Microsoft OneDrive, Google Drive, and Dropbox. What is utility software? Utility software runs continuously on a computer without requiring direct interaction with the user. These programs keep computers and networks functioning properly. Some types of utility software are as follows. Anti-malware software scans the computer and individual files for malwares like viruses, spyware, worms, and trojans. Anti-malware looks for suspicious patterns of computer code. Once a threat is identified, the anti-malware software removes it or quarantines it. Examples are Bitdefender, McAfee, and Norton Antivirus. Firewall software protects users from streams of network traffic that could harm their computers and networks. Some of the methods firewalls use to control traffic in and out of a network are packet filtering, proxy service, and stateful inspection. Some examples are Windows Firewall, PFSense, and Cisco Secure Firewall. And preventative maintenance software runs scans, checks, and diagnoses hard disks for errors. Some software also optimizes the performance of the computer. Some examples are Windows Disk Management, Check Disk, and Optimized Drives. Software Usability Most software is cross-platform software that runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS machines. Software applications are installed from a disk 
flash drive, or downloaded from the internet, and then they are activated using the product key. Some commercial software, like Adobe Photoshop, Oracle NetSuite, and Intuit QuickBooks can be purchased from the vendor and activated via a product key or activation key. In this video, you learned that productivity software like Microsoft Word and Adobe Photoshop helps users manage tasks, email, documents, projects, and activities. Business software such as Oracle NetSuite and Intuit QuickBooks helps people and companies complete business tasks. Collaboration software like Slack and Microsoft Teams enables people to work together and communicate with each other. And utility software such as McAfee and Cisco Secure Firewall keeps computers and networks functioning properly. Welcome to Types of File Formats. After watching this video, you will be able to list common file format types and identify common types of files by their extensions. Knowing the format of a file helps you determine which application is needed to open or run the file. Some common file formats are executable files, compression files, audio and video files, also known as media files, image files, and document files. You can identify the file format quickly by the file extension. File extensions tell users more information about files and the applications that use those files. They can do several different things. File extensions are identified by a period followed by a three or four letter extension or suffix. The extension tells the operating system which applications will run the files. The extension appears after the file name. In Windows applications, the extension will usually indicate what application will run the file. And they can indicate the file type, such as executable, compressed, or image. Executable files run programs and applications. The executables may be part of the operating system, an installation package, or an application that runs on the computer. Being familiar with the types of executable file types is important so you understand what will be running on your computer. Some executable file formats and extensions are as follows. EXE are Windows applications that may have several files with them that help them run on the computer. BAT files are batch files or scripts and include a list of commands that the computer must execute in sequential order. SH files run shell commands and scripts that are executable on Linux or Unix, which are equivalent to Windows BAT files. CMD are command files for Windows. They are also script files and contain commands that are completed in order. They are similar to BAT files. App files are a type of Mac application bundle, and MSI files are installer packages in Windows. What are compressed file formats? Compressed formats, also called compression formats, are used as follows. Combining files to save disk space. The most popular compression format in Windows is zip, and file compression is often discussed as zipping files or as zipped folders. Storing archived files, like old emails that might not need to be accessed regularly, but should still be kept. And condensing any type of file, including media files. Common compressed formats are as follows. ZIP or ZIPX is a compression format for Windows computers. 7-ZIP or 7-Z is used for the 7-ZIP archiver. GZIP or GZ is the default format for the GZIP compression utility. ISO is a file system that uses writable CDs and DVDs or USB flash drives to create an optical disk image. JAR is a format for compressing Java class files and data. RAR is a format for the WinRAR file archive program. And TAR is a tape archive. What are audio and video formats? Audio and video formats are media files that can contain sound recordings, video recordings, or both. Audio files such as voice recordings, podcasts, music, and audiobooks are saved in audio formats. Video files, such as movies, TV shows, video presentations, and music videos are saved in video formats. 
and because different media players support different media format files, it's important to know which format you have. Audio and video formats are sometimes listed together and sometimes share the same extensions. This is because they often share the same properties or have both video and audio data in them. Common audio files include WAV, MPEG, which includes MP3 and MP4 file types, AAC, and MIDI. Common video files include AVI, FLV, MPEG, which includes MP4 and MPG, and WMV. Images, photos, digital paintings, and pictures can be stored as image files. The BMP format is an older file format, but it is not used as often due to large file size. The GIF format can store and cycle through several graphics in one file. JPG or JPEG have smaller file sizes, but also have lower image quality. PNG has higher image quality than its predecessor, GIF. And TIFF, or TIF, saves images in a high-quality format, but the images do have a larger file size. While these are not all of the image formats, these are the most common. Files that rely on mostly text are saved as document files. Some document formats are as follows. TXT, or text files, are plain text with no formatting. RTF, or rich text format, is a word processing format used by most of the common word processing applications. It includes basic text formatting, headers and footers, and margins. DOCX and DOC are used for Microsoft Word documents. XLSX and XLS are file formats for Microsoft Excel, a spreadsheet application. PDF format is primarily used by Adobe Acrobat and Adobe Reader. This format preserves document formatting so that no matter what device you open the file in, the file will look the same. And PPTX and PPT format are used for creating PowerPoint slides and decks for presentations. In this video, you learned that common file formats are executables, compressed, audio and video, image, and document. File formats are classified by name and extensions. Executable files run programs and applications. Some examples of executable files are EXE, CMD, SH, BAT, and MSI. Compression files save disk space and are commonly used for archiving files or bundling large files. Common compression file types are ZIP, GZIP, ISO, and JAR. Audio and video files are media files. Some examples of audio and media files are WAV, MPEG, MP3, MP4, AVI, and WMV. Pictures, photos, and digital drawings can be stored as image files. Examples of common image files are BMP, GIF, JPEG, and PNG. And finally, document files are mostly text-based files, like DOCX, PPTX, PDF, and RTF. Welcome to Common Web Browsers. After watching this video, you will be able to identify common web browsers and identify the components of a web browser. A web browser is the software interface that accesses resources on the internet, including text, images, music, video, and online games. As an internet user, you use a browser to request access to web pages on various websites. And it's the browser's job to request and retrieve that web-based content stored on a web server and display that content on web pages in the browser window on your device. You can use a web browser on several different types of devices, including desktop PCs, laptops, notebooks, tablets, smartphones, game consoles, and even smaller wearable tech devices, such as smartwatches. It is estimated that in 2021, just over 5 billion people around the world used some type of web browser. According to statistical information provided by StatCounter Global Stats, as of October 2021, the most commonly used web browsers, according to worldwide market share across all platforms, are Chrome by Google, 
which has approximately 65% of the market share. Safari by Apple, which has around 19% market share. Edge by Microsoft, which has just under 4% market share, which is closely followed by Firefox by Mozilla, which has an approximate market share of just over 3.6%, the Samsung Internet Browser, which has just under a 3% share, and finally, the Opera Browser, which has just over 2.3% share of the web browser market. Apart from the six most popular web browsers, there are several other alternative browsers that you could use instead. This table summarizes which browsers each operating system supports. Note that most web browsers can be used on any platform, but there are cases where the browser can only be used on a restricted set of operating system platforms, such as Apple Safari Browser, which can only be used on the Mac OS and iOS operating systems. And similarly, the Samsung Internet Browser can only be used on Samsung Galaxy devices running Android 5.0 or later. A typical web browser is made up of various components. The user interface is where the user uses common UI elements, such as a search bar and an address bar, to enter a uniform resource locator, or URL, to search for content on the web. It includes navigation tools, such as home, back, forward, and refresh buttons, along with other features such as history, bookmarks, and favorites to visit previously viewed pages or save links to web pages for later reference. The browser engine is the piece of code that is responsible for querying and controlling the rendering engine in the layer below it based on user interactions coming from the user interface layer above it, such as requests to load the URL and back and forward navigation when browsing. The rendering engine is responsible for presenting or rendering the requested web pages and content on your browser screen. Primarily, it interprets the hypertext markup language or HTML code, XML documents, and images and presents them in an easily digestible format on your browser screen. The rendering engine can also display other kinds of data by virtue of plugins or extensions. The networking component retrieves the entered URLs by using internet communication protocols, namely Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, and File Transfer Protocol, or FTP. This component is also responsible for handling a cache of recently retrieved content, which it can reissue when requested. This reduces network traffic by eliminating the need to constantly retrieve files from a web source that have been previously retrieved and have not changed since the last retrieval instance. The JavaScript interpreter, as the name suggests, interprets and executes any JavaScript code embedded in viewed websites. The interpreted results are directed to the rendering engine to be rendered on your browser screen. The user interface, or UI backend, is responsible for drawing basic widgets, such as windows and combo boxes, by using underlying operating system UI methods to expose a generic interface that is not platform-specific or dependent. And lastly, there is the data persistence, or data storage component, which is essentially a small database located on the local device that stores user data, such as cache, session storage, cookies, bookmarks, and user profile preferences. These components work together to give a web browser its core functionality. In this video, you learned that a web browser is the software interface to access resources on the internet including text, images, music, video, and online games. You can use a web browser from desktop PCs, laptops, tablets, smartphones, game consoles, and wearable tech devices, such as smartwatches. The six most widely used web browsers are Chrome, Safari, Edge, Firefox, Samsung Internet, and Opera. Most web browsers can be used on any platform, but some can only be used on a restricted set of operating system platforms. And finally, web browsers consist of several integrated software components. Welcome to Browser Installs and Updates. After watching this video, you will be able to 
identify how to obtain web browsers, and understand the need for web browser updates. So how do you obtain a web browser? Well, there are really two options. It will either be provided as a part of an operating system, as is the case with Microsoft Edge on the Windows operating system, Safari on Apple devices, and Samsung Internet on Android devices. Alternatively, and in addition, you can download a web browser from a vendor's website or app store, but of course, for that you will first need a web browser to initially browse to the site or store. There is a huge amount of debate about which browser is better than the other, which is more secure than the other, which performs faster than the other, and so on. But as these web browsers are all free to obtain and use, you are also free to make your own decision about which one or more best suits your needs. So, there is absolutely nothing wrong or uncommon with having several different web browsers installed and running on your device. In any case, you will likely be asked by the operating system at some point to define your default browser. And this is the one the operating system will automatically use when you click a link in an app or an email, for example. You are probably already aware that it is important to keep your operating system and software applications up to date. Well, the same is true for your web browsers, too. Here are some key reasons for keeping your web browsers updated. Compatibility with websites. As new web-based technologies emerge, websites start to use them, and therefore web browsers need to be improved and updated to support those new technologies. Any older versions of browsers that have not been updated may not be able to display or use some areas or features of a website. Security. If you don't keep your web browser updated to its latest version, it can lead to security vulnerabilities that expose your browser to the possibility of being compromised by some form of malicious software attack such as a virus, keylogger, or spyware. These attacks can lead to the leakage of personal and or financial information. New features. As developers add new or improved features to their browser software, or just generally improve its performance, your web browsers need to be updated to gain the benefits those improvements provide. Most of the top desktop web browsers provide standard, fast release updates at the same release rate, which typically releases major updates every four weeks, but releases minor updates such as security fixes, crash fixes, and updates to policies on an as-needed basis within the four-week period. This is currently the case for Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, and Mozilla Firefox browsers. Aside from the standard fast release update frequency, some vendors also offer an extended release for updates, which provides updates at a much reduced frequency to help more structured environments such as large corporations, educational establishments, and government departments maintain browser stability over a longer period. Regardless of which flavors of web browser you use, updating them is relatively quick and simple. Most browsers have an automatic updates option that is often the default setting, which typically checks for updates every hour or so and on every browser restart. However, if needed, you can manually initiate a browser update too. For example, in Google Chrome, you select the Customize and Control Google Chrome icon in the top right corner of the browser window, point to Help, and then select About Google Chrome. Chrome will check for any available updates and download and install them. In Mozilla Firefox, click the Open Application Menu icon in the top right corner of the browser window, then click Help, and then click About Firefox to check for updates. Firefox will check for any available updates, and you restart the browser to install the updates. In Microsoft Edge, click the Settings and More icon in the top right corner of the browser window, then point to Help and Feedback, and then click About Microsoft Edge. Edge will check for any available updates and download and install them. Once the update has been downloaded, you will need to restart Edge in order to complete the update process. Devices that run macOS regularly and automatically check for updates to the Safari browser and any other software installed via the App Store, and will prompt you to install updates as and when they are discovered using on-screen notifications. 
In the App Store, you can either update Safari alongside other applications as part of a single mass update process, or you can check for Safari updates only. If you want to manually check for and install updates to Safari only, select the Apple logo icon in the top left corner of the window, point to App Store, and then select the Updates tab. On the Updates tab, next to Software Update, select the More link. This will expand the system applications list and enable you to select Safari from the list of applications. Next to the Safari version number, select Update, and the latest available version of Safari will then download and install. In this video, you learned that web browsers can be obtained as part of an operating system or via a download. The key reasons for keeping your web browsers updated are website compatibility, security, and new features. The top desktop web browsers provide major updates every four weeks and minor updates on an as-needed basis within the four weeks. And web browsers usually update automatically, but you can also update them manually if required. Welcome to Browser Plugins and Extensions. After watching this video, you will be able to define browser plugins, define browser extensions, and install and configure browser plugins and extensions. A web browser typically allows users to not only view HTML content, but also some other web-based content, such as images, video, audio, and XML files. However, in most cases, to view other, more advanced types of content, you need additional software. A browser plugin, also sometimes referred to as an add-in or add-on, is essentially a small piece of software that provides some specific bit of additional functionality to a web browser. In this way, you can use plugins to customize your browser, and therefore your browser experience. So, a plugin extends the capabilities of your web browser. Common examples of a plugin are the Adobe Reader plugin that enables you to view PDF content, the Adobe Flash Player that lets you view FLV formatted videos, or the Java plugin that allows you to run applications written in the Java programming language. Typically, when you browse to a website that has this type of content available and you do not already have the appropriate plugin installed, you will be prompted with a link to download it. It is also worth noting that as plugins are improved to support new features or are updated to increase security, you will need to update your installed plugins too. Many web browsers now update their plugins automatically, but some older browsers may not. A browser extension is an application that provides extended functionality for a web browser and allows users to customize their web browsers. Extensions and plugins may seem similar, and although they do provide seemingly similar benefits to a web browser, they actually work quite differently. A browser plugin is an executable piece of software code that gives you added functionality on a specific web page or website, whereas browser extensions typically consist of source code that is not executable, but they extend the core functionality and features of the web browser itself, hence the term extension. So, a browser extension can customize a web browser's context menus, add buttons and toolbars, manage cookies and block pop-up ads, for example, but a browser plugin cannot. Browser extensions are widely used, but in the last few years, browser plugins have largely been deprecated by most popular web browsers, and they no longer support them. As mentioned previously, some modern browsers do not support plugins at all. So, in Google Chrome, for example, there is no longer a plugins page available to view or the option to disable installed plugins. In browsers that still provide some support for standard plugins, such as Mozilla Firefox, you can configure the plugin settings. In Firefox, you open the application menu, select add ons and themes, and select plugins in the left menu, which then displays the installed plugins. Select the ellipsis button next to the name of the plugin and select Manage. Here, you can configure the individual plugins settings, such as allowing automatic updates. You can also configure general plugin settings in Firefox by selecting the Tools for All add ons button. 
Here you can check for updates, view recent updates, install add-ons from a file, and configure the automatic updates setting. To configure browser plugins in Internet Explorer, you open the Tools menu, then select Manage Add-ons. Select Toolbars and Extensions in the left menu, which then displays the installed plugins and extensions. By default, it shows all currently loaded add-ons, but you can change this to display all add-ons instead. Then you can configure an individual plugin, such as enabling or disabling it. The method for installing browser extensions varies slightly between different web browsers. For example, to install web browser extensions in Microsoft Edge, you select the Extensions button on the toolbar, select Open Microsoft Edge add-ons, search for the extension you want to install, select Get, and then select Add Extension. Your new extensions toolbar will now be visible in your web browser. Whereas, to install browser extensions in Google Chrome, you browse to the Chrome Web Store, then, in the Extensions section, you search for the extension you want to install. Select the extension from the suggested list, select Add to Chrome, and then select Add Extension. And your new Extensions toolbar will now be visible in your web browser. To configure browser extensions in Microsoft Edge, select the Extensions button on the toolbar, select Manage Extensions, and then either select Details to configure the extension or select Remove to delete the extension from the web browser. To configure browser extensions in Google Chrome, select the Customize and Control Google Chrome button, point to More Tools, and then select Extensions. Here you can either configure the extension by clicking Details, remove it, or simply turn the extension on or off using the toggle switch. You may have noticed that some browser settings only allow you to disable a plugin or extension, but they do not allow you to remove them. In these cases, you need to use the Uninstall feature on your computer. For example, in Windows 10, from the Start menu, you select the gear icon to open Settings, select Apps, and then select Apps and Features. From this list of apps and features, you select the plugin or extension you wish to remove and select Uninstall, then follow the instructions. You may also find that malicious plugins and extensions will typically not appear in the list of installed apps and features on your operating system, and they will require more work to remove. The simplest way to do this is to run some form of trusted anti-malware program, which will help you to remove the offending item. Genuine plugins and extensions developed by reputable organizations can be very useful additions to your web browser and are safe to download and use. So, to avoid malware, ensure you trust the source of a plugin or extension before you install it. In this video, you learned that a browser plugin is a small piece of software that provides some specific bit of additional functionality to a web browser. You need to update your installed plugins. Most modern web browsers update plugins automatically. Plugins are largely deprecated by the major web browsers. Extensions enable users to customize a web browser. Extensions can customize a browser's context menus, add buttons and toolbars, manage cookies, and block pop-ups. Extensions are widely used by all web browsers. And you should ensure you trust the plugin or extension source before installing it. Welcome to Basic Browser Security Settings. After watching this video, you will be able to identify and access basic browser security settings, manage proxy server settings, and manage cookie and cache settings. The method for accessing security settings in each web browser is slightly different, but most of them offer similar kinds of settings to enforce security and privacy. For example, in the Google Chrome web browser, to access these settings, you select the Customize and Control Google Chrome button, that's the vertical three dots in the top right corner, and select Settings. Then you select Privacy and Security from the left navigation menu, and from here, you can configure several settings, including clearing browsing data, configuring cookies and site data, configuring safe browsing options and managing certificates, 
and site permissions. You can also navigate directly to this settings page by browsing to Chrome colon forward slash forward slash settings forward slash privacy in the address bar. And in Microsoft's Edge web browser, you can access security and privacy settings by selecting the settings and more button, that's the horizontal three dots in the top right corner, and select settings. Then, for most security settings, you select privacy, search, and services from the left navigation menu. Here, you can configure several security settings, including tracking prevention, clearing browser data, privacy settings, managing certificates, blocking unwanted apps, secure browsing options, and services settings. You can also navigate directly to this settings page by browsing to edge colon forward slash forward slash settings forward slash privacy in the address bar. In the left navigation menu, there is also a cookies and site permissions option. Here you can manage and delete cookies and site data, as well as view and configure all your site permissions. You can also navigate directly to this settings page by browsing to edge colon forward slash forward slash settings forward slash content in the address bar. Other security settings you need to consider are the proxy server settings. A proxy server acts as a go-between when you browse the web so that to the websites you are browsing, the site visitor appears to be the proxy server rather than your computer. There are several advantages to using a proxy server. Firstly, it can help protect your privacy when browsing the internet or bypass certain content restrictions. It can also help organizations and educational establishments to maintain web security, web monitoring, and content filtering when their employees are browsing the internet. This helps organizations control what web content is being accessed, when it is being accessed, and by whom, typically to comply with organizational security policies. Using a proxy server can also help reduce an organization's bandwidth usage and improve the speed of web requests. Proxy servers essentially work by modifying the IP address information in a web request to web servers to make the request appear to be coming from the proxy server rather than from the original requesting client computer on the proxy server's network. So, the proxy server makes the request on the client computer's behalf. The response from the web server is sent back to the proxy server, and the proxy server then forwards the information onto the original requesting client computer. While retrieving the information on behalf of the requesting client PC, the proxy server will typically change the source IP address data and may also perform other tasks such as encrypting data and blocking access to certain categories of web content. To configure proxy server settings in Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, and the Opera browser, you use the proxy settings defined by the operating system. For example, in Google Chrome and the Opera browser, you open Settings, then in the left navigation menu, expand Advanced, and select System. From here, you can select Open Your Computer's proxy settings. Similarly, in Microsoft Edge, you open Settings, then in the left navigation menu, select System and Performance, and again, you select Open Your Computer's proxy settings. In all cases in Windows 10, this action opens the proxy settings page. From here, you can either configure auto-detect proxy settings, or you can manually specify the proxy server address and port to use. Some other web browsers allow you to configure proxy settings that differ from those defined and controlled by the operating system. For example, in Mozilla Firefox web browser, you open Settings, then scroll down to Network Settings and select Settings. From here, you can either choose to use the operating system settings, which is the default, or you can choose Auto Detect or Manually Configured Proxy Server Settings. Other devices, such as tablets and mobile phones, also allow you to configure proxy settings. For example, on an iOS device, such as an Apple iPhone or iPad, you open Settings, then navigate to Wi-Fi and select the name of your wireless network. Then scroll down to the HTTP Proxy section and select Configure Proxy. And just like for other web browsers, you can choose between Off, Manual, and Automatic for your proxy server settings. Cookies are small pieces of text-based data that contain information about your computer when browsing a website. 
This information can be used to save session information for when a user revisits a website and to provide a more customized and targeted experience for the user. A classic example of a session-based cookie would be one that retains data about items in an online shopping basket when you are purchasing goods on a website. While most cookies can be useful, you should also be aware of the risks they bring, such as invading your privacy by tracking your browsing activities and targeting you with unsolicited online ads, and potentially more seriously, using cookie fraud to falsify your identity on the internet or use your legitimate identity to carry out malicious activities. Cookies can be viewed and managed in your web browser settings. In Google Chrome, you navigate to Settings, Privacy, and Security, and then select Cookies and Other Site Data. Many websites require cookies to be enabled on your browser in order to provide their online services, but there may be occasions when you wish to disable cookies or at least be able to control whether they are created when you visit a website. You can allow all cookies, block third-party cookies, or block all cookies. Additionally, you may want to delete cookies when you no longer need them. You can also view the cookies currently saved by your browser. In the list of cookies, you can use the icons to either view the details about a cookie or delete it. Cache is the temporary area used by your web browser to store web data that can be quickly reused when requested, instead of needing to go back to the original source content. So, in this situation, if the web content hasn't changed since it was last retrieved, it can be served from the local disk rather than from the internet, and in this way, the cache can vastly improve the web browser's speed and performance and can help reduce bandwidth usage. If you want to ensure you are retrieving the latest content from the internet or are concerned about storing some data locally, you can clear or purge the cache from the disk. To manage cache in Google Chrome, navigate to Settings, Privacy, and Security, then select Clear Browsing Data. In the Clear Browsing Data dialog box, you need to select the time range, which can be from one hour up to all time. Then select the Cached Images and Files checkbox and select Clear Data. In this video, you learned that a proxy server acts as a go-between when web browsing. Proxy servers help organizations reduce bandwidth usage, improve speed of web requests, and maintain security. You can configure either manual or automatic proxy server settings. Cookies are the small text-based files containing information about your computer when browsing. Cookie settings can be configured to allow all cookies, block third-party cookies, or block all cookies. Cache is a temporary storage area, so data can be quickly reused when requested. And you can clear the cache from the disk when it's no longer required. Welcome to Browser Security Certificates and Pop-Up Settings. After watching this video, you will be able to Identify and access advanced browser security settings. Verify security certificates for websites and configure pop-up settings. The method for accessing security settings in each web browser is slightly different, but most of them offer similar kinds of settings to enforce security and privacy. For example, in the Google Chrome web browser to access these settings, you select the Customize and Control Google Chrome button that's the vertical three dots in the top right corner, and select Settings. Then you can select Privacy and Security from the left navigation menu. And from here, you can configure several settings, including configuring safe browsing options, managing certificates, and configuring site settings, such as site permissions and pop-ups. You can also navigate directly to this settings page by browsing to Chrome colon forward slash forward slash settings forward slash privacy in the address bar. And in Microsoft's Edge web browser, you can access security and privacy settings by selecting the settings and more button, that's the horizontal three dots in the top right corner, and selecting settings. Then for most security settings, you select privacy, search, and services from the left navigation menu. Here, you can configure several security settings, including tracking prevention, managing certificates, blocking unwanted apps, and secure browsing options. 
And again, you can also navigate directly to this settings page by browsing to edge colon forward slash forward slash settings forward slash privacy in the address bar. When you are browsing websites, especially those that you have never visited before, and even more crucially, if you are using the website of a financial institution, such as an online bank, it is a good security practice to check the authenticity of those websites. You can identify a secure website by looking for the padlock icon next to the URL in the browser's address bar. And when you click the padlock, you should see the message, connection is secure. If you don't see the padlock icon and instead see a warning icon and the words not secure to the left of the URL, then this site is not using the secure sockets layer or SSL protocol. So, in other words, you are accessing it by using the HTTP protocol rather than the more secure HTTPS protocol. SSL, or more accurately, SSL over TLS, or Transport Layer Security, is a protocol standard for secure communications between two systems over the internet by virtue of encryption algorithms. When you see the not secure message to the left of the URL, it means that either the SSL security certificate on the website you are visiting has expired and therefore needs renewing by the hosting website, or the security certificate has been signed or authorized by an issuing authority that is not trusted by the browser. In other words, the Certification Authority, or CA, is not on the browser's built-in list of trusted certificate providers. If you click the Not Secure message, you will see a dialog box that informs you that the connection to the website is not secure, and the message also warns you about entering sensitive information on this site. Even when you are browsing a website that is displaying the padlock icon, if you are unsure about its authenticity or just want to dig a bit deeper into the security information behind that website, you can view the security certificate that has been issued to the web server hosting the website. The certificate is issued by a certification authority or CA. To view a website security certificate in Google Chrome, browse to a website using the HTTPS protocol and click the URL address in the address bar to display the full URL. Select the padlock icon to the left of the URL and select Connection is Secure. Then select Certificate is Valid and the web server certificate will open in a separate dialog box. Here you can view general certificate information such as the issuing CA and the validity dates. On the other tabs, you can view detailed information about the certificate such as its serial number, security algorithms, and its certification path back to the issuing CA. Many websites contain pages that host third-party scripts or pop-up ads, also known simply as pop-ups, which are typically used to target you for online marketing purposes. They can sometimes be a little annoying as they might distract you from your intended purpose and can literally get in the way of what you are trying to view on a website. But while they may be simply annoying, there is also the potential for them to be malicious as well, and the developers of these pop-ups will usually associate them with some form of on-screen activity, such as clicking a button. The button could be labeled close or cancel, and therefore may appear to be totally legitimate. Another common type of malicious pop-up is ransomware that looks like a notification from a government agency, such as the IRS or the FBI. Ransomware is malware, that can enable hackers to take control of a victim's computer if they click a link in the pop-up notification. So, to maintain security and for a better browsing experience, you should be very careful when interacting with these kinds of items. It is also important for you to know how to block these items when browsing a website. Most modern web browsers include built-in tools for blocking pop-ups, but there are many third-party pop-up blockers or ad blockers available on the market, such as AdBlock, AdGuard, AdBlock, Ghostery, and AdBlock Plus. And some of these include additional features, such as ad filtering. Today's modern web browsers block pop-ups by default. This is typically indicated in your web browser by an icon in the browser's address bar or a notification dialog box. To modify Google Chrome's behavior when encountering pop-ups, open Settings and select Privacy and Security. 
select Site Settings, and then scroll down to the Content section and select Pop-ups and Redirects. Here, you can choose which default behavior to use for pop-ups. The options are either to allow all sites to send pop-ups and use redirects, or to not allow any sites to send pop-ups and use redirects. However, you can also customize this default behavior by adding sites to the allowed list and or the blocked list. For example, here we have added the popuptest.com and amazon.co.uk sites to the blocked list, and the skillup.tech and bbc.co.uk sites to the allowed list. Note that you can use the syntax square bracket asterisk dot square bracket before the domain name, which will then include all subdomains as well. In this video, you learned that it is a good security practice to check the authenticity of websites you are visiting. You can identify a secure website by looking for the padlock icon next to the URL in a browser's address bar. Pop-ups are typically used to target you for online marketing purposes. And while pop-ups are annoying and distracting, they can also be malicious. Modern web browsers include built-in pop-up blocking tools, but you can also use third-party pop-up blocking apps. And you can modify your browser's default behavior when encountering pop-ups. Welcome to Private Browsing and Client-Side Scripting Settings. After watching this video, you will be able to enable Private Browsing Mode in Web Browsers and manage Client-Side Scripting Settings. If you want to hide your browsing activity, then you can utilize Private Browsing, which is a web browsing mode that does not save the kinds of information about your activity that a standard browsing session would, such as the history of visited websites, passwords entered, data entered in web forms, cookies, and session cache. This data is deleted when you close the private browsing window. But please note that this only hides the information locally from people who might use the web browser on the device after you. It does not hide the information from your internet service provider or ISP or from the websites and web servers that you visit. Additionally, your place of education or your workplace might also be able to view this data. All the major web browsers have a private browsing mode, but they refer to it by different names. For example, in Google Chrome, it is called incognito mode. In Microsoft Edge, it is referred to as in private. And in Firefox and Opera browsers, it is simply called private browsing. In Google Chrome, you can start a private browsing session by selecting the Customize and Control Google Chrome button in the top right corner, then selecting New Incognito Window. In Microsoft Edge, you select the Settings and More button in the top right corner, then select New in Private Window. And in Opera, you select the Customize and Control Opera logo in the top left corner, then select New Private Window. Alternatively, in all three of these cases, you can use the shortcut key, which is Control plus Shift plus N. But in the Mozilla Firefox browser, the shortcut is Control plus Shift plus P. In the early days of the World Wide Web, most web pages were written in HTML, and they were fairly static pages, that is, the page looked the same to every user who visited it. This issue was resolved by the development of dynamic web pages that could adapt to the needs of different scenarios and different viewers of the web page. These dynamic pages are generally generated in one of two ways. Either the processing is done by the server that is hosting the dynamic content, this is referred to as server-side scripting, or the client computer is responsible for the processing, which is referred to as client-side scripting. With client-side scripting, special code is embedded in the web page itself, and the user's web browser does the required processing to retrieve the data. By far, the most common example of this kind of client-side scripting code is JavaScript. These client-side scripts will generally provide a set of instructions to be performed by the browser. The key benefits of client-side scripts are that users can see the scripts on the front end, they do not need to rely on server resources, and therefore, they can help reduce the load on servers. However, although client-side scripting can be very useful, 
it also brings its own dangers in terms of security implications. In theory, the instructions contained in the code that is processed by the web browser could instruct the browser to perform all manner of malicious actions, including accessing settings and data on the local computer. Fortunately, web browsers are designed with inbuilt security measures to mitigate against most of these kinds of security threat, such as restricting the code to only executing within the browser and therefore not allowing access to the local computer system. However, malware developers are constantly trying to find new ways to circumvent these security measures or detect flaws in them. Therefore, it is important for you to be able to control client-side scripting in your web browser. To help you decide whether or not you should disable JavaScript in your web browser, here are some pros and cons of disabling it. First, some of the pros. The major pro for disabling JavaScript is security. One of the biggest known potential issues with JavaScript is suspicious web pages and the possibility and opportunity for malicious code to be run in your browser that could adversely affect your computer. Browsing speed could be improved by eliminating the dynamic content that JavaScript can provide. Not all browsers are capable of supporting and running JavaScript effectively, as they can each interpret the code in a different manner which could lead to inconsistencies in functionality and the overall browsing experience. If you disable the JavaScript programming language, you can make sure that your browser successfully views and loads pages correctly, particularly in the case of older web pages and websites. Another major issue for internet users is that companies can track their internet usage and then sell that data onto other interested companies. If you disable JavaScript, a lot of the cookies that are responsible for the gathering of this personal information will no longer function correctly. And now, some of the cons. When you disable JavaScript, you lose the ability to view a lot of the useful dynamic content that is available on the internet, such as images, videos, maps, and various types of media. Additionally, many of the features that create the user interface will disappear which can look very confusing and hard to read on a website that contains a lot of JavaScript-based content. With JavaScript disabled, it can be much harder and take much longer to search for and scroll through the content on dynamic web pages, and you may find yourself needing to continually click on next links to progress through the content. If you want to stop JavaScript scripts being run in your web browser, you can disable them in your web browser settings. For example, in Google Chrome, you select Settings, then Privacy and Security, then Site Settings, and then under the Content section, you select JavaScript. Here, you can set the default behavior to either allow all sites to run JavaScript or to not allow any sites to run JavaScript. The default for this setting is to allow all sites to run JavaScript. If you want to set a custom behavior for some sites, you can either block specific sites from running JavaScript scripts, or you can allow specific sites to run them. As before, you can use the syntax square bracket asterisk dot square bracket in front of the domain name to include all subdomains as well. When deciding whether to block these client-side JavaScript scripts or not, you need to balance between the additional functionality they provide on a website against the potential security risks they might pose. This is what you might see when you visit a website that you have added to the list of sites that are not allowed to run JavaScript code. You then have the option of continuing to block JavaScript on this site or allowing it. In this video, you learned that you can hide your browsing activity by using private browsing, which does not save historical information about your activity. Private browsing only hides the information locally from people using the web browser on the device after you. Dynamic web pages can adapt to different situations and different users. With client-side scripting, code is embedded in the web page and the user's web browser performs the required processing. And you can stop JavaScript scripts being run in your web browser or on specific sites. Welcome to Introduction to Cloud Computing and Cloud Deployment and Service Models. 
After watching this video, you will be able to describe cloud computing concepts, define cloud deployment models and cloud service models, and identify the characteristics of cloud computing. Cloud computing, also referred to as the cloud, is the delivery of on-demand computing resources, such as networks, servers, storage, applications, services, and data centers over the internet on a pay-for-use basis. The term cloud computing can be used to describe applications and data that users access over the internet rather than on their local computer. Examples of cloud computing include users using online web apps, employees using secure online business applications to conduct their work, and users storing personal files on cloud-based storage platforms such as Google Drive, OneDrive, and Dropbox. One of the main user benefits of cloud computing is that instead of users needing to purchase their own applications and install them locally on their computer, they can use online versions of those applications and pay a monthly subscription. Not only is this typically more cost-effective initially, but users can also access the latest version of the application without having to purchase a full retail copy of the newer version. A side advantage of this is that the user also saves lots of local storage space as the application is hosted online. And the beauty of most cloud-based applications is that they also enable users to work collaboratively with their colleagues working on the same files in real time and being able to see each other's edits and updates. Cloud computing is composed of five essential characteristics, three deployment models, and three service models. Let's start with understanding the five essential characteristics of the cloud. On-demand self-service means that you get access to cloud resources, such as the processing power, storage, and network you need using a simple interface without requiring human interaction with each service provider. Broad network access means that cloud computing resources can be accessed via the network through standard mechanisms and platforms such as mobile phones, tablets, laptops, and workstations. Resource pooling is what gives cloud providers economies of scale, which they pass on to their customers, making cloud cost-efficient. Using a multi-tenant model, computing resources are pooled to serve multiple consumers, and cloud resources are dynamically assigned and reassigned according to demand, without customers needing to know the physical location of these resources. Rapid elasticity implies that you can access more resources when you need them and scale back when you don't, because resources are elastically provisioned and released. And measured service means that you only pay for what you use or reserve as you go. If you're not using resources, you're not paying. Resource usage is monitored, measured, and reported transparently based on consumer utilization. As you have seen, cloud computing is really about using technology as a service, leveraging remote systems on demand over the open internet, scaling up and scaling back, and paying for what you use. And it has changed the way the world consumes compute services by making them more cost-efficient while also making organizations more agile in response to changes in their markets. Cloud deployment models indicate where the infrastructure resides, who owns and manages it, and how cloud resources and services are made available to users. There are three types of cloud deployment models, public, private, and hybrid. Public cloud is when you leverage cloud services over the open internet on hardware owned by the cloud provider, but its usage is shared by other companies. Private cloud means that the cloud infrastructure is provisioned for exclusive use by a single organization. It could run on-premises, or it could be owned, managed, and operated by a service provider. And when you use a mix of both public and private clouds working together seamlessly, that is classified as the hybrid cloud model. Now, let's look at the three cloud service models that are based on the three layers in a computing stack, infrastructure, platform, and application. These cloud computing models are aptly referred to as infrastructure as a service, or IaaS, platform as a service, or PaaS, and Software as a Service, or SAAS. 
In an IAAS model, you can access the infrastructure and physical computing resources, such as servers, networking, storage, and data center space without the need to manage or operate them. In a PAAS model, you can access the platform that comprises the hardware and software tools that are usually needed to develop and deploy applications to users over the internet. And an SAAS is a software licensing and delivery model in which software and applications are centrally hosted and licensed on a subscription basis. It is sometimes referred to as on-demand software. In this video, you learned that Cloud computing is the delivery of on-demand computing resources over the internet on a pay-for-use basis. Cloud computing is composed of five essential characteristics, three deployment models, and three service models. The five essential characteristics of cloud computing are on-demand self-service, broad network access, resource pooling, rabbit elasticity, and measured service. There are three types of cloud deployment models public, private, and hybrid. And the three cloud service models are based on the three layers in a computing stack, infrastructure, platform, and application, and they are referred to as infrastructure as a service, or IAAS, platform as a service, or PAAS, and software as a service, or SAAS. Welcome to Application Architecture and Delivery Methods. After watching this video, you will be able to define application architecture models and define application delivery methods. When developers create an application, they must ask, how will an application be used and how will it be accessed? Also, will the application be one tier, two tier, three tier, or N tier? Depending on the size of the application, developers need to determine the application architecture that will work best. The one-tier architecture is a single-tier model. It is also sometimes referred to as the monolithic model. All the components of an application run on one local computer. The two-tier architecture model consists of two sides, a workspace-based client, like your personal computer, and a web server or a database server. It's a two-tier model because the application is kept in two places, the hardware of the user and the hardware of the server. The three-tier architecture divides applications into three tiers, the workspace-based client, the application server or web server, and another server like a database server. The benefit of a three-tier architecture is that each tier can be individually developed and updated by a separate team, and each tier can be modified and upgraded without affecting the other tiers. The N-tier model has a number of tiers. The N in N-tier stands for number. Sometimes it is referred to as a multi-tier model. It has a workspace-based client tier, like a personal computer. It could also have a web server or a database server tier. It might have a security tier. And it has several other tiers with additional servers. And the N-tier model is more popular than the one-tier monolithic pattern because it is more in line with the microservices pattern and the Agile model. There are some advantages and disadvantages of N-tier applications. Some of those are code changes and updates can be made to specific tiers, which takes less time than changing all tiers. Each tier can have its own security settings. Different tiers can be load balanced, distributing application activity in the least busy server in a group of servers where the application is hosted. Tiers can be individually backed up by IT administrators. And changes, updates, and backups may take longer because there are more tiers. There are several different ways that applications can be available to users. Local installation, hosted on a local network, and cloud hosted. A user can locally install an application, such as a game, on their computer. The application exists on their local computer and a network connection is not required. Files for the application are saved locally on the user's personal device. Some applications are local network hosted. 
Applications are used over a hosted network, such as over a local area network, or LAN, or a wide area network, WAN. Users can access the applications on the server's local storage. An internet access is not required, however, a network like a LAN or WAN is required. Cloud-hosted applications are available over the internet. To use the application, internet access is required and normally paid access or a subscription to the service that provides the application is required. And files are saved in the cloud, so they do not need to be saved locally to your computer or device. In this video, you learned that application architecture models are made up of one-tier, two-tier, three-tier, and n-tier models. The benefits of a three-tier architecture are that each tier can be individually developed and updated by a separate team, and it can also be modified and upgraded without affecting the other tiers. N-tier models are currently the most used because changes can be made quickly to individual tiers. Each tier can have its own security settings. Tiers can be load balanced, and each tier can be individually backed up. And finally, Application delivery methods are local installation, hosted on a local network, and cloud-hosted. Welcome to Software Development Lifecycle. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe the Software Development Lifecycle, or SDLC, framework. Explain the different phases of the SDLC and identify the various SDLC models. The SDLC is a structured framework that defines the steps in creating and developing software. Organizations follow a detailed plan to develop, maintain, or enhance specific software. The SDLC framework details a methodology for consistent software development that ensures quality software production. There are six major steps in the SDLC process. Requirement analysis and planning, design, coding, testing, deployment, and maintenance. In the first stage of the SDLC, the requirement analysis and planning phase, all relevant information is gathered from the customer. As part of the planning process, labor and material costs are calculated, targets are estimated, and project teams and leaders are proposed. Feedback is also gathered from stakeholders on the requirement analysis document. When planning a software solution, several factors must be considered. Users of the solution, overall purpose of the solution, data inputs and outputs, legal and regulatory compliance, risk identification, quality assurance requirements, allocation of human and financial resources, and project scheduling. These specifications are combined into a document called a Software Requirement Specification, or SRS document. The SRS document needs to be clearly understood and approved by the stakeholders. The developers are also involved at this stage for a clear understanding of the requirements. In the design phase, the requirements gathered in the SRS document are used as an input, and a software architecture is developed and reviewed by the stakeholders and team. The document created in this phase is called a design document, and it is used by developers for the coding process. The coding or implementation phase is when the developers start the coding process once the design document is baselined. The project planners assign code development tasks to the developers, and teams in turn start coding. A modular or microservices approach is often used, and code chunks are created as outlined in the design document. This is one of the longest phases of the SDLC process. The testing phase is next in the process once coding is complete. Some large projects have dedicated testing teams. Created code needs to be thoroughly tested to ensure it is stable, secure, and performs the necessary functions. Testing can be manual, automated, or a hybrid of both. Product bugs are reported, tracked, and fixed, and code is retested until the software is stable. Some common testing types are unit testing, regression testing, integration testing, and stress testing. The deployment phase is where the application is released into the production environment and made available to users. 
This can also happen in stages. First, it is released onto a User Acceptance Testing, or UAT, platform. And once the customer signs off on the functionality, it is released to production. This approach can be used for making software available on a website, mobile device app store, or a software distribution server on a corporate network. The maintenance phase, once the code has been deployed into the production environment, is required to fix any issues as they come up or to enhance the code as needed. If bugs are discovered in this phase that were missed during testing, then these errors are fixed or planned as part of a future software release. At each phase of the SDLC cycle, documentation is maintained and metrics are recorded and evaluated for compliance. There are various models that implement the SDLC methodology. Some of the popular ones are waterfall, iterative, spiral, V-shaped, agile, and lean. A waterfall model is also called a linear sequential model. The output of one phase is the input for the next phase in the cycle. Development and work on the next phase start only after the completion of the previous phase. The iterative model is also called an iterative incremental model. Product features are developed iteratively, and once all iterations are complete, the final product build includes all the features of the product. The spiral model uses both the waterfall and prototype models. It is best suited for large projects, and it reduces risk to a large extent. The spiral model has four phases, planning, risk analysis, engineering, and evaluation. The spiral model phases are followed iteratively. The V-shaped model is also called a verification and validation model. Development and testing are concurrent, that is, testing is implemented parallel to the development phase. The Agile model focuses on a collaborative software development process over multiple short cycles rather than a top-down process. Teams work in cycles or sprints, which are two to four weeks long. Testing happens in each sprint to minimize the risk of failure. Agile is a form of an iterative approach to development. At the end of each iteration, a minimum viable product is developed that can receive user feedback, and this process is repeated for every sprint cycle. The four core values to Agile development are individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. The Lean model is the application of Lean principles to software development. Like Agile development, the Lean model also focuses on delivery speed, continuous improvement, and reducing waste in every phase. The Lean methodology is based on seven principles. Eliminate waste, build in quality, create knowledge, defer commitment, deliver fast, respect people, and optimize the whole. DevOps methodology evolved from application of Agile and Lean practices to operations work, wherein development and operations teams work collaboratively to accelerate the deployment of software products. There are some differences between a traditional SDLC and the Agile method of software development. Traditional SDLC centers around the whole product being developed before being sent to the customer, and the Agile focuses on short, quick bursts of development. Research and planning are often completed at the beginning of a project in a traditional SDLC. The Agile development is different, relying on ongoing research, planning, and testing during product development. When adding new features into a project, development must go through the same waterfall process of a traditional SDLC, but in Agile, new features are handled quickly and easily. In this video, you learned that the SDLC is a framework for software development in a systematic manner. The SDLC phases are broadly classified into six steps, requirement analysis and planning, design, coding, testing, deployment, and maintenance. And there are several SDLC models. The most popular ones include Waterfall, Iterative, Spiral, and Agile.
Welcome to Interpreted and Compiled Programming Languages. After watching this video, you will be able to identify interpreted programming languages and identify compiled programming languages. What are programming languages? Programming languages help us tell computers what to do. Computers don't use human language, they use their own language called machine code. Machines understand binary code, that is, ones and zeros, so to make communicating with computers easier, we have human-readable programming languages. Two common categories for programming languages are interpreted and compiled. These are broad categories, and there are many programming languages that are classified under compiled languages and interpreted languages. The purpose of the project helps a developer determine which programming language is best. Interpreted language is also commonly referred to as scripted or scripting language. Programs written in interpreted or scripted language, like Python and HTML, run through the programming interpreter on your computer's operating system or in your web browser. Remember that programming languages are in human-readable code, so the interpreter takes the human-readable scripted code and then translates it into machine code, enabling the computer to complete the requested task. As computers and web pages have changed and advanced, some interpreted programming languages are outdated, and they are not as useful or relevant. Some other languages are more versatile and easier to learn, which means they are preferred over other scripting languages and are used more often. All interpreted programming languages need an interpreter to translate the source code. Translators are built into your web browser or they require a program on your computer to translate the code. Several different interpreted programming languages exist. Some examples of common interpreted programming language types are JavaScript, a simpler scripting language that runs through the web browser interpreter, Python, a language that is popular because it is easy to learn and use for developers. Lua, a general-purpose, lightweight game scripting language that is easy to learn and use. And HTML, a markup language used for formatting web pages. Another category of programming languages is the compiled programming languages. Compiled programs are applications and programs, like your music app or your operating system, that you run on your computer or device. The programs are packaged, or compiled, into one executable file. They are usually larger programs. Compiled programs are used to help solve more challenging problems like interpreting source code. Compiled programming languages are often referred to more simply as programming languages. A compiler program creates a program file, which runs the software. Simply put, it piles the code into one file that runs when you double-click on the app on your device. The program runs faster, and it can be done repeatedly. The source code is converted from the programming language to machine code. Then it is compiled into one executable file. Finally, the program runs when you select the icon or file on your device. Some examples of compiled programming languages are C and its variations, C++ and C Sharp, which are used in many operating systems like Microsoft Windows, Apple's Mac OS, and the open source operating system, Linux. Java is another compiled programming language. It shouldn't be confused with the interpreted language JavaScript. The Android OS is written in Java because it works well across computing platforms. Let's look at this process. When you update to a new version of your operating system, like Microsoft Windows, your device might download an installation program. That program is made up of many files. The files are written in a compiled programming language. These files give instructions to your device in machine code. The compiled program is running on your device. A compiled program that you commonly use is your device's operating system, such as Linux, Microsoft Windows, Apple's Mac OS, or Android. Your operating system is written in a compiled programming language, like C, C++, C Sharp, or Java. In this video, you learned that interpreted programming languages run scripts that are repetitive and need to be run often. 
Interpreted programming languages are more versatile and can be used across platforms as long as there is the correct interpreter. Some examples of interpreted programming languages are JavaScript, Python, and HTML. Compiled programming languages are for more complex programs that complete larger tasks. Compiled programming languages are used for creating executable files that can run directly from your device. And some examples of compiled programming languages are C and Java. Welcome to Comparing Compiled and Interpreted Programming Languages. After watching this video, you will be able to compare interpreted and compiled programming languages and discuss interpreted and compiled programming languages. How do developers choose a programming language? Developers choose which programming language is best to use depending on what they have the most experience with and what they trust, what is best for their users, and what is the most efficient to use. What are interpreted and compiled programming languages? Interpreted programming languages are used to create a scripted source code for smaller tasks. The source code goes through an interpreter. The interpreter is built into the operating system on a computer or on a web browser. Compiled programming languages are used to create files. The files are executable files. They are then grouped in programs that you can run on a computer or device. Interpreted programming languages are also called script code or scripting because they are used to automate tasks. Interpreter programs read and execute the source code line by line like someone would read a script. Each time the program runs, the source code needs to be executed to receive the desired output. And source code written in one of the interpreted programming languages runs on almost any operating system with the right interpreter. For example, imagine you have a client requesting information about web page views for last month. Which type of programming language would be the most appropriate and efficient to create a program for this task? You would use one of the interpreted programming languages to write code for a script. The script would retrieve the web page views data and then put it into a table for the client to read. Compiled programming languages are also called programming languages for short. They are used for more complex programs that complete larger tasks like running a spreadsheet program on your computer. A compiled programming language is used to write a larger program usually installed on your device as an executable file. Writing code in a compiled language does take longer, but the payoff is that the program's code runs faster because compiled programs are installed on the device. And once the program is coded, the compiled program is grouped into one downloadable file. Remember that client who wanted information about web page views? Now they want a spreadsheet program to view and manage the data. A programmer could use the C programming language to create a compiled program like Microsoft Excel. So what are the major differences between interpreted programming languages and compiled programming languages? First, there's interpreted programming. These programs are available across multiple platforms or in the cloud. The scripting languages are easier to learn and use, and they're better for websites because they tackle smaller, repeated processes. Then there's compiled programming. These programs are available to users with the same operating system coded in the same language. However, compiled programming languages are more difficult to learn and use because they are larger programs with more parts. And they're better for larger tasks like running the operating system on your computer. To better understand more of the similarities and differences of programming languages, let's take a look at some examples. A few of the most common programming languages are C, C++, and C Sharp. C is a compiled programming language. C is the original language, and C++ and C Sharp are variations. C and its variations are case-sensitive languages. The C programming language is the basis for Windows and other common operating systems. 
and it takes more time to learn and use for coding, but requires less memory and the code runs faster. Another common programming language is Java. It is a compiled programming language. It is also a case-sensitive, object-oriented programming language. The Java Virtual Machine, or JVM, is required to run the code written in Java. It is the primary programming language for some operating systems, like the Android OS. And a benefit of Java is that it is a cross-platform language, which means it runs the same code on Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. Python is an example of an interpreted programming language. It is also referred to as a scripting language. Python is a popular general-use case-sensitive programming language. It is used with Windows, Mac OS, and Linux operating systems, and with server-side web app code and it requires the Python engine to interpret code. JavaScript is another interpreted programming language. It is a scripting language that runs on the client side in web browsers. JavaScript is case insensitive. Simple scripts are run with HTML. Complex scripts are run in separate files. And while it sounds similar, it shouldn't be confused with Java, the compiled programming language. Another example of a common programming language is HTML. It is an interpreted programming language. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. HTML is mostly case insensitive with some exceptions, and it uses tags to format web pages on client-side web browsers. In this video, you learned that Interpreted programming languages create source code that runs through an interpreter in your device's operating system or on your web browser. Compiled programming languages create executable files that are grouped in programs on your device. Compiled programming languages, like C and Java, are used to write larger programs like operating systems and other executable files. And interpreted programming languages, like Python and HTML, are used to write code that can complete repetitive tasks within a web browser or a computer. Welcome to Query and Assembly Programming Languages. After watching this video, you will be able to compare high-level and low-level programming languages, describe query languages, and describe assembly languages. Let's explore query and assembly programming languages. But first, we need to categorize programming languages into two levels, high-level and low-level. A high-level programming language is more sophisticated and uses the common English language to make its code more understandable and to increase the speed of coding and debugging programs. Examples of high-level programming languages include query languages, such as Structured Query Language or SQL, Structured Programming Languages, such as Pascal, and Object-Oriented Programming Languages, such as Python. In contrast, a low-level programming language uses a set of symbols to represent machine code. Examples of low-level programming languages include assembly languages such as ARM, MIPS, and x86. A query is a request for information from a database. The database handles the query and searches its tables for the information requested and returns the results to the querying entity. When querying a database, it is important that both the user application making the query and the database handling the query are speaking the same language. In programming terms, writing a query means using predefined and understandable instructions to make the request to a database. This is achieved using programmatic code, and this is what we refer to as a query language. A query language may also be referred to as a database query language. By far the most prevalent query language for database queries and database management is SQL. However, there are other query languages available, such as AQL, CQL, Datalog, and DMX. In addition to SQL databases, there is another type of database called NoSQL, which stands for not only SQL. 
The key difference between these two types of databases is their data structures. While SQL databases are relational and use structured predefined schemas, NoSQL databases are non-relational in nature and have dynamic schemas for unstructured data. A query language is predominantly used to request data from a database or to create, read, update, and delete data in a database. You will likely see the term CRUD used to refer to these last four key database operations. Typically, a user enters a command to either make a query or perform a CRUD operation using syntax that is understandable to the database management system hosting the database. And a database typically consists of structured tables made up of multiple rows and columns of data. When a user performs a query, the database retrieves the data from the relevant rows and columns in the table and arranges it into some sort of order ready to be returned and presented in the query results. Database queries are either a select command or an action command such as create, insert, update, or a mixture of both. The term statement is more commonly used to describe these commands. Select queries request data from a database, whereas action queries manipulate data in a database. Query statements can also be used to perform other administrative functions, such as creating users and modifying permissions. This table lists some of the most common SQL query statements. And here are some simple syntax examples of common SQL statements. As mentioned earlier, assembly languages are less sophisticated than query languages, structured programming languages, and object-oriented programming languages. As an assembly language uses a simple set of symbols to represent the zeros and ones of machine code, it is categorized as a low-level programming language. Assembly languages are closely tied to the processor architecture from hardware manufacturers, and therefore each CPU type will typically have its own assembly language. For this reason, there are a large number of assembly languages in use today, which vary among hardware manufacturers. Assembly languages use a simple, readable format for their statements, and they are entered one line at a time with one statement per line. Assembly language statements use the standard format shown here. In this syntax, all fields in curly brackets are optional, and the statement has two main parts. The first part is the instruction, or the mnemonic, and the second part includes the parameters, or the operands. There may also be optional useful comments added on the end of the statement. One other key difference with assembly languages is that they are translated using an assembler instead of a compiler or interpreter, and one statement translates into just one machine code instruction, as opposed to high-level languages where one statement can be translated into multiple machine code instructions. Assemblers translate assembly language into machine code using mnemonics, such as input INP, output OUT, load LDA, store STA, and add ADD. The statements consist of opcodes that tell the processor what to do with the data and operands that tell the processor where to find the data. In this video, you learned that query languages, structured programming languages, and object-oriented programming languages are categorized as high-level programming languages. Assembly languages are categorized as low-level programming languages. A query language is predominantly used to request data from a database or to manipulate data in a database. The most prevalent query language for database queries and database management is Structured Query Language, or SQL. Select queries request data from a database, whereas Action Queries manipulate data in a database. You also learned that Assembly languages use a simple set of symbols to represent the zeros and ones of machine code. Assembly languages are closely tied to the processor architecture from hardware manufacturers. Assembly languages are translated using an assembler instead of a compiler or interpreter. And assembly language instructions have a one-to-one -one association with their machine code counterpart.
Welcome to Understanding Code Organization Methods. After watching this video, you will be able to explain why code organization methods are important when programming, define the different code organization methods, and identify the benefits of using code organization methods. Organizing is very important when it comes to reading, maintaining, and configuring code. Well-planned-out software design, usually using one of several methods, helps programmers write cleaner and more reliable code. Planning out code in a visual format helps improve the code base once it is written and reduces the chance of bugs and errors throughout the lifespan of a project. Organizing code before programming has a positive impact on the quality of the program and helps provide a consistent and logical format to use while coding. There are two main methods of organizing code, flowcharts and pseudocode. The main difference between pseudocode and a flowchart is that the former is a basic high-level description of an algorithm. An algorithm is a step-by-step -step sequence of solving a given problem. A flowchart is a pictorial representation of an algorithm, showing the steps as boxes of various shapes and colors connected by arrows that indicate their order. Flowcharts are used in designing or documenting a process or program. Pseudocode provides a beneficial bridge to the project code because it closely follows the logic that the code will. Pseudocode also helps programmers share ideas without spending too much time creating code, and it provides a structure that is not dependent on any one programming language. Flowcharts are especially beneficial for smaller concepts and problems, while pseudocode is more efficient for larger programming projects. And flowcharts provide an easy method of communication about the logic and offer a good starting point for the project because they are easier to create than pseudocode in the beginning stages. A flowchart is the graphical or pictorial representation of an algorithm using different symbols, shapes, and arrows in different sizes and colors to demonstrate a process or a program. The main purpose of using a flowchart is to analyze different methods of solving a problem or completing a process. Several standard symbols are applied in a flowchart, and you can easily highlight certain elements and the relationships between each part in the process. Some traditional flowchart shapes used for programming concepts are start end, a capsule, process, a rectangle, decision, a diamond, data, a parallelogram, and connectors as arrows. A simple flowchart to represent how to add two numbers is easy to create. The procedure starts with the capsule and has a connector or arrow progressing to the next step, the data input, the parallelogram, in this case, input N1 and input N2. Then another connector or arrow goes to the process, the rectangle of adding the two inputs, sum equals N1 plus N2. Another connector or arrow moves to the data, the parallelogram showing the result, in this case, print sum. And the last connector or arrow moves to the end of the process, the end capsule. Flowchart software is an application that provides various functionalities to create flowcharts by providing the ability to drag shapes into the desired order using an easy-to-use editor. Flowchart software also provides team collaboration for creating flowcharts. Some of the well-known flowchart software programs include Microsoft Visio, LucidChart, Draw.io, and Draw Anywhere. Pseudocode is an informal type of programming description that does not require any strict programming language syntax or underlying technology considerations. System designers write pseudocode to ensure that programmers understand a software project's requirements and align code accordingly. Pseudocode is used for creating an outline or a rough draft of a program that summarizes a program's flow but excludes underlying details. Pseudocode acts as the bridge between the programmer's brain and the computer's code executor that provides the ability to plan instructions that follow a logical pattern without including all the technical details. Pseudocode is a great way of getting started with software programming as a beginner without worrying about coding syntax. Pseudocode helps both programmers and non-programmers agree about the program's goal and the basics of how the task should be done. 
Here's one example of pseudocode written to check if the user entered an odd or even number. The next example displays the pseudocode written in C++. There are many advantages of using pseudocode over flowcharts. The main benefit of pseudocode is that it's simple and explains exactly what each line of an application should do. The coder can focus more on logic than on program language syntax. Removing the distractions of coding when using pseudocode makes the code development stage easier. Words and phrases in pseudocode represent lines of basic computer operations that simplify translation from the pseudocode algorithm to the specific programming language. Pseudocode allows programmers working in different computer languages to interact with each other. Pseudocode can be reviewed by different development groups, easier than real code. Pseudocode is easier for non-programmers to read and enables quick and easy translation to any computer language. Writing pseudocode is more concise and easier to modify, so changes to the design can be easily incorporated. And lastly, unlike some flowcharts, pseudocode is usually less than one page. In this video, you learned that Organizing and planning out software design enables programmers to write cleaner and more reliable code. And organized code is very important from a readability, maintainability, and scalability standpoint. Two main methods of organizing and planning software code are by developing flowcharts or writing pseudocode. A flowchart is a pictorial representation of an algorithm, showing the steps as boxes of various kinds, connected by arrows that indicate their order. And the main goal of pseudocode is to explain exactly what each line of a program should do, making the code construction phase easier for the programmer. Welcome to Branching and Looping Programming Logic. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe the two types of programming logic Define Boolean expressions and variables And list the differences between branching and looping. There are two major types of programming logic, branching and looping. Both types use Boolean expressions and variables. A Boolean expression is a type of programming statement with only two values, either true or false, and variables have assigned values that are passed into a function or subroutine within a more extensive program. Computers use Boolean logic to make decisions. The computer takes one action if a Boolean expression is true and a different action if the expression is false. Typically, a program consists of instructions that tell the computer what to do, and data that the program uses when it is running. A variable has a value that can change, depending on conditions or information passed to the program. Boolean logic, along with variables, form the basis of programming. Branching logic is where a computer makes a decision following a different set of instructions, depending on whether certain conditions are met during the program's execution. Each possible code pathway creates another branch. The branch of code that runs depends on the values assigned to the parameters of the branching procedure. And there is no limit to the number of branches to implement complex logic. The values of these parameters may be input by the user or generated by the output from a previous procedure. Branching contains constructs that occur and are processed to determine the path a program takes when running. Branching statements, also known as constructs, allow the execution flow to jump to a different part of the program. The common branching statements used within other control structures include if, if then else, switch, and go to. The if statement is a decision-making construct that guides a program to make decisions based on specified criteria. The if statement executes one code set when a specific condition is met, true, or another code set if the condition is not met, false. The if-then-else is a conditional construct that executes its substatement, which follows the then keyword. This only occurs if the provided condition is true. The if-else statement extends the if statement by specifying an action if the if, or true-false expression, 
is false. With the if-else statement, the program will execute either the true code block or the false code block, so something is always performed with an if-else statement. In computer programming languages, a switch statement is a type of selection control mechanism used to allow the value of a variable or expression to change the control flow of program execution via search and map. GoTo is a statement found in many computer programming languages that performs a one-way transfer of control to another line of code. In contrast, a function call typically returns control. Now, let's look at the logic of looping programming. A loop is a sequence of instructions that continually repeats until reaching a specific condition. Typically, a particular process is performed, such as retrieving and changing data, and then some conditions are checked, such as whether a counter has reached a prescribed number. If it has not, the next instruction in the sequence is to return to the first instruction in the series and repeat the sequence. If the condition is reached, the next instruction falls through to the next sequential instruction or branches outside the loop. A loop is a fundamental programming idea commonly used in writing programs. There are three basic loop statements, while, for, and do while. In a while loop, a condition is evaluated before processing the body of the loop. If a condition is true, then and only then the body of the loop is executed. In a for loop, the initial value is performed only once, then the condition tests and compares the counter to a fixed value after each iteration, stopping the for loop when false is returned. And in a do while loop, the condition is always executed after the body of a loop. It is also called an exit controlled loop. In this video, you learned that there are two major types of programming logic, branching and looping. Both types of logic use Boolean expressions and variables. Boolean expressions have only two possible values, either true or false, and variables have assigned values that are passed onto a function or subroutine within a more extensive program. Variables have values that can change depending on conditions or information passed to the program. And branching is deciding what actions to take, while looping is deciding how many times to perform a certain action. Welcome to Introduction to Programming Concepts, Part 1. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe the purpose and use of identifiers in programming, and describe the purpose and use of containers in programming. To fully understand software programming, there are some fundamental programming concepts you need to know first. The first concepts you will look at are identifiers. Software developers use an identifier to reference a program component, such as a stored value, a method, an interface, or a class by assigning a custom named label to it. If the identifier stores data, then the data values in the program can be one of two types, either a constant or a variable. A constant is a data item whose value does not change within a program. This could be a numerical constant, such as the mathematical value of pi, or it could be a text string that remains constant, such as a player's name within a game. Constants are also referred to as named constants. You assign a value to a constant when you define it. For example, you might want it to refer to a numerical value within your program, such as pi, or a cost price, or a rate of tax, and then, rather than repeatedly retyping the same numerical value, you can just declare a constant for the value instead, and name it something meaningful, like pi underscore value, or cost underscore price, or tax underscore rate. There are a couple of major benefits to using constants in your programs. One is for ease of readability in your code, and the other is that if the specified value changes in the future, you only need to change it once on the constant, rather than finding every instance of that numerical value within your code and changing it. The other type of identifier used in programming is a variable. 
As the name suggests, this kind of identifier is not constant. Its value can change during the program's execution, such as a user entering their age in an application or a high score in a game. Variables can be strings of text, numerical values, or any other type of data. Using a variable as an identifier is a useful way to refer to program items that are unknown to you, such as a user name, a service, or a file name, for instance. If you don't use a variable, then you will need to hard code all the names and values in your program, which is not considered best practice. Variables can be declared and assigned a data type and initial value as they are defined, or you can decide not to assign an initial value when you define a variable and instead have the value assigned later by instructions within the program. In addition to the identifier data structures already discussed, there are also special kinds of identifiers that can reference multiple elements in a program, and these are referred to as containers. Being able to specify multiple elements means that you don't have to create a variable for every individual element. This makes it faster and more efficient. For example, if you only want to store six numerical integers, then you could argue that you could just create six variables, one for each. But what if you need to store 1,000 integers or more? In such a case, defining 1,000 variables would obviously be an unwieldy and inefficient programming technique. So in this case, you would use a container. There are two types of containers to specify multiple elements, arrays and vectors. The simplest of these container types is an array. In an array, a fixed number of elements of the same type are stored in sequential order starting from index 0. When you declare an array, you specify the data type of the values it contains, such as an integer, or boolean, or a string, and then the maximum number of elements it can contain. The syntax for declaring an array is to specify the data type first, then the name of the array, then the maximum size of the array in square braces. In contrast to arrays that have a fixed size, vectors have a dynamic size and they will automatically resize themselves as you add elements to them or remove elements from them. For this reason, you may also see them referred to as dynamic arrays. Because they are dynamic in nature, vectors take up more memory space than arrays and their elements also take a little longer to access than elements in an array, as they are not stored in sequential memory locations. The syntax for declaring a vector is to specify the container type of the vector first, then specify the data type in angle brackets, then the name of the array. Note that because it is a vector, you do not need to specify a maximum number of values it can contain, because the size is not fixed, it is dynamic. In this video, you learned that software developers use an identifier to reference a program component. If an identifier stores data, then it can either be a constant or a variable. A constant is a data item whose value does not change within the program. A variable is not constant, it can change during the program's execution. In an array, a fixed number of elements of the same type are stored in sequential order starting from zero. And vectors have a dynamic size and they automatically resize themselves as elements are added or removed. Welcome to Introduction to Programming Concepts, Part 2. After watching this video, you will be able to describe the purpose and use of functions in programming, and describe the purpose and use of objects in programming. Next, let's look at the fundamental concept of functions. Functions are a consequence of the modular programming software development methodology that encourages the separation of a program into multiple modular components, where each performs a specific task within a program. So, a function is essentially a piece of structured, standalone, and reusable code that will perform a single specific action. This enables software developers to take a substantial, complex program and divide it into smaller, more manageable, and focused pieces. 
Although some programming languages may refer to them as something else, such as subroutines, procedures, methods, or modules, most modern programming languages refer to them as functions. Functions take in data as an input, then process the data, and then return the result as an output. There are essentially two types of functions. Standard library functions are the built-in functions provided by the programming language. Common examples include the if, else, while, and print functions. But programming languages also allow you to write your own functions. And once you've written a function, you can use it over and over again. The way that the blocks of code that make up a function are identified is different across programming languages. Some use braces, some use begin and end statements, and others use indentations, for example. There are a few steps to using functions. The first thing you need to do is define or create a function. When you define a function, you provide a function keyword, then give the function a unique name, and you provide the statements that make up the body of the function. Once a function has been defined, it then needs to be called or invoked. When you call a function, the specified actions within the function are performed using any specified parameters. While defining and calling functions are common to all programming languages, some programming languages, such as C and C++, also require you to declare a function. Next, let's look at the concept of objects. Understanding what objects are is key to understanding object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming, or OOP, is a programming methodology that is focused on objects rather than functions, which is what procedure-oriented programming is focused on. The objects themselves will contain data in the form of properties or attributes, and code in the form of procedures or methods. The key distinction between the two methodologies is that where procedural programming uses methods to operate on separate data structures, OOP packages them both together so an object operates on its own data structure. Consider the real-world objects in your life, such as your car, bike, TV, or your washing machine, and ask yourself the following two questions. What states can the object be in, and what behaviors can the object perform? When you think about your answers to these questions, you will find that the answers to these questions vary across the objects. More complex objects will typically have more potential states they can be in and will be able to perform more behaviors. In programming, a software object is similar to a real-world object, conceptually speaking, in that they too consist of states or properties and behaviors or methods. Software objects can be anything, such as a Windows service, a user account, a database table, or a system folder. Objects store their properties in fields, referred to as variables in some programming languages, and expose their behaviors through methods, referred to as functions in some programming languages. In this video, you learned that a function is a piece of structured, standalone, and reusable code that will perform a single specific action. The defining and calling of functions is common to all programming languages. Object-oriented programming is a programming methodology that is focused on objects rather than functions. And software objects consist of properties and methods. Welcome to Types of Data, Sources, and Uses. After watching this video, you will be able to identify different types of data, recognize data sources, and list some of the ways to use data. Today's world is full of data, but how do we define data? Data is any set of characters that is gathered and translated for some purpose, usually research or analysis. Data can consist of facts, observations, perceptions, numbers, characters, symbols, images, audio, text, or any combination of these. There are multiple types of data, including these common types, single character, boolean, true or false, text, string, number, integer or floating point, picture, sound, and video. Data can be classified as primary or secondary. 
Primary data is generated directly by the individual needing the information. Secondary data is information that has already been gathered for another purpose. Raw data, also known as primary data, contains numbers, instrument readings, and figures collected from sources. In the context of an examination, the raw data might be a raw score. When processed, this raw data output can be analyzed and studied. Data and information are collected on a computer using a hard drive or another storage device. Data is stored in binary form using zeros and ones. There are several forms of data. Personal data is anything specific to an individual, like name, demographics, location, address, and other identifying information. Transactional data is anything that requires an action to collect the information, clicking online advertisements, making an online purchase, and visiting certain websites are all forms of transactional data. Transactional data is crucial for businesses, helping them to expose variability and optimize operations. Web data refers to any data pulled from the internet for research or other purposes. Web data is a catch-all for public-facing information on the internet. In other words, not stored in a private database. Companies can use this information to monitor competitors, track potential customers, keep track of channel partners, generate leads, and build applications. Sensor data is information produced by objects and is often known as the Internet of Things. This type of data covers everything from a smartwatch measuring heart rates and temperature to a building with external sensors that measure the weather or turn on lights when motion is detected. Currently, sensor data's primary use is to help optimize processes. The level and rigidity of the data's structure determine the information's classification. Data can be structured, semi-structured, or unstructured. Databases store and display structured data in rows and columns similar to an Excel or Word table. The information has a well-defined schema and a rigid structure. These characteristics make relational databases, which store data in tables, ideal for structured data. Microsoft SQL Server, IBM DB2, and Oracle databases are forms of structured data. Semi-structured data has some organizational properties. However, the information does not collect in the rows and columns required by a rigid tabular schema. Instead, semi-structured data is organized into a hierarchy using tags and metadata and is stored in non-relational databases. Unstructured data is information that does not have an identifiable structure or specific format, sequence, semantics, or rules and is often stored in NoSQL databases. The most common examples of unstructured data include text like Word documents and emails. However, unstructured data also includes images, audio files, and log files. MongoDB, HBase, Cassandra DB, and Oracle NoSQL DB are forms of semi-structured and unstructured data. A multitude of data sources are available today, including internal organizational data stored in a database, publicly available data like weather, financial, and government, APIs and web services, websites, data streams and feeds, social platforms, and devices with sensors. This data is stored, processed, and made available for analysis, providing businesses with insights into their performance. Data sources can be internal or external. When an individual collects data from reports and records supplied by an organization, group, or other entity, this is known as internal sourcing. Examples of internal sources include accounting information, order processing details, payroll, and shipping information. When users collect data from sources outside an organization, group, or other entity, this is known as external sourcing. Examples of external sources include social media feeds, weather reports, government information, and research. Companies use internal and external data to scale up businesses, understand customer purchasing trends, and increase overall productivity. In this video, you learned that Data is information like facts, observations, perceptions, numbers, characters, and images that are processed to become meaningful. For example, 
upper and lower case letters, numerals, and special characters. Data can be structured, semi-structured, or unstructured depending on the level and rigidity of its organization. Different data sources offer different types of data. For example, data from social media can be unstructured or semi-structured. And data is essential to many organizations and is used to manage information from accounting to shipping and routing. Data is generated constantly in today's world, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Welcome to Database Fundamentals and Constructs. After watching this video, you will be able to describe the fundamentals of databases, recognize the need for databases, and identify database constructs. A database is a computerized record-keeping system that stores large quantities of information and provides tools for evaluating and manipulating data. Database users can search, research, analyze, compare, change, and manipulate information within a database with optimal speed and minimal processing. A database is built and maintained using a programming language. The most common is SQL, but SQL has multiple flavors, depending on the type of database. And there are two types of databases, relational and non-relational. A database has four main components. A schema is a collection of one or more tables of data. A database can contain one or more schemas. A table is one or more columns of data, like in an Excel spreadsheet. A table can have two or more columns depending on the type of stored data. A column is a pillar of information containing one or more data values, including dates, numeric or integer values, and alphanumeric values. And a row is horizontally formatted information, like rows in an Excel spreadsheet. Typically, there may be hundreds or thousands of rows of data in a table. Additional terms associated with a database are queries and constraints. A query can either be a request for data results from a database, action on the data, or both. A query can also provide an answer to a simple question, perform calculations, combine data from different tables, and add, change, or delete data from a database. Constraints are made up of primary keys, which are the rules enforced on the data columns, certifying that the values in any column row do not repeat. Constraints limit the type of data that can go into a table and ensure the data's accuracy and reliability in the database. When setting up a database, it is usual to define a set of queries used to answer questions from the data in the database. The output produced by the database is called a report. Queries are an important part of using a database. A query is a way of requesting information from a database, and there are two types of queries, select or action. A select query retrieves data, and an action query requests additional actions to be performed on the data, like deletion, insertion, and updating. A frequently used query is the create table statement that creates a new table in the database. The column parameters specify the names of the columns of the table. The data type parameter specifies the type of data the column can hold. For example, varchar, integer, date, and so on. Another common query is the select statement that retrieves records from a database table according to clauses, for example, from and where that specify criteria. The select clause specifies one or more columns to be retrieved. To specify multiple columns, use a comma and a space between column names. To retrieve all columns, use the wildcard star or asterisk. The from clause specifies one or more tables to be queried. Use a comma and space between table names when specifying multiple tables. And the WHERE clause selects only the rows in which the specified column contains the specified value. The value is enclosed in single quotes, for example, WHERE last underscore name equals Smith. The semicolon is the statement terminator, and if only one statement is sent to the back end, the statement terminator is not necessary. However, it is a best practice to include the statement terminator regardless. Some common relational database constraints are primary and foreign keys. 
A primary key is the column or columns that contain values that uniquely identify each row in a table. In this figure, the primary key is ID. A database table must have a primary key defined to insert, update, restore, or delete data from a table. A foreign key is a column or set of columns in a table whose values correspond to the values of the primary key in another table. In this figure, the foreign key is class ID. For each foreign key value, a row in the related table must exist with the same primary key value. A database management system, or DBMS, has the following characteristics. It provides security and removes redundancy, has the same self-describing nature as a database system, grants program data independence, meaning there is insulation between programs and data abstraction, supports multiple views of the data, shares data and multi-user transaction processing, allows entities and relations among them to form tables, follows the atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, or ACID concept, and a DBMS supports a multi-user environment that allows users to access and manipulate data in parallel. Many industries use databases, including universities, banking, and telecommunications. A flat file database, also known as a text database, stores data in a single table and can be set in various application types, including HTML documents, simple word processors, or worksheets in spreadsheet applications. The tables within a flat file database can be sorted based on column values. Flat files serve as a solution for simple database tasks. A database is another method of storing information. A database uses multiple table structures, cross-referencing records between tables. A database can store information in multiple table structures with records organized in columns and rows with each column containing a single piece of data. Finally, databases are faster, more efficient, and more powerful than flat files. Here is an example of a flat file database that stores information about students in a school identifying their form and form teacher. There are two issues with trying to store this data in a flat file database. Redundant data. Some data can be stored more than once, wasting storage space and causing inconsistencies. And data inconsistency. Multiple tables within a database deal with the same data but may receive it from different inputs. Data redundancy can compound data inconsistency. In a relational database, data is stored in multiple files linked by common fields. Here is the same data stored in two files in a relational database. Relational databases have two important advantages over flat file databases. Control over redundant data. Wherever possible, storing data once eliminates the wasting of storage space. And data consistency. Because each data item is stored only once, there cannot be two different values, so the data will always be consistent. Here are some of the many differences between flat files and databases. Flat files do not support multi-user access, while multiple users can access a database at one time. Databases with permissions and privileges are more secure than flat files. Flat files are usually one file, and databases can have a large amount of records. A database can contain multiple databases within it, unlike flat files. Searches and other transactions within flat files are faster than in databases. Most databases support complicated transactions. Flat files do not and flat files are easy to set up without needing specific expertise. Special training may be required to configure a database. In this video, you learned that a database is a computerized record-keeping system to store large quantities of information. A database provides tools that give the ability to search through stored data for specific bits of information. When creating a database, organize data so that the computer can analyze and search it automatically. Databases include schemas, tables, columns, and rows. Databases also contain queries and constraints. A query is a way of requesting information from the database, and constraints are the rules that apply on the type of data in a table. And there are two types of databases, 
flat files, and relational databases, and each has advantages. One of the main differences is a flat file has a single record, while a database can have multiple records. Welcome to Database Roles and Permissions. After watching this video, you will be able to Describe how database permissions work Explain how permission commands enforce database security in a multiple-user database environment and identify the benefits of roles in a database. Permissions are authorizations enabling a particular user to access a specific database or database table. There are three main types of database permissions in decreasing scope, database, system, and object. Database permissions and privileges execute a specific type of SQL statement or access a second person's object. Database privilege controls the use of computing resources and does not apply to the database administrator or DBA. System permission is the right to perform an activity, such as to create, alter, or drop on a specific type of object. The ability to add or delete columns and rows of any table in a database is an example of system permission. Object privilege is the right to perform a specific action on a particular table, function, or package. For example, the right to delete rows from a table is an object privilege. This privilege allows the user to insert, delete, update, or select the data in the database object. An object's owner has all object permissions for that object, and those permissions cannot be revoked. The object's owner can grant object permissions for that object to other database users. A user with admin privileges can grant and revoke object permissions from users who do not own the objects on which the permissions are granted. Permission commands enforce database security in a multiple-user database environment. There are three main permission commands, grant, revoke, and deny. The grant command provides user access rights or permissions to the database objects. This command also allows users to grant access rights to other users. Here is the syntax for the grant command. The revoke command removes user access rights or permissions to the database objects. Here is the syntax for the revoke command. And the deny command denies permission on an object and prevents the principal from gaining grant permission based on membership in a group or role. Here is the syntax for the deny command. Only a database administrator or the owner of a database object can provide or remove permissions on a database object. A database role is a collection of any number of permissions that can be assigned to one or more users. Roles allow you to grant and manage sets of permissions for various categories of users rather than grant those permissions to each user individually. The DBA maintains user roles and applies them to the entire server and not to an individual database file. The public role sets the basic default permissions for all users. Every user that is added to a SQL Server is automatically assigned to the public role, so no additional actions are needed. Database roles are applied to an individual database. The table contains a list of some of the more common user roles and their associated access levels. Database roles can be granted. To set system or schema object permissions to other roles, However, a role cannot be granted to itself and cannot be granted circularly. For example, role A cannot be granted to role B if role B has previously been granted to role A, to any database user, to a user as either enabled or disabled. A user's security domain includes the permissions of all roles currently enabled for the user and excludes the permissions of any roles currently disabled for the user. Roles can be enabled or disabled to provide selective availability of permissions. Indirectly to a role, this means that the role can be explicitly enabled or disabled for a user. However, by enabling a role that contains other roles, you implicitly enable all indirectly granted roles of the directly granted role. 
and roles can be granted or revoked at any time. In this video, you learned that permissions provide the authority to access a database, tables, objects, and other system resources in a specified manner to allow selection, insertion, or modification of data rows. A database role is a collection of any number of permissions that can be assigned to one or more users. Roles allow granting and managing sets of permissions for various categories of users rather than granting those permissions to each user individually. And roles can be granted and revoked at any time, allowing for more flexibility in maintaining a database. Welcome to Data Types. After watching this video, you will be able to define the different types of databases, identify relational databases, and describe non-relational databases. There are three types of data, structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. Structured data is generally tabular data that is represented by columns and rows in a database. The databases in this form are called relational databases. The mathematical term relation is specific to a formed set of data held as a table. In structured data, all rows in a table have the same set of columns. One example of structured data is structured query language or SQL programming language. Here is an example of semi-structured data. Semi-structured data has some structure to it and consists of documents held in JavaScript object notation or JSON format. This type of data also includes key-value stores and graph databases. Unstructured data contains a lot of types of information and is not organized in a predefined manner or data model. This type of data is usually text-heavy but may contain numbers, dates, and other characters. Videos, audio, and binary data files might not have a specific structure and are considered unstructured data. Some specific examples of unstructured data types are text files and documents, server, website application logs, images, video files, emails, social media data, audio files, and sensor data. There are two types of databases, relational and non-relational. A relational database is structured to recognize relations among stored items of information. A non-relational database stores data in a non-tabular form and tends to be more flexible than the traditional SQL-based relational database structures. A relational database, or a SQL database, stores data in tables that contain rows and columns. The rows in a database are called records. Relational databases store related data information with a defined relationship between database tables used with other datasets. A relational database works by connecting multiple data tables with unique identifiers known as keys, which allow for the connected relationship between tables. Relational databases apply to structured data sources and have connections within the database. Examples of relational databases include MySQL, IBM DB2, Oracle, SQLite, Postgres, and MS SQL. A non-relational database is a non-SQL database, also known as a NoSQL database, that stores unstructured data. Non-relational databases are not restricted to data being in tables and therefore differ from structured relational databases in that there are no tables, rows, or keys. Instead, a range of different types of data can be stored in different formats using specialized frameworks. Non-relational databases are ideal for storing and combining big data and unstructured data, offering more flexibility in working with this type of data over relational databases. Examples of non-relational databases include MongoDB, Apache Cassandra, Redis, Couchbase, and Apache HBase. Non-relational databases permit storing store data in a format that more closely meets the original structure. There are many types of data stores, but the following are encountered most often. Document data stores, key value stores, column-oriented databases, and graph databases. A document data store handles a set of objects, data values, and name string fields in an entity referred to as a document. These data stores generally store data in the form of JSON documents. 
Here is an example of the document data store model. A key value store is a large hash table with each data value associated with a unique key to collect data by using a correct hashing function. The hashing function is preferred. It provides an even distribution of hashed keys across the data storage. Key value stores are highly suitable for applications operating simple lookup functions using the value of a range of keys. A columnar or column family data store constructs data into rows and columns. The columns are divided into groups known as column families. Each column family consists of a set of columns that are logically related and are generally retrieved or manipulated as a unit. Within a column family, rows can be sparse and new columns can be added dynamically. A graph data store handles two types of information, edges and nodes. Edges point out the relationships between these entities, and nodes represent entities. The aim of a graph data store is to allow an application to efficiently perform queries that traverse the network of edges and nodes, and to inspect the relationships between entities. In this video, you learned that there are three types of data. Structured data is organized in a relational database. Semi-structured data is partially organized and unstructured data is based on simple character and binary data. Relational databases store data in rows and columns, and non-relational databases do not have a predefined manner or data model. There are different NoSQL databases for storing non-structured data. And non-relational databases store different types of data in various formats using specialized frameworks. Welcome to Interfacing with Databases. After watching this video, you will be able to describe the working principle behind interfacing a database and identify the four main ways of interfacing with databases. A database interface enables users to input queries to a database without using the query language itself. Interfaces are an electronic form that contains what kinds of queries users can make. Web-based forms are becoming increasingly common with the popularity of MySQL, but the traditional way to do it has been local desktop applications. Mobile applications can also be designed to provide a friendly way of accessing data. The application poses a query to the database system with the help of SQL. There, the corresponding result set, or answer, is prepared, and with the help of SQL, given back to the application. This communication takes place interactively, or can be embedded into another language. There are two types of database interface, interactive SQL, which can be used from a terminal, and embedded SQL, which can be embedded into another language or host language, which might be used to create a database application. A database can be accessed in a variety of ways, direct or manual access, programmatic access, user interface or utility access, and query or report builders. Direct access or manual access is when a user enters SQL commands and selects a menu to access the tables in a database. Users can directly access database tables to view or change data. Direct access works well when it only needs to be accessed by a few users and with a database that is stored locally or on a local area network. The following figure is an example of editing a table directly in Microsoft Access Database. Programmatic Access uses a programming language to access a database that enables the data to be used in more ways. This type of access is safer than using direct access. Oracle databases support access from many languages, including Oracle PL SQL, which combines a procedural language with SQL, Oracle JMS, a Java application programming interface API, ProCC, C++, and others. Depending on the database and programming language, it might be necessary to perform a query using a supported language and then connect to the result with the language you prefer. This table showing product ID, product name, and price is an example of connecting to SQL Server from a Python program and extracting data and displaying information. 
The server name, database name, and table name are given in this code example. A database, like Microsoft Access, is designed to permit database access through its user interface. With SQL databases, an optional user interface may be needed to make usage easier. Oracle offers MySQL Workbench as a graphical user interface, or GUI, for use with MySQL. A database management system, or DBMS, interface is a user interface which allows for the ability to input queries to a database without using the query language itself. DBMSs provide the following benefits. Web-based interfaces for web clients or browsing. Form-based interfaces. A GUI displays a schema to the user in diagrammatic form. The user can specify a query by manipulating the diagram. GUIs utilize both menus and forms. Most GUIs use a pointing device, such as a mouse, to pick a certain part of the displayed schema diagram. And natural language interfaces have their own schema, like a database conceptual schema, that accepts user requests and tries to interpret them. Search engines use a natural language interface to enter and retrieve information. This image is querying a table in MySQL using the MySQL Workbench interface. A query is used to find specified data in a database by using the SELECT statement. Some databases, like Microsoft Access, have built-in query and reporting functions. Query Builder provides a GUI for creating SQL queries and is designed to enhance productivity and simplify SQL query building tasks. Users can drag multiple tables, views, and columns into a visual designer to generate SQL statements. The query builder can perform the following tasks. Work with a graphical representation of a query or SQL code. Query builder includes a pane that displays a query graphically and a pane that displays the corresponding SQL text. Join related tables. When adding more than one table to a query, Query Builder automatically determines how the tables are related and constructs the appropriate join command for data extraction. Query or Update Databases Returns data using select statements to create queries that update, add, or delete records in a database. And View and Edit results that are immediate. Some examples of Query Builders are Chartio Visual SQL, DBForge Query Builder for SQL Server, Active Query Builder, Fly Speed SQL, Query DB Viz, and Query Builder. This image displays a query built using Fly Speed Query Builder, where the user selects the tables and the columns he needs in each table. In this video, you learned that a database interface enables interaction between the user and a database management system. And there are many ways to access a database, but the common ones are direct access, programmatic, user interface, and query and report builders. Welcome to Database Management. After watching this video, you will be able to describe how databases are managed, Identify the three major SQL command categories and what each one does, and explain how to input and extract database information. Databases are managed with structured query language or SQL commands and queries. A database query refers to the retrieval and management of data or information from a database. A database query generates data of different formats according to function. Query commands perform the retrieval and management of data in a relational database. With SQL commands, you can provide access to data in relational database management systems, describe the data, manipulate the data, create and drop databases and tables, view stored functions and procedures in a database, and set permissions on tables, procedures, and views. SQL commands can be grouped into the following categories based on functionality. Data Definition Language, or DDL, Data Manipulation Language, or DML, and Data Control Language, or DCL. DDL consists of the SQL commands used to define the database schema. 
DDL commands enable you to create, modify, and delete database structures, but not data. Common DDL commands include the following. The create command that creates the database or its objects, such as tables, indexes, functions, views, store procedures, and triggers. The drop command that deletes objects from the database. The alter command that alters the structure of the database and the truncate command that removes all records from a table, including all spaces allocated for the records. This is an example of a drop command where table is the name of the table to be deleted. DML includes most of the SQL commands that deal with the manipulation of data in the database. The DML command is the component of the SQL statement that controls access to the data and to the database. Common DML commands include the following. The insert command that inserts data into a database table. The update command that updates existing data within a database table. The delete command that removes records from a database table. And the select command that retrieves records from a database table according to clauses. For example, from and where that specify criteria. This is an example of the delete command. DCL includes commands which mainly deal with the rights, permissions, and other controls of the database system. DCL commands create and modify the structure of objects in the database. DCL commands include the following, the grant command that provides users with access permissions to the database, and the revoke command that withdraws users' access permissions given by the grant command. Here is an example of the revoke command. One way of inserting data into a database is through queries. Some of these query commands include create database, create table, and insert into table. Here is an example of inputting data into a relational database using these commands. The other way to input data is by importing it from external sources into a database using software tools and utilities. This example shows inputting an Excel data source into a SQL Server database. Importing multiple worksheets from an Excel workbook into a SQL Server database typically involves using one of the following software application tools. SQL Server Import and Export Wizard, SQL Server Integrated Services, or SSIS, or the Open Row Set function. Importing data directly from Excel files using the SQL Server Import and Export Wizard involves following a sequence of dialog boxes through a series of well-defined steps. The settings can be saved as an SSIS package that can be customized and reused later. The Open Row Set function imports data directly into SQL Server from Excel files by using the Transact SQL Open Row Set or the open data source function. This process is called a distributed query. There are two ways to extract data from a database, queries and report builders. A query is a question defined and sent to the data source to retrieve the data. Here is an example of the select command to retrieve data from a table. Reports offer a way to view, format, and summarize the information in a database. A database report is the formatted result of database queries that contains useful data for decision-making and analysis. Reports can be a simple list of phone numbers of all contacts, or more complex, like a summary report on the total sales across different regions and time periods. There are many data reporting tools that are popular on the market today, including ClearPoint, SAP Crystal Reports, and Jaspersoft Reporting. In this video, you learned that SQL commands are the instructions used to communicate with a database to perform tasks, functions, and queries with data. SQL commands can be used to search the database and perform other functions like creating tables, adding data to tables, modifying data, and dropping tables. SQL commands are grouped into three major categories depending on their functionality. DDL commands that are used for creating, modifying, and dropping the structure of database objects. DML commands that are used for storing, retrieving, modifying, and deleting data.
and DCL commands that are used for providing security to database objects. And data is input into a database using queries, create database, create table, and insert into table, and data is extracted by using queries and reporting software tools, such as ClearPoint, SAP Crystal Reports, and JasperSoft Reporting. Welcome to Backing Up Databases. After watching this video, you will be able to Define the two types of database backups and explain the differences between the two. Describe why database backups are important and identify the four main physical backup methods. Backing up a database protects data whether it is a person's or an organization's from disaster and allows for restoring information when necessary. A backup, usually performed by a relational database management system or database manager, replicates a database or database server that can be saved either locally or on a backup server. Database backups are categorized as either physical or logical. A logical backup is called a database dump, and a physical backup is completed through a type of backup software. Some examples of backup software include ScaleGrid, CyberShield, Backup Ninja, and SQL Safe Backup. Physical database backups are copies of directories and data files, including data controls, transaction files, and archived logs. This information is necessary to perform a full database restoration with minimal application errors and data loss. The backups, which can be full or incremental copies of the physical backup, should always be stored in separate, dedicated storage space, such as a disk, tape, or in the cloud. A logical database backup contains copies of information about a database, such as tables, schemas, and procedures. This data is commonly exported as binary files using export-import tools. Logical backups are helpful when restoring or moving a copy of the database to another environment. Physical backups are simple and fast, regardless of the data format. The physical backup is a mirror copy that is loaded to another device. The downside to physical backups is that this type is typically used only to recreate the system at restoration and cannot do a full restoration if there are any missing files. In logical backups, only a selected set of data is backed up, saving time and storage. The downside is that there is no file system information, which complicates the restoring process. There are four database backup methods available, full, differential, incremental, and virtual. A full backup stores a copy of all files following an automatic preset schedule. Typically, files are compressed to save space, but a lot of storage space may still be needed. A differential backup simplifies recovery, requiring only the last full backup and the last differential backup to create a complete database recovery. An incremental backup saves storage by backing up the files generated or updated since the last backup. And a virtual full backup uses a database to track and maintain backup data, helping to avoid the pitfalls of other methods. Having a backup system allows access to data without time or location constraints. Multiple copies of data are kept secure at different locations, ensuring all information is preserved. Online backup services, such as cloud storage, offer additional protection for emergencies, such as natural disasters. Automatic backup and detailed file management enhance processing and recovery without needing manual effort. Having an online server backup saves effort when setting up a system and shifts the focus to database security, allowing the efficient use of available resources that saves time and money. A prompt and reliable backup solution enables businesses to avoid a loss of reputation and legal action if valuable information is lost. After making a solid plan and completing initial work, the database administrator should properly manage backups by automating backups, monitoring backups, keeping backup logs and catalogs, maintaining the database catalog, setting up dependencies, and validating backups. There are a multitude of ways to store data. 
online, USB drives, external hard drives, and local area networks. In this video, you learned that a logical backup contains copies of information about a database, and physical backups are copies of directories and data files, including data controls, transaction files, and archived logs. Backup copies allow data to be restored from an earlier point in time to help the business recover from an unplanned event. Storing the copy of the data on a separate medium is critical to protect against primary data loss or corruption. And there are four main methods of backing up a database. Full, which is a copy of all files following an automatic preset schedule. Differential, which includes the last full backup and the last differential backup. Incremental, which saves storage by backing up the files generated or updated since the last backup. And Virtual, which uses a database to track and maintain backup data. Welcome to the Introduction to Networking and Storage course. Whether you're skilling up to become a field technician, network support specialist, virtual customer service agent, or just want to learn the basics of working with and managing computer networks, then you need a strong foundation in networking fundamentals. The most recent U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics report indicates about 667,000 annual job postings and a projected job growth of 13% through 2029. At the time of this course publication, the median U.S. IT salary was $112,161, more than double the U.S. median salary of $41,950 for all jobs. An IT role is right for you if you like change and enjoy ongoing learning. Computing technology is always evolving, and there's always new technology or a new feature to learn. If you're balancing work-life commitments, many companies offer on-site work, remote work, hybrid work environments, and flexible shifts. Employers need coverage 24 hours a day and 7 days a week. IT careers offer multiple paths for career growth. And, if you enjoy making a positive difference for others, an IT role can be rewarding. To successfully complete this course, you should be familiar with basic computer operating skills, basic knowledge of computer terminology, knowledge of switching applications, and have a familiarity with the Microsoft Windows operating system. This course is part of a series of IBM courses intended to help you develop IT fundamental skills and knowledge. When you complete this course, you'll be able to identify wired and wireless network types, explain physical and logical topology, differentiate between network cable types and what each is used for, list common network devices, discover what packets are and how IP addresses work, and explain what protocols are and why models are necessary. Determine how to set up and encrypt networks and mobile devices, Diagnose connectivity issues and utilize the command prompt and window settings. List network drive types. Explain RAM, ROM, and RAID, and troubleshoot storage issues. Explain storage as a service and define file, block, and object storage. When taken as part of the series, this course also helps you prepare for CompTIA IT Fundamentals ITF Plus certification, especially for beginners. Guided instructional videos walk you through key concepts with essential need-to-know facts. Interactive activities reinforce what you've learned in videos get you applying new knowledge and skills as you learn. Forums provide connections where you can introduce yourself to others, provide feedback, and get support. Practice assessments help you gauge your knowledge, and graded assessments prove what you've learned, leading to a shareable badge and certificate that you can show prospective employers. We're here to support your success, and we're excited that you're here. Let's get started. Welcome to Types and Topologies. After watching this video, you will be able to define what a computer network is and its purpose, identify the most popular network types, and list the characteristics of the five main network topologies. 
Computer networking refers to connected computing devices like laptops, servers, and smartphones, and an ever-expanding array of IoT devices like security cameras, door locks, doorbells, refrigerators, thermostats, and more. Computer networks enable data transfer and resource sharing through emails, files, documents, databases, and notifications amongst multiple users. There are multiple network types. PAN, or Personal Area Network. LAN, or Local Area Network. MAN, or Metropolitan Area Network. WAN, or Wide Area Network. WLAN, or Wireless LAN. And VPN, or Virtual Private Network. A PAN, or personal area network, enables communication between devices around a person. PANs can be wired or wireless, such as USB, FireWire, Infrared, Zigbee, and Bluetooth. They range from a few centimeters to a few meters. PANs are also used to connect laptops, tablets, printers, keyboards, and other computerized devices. One of the most common real-world examples of a PAN is the connection between a Bluetooth earpiece and a smartphone. A LAN or local area network, is typically limited to a small localized area, such as a single building or site. A LAN is a group of computers and peripheral devices that share a connection to a server. A LAN may serve two or three users in a home office or several hundred users in a corporation's central office. LANs enable network devices to share resources like printers or network storage. LANs require cables, switches, and routers, so users can connect to internal servers, websites, and other LANs. A MAN, or Metropolitan Area Network, is a network that spans an entire city, a campus, or a small region. MANs are sometimes referred to as CANs, Campus Area Networks. A MAN is optimized for a larger geographical area than a LAN, ranging from several building blocks to entire cities. A MAN is often formed by connecting multiple LANs. Examples of MANs include cable TV networks, telephone networks providing high-speed DSL lines, or any public or free Wi-Fi system provided to residents of a city. A WAN, or Wide Area Network, is a network that extends over a large geographic area. WANs are often established with leased telecommunication circuits. WANs are often used by businesses, schools, and government entities to relay data from almost anywhere in the world allowing them to carry out daily functions regardless of location. The Internet is an example of a WAN. A WLAN, or wireless LAN, links two or more devices using wireless communication to form a LAN within a limited area such as a home, school, computer lab, campus, or office building. Users can move around within the area and remain connected to the network. Through a gateway device, a WLAN can also provide a connection to the wider Internet. WLANs are used in smartphones, tablets, laptops, and gaming consoles. A VPN, or Virtual Private Network, establishes a private or protected network connection across public networks. VPNs encrypt your internet traffic, disguise your online identity, and safeguard your data by preventing unauthorized people from eavesdropping. The encryption takes place in real time and ensures that sensitive data is securely transmitted. Topology defines a network's structure, its physical layout, and virtual shape. A network's topology type is chosen based on the specific needs of the group installing that network. Each topology type has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. Physical topology describes how network devices are physically connected. Logical topology describes how data flows across the physically connected network devices. The five main types of physical network topology include star, ring, bus, tree, and mesh. Star topology networks feature a central computer that acts as a hub. Each device connects to the central computer with a dedicated cable known as a backbone cable. Star topologies are the most common type used in many networks, large and small. Ring topology networks connect all devices in a circular ring pattern where data only flows in one direction, clockwise. Each device receives and passes on the data until it reaches the intended recipient device, which processes the data. A small office with only a few nodes may use a ring network topology. Bus topology networks connect all devices with a single cable or transmission line. This cable functions as a shared communication channel that devices can tap into without a separate network connection device. 
Bus topology is the simplest kind of topology used. It is mainly suited for small networks, such as LAN. Tree topology networks combine the characteristics of bus topology and star topology. Tree topology is a type of structure in which all the computers are connected with each other in a hierarchical fashion. An example of a tree topology use case is a university campus in which each building has its own star network, and all the central computers are linked in a campus-wide system. Mesh topology networks connect all devices on the network together. Each mesh network device has a special mesh network software installed so that it can automatically choose the quickest path to the intended recipient. This is called dynamic routing. Mesh topology is commonly used in WAN for backup purposes. This topology is not used in LAN implementations. The internet is an example of mesh topology. In this video, you learned a computer network enables two or more computers to be connected so users can communicate and share resources. There are different network types, ranging from the smallest that cover only a few meters to the largest that span across the whole world. They include PAN, LAN, MAN, WAN, WLAN, and VPN. Network topology defines the structure of a network and its physical and logical types. Network topology types include star, ring, tree, bus, and mesh. Welcome to Wired Connections. After watching this video, you will be able to identify wired connection types. Understand which wired connection types are older and which are newer and list the pros and cons of wired connection types. Older internet connection types that use phone lines are dial-up, cannot use the phone and internet at the same time. ISDN, or Integrated Services Digital Network, transmits data and phone conversations digitally. And DSL, or Digital Subscriber Line, faster than dial-up, can use the phone and internet at the same time. Newer internet connection types are satellite, relies on communication satellites, popular in remote and rural areas. Cable, uses the same coaxial cables as cable television, one of the most common connection types. Fiber optic, relies on fiber optic cables to transfer data with light waves instead of electricity, the fastest connection type. And cellular, uses the same channels as cellular phones, allows connection almost anywhere. Wired networking refers to the use of wire connections that allow users to communicate over a network. Most computer networks still depend on cables or wires to connect devices and transfer data. Dial-up requires a modem and phone line to access the internet, popular in the past but has steadily been replaced by broadband internet services. Pros? Available to everyone with a phone line, computer, and modem. Can serve rural or remote areas low cost, and easy setup. Cons. Very slow, unsuitable for gaming or downloading media, and cannot use the phone at the same time. DSL, or a digital subscriber line, connects to the internet using a modem and two copper wires within phone lines to receive and transmit data, slower than cable and fiber. Pros. Faster than dial-up, inexpensive, dedicated connection, provides Wi-Fi, and transmits data using existing phone lines. Cons? Slow and weak over long distances. Speed rarely exceeds 100 megabits per second, and not always available. Cable delivers internet via copper coaxial television cable. It is the best option for fast and reliable internet if you don't have access to fiber optic. Pros? Uses existing TV infrastructure to reduce cost. High speeds rival pure fiber in ideal implementations. Higher bandwidth than DSL in most cases, and speeds not substantially affected by distance from ISP office. Cons. Bandwidth sharing with neighbors is slow during peak times. Upload speeds much slower than download, susceptible to electromagnetic interference, and lower latency than DSL in most cases. Fiber optic cables. Transmit data by sending pulses of light across strands of glass, up to 200 gigabits per second. Fast, reliable, and consistent. This connection rarely lags, which makes it perfect for HD streaming or online gaming. Pros. 
Efficient, reliable connection, great for long distances, fast speeds, up to 200 gigabits per second. Best for streaming and hosting. Cons, expensive, not available everywhere. In this video, you learned that older internet connection types like dial-up, ISDN, and DSL are low cost and offer low to medium speed. Newer internet connection types like satellite, cable, fiber optic, and cellular are higher in cost, but offer useful features such as higher speed and mobility. And wired connections like cable and fiber optic have gotten faster and stronger, but older technology like dial-up and DSL still works when you need it. Welcome to Cables. After watching this video, you will be able to list the common cable types and their characteristics, understand the purpose of each cable, and identify the most appropriate cable type in varied scenarios. Here are the common cable types. Hard drive cables like SATA, IDE, and SCSI connect a central processing unit, or CPU, to a device's main or default storage. Network cables like coaxial, fiber optic, and ethernet connect devices and transmit data. Serial cables, like you might find on a keyboard or mouse, are used for transferring power or data slowly over a distance. Video cables like VGA, HDMI, mini HDMI, DisplayPort, and DVI transmit video signals from a device to a monitor. And multipurpose cables like USB, Lightning and Thunderbolt are used for fast data transfers, fast power transfers, and connecting devices. Hard drive cables connect a hard drive to a motherboard or controller card. The same cables may also be used to connect optical drives and older floppy drives. Hard drive cables include SATA, IDE, and SCSI. Serial Advanced Technology Attachment, or SATA, is the next generation hard drive cable. SATA carries high-speed data and connects to storage devices, hard disk, optical, and solid-state drives. Integrated Drive Electronics, or IDE, is an older interface. The IDE cable is a 40-wire ribbon cable that is connected from the motherboard on one end to one or two drives on the other end. Small Computer System Interface, or SCSI, was designed to support a wide variety of device types. This means there are different types of SCSI cables. They may be ribbon cables or standard round cables of 50, 68, or 80 wires. Up to 16 devices, including the motherboard or SCSI controller card, may be connected to one SCSI cable or daisy chained together. Multipurpose cables connect devices and peripherals directly together without a network connection. They can transfer both data and power. Multipurpose cables include USB, Lightning, and Thunderbolt. USB cables connect to a wide variety of peripheral devices. USB supports two speeds. Low speed supports data transfer rate of 1.5 megabits per second at lengths up to 3 meters. Full speed supports data transfer rates of 12 megabits per second at lengths up to 5 meters. USB cables can carry data and power. Lightning cables are proprietary to Apple. They are used to connect Apple devices to USB ports. It can carry both data and power to charge the device. Thunderbolt is another Apple proprietary cable. It comes as either copper or optical cable. The maximum length is 3 meters for copper and 60 meters for optical. It provides both data and power to peripheral devices, most commonly storage and display devices. Video cables connect a specific type of video port on a computer to a display. Each has its own connector type. VGA cables connect older analog video graphics adapters to a display. HDMI cables connect a high-definition multimedia interface to a display. There are different types of HDMI cables. Type A is most common, but is usually just referred to as HDMI cable with no type designation. Mini HDMI is an HDMI type C cable. Display port cables connect a display port interface to a display. DVI cables connect a digital visual interface to a display. DVI-D, D for digital, supports only digital signals. DVI-I, I for integrated, 
supports digital and analog signals. There are single link and dual link DVI cables. A serial cable is used to transfer information between two devices using the RS-232 standard, which states that data bits must flow in a line one after another over the cable. Serial cables are used in modems, keyboards, mice, and other peripheral devices, which is why serial cables are sometimes called peripheral cables. However, video and multipurpose cables are also called peripheral cables for the same reason, even though they might not use the RS-232 standard. In wired networks, network cables connect devices and route information from one network device to another. A network's topology, protocol, and size determine what type of cable is needed. Some networks use only one type of cable, while others use a variety of cable types. Here we will cover three types of network cables, coaxial, fiber optic, and ethernet cables. The coaxial, or coax cable, was originally developed to connect TVs to home antennas. These days, it is used to send cable TV signals to cable boxes and internet to home modems. Coaxial cables contain an inner copper wire that is surrounded by insulation and other shielding. They are highly resistant to signal interference and can support greater cable lengths between network devices than twisted pair Ethernet cables. The coax cable has a 10 megabits per second capacity. The Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification, or DOCSIS, is a networking standard used in systems that provide internet across cable TV lines. Coaxial cables use the DOCSIS standard. Fiber optic cables are used in wide area networks, or WANs, because they work over long distances without much interference and can handle a heavy volume of data traffic. Different types of fiber optic cables are used depending on the cost and the amount of bandwidth the cable can support. There are two basic types of fiber cables. Single mode carries only one light path, typically sourced by a laser. It has a much longer transmission distance. Multimode carries multiple light paths and is sourced by an LED and can carry multiple signals in the same line simultaneously. Ethernet, or twisted pair cables, consist of four pairs of twisted wires to reduce interference. These cables hardwire a computer to a LAN. Hardwiring is faster and more consistent than Wi-Fi. They are available in two types, shielded wires or unshielded wires. Unshielded twisted pair, or UTP cables, are cheaper and more common. Shielded twisted pair, or STP cables, are more expensive and designed to reduce any outside interference that might interrupt data transmission. Ethernet cables also have category numbers. A higher category number means the cable is newer and usually faster with better bandwidth. Category, distance, and bandwidth are factors that are considered when building networks using Ethernet. There are many types and categories of Ethernet cables. While all of them use the same connector on both ends, mixing up types can damage cables or hardware. In this video, you learned there are many cable types and each has a specific purpose. SATA cables have the latest hard drive cable technology. Multipurpose cables can be proprietary or universal. Video cables come in a wide variety. Serial cables are used for peripheral devices and network cables include coaxial, fiber optic, and ethernet. Welcome to Wireless Connections. After watching this video, you will be able to understand wireless network types and their differences. Identify specific connection examples for each wireless network type and list the latest networking trends. A wireless network is a network that lets users connect without cables. Wireless networking is when people communicate and access applications and information without being physically plugged in. There are four main types of wireless networks. WPAN, or Wireless Personal Area Network, interconnects devices in a short span, generally within a person's reach. WLAN, or Wireless Local Area Network, links two or more devices using a wireless distribution method, providing a connection to the wider internet through access points. WMAN, or Wireless Metropolitan Area Network, connects several wireless LANs, generally used to cover an entire city. 
NWAN, or Wireless Wide Area Network, covers large areas such as neighboring towns and cities. WPAN is used for peripheral devices. Bluetooth, radio communication that enables low-power, short-distance wireless networking between phones, computers, and other network devices. RFID, or radio frequency identification, communicates using electromagnetic or electrostatic coupling to uniquely identify an object, animal, or person. NFC, or near-field communication, a method of data transfer that allows short-range communication between compatible devices. And IRDA, or Infrared Data Association, a set of infrared communication protocols that provide wireless line-of-sight connectivity between devices. WLAN is used for mobile extension of wired networks. Wi-Fi, radio signal sent from a wireless router. Standards 802.11, A, B, G, N, and AC. Older IEEE standards for WLANs that evolved to become faster and more efficient. 802.11 AC, also known as Wi-Fi 5, was introduced in 2013. And Wi-Fi 6, standard 802.11 AX, an IEEE standard for WLANs that provides faster throughput speeds, better battery life, and less bandwidth congestion than Wi-Fi 5 technology. WMAN is used for fixed wireless between the internet and homes and businesses. Proprietary a vendor-specific wireless municipal network with proprietary standards and equipment. IEEE 802.16, the standardized version of WiMAX with added features like OFDM and quality of service. It was developed in the mid-2000s. And WiMAX, a broadband wireless solution developed in the early 2000s as an alternative to wired DSL or cable, especially in rural areas. WiMAX stands for Worldwide Interoperability for Microwave Access. WAN is used for mobile access to the Internet from outdoor areas. LTE, or Long-Term Evolution, a converged 4G standard supported by both the GSM and CDMA network providers. In theory, LTE has a maximum downlink of 150 megabits per second. LoRaWAN, or Long Range Radio, an open standard network that balances low power with long-range communication requirements, and cellular, 4G and 5G, a network based on a collection of cell areas, each with a cell tower at its center that connects to the Internet via satellite. Cellular provides consistent speeds, reliability, and efficiency. Wired and wireless networks have different advantages and disadvantages. The mobility you gain from a wireless network might mean putting up with higher costs and additional security concerns. Wired networks offer more speed and security, but installation may be more difficult. Let's look at the latest networking trends. Wi-Fi 6, standard 802.11 AX, is an IEEE standard for WLANs that brings faster throughput speeds, better battery life, and less bandwidth congestion than what you would get with Wi-Fi 5 technology. Network Analytics – Leveraging AI for Smarter Insights When a disruption hits, NetOps teams need the help of advanced analytics to make smart and timely decisions. Network Analytics uses AI and machine learning to manage such disruptions and issues. Network Automation – Automating operations for faster recovery There's an extraordinary strain on today's NetOps teams with unprecedented volume in client counts, application traffic patterns, and new use cases like e-learning, video conferencing, virtual events, and remote care. Network automation is critical to ensure continued service and performance. And SASE, Secure Access Service Edge, is a solution for today's combined networking and security challenges, adopted in cloud or hybrid models and in on-premises data centers. In this video, you learned that common technologies like RFID and Bluetooth are commonly used in many WPANs around the world. There are many evolutions of Wi-Fi with 802.11ax being the latest and most advanced. Cellular works because of the vast regional coverage provided by cellular and LTE WAN networks. Wireless connections are slower and less consistent than newer wired connections, but wireless connections can be accessed almost anywhere and are easier to install and deploy. And new networking trends include the Wi-Fi 6 IEEE standard.
Network Analytics and Automation, and Secure Access Service Edge, or SASE. Welcome to Advantages and Disadvantages of Network Types. After watching this video, you will be able to define the pros and cons of networking, explain how size and connection type affect a network, and describe the pros and cons of each network type. Computer networking refers to connected computing devices like laptops, servers, and smartphones. Networking has expanded to include Internet of Things devices like security cameras, door locks, doorbells, refrigerators, thermostats, and more. Networks provide communication tools like email and chat and enable the sharing of files and devices like printers, security cameras, and sensors. Networks provide centralized resources like storage databases, which enable bulk software installations, easy backups, and larger storage capacity. Networks allow remote access when you're away from your computer but need to perform a task or get to specific files. Networks also reduce hardware and software costs and enable control over security and access. However, networks also require technical expertise and more maintenance than just one device. Networks are more vulnerable to viruses and hacking, more expensive than using a single device, and require other users and systems to function. Smaller networks are easier to troubleshoot than larger networks. They require less hardware and are easier to secure, upgrade, and manage. Smaller networks are not as flexible as larger networks when it comes to access, resources, and mobility, but they are less expensive. Wired networks have fixed access points, while wireless networks can be accessed from anywhere in the network. Wired networks have less expensive hardware than wireless, but require more devices and cabling. Wired networks are also easier to manage and offer faster connectivity and more security. However, wired networks are less flexible than wireless when it comes to mobility and are also harder to set up and scale. The basic network types can be wired or wireless. From smallest to largest, they are PAN or WPAN, LAN or WLAN, MAN or WMAN, and WAN or WWAN. A personal area network, or PAN, enables communication between devices around a person. PANs are wired and WPANs are wireless. PANs use technology like USB and FireWire. WPANs use technologies like infrared, Zigbee, and Bluetooth. PANs and WPANs range from a few centimeters to a few meters. PANs and WPANs are flexible and mobile, have a one-time easy setup, and are portable. But they also have limited range and limited bandwidth. A local area network, or LAN, is a group of computers and peripheral devices that share a connection to a server. LANs use wired connections and WLANs use wireless connections. A LAN or WLAN may serve two or three users in a home office or several hundred users in a corporation's central office. LANs and WLANs enable network devices to share resources like printers or network storage. LANs provide connection via cables, switches, and routers. WLANs provide connection via Wi-Fi signals from Wi-Fi routers, modems, and wireless access points. Advantages include reliability and versatility, high data transmission rates, and they are easier to manage. Disadvantages include smaller network coverage area, the number of devices affects speed, and there are security risks. A metropolitan area network or MAN, is optimized for a larger geographical area than a LAN, ranging from several building blocks to entire cities. A MAN is often formed by connecting multiple LANs. 
Examples of MANs and WMANs include Cable TV networks, telephone networks providing high-speed DSL lines, or any public or free Wi-Fi system provided to residents of a city. A MAN or WMAN covers multiple city locations, is easy to use, extend, and exchange, and is managed by an ISP, government entity, or corporation. However, it requires special user permissions and has the higher costs and security risks that come with larger networks. Wide Area Networks, or WANs, provide global coverage. WAN and WAN examples include the Internet and cellular networks. WANs and WANs offer global coverage and more security. However, they are expensive and difficult to maintain. In this video, you learned that networks offer control, remote access, and sharing, but are harder to manage, vulnerable, and depend on other systems. Smaller networks cost less and are easier to learn and manage, but have less power, capacity, and flexibility. Wired networks are faster, more secure, and easier to manage, but require more hardware and offer less flexibility. And each network type has its own pros and cons. Welcome to Networking Hardware Devices. After watching this video, you will be able to identify common networking hardware devices, list differences between similar network devices, and explain the significance of each type of network device and its functions. Network devices, or networking hardware, are physical devices that enable communication and interaction on a computer network. This includes cables, servers, desktops, laptops, tablets, smartphones, and Internet of Things, or IoT devices. This video covers network devices that connect or route, such as hubs, switches, routers, bridges, and gateways. A server is a powerful computer that stores files and applications. Other computers or devices on the same network can access the server as a central place to store information or use applications. The devices that access the server are known as clients. The server controls the level of access that clients have. A user can access a server file or application from anywhere if they use a client that is connected to the server's network and has the proper level of access, usually password-based. A node is a network-connected device that can send or receive information. A client is a node that accesses the network through a server. All devices that can send, receive, and create information on a network are nodes. The nodes that access servers to get on the network are known as clients. The server controls the level of access that clients have. If a client fails, the network remains unchanged. Client-server networks are common in businesses. They keep files up to date and easy to find by ensuring users work on one shared file in one location. Examples of services that use client-server networks include file transfer protocol sites, or FTP sites, web servers, and web browsers. Peer-to-peer -peer networks are common in homes and on the internet. Examples include file sharing sites, discussion forums, media streaming, and voice over IP services, also called VOIP services. A hub connects multiple devices together in a network. When data is sent to a hub, it broadcasts that data to all devices on the network, except for the one that sent the data. A switch is similar to a hub, except it keeps a table of MAC addresses. When a switch receives any data, it looks up the proper MAC address and forwards the data to the right place. Switches are more efficient than hubs because they only send data to the intended recipient. Switches and hubs connect to modems. If a switch or a hub fails, it brings the entire network down. Routers interconnect different networks or subnetworks. A router serves two primary functions. They manage traffic between networks by forwarding data packets to their intended IP addresses, and they allow multiple devices to use the same internet connection. Routers connect to modems. 
To direct packets effectively, a router uses an internal routing table, which is a list of paths to various network destinations. The router reads a packet's header to determine its path, consults the routing table to figure out the most efficient path, then forwards the packet to the next network in the path. A modem, or modulator-demodulator, converts data into a format that is easy to transmit across a network. Once that data reaches its destination, the receiving modem converts it back to its original form. The most common modems in use today are cable and DSL modems. A bridge joins two separate computer networks so they can communicate with each other and work as a single network. Bridges can be wired or wireless. Wireless bridges can support Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi to Ethernet, and Bluetooth to Wi-Fi connections. A gateway is hardware or software that allows data to flow from one network to another. For example, a home network to the internet. Gateways are distinct from routers or switches in that they use multiple protocols to connect multiple networks. A repeater or extender receives a signal and retransmits it. Repeaters are used to extend a wireless signal so it can cover longer distances or be received on the other side of an obstruction like brick, steel, or concrete. Repeaters connect to wireless routers. A wireless access point, also known as WAP or AP, allows Wi-Fi devices to connect to a wired network. The WAP usually connects to a wired router as a standalone device. The WAP can also act as a central wireless connection point for computers equipped with wireless network adapters. The WAP is plugged into a wired network switch. The WAP reads each computer's MAC address and forwards that to the wired switch. If the wired network is connected to a router with internet access, the wireless network will also have internet access. Network interface cards, or NICs, connect to individual devices to a network. NICs can be wired or wireless. Today's computers usually come with wireless NICs already built in. Most include ports for network cables, so users can easily connect their computer to a network. A firewall monitors and controls incoming and outgoing network traffic based on predetermined security rules. A firewall typically establishes a barrier between a trusted internal network and untrusted external network, like the Internet. Firewalls can be either software or hardware. Wireless routers and computer operating systems often have built-in firewalls. A proxy server acts as an intermediary between a LAN and the Internet to minimize security risks. The proxy server evaluates requests from clients and forwards them to the appropriate server if those requests meet preset security requirements. Proxy servers hide an IP address. If an IP address is hidden, it cannot be tracked. Proxy servers save bandwidth. For example, a proxy server will download files or updates for the first user, then keep them stored for any future users who need them. An intrusion detection system, or IDS, monitors network traffic and reports malicious activity to the network administrator. An intrusion prevention system, or IPS, inspects network traffic and removes, detains, or redirects malicious items based on rules set by the network administrator. In this video, you learned network devices, which can be a variety of different types, enable communication and interaction on a network. Servers are powerful computers that store files and applications and are accessed by other computers on the same network. Nodes and clients can be configured in different ways. Routers and modems transmit and convert data to ensure interconnections happen and information reaches its destination correctly. And firewalls, proxy servers, IDS, and IPS work to keep networks secure. Welcome to Packets, IP Addressing, DNS, DHCP, and NAT. After watching this video, you will be able to explain what packets and IP addresses are and how they relate to networking and explain the importance of DNS and DHCP servers and the NAT process. Everything you do on the internet involves packets. Every web page that you visit arrives as a series of packets, and every email you send leaves as a series of packets. Packets are also called frames, blocks, cells, or segments. There are three data transmission flow types. 
In simplex mode, the communication is unidirectional, where one of the two devices on a link can only transmit but not receive, and the other only receive but not send, like a radio or a keyboard. In half duplex mode, each station can both transmit and receive, but not at the same time, like a walkie talkie. In full duplex mode, both stations can transmit and receive simultaneously, like a phone or a messaging app. There are four basic transmission modes for IP packets. Unicast, transmission to a single specific destination, used for most internet traffic such as HTTP and FTP. Anycast, transmission to the closest of multiple nodes that have had the same unicast address assigned to them. Multicast, transmission to all nodes that have subscribed to the destination multicast group or address. Multicast transmission is limited to UDP protocol. And broadcast, transmission to all other nodes on the subnet. For example, to find a DHCPv4 server, broadcast transmission is limited to UDP protocol over IPv4 only. When you send an email, it is broken down into individually labeled data packets. Each packet travels independently over the network and arrives at their destination in no set order. They are then compiled in the correct order to produce the original message. Internet Protocol version 4, or IPv4, is one of the core protocols for the Internet. It was developed to provide identification for every network device. Internet Protocol version 6, or IPv6, is the newest version of Internet Protocol. IPv6 solves many of the limitations of IPv4, including address space and security. IPv4 only allows around 4.3 billion IP addresses. With all the smartphones, hotspots, and IoT devices, that's just not enough anymore. IPv6 allows over 340 undecillion IP addresses. An undecillion has 36 zeros. IPv6 ensures larger network capacity with added efficiency and security features. An IP address is used to logically identify each device or host on a given network. An IPv4 IP address is a 32-bit binary value. It is broken into four eight-character binary values called octets. Each octet has a decimal value between 0 and 255. Any IP address with any octet higher than 255 is not a valid IP address. An IPv6 IP address is a 128-bit binary value broken into eight fields, each separated by a colon. Each of the IPv6 binary values are represented by alphanumeric hexadecimal numbers. There are several different types of IP addresses. Static IP addresses are manually assigned. Network servers or network devices that have specific protocol settings often use static IP addresses. Dynamic IP addresses are automatically assigned. They change every time the device connects to a network or changes location. A public IP address is used to communicate publicly outside of the local network. It connects to the internet. A private IP address is used to connect securely within an internal private network. It does not connect to the internet. Loopback IP address is the range of IP addresses reserved for the local host address. And reserved IP addresses are addresses that have been reserved by the IETF and the IANA for special purposes. The domain name system, or DNS, is the phone book of the internet. When you type a URL, like www.google.com, into a browser and press Enter, the browser sends the URL to the DNS server. The DNS server replies with the proper IP address. Your browser will connect to the IP address provided. Because number-only IP addresses are not as easy for people to remember, DNS translates easy-to-remember web addresses to number-only addresses, and ensures that both network devices and the people that use them know where they're going. The Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP, automates the configuring of IP network devices. A DHCP server uses a pool of reserved IP addresses to automatically assign dynamic IP addresses or allocate a permanent IP address to a device. DHCP Static Allocation, the server uses a manually assigned permanent IP address for a device. DHCP Dynamic Allocation. The server assigns a different IP address to a device each time it connects to the network. And DHCP Automatic Allocation. The server assigns a permanent IP address for a device automatically. 
Subnetting is the process of taking a large, single network and splitting it up into individual smaller subnetworks, or subnets. Subnetting makes network routing much more efficient, where traffic travels a shorter distance passing through fewer routers to reach its destination. Each subnet mask identifies the boundary between the IP network and the IP host. A subnet mask is like an IP address, but for only internal usage within a network. Routers use subnet masks to route data packets to the right place. Automatic Private IP Addressing, or a PIPA, is a feature in operating systems like Windows that let computers self-configure an IP address and subnet mask automatically when the DHCP server isn't reachable. If a device can reach the local network but not the internet, chances are the device was assigned an APIPA address. Find out by typing ipconfig into the command prompt. Network Address Translation, or NAT, is a process that maps multiple local private addresses to a public one before transferring the information. Organizations that want multiple devices to employ a single IP address use NAT, as do most home routers. NAT conserves public IP addresses and improves security. When data packets arrive at the public IP address, the NAT instructions send all data packets without revealing the private IP addresses of the intended destinations. That single network device acts as an intermediary between the private network and the internet. A media access control address, or MAC address, is the physical address of each device on a network. A MAC address usually consists of six sets of two digits or characters separated by colons. Technologies like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and Ethernet use MAC addresses. A universally administered MAC address, or UAA, is uniquely assigned to a device by its manufacturer. A locally administered MAC address, or LAA, is assigned to a device by software or a network administrator, overriding the burned-in address for physical devices. MAC addresses handle the physical connection from computer to computer, while IP addresses handle logical network connection routes. In this video, you learned data packets travel in any order across networks to be reassembled at the recipient point. The three types of data transmission modes are simplex, half-duplex, and full-duplex. IPv4 and IPv6 are core protocols for the Internet, with IPv6 being newer, more efficient, and more secure. Different IP address types are assigned and used for different purposes and security levels. And subnetting allows large networks to split into smaller, more efficient subnets. Welcome to Models, Standards, Protocols, and Ports. After this video, you will be able to explain networking models and standards, list the role of each protocol type, and define common ports. A networking model describes the architecture, components, and design used to establish communication between the source and destination systems. Data packets follow the protocols of network models. There are two types of networking models. The OSI, or Open Systems Interconnection Model, is a conceptual framework used to describe the functions of a networking system. The TCP IP, or Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol Model, is a set of standards that allow computers to communicate on a network. TCP IP is based on the OSI model. The OSI model is a conceptual framework used to describe the functions of a networking system. Data flows across these layers when communicating over a network. The seven layers of the OSI model include application. Users and applications interact directly with the software application. Presentation. Ensures that data is in a usable format and is where data encryption occurs. Session. Controls the flow of information between different computers, including authentication and reconnections. Transport. Manages the delivery and error checking of data packets. Data is commonly transported using Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP. Network. Responsible for interpreting the addresses and directing the path the data will take. Data Link. Defines the format of data on the network. This layer also corrects errors that may have happened at the physical layer. And Physical. Electrically or optically transmits raw, unstructured data over a physical medium. The TCP IP model is a set of standards that allow computers to communicate on a network. TCP IP is based on the OSI model, 
and functions similarly. The background protocols are still in place, but the way they are organized is slightly different. The data travels through fewer layers on both ends. Networking standards define the rules for data communications that are needed for interoperability of networking technologies and processes. Standards are widely accepted protocols that engineers use to make sure the things they build integrate with existing devices and technology. There are two types of network standards. De jour, or formal standard, are formal standards developed by an official industry or government body. Formal standards have gone through formal processes to obtain consensus, including publicly available documentation. Examples include HTTP, HTML, IP, and Ethernet 802.3D. De facto standards result from marketplace domination or practice. De facto standards are accepted in practice but have not undergone any formal process to obtain consensus and may not have publicly available documentation. Typically, de facto standards result from marketplace domination or practice. Examples include Microsoft Windows and QWERTY Keyboard. Standards are usually created by government or nonprofit organizations for the betterment of an entire industry. This ensures a broader compatibility across vendors and industries. Some of the well-known organizations that have created network standards are International Standards Organization, or ISO, established the well-known OSI reference networking model. International Telecommunication Union, or ITU, standardized international telecom and set standards for fair use in radio frequency. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, established the TCP IP protocol suite. Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineers, or IEEE, established the IEEE 802 standards. The World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C, established the World Wide Web, WWW, standard. Finally, the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF, maintains the TCP IP protocol suites. IETF also developed the Request for Comment, or RFC, standard. A network protocol is an established set of rules that determine how data is transmitted between different devices in the same network. Network protocols are typically created according to industry standards. There are thousands of different network protocols, but they all perform one of three primary actions, security, communication, and network management. Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, and User Datagram Protocol, or UDP, are two primary internet protocols. TCP guarantees sent data makes it to its intended recipient. It's slower and requires more resources. File Transfer Protocol, or FTP, web browsing, and email are typical applications of TCP. UDP doesn't guarantee all packets will arrive, but it's fast and needs fewer resources, good for live streaming, online gaming, and calls over the internet. The TCP IP suite is a collection of protocols. Together, these protocols provide a complete networking solution. The Internet of Things, or IoT, network model comprises diverse protocols for communication, which include data collection, data package, data transfer, and data control. The Crypto Classic protocol is designed to serve as one of the most efficient, effective, and secure payment methods built on the blockchain network. It ensures privacy and transparency of payments directly transferred between two parties who have an address on the blockchain network. Ports are the first and last stop for information sent across a network. A port is a communication endpoint. A port always has an associated protocol and application. The protocol is the path that leads to the application's port. A network device can have up to 65,536 ports. Port numbers do not change. In this video, you learned that networking models describe the design used to establish communication between source and destination, and there are two types of networking models, OSI and TCP IP. Network standards define the rules for data communication and ensure broader compatibility across vendors and industry, and network protocols are based on an established set of rules that determine how data is transmitted between different devices. Welcome to Wireless Networks and Standards. After watching this video, you will be able to explain the different wireless network types, list the advantages and disadvantages of each wireless network type, 
and described the wireless networking standards. As an alternative to traditional cable and fiber optic networks, wireless networks have become crucial for enabling mobility. Wireless networks like WPAN, WLAN, WMAN, and WAN use radio waves for data transmission and reception instead of wires. And they follow IEEE wireless standards. These are the sets of protocols that define how all wireless communication works. This video describes how wireless networks function and what each one is used for. A WPAN connects devices within the range of an individual person, around 10 meters. WPANs use signals like infrared, Zigbee, Bluetooth, and ultra-wideband. WPANs use the IEEE 802.15 wireless standard. Bluetooth and Zigbee are some of the IEEE 802.15 signals that wirelessly connect devices over short distances. Advantages include flexible and efficient, one-time easy setup, and portable. Disadvantages include limited range, limited data rates, and more expensive. A WLAN connects computers and devices within homes, offices, or small businesses. WLANs use Wi-Fi signals from routers, modems, and wireless access points to wirelessly connect devices. Wi-Fi follows the IEEE 802.11 wireless standard. The latest version of IEEE 802.11ax enables 8K video streaming, data-heavy cloud computing, and virtual reality experiences. Advantages include reliable and versatile, high data transmission rates, and easy to manage. Disadvantages include low network coverage area, number of devices affects speed, and less secure. A WMAN spans a geographic area. It serves ranges greater than 100 meters. Worldwide Interoperability for Microwave Access, or WiMAX, is a family of wireless communication standards that provide WMAN broadband connectivity. There are similar open source and proprietary broadband technologies, but WiMAX is the accepted suite of standards based on IEEE 802.16. Advantages include covers multiple city locations, easy to use, extend, and exchange and managed by an ISP, government entity, or corporation. Disadvantages include require special user permissions, less secure, and slower than wired. A WAN provides regional, nationwide, and global wireless coverage. This includes private networks of multinational corporations, the Internet, cellular networks like 4G, 5G, Long-Term Evolution, or LTE, and LoRaWAN, which is a low-power WAN protocol built on top of the techniques used in long-range radio modulation. Advantages include global wireless coverage, better security than WLAN, and centralized flexible infrastructure like cloud apps and storage. Disadvantages include expensive, difficult to maintain, and decreased coverage over large areas. A wireless ad hoc network, or WANet, uses Wi-Fi signals from whatever infrastructure happens to be available at the time to connect devices instantly, anywhere. WANets are similar in size to WLANs, but use technology that is closer to WANs and cellular networks. Advantages include flexible, no required infrastructure, and can be set up anywhere instantly. Disadvantages include limited bandwidth quality, not robust, and has security risks. There are also manets, or mobile ad hoc networks, and vanets, or vehicle ad hoc networks. These are similar to WANets, but have different specifications. A cellular network provides regional, nationwide, and global mesh coverage for mobile devices. Each version below represents a cellular network evolution. 2G supported digital voice and simple data with 64 kilobits per second speed. 3G supported mobile broadband with 2 megabits per second speed, which enabled basic GPS, media downloads, and streaming. 4G advanced speeds and efficiencies with 100 megabits per second speed. And 5G brought 1 gigabits per second speed, which is still bringing cellular networks to a whole new level. Advantages of cellular networks include flexibility, access, and speed and efficiency as it evolves. Disadvantages include expensive, decreased coverage in rural areas, 
and hardware limitations, like screen size and mobility of peripherals. The IEEE 802.20 and IEEE 802.22 network standards support WANs, cellular networks, and WANets. Well-known use cases include emergency mobile operations, internet on airplanes, internet service provider networks, and large-scale monitoring for things like earthquake zones, flood warnings, and space exploration. IEEE 802.20 uses smart antennas to optimize bandwidth for increased coverage or mobility. It is no longer being actively developed, but it is still used to fill the gap between cellular and other wireless networks. IEEE 802.22 uses empty spaces in the TV frequency spectrum to bring broadband to low-population, hard-to-reach areas typical of rural environments. In this video, you learned that WPANs use IEEE 802.15 for nearby devices. WLANs use IEEE 802.11 for home or office networks. WMANs use IEEE 802.16 for city or campus networks. WWANs supply regional or global networks. WANets are land-sized temporary mobile networks. Cellular networks have evolved over time to become faster and more efficient. And IEEE 802.20 and 802.22 are the standards for WANs, WANets, and cellular networks. Welcome to Protocol Table. After watching this video, you will be able to explain the difference between TCP and UDP, describe the relationship between ports and protocols, and list common protocols and their uses. A network protocol is an established set of rules that determine how data is transmitted between different devices in the same network. Network protocols are typically created according to industry standards. There are thousands of different network protocols, but they all perform one of three primary actions, security, communication, and network management. Ports are the first and last stops for information sent across a network. A port is a communication endpoint. A port always has an associated protocol and application. The protocol is the path that leads to the application's port. A network device can have up to 65,536 ports. And default port numbers do not change. Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, and User Datagram Protocol, or UDP, are two primary internet protocols. TCP guarantees that sent data makes it to its intended recipient. It's slower and requires more resources. Typical applications include File Transfer Protocol, or FTP, Web Browsing, Email. UDP doesn't guarantee that all packets will arrive, but it's fast and requires fewer resources. Typical applications include Live Streaming, Online Gaming, Calls over the Internet. Ports send and receive data using TCP, UDP, and sometimes both. Web page protocols control access and connection between internet users and the sites they visit. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, is responsible for standard internet or web page access. The default port for HTTP is 80. And Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, or HTTPS, is responsible for encrypted internet or web page access. HTTPS should be used on a web page that prompts for sensitive data, such as credit card numbers. The default port for HTTPS is 443. File transfer protocols control how data is managed when sent from one location to another. File transfer protocol, or FTP, is responsible for file transfer. FTP transfers files to and from an FTP server or client, the default port for FTP is 21. And Secure File Transfer Protocol, or SFTP, is responsible for encrypted file transfer. 
The default port for SFTP is 22. Remote access protocols enable device control from a remote location. Teletype network, or Telnet, is used to remotely control another device via console or command shell. Telnet lets users configure network devices from almost anywhere worldwide, so long as both devices have network connectivity. However, Telnet should not be used due to data being in clear text, no encryption. The default port for Telnet is 23. Secure Shell, or SSH, is used to remotely control another device via console or command shell securely with encryption. SSH uses encryption to secure remote data. The default port for SSH is 22, which is the same port that SFTP uses, since they both offer similar secured services. And Remote Desktop Protocol, or RDP, is used to remotely control another computer via a graphical user interface, also called GUI or GUI for short. Email protocols determine how email messages are received, stored, downloaded, removed, or retained. Post Office Protocol Version 3, or POP3, is an older protocol that was the standard for receiving email. With POP3, email is downloaded from an email server to a single device, and then the email is deleted from the server. The default port for POP3 is 110. Internet Message Access Protocol Version 4, or IMAP4, is a protocol responsible for receiving email. With IMAP4, Email is stored on the server and synchronized to multiple devices, like laptops and mobile phones. The default port for IMAP4 is 143. And Simple Message Transport Protocol, or SMTP, is responsible for sending email. The default port for SMTP is 25. Network protocols monitor, control, and help the network locate, share, and transfer data. Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP, automatically assigns IP addresses to devices. The default ports for DHCP are 67 and 68. Domain Name System, or DNS, resolves or translates domain names to IP addresses. The default port for DNS is 53. Server Message Block, or SMB, enables sharing files and printers on the network. The default ports for SMB are 137 through 139. Simple Network Management Protocol, or SNMP, monitors the network. The default port for SNMP is 161. And Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, or LDAP, allows directory services to store and authenticate passwords, usernames, and accounts and share them over the network. The default port for LDAP is 389. In this video, you learn that protocols determine how data flows on a network. Ports are the first and last stops on a network. Ports send and receive via TCP, UDP, or both. HTTP and HTTPS are web page protocols. FTP and SFTP are file transfer protocols. Telnet, SSH, and RDP are remote access protocols. POP3, IMAP4, and SMTP are email protocols. And DHCP, DNS, SMB, SNMP, and LDAP are network protocols. Hello and welcome to using your Windows Lab workspace. We're excited for you to take these next steps in your skills journey. The labs in this course and other courses provide you with a virtual hands-on lab environment where you can boost your skills by practicing what you've learned in your course videos and readings. Your lab space, also known as a guided project or the MyCloud workspace window, contains all the software you need to successfully complete your lab tasks. You'll also open a lab instructions file. For your best experience, we recommend displaying your lab space and instructions side by side. To access your hands-on lab, first open the item in the course for the hands-on lab. If the lab instructions display in a new tab, 
hover over the tab and pull the tab down onto the desktop. You can drag the window edges to resize the window to about one-third of the screen size. You'll return to this window later. Return to the course screen and scroll through the displayed course lab instructions. Select the checkbox to accept the Coursera on our code conditions. Then click the Open Tool button. Next, you'll see the Coursera Guided Project window. This window may take a moment to display. The displayed MyCloud Workspace window is divided into two panes. The left pane is named the Cloud Workspace window, and the right pane is named the Instructions window. You won't use this Instructions window. Now, you can expand the Cloud Workspace pane on your screen's left side using one of two methods. Drag the vertical slider between the Cloud Workspace and the Instructions pane to the far right side of the screen, or click the Expand Cloud Workspace window button displayed on the top right of the left pane. Take a moment to view your lab window. You can click the Lab Window Resolution drop-down arrow to adjust the size of the on-screen icons in the Cloud Workspace. And next, let's adjust your browser windows to see your Cloud Workspace and Lab Instructions side-by-side. Side. On the Cloud Workspace Lab Window, hover over the double box icon located in the top right of the browser window to reduce the size of your window. Move the window to the left side of the screen. Now, drag the window's right edge so that the Cloud Workspace Lab window uses about two-thirds of the available desktop space. Next, select the browser window that displays your lab instructions. Drag the instructions window so that the window is to the right of the Cloud Workspace Lab window. Now, you can perform the lab tasks in the Cloud Workspace window while using the lab instructions. After completing the lab, select Leave Session to close the Cloud Workspace window, then close your lab instructions using the option available for your browser. Also, before you begin, here's some extra information you need to know. Each time you connect to these labs, Coursera creates a fresh new environment. Data or files you saved in a previous session are no longer available. To avoid losing your data, plan to complete your lab tasks in a single session. These labs are time to provide enough time to complete lab tasks, but if you leave the lab session unattended, your lab may time out or end. Now, these setup instructions used a Chrome browser within Microsoft Windows 10. Other browsers and web browsers on Mac or Linux computers may use different navigation. You're now lab ready. Let's get started. Welcome to configuring a wired Soho network. After watching this video, you will be able to describe the features of a Soho network, list the requirements for setting up a Soho network, and explain how to configure, test, and troubleshoot a Soho network. A small office home office, or Soho network, is a local area network or LAN with less than 10 computers that serves a small physical space with a small number of employees or home users. It can be a wired Ethernet LAN or a LAN made of both wired and wireless devices. A typical wired Soho network includes a router with a software-based firewall, a switch with four to eight Ethernet LAN ports, a printer, and several desktops or laptops. Soho networks often use email, website, and cloud subscription services, since maintenance and reliability are included. Internet is provided via cable, DSL, or ISDN. Basic equipment maintenance is easy since there are only a handful of devices and cables to consider. When setting up a Soho network, knowing the compatibility requirements is very important. The hardware, software, adapter cards, and cables all need to be compatible for the network to function properly. Before setting up any Soho network, review and confirm everything in your plan to ensure a successful installation. Soho networks need a switch to act as the hub of the network. If internet is desired, a router can be added or used instead. Soho routers often have other integrated features, like a cable or DSL modem, switch ports, and a built-in firewall. A modem provides an internet connection. Ethernet cables provide a wired connection. Category 5, 5E, and 6 cables are the current standard. A router automatically assigns IP addresses to each device on the network. 
which is necessary if you intend to share your internet connection with all the connected devices. And a Soho network switch typically allows four to eight connected devices to talk to each other, but does not assign IP addresses or provide internet. Switches are best used to expand the number of LAN ports available on the network, since the number of ports on a router can be limited. Set up the hardware in a Soho network using the following steps. Plug the switch or router into a power source. Connect the switch to the router, if necessary. If you're using a switch and a router, plug one end of an Ethernet cable into any LAN port on the router and the other into any LAN port on the switch. This will expand the network to the rest of the LAN ports on the switch. Connect your modem to your router, if necessary. If you're sharing an internet connection from a modem, connect the modem to the WAN internet port on the router. This is usually a different color than the other ports. Connect your computers to open LAN ports. Use ethernet cables to connect each computer to any open LAN port on your router or switch. Keep devices close to the router or switch since Ethernet doesn't transfer data reliably over long distances, 100 meters maximum. The next steps are to configure router settings. Log in to router settings. Enter ipconfig into a command prompt window to find your router's public IP address. It will be listed next to default gateway. Enter it into a browser and log in. Update username and password. All routers have default administrator usernames and passwords. Anyone with access can change the admin password or other settings and even lock you out. To improve security, always change the default username and password. Update firmware. Updating router firmware solves operational problems and enhances security. Check the manufacturer website for available firmware updates. Download and install if your firmware is not up to date. As you configure, Remember that the model number, revision number, and login defaults are printed on the router or its manual, and that the local or private IP address of any router is usually set to 192.168.1.1. The security of a wired SOHO network primarily depends on a firewall, since all data packets in a wired network travel through secure Ethernet cables. Most broadband routers have a built-in firewall, and additional software firewalls can be installed on individual machines. Servers and hardware have built-in dynamic host configuration protocol and network address translation actions. DHCP servers use IP addresses to provide network hosts, while NAT maps a public IPv4 address to private IP addresses. Soho network administrators don't have to configure firewall or server settings unless more than a basic setup is required. User account setup is included in most operating systems. Apple or Linux setup steps will vary. In Windows, open the control panel and select User Accounts. Configure your account and settings. Add or configure other users by selecting Manage another account. If you wish to add and configure local users and groups, search and select Computer Management, then select Local Users and Groups. In Windows 10 or higher, Device Manager allows you to add devices to a network, set default printers, and more. If the network firewall uses MAC filtering, be sure to modify the whitelist for each authorized client. Network performance depends on internet strength, cable specification, installation quality, connected devices, and network and software settings. Test and troubleshoot to ensure proper network performance. To troubleshoot performance, run security tools, check for updates, restart devices, run diagnostics, reboot the router or modem, and check equipment for damage. In this video, you learned that wired SOHO networks have a router, switch, printer, and connected devices. Compatibility requirements are very important. Physical setup includes connecting the router to the modem and a device to the router. IP config shows your router's public IP address. Router settings are configured from a browser, and groups and users are configured through the control panel and computer management tools. Welcome to Configuring a Wireless SOHO Network. After watching this video, you will be able to list the features of a SOHO wireless network.
Describe how to configure a WAP, SSID, security, and encryption, and explain how to test and troubleshoot a SOHO wireless network. A small office home office, or SOHO wireless network, is a wireless local area network, or WLAN, that serves a small physical space with a small number of employees or home users. A SOHO wireless network can be configured with the help of a central wireless access point, or WAP, which can cover a range of wireless devices within a small office or home. SOHO networks often use email, website, and cloud subscription services, since maintenance and reliability are included. Some common broadband types that enable network connection include Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP, which is the most common broadband type. It is used in cable modem connections. PPPoE, or Point-to-Point -point Protocol over Ethernet, is used in DSL connections in areas that don't have newer options. Static IP is more common in business. DHCP is the easiest broadband type to use. Internet service providers can provide other options if needed. Wireless networks can be set up to be either open or encrypted. Open networks are popular in public spaces because they don't require a password. However, they are easily exploited because anyone can join. Encrypted networks require a password before users can connect. There are different types of Wi-Fi encryption, the strongest being WPA2. A captive portal is a web page pop-up that authenticates users who try to log in to Wi-Fi in places like apartment houses, hotel rooms, and small business centers. However, a captive portal is not a secure connection. On the rear of a typical wireless router, you'll see several connections. A power input jack, one or more wired Ethernet jacks for wired connections. These may include a jack for broadband connection, often labeled WAN or Internet. A USB port, which lets you connect a printer or external hard drive for sharing on the network. And a Wi-Fi on-off button, which allows you to easily enable or disable a wireless network. To manage a router, you must find its default IP address. First, type CMD into the Windows search bar to open the command prompt. Then, type ipconfig in the command prompt window to see IP information for your network. Next, copy the default gateway IP address. Paste it into a web browser and hit enter. A login will appear. The default router username and password are usually admin. Change these during setup to protect the network. Whenever a change is made, Save Settings must be clicked. After setup, if you cannot access the web, the router is not connected. This is usually caused by choosing the wrong broadband connection type for your service. A Service Set Identifier, or SSID, is the name of a wireless network. This name is chosen during the setup of a wireless network. It's a good idea to choose a unique name to distinguish your router from any neighboring wireless routers nearby. Each country determines the band usage and the available 802.11 modes. The supported modes for the 2.4 GHz band are 802.11, B, G, and N. And the supported modes for the 5 GHz band are 802.11, A, N, and AC. Every router has a default option, which supports all types. If you are not sure which modes are supported, select the default one. Most wireless network users will select one of the common forms of secure encryption. Wired Equivalent Privacy, or WEP, was the first security protocol developed. It was retired due to security flaws. It is only in use now when equipment is old or not updated. Wireless Protected Access, or WPA, is stronger than WEP and supports a wide variety of devices. WPA2 is even stronger and is supported on newer wireless devices. WPA2 is the most common and most secure. When you configure your encryption, select the WPA2 security mode. Set your pre-shared key, this is your WPA password. It must be 8 to 63 characters long. Choose a longer, harder to guess key for stronger security. Once the router is configured, your wireless network is ready. Users will see it among the available wireless networks when they click the Wi-Fi icon, located at bottom right of PC screens and in the drop-down menu of mobile devices. 
test network performance and internet connectivity on each wireless device in the vicinity of the WAP. If needed, troubleshoot performance issues like network lags, glitches, or blocked access with the following actions. First, check the router configuration settings. Next, run security tools. Check for updates. Restart devices, run diagnostics, reboot router or modem, and finally, check your equipment for damage. In this video, you learned that a SOHO wireless network is configured with a central wireless access point, WAP, to cover all wireless devices within a small office or home. DHCP is the most common broadband type over PPPoE and static IP. The IP config tool lists the IP address of a host on a network and the IP address of its assigned default gateway. SSID is the name of a network and can be changed in the router settings. And WPA2 is the best encryption choice because it is the strongest. Welcome to Mobile Configurations. After watching this video, you will be able to perform mobile devices basic setup, understand mobile device configuration settings, and apply security features to mobile devices. Setting up a new mobile device is an automatic, easy to follow process. Steps will vary depending on make and model, but the general process is outlined below. First, insert your SIM card, turn on your phone, and ensure that it is fully charged. Next, select a language and connect to Wi-Fi. Enter your account details using Google for Android devices and Apple for iPhones. Select desired settings like data backup, location service, and diagnostics sharing. Set the date and time, and set up a pattern, PIN, password, and or fingerprint. After that, the next steps would be to personalize ringtones, phone sounds, wallpaper settings, and to download and configure apps. Updates to PRI, PRL, and firmware improve mobile device reliability and provide the latest technology and security features. Product Release Instruction, or PRI, are the set of configuration settings for the device's network. Preferred Roaming List, or PRL, tells a device which cell towers to use when roaming. Radio Firmware is software that manages connections for cellular, Wi-Fi, GPS, Bluetooth, and NFC. Connection types for mobile devices include both wired and wireless options. Wired connections enable data transfer and charging. Mini USB and micro USB are examples of older wired connectors, and USB C is the fastest and newest mobile connector. Lightning is an Apple only connector and is equivalent to USB C. Wireless connections enable sharing data over short distances. Near Field Communication, or NFC, is used for tap to pay, to unlock doors, or to share with nearby devices. And Bluetooth is used for sharing audio, video, and other files with nearby devices. Infrared, or IR, is used for remote control capabilities. Mobile devices can be configured to provide network connectivity or to restrict it completely. Tethering enables a phone's cell network to provide service to another device. Hotspot is a broadband access point created by tethering. Airplane mode toggles Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cellular on or off. Bluetooth is a wireless technology that exchanges data over short distances. Mobile users can turn on their phone's hotspot to tether other devices to the internet, or they can block connectivity with airplane mode, then turn on Bluetooth to watch downloaded content with wireless headphones. Synchronization lets you transition from one device to another without losing any newly added information. Mobile devices can sync via wired or wireless connection. Cloud Sync lets you collaborate on a work document from a public computer or take a work meeting from your phone. Desktop Sync lets you access phone photos on your desktop or view PC bookmarks on your phone. Vehicle Sync lets you turn your car on remotely or turn your oven off from your car. Single Sign-On, or SSO, lets you use a single ID to log into multiple apps from any device. Tech companies provide SSO to give users easy access to their cloud-synced apps and files. 
to receive email on a mobile device, configure it to use POP3 or IMAP4. Post Office Protocol version 3, or POP3, removes downloaded emails from the server, and it is better for single device users. Internet Message Access Protocol version 4, or IMAP4, saves emails on the server so multiple devices can see the same messages. Use protocols like SSL or SMIME to encrypt emails for security and authentication. IMEI and IMSI are used to identify cellular devices and network users when troubleshooting device and account issues. International Mobile Equipment Identity, or IMEI, is a unique number for phones on the GSM, UMTS, LTE, and IDEN networks. It can be used to block stolen phones. International Mobile Subscriber Identity, or IMSI, is a unique number for cell network subscribers. It is usually stored in a device's SIM card. Using VPN on a mobile device provides a secure, private connection over public Wi-Fi. iOS, Android, and Windows 10 devices support VPN. There are many mobile accessories, including headsets, speakers, gamepads and controllers, battery packs and chargers, phone cases, credit card readers, used to process payments using a phone app, and micro SD cards, used to expand storage capacity. Mobile device settings can be configured via the Settings app, which is usually depicted by an icon shaped like a cogwheel or gear. Manage Apps lets you manage, uninstall, and configure data storage locations for apps. Backup lets you store settings, apps, messages, and call history in case of new device or reset. In this video, you learned that basic mobile device setup is easy and automatic. USB-C is the fastest wired type for data and power transfers. Applying updates, VPN, and protocols like SMIME secures mobile devices. You can use your device as a hotspot to tether other devices to the internet. Synchronization lets you access your apps and files from multiple devices. Settings are configured through the Settings app. And tech support uses IMEI and IMSI to troubleshoot device and account issues. Welcome to Network Settings in Windows. After watching this video, you will be able to explain where common network resources are in Windows, list network tools available in Windows settings, describe when you would and wouldn't use a network reset. Windows settings is a key troubleshooting tool. To get to it, type settings in the Windows search bar. From there, you can select Network and Internet to access related information and tools. You can get to this same location by right-clicking your Start menu and selecting Network Connections. When the Network Status page loads, it shows the network you're connected to. It also shows the Properties button and the Data Usage button. The Data Usage button loads the Data Usage subpage, which shows you how much data each application has used on the network. Here, you can set a data limit and reset usage stats. The Properties button loads the Network and Internet Properties subpage. You can select the Public option to block access from other devices, or select the Private option, making your device shareable when you're on a trusted private network. You can create random hardware addresses to make device tracking difficult, and you can adjust metered connection settings to reduce data usage and set a data limit. The property subpage also shows you your network name, the type of Wi-Fi you're on, what network band you're using, your data transmission speed, your IP addresses, and information on your network router. This information is useful in many scenarios. As an example, when you are troubleshooting a network speed problem, you can use properties to see if your network is on a faster, shorter range 5 GHz band rather than a slower, longer range, 2.4 GHz band. If you're farther away from a wireless signal, a 2.4 GHz band connection is better. Back on the main network status page, you can scroll down to Advanced Network Settings to adjust adapter options, configure sharing settings, and use the Network Troubleshooter tool. You can also get a deeper view into hardware and connection properties, go to Firewall Settings, 
or perform a network reset. Let's take a deeper look at advanced options. The Network and Sharing Center has basic network information and tools like the network name, network troubleshooter, and the advanced sharing settings. Advanced sharing settings let you choose the level of access each network type has for things like network discovery and the sharing of files and printers. The Network Troubleshooter is an automated tool that detects and helps fix common network problems. With a single click, the Network Troubleshooter automatically searches for network issues and provides solutions or guidance for further troubleshooting. The Hardware and Connection Properties subpage lists the name, type, status, MAC address, DHCP information, default gateway, DNS server, and IP addresses for a device's connections, which can include Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Ethernet, and more, even when some of those connections are not active. If you want to find out if the IP address for a connection is static or dynamic, this is where you look. Here we see that DHCP is enabled, which means that the IP address is dynamic. The Firewall and Network Protection page has firewall status information and firewall customization settings. You can see firewall status for each type of network you connect to, whitelist apps, adjust notification settings, and configure advanced settings. The Network Reset tool lets you restore original network settings. This can be useful, but should be avoided if a network has a detailed or custom setup because you may have to reinstall and reconfigure network software and settings after the reset is completed. As you can see, network information and troubleshooting tools are easy to find and work with in Windows settings. From network names to sharing settings, the Network and Internet section has the information and tools you'll need to troubleshoot common network problems. In this video, you learned that the Network Status page shows the SSID and IP address for the connected network and provides tools for troubleshooting and setup. DHCP data and default gateway addresses can be found in hardware and connection properties. Advanced sharing settings let you adjust network discovery and file and printer sharing. Network Reset restores a network back to its original settings. Welcome to Troubleshooting Network Connectivity. After watching this video, you will be able to explain the two main symptoms of network connectivity problems, list the common causes of network connectivity problems, explain how to resolve common network connectivity problems. Can't connect or slow connection are two of the most common network problems. These symptoms can be caused by several different things. Let's explore some of their causes. Here are some common causes of network connectivity problems. Cable damage, equipment malfunction, out of range, missing network name or SSID, interference, weak signal, DNS and software malfunction, and malware. Now let's take a look at how to resolve each one. Cable damage slows or stops network connections. The damage can be obvious or hidden from view. To fix this, Check for physical damage. Test the cable using different devices or a specialized tool. Replace the cable. An equipment malfunction can slow up or stop network connections. To fix this, check the network adapter drivers in Device Manager. Make sure your switch's port settings are correct in the management software. Or replace the malfunctioning equipment. When a user is too far away from a wireless signal, their connection will lag or fail. To fix this, move physically closer to the source of the wireless connection. Move the wireless connection source closer to the affected users. Use stronger devices to boost the signal strength. Or use more devices to ensure the Wi-Fi reaches users who are farther away. Network connections can fail when a user can't find the network name, SSID, in the available network list. To fix this, move physically closer to the Wi-Fi source. Reconfigure the network to ensure the SSID is not hidden. 
upgrade devices or use compatibility mode on newer networks so older devices can still connect. Note that compatibility mode can slow an entire network down. To correct this, reserve the 2.4 GHz band for legacy devices. Interference is when a radio or microwave signal slows or breaks a wireless connection. To fix this, remove the source of the interfering signal. If on a wireless connection, use a different Wi-Fi frequency. If on a wired connection, use shielded cables to connect. Or, remodel the building with signal blocking materials. When signal strength is weak, a wireless adapter might slow speeds down to make the connection more reliable. This is one reason why fast hardware sometimes lags. If the signal is too weak, the connection may be completely dropped or batted back and forth between multiple weak network signals. This can happen when you are out of range. However, if you are in range but the signal is still weak or the connection keeps dropping, there may be interference from other devices or from physical obstacles made of dense materials like concrete or metal. To fix this, get closer to the wireless signal, adjust the wireless frequency channel, or physically realign devices and antennas for better reception. It's important to note that wireless access points should be placed up high and in the middle of the space. Network connections can fail when DNS servers and apps and OSs are configured incorrectly. To ensure proper configuration of the DNS server, run ipconfig in a command prompt. To ensure proper configuration of apps and OSs, use the network troubleshooter in Windows settings. Malware slows or stops network connections intentionally or as a result of overloading a system with other tasks. To fix this, use anti-malware tools in Windows Security, adjust firewall settings in Windows Settings, and configure privacy settings in Windows and in your browser and email applications. In this video, you learn that can't connect or slow connection are symptoms of network connectivity problems. Connectivity problems can be caused by cable damage or equipment malfunction. Wireless connectivity can be affected by range, a hidden SSID, interference, or weak signal. DNS, software configuration, or malware can also cause connectivity problems. Welcome to Network Troubleshooting with Command Line Utilities. After watching this video, you will be able to list the common network-related command line utilities, explain the function of each command line utility, describe how to use each command line utility. The command prompt is very different from Windows settings, but it has many useful diagnostic and troubleshooting features. It provides system information based on the commands a user enters in its command line. To access the command prompt, type command or the letters CMD into the Windows search bar. Now, let's review a few common command line utilities using the command prompt. Common command line utility commands that you would use to troubleshoot or diagnose network issues include ipconfig, ping, nslookup, traceRT, netstat, IPConfig shows the information and status for network adapters in a system. For configured adapters, IPConfig shows IP address, subnet mask, and the default gateway. If a network adapter is not configured, it will show as media disconnected. The ping utility sends an echo request to another computer to see if an echo reply message is received. You can ping IP addresses or domains. If you ping your computer's loopback address and get a reply, that means your network interface card is working properly. If you ping an IP address or a domain and get a reply, that means those locations are reachable from your network. If you ping a domain or IP address that doesn't exist or that isn't connected, you will receive a request timed out message. 
If nothing is returned, there is no connectivity. Sometimes, not all packets will return, which indicates a possible problem in connectivity. When this happens, re-ping to verify results. NSLOOKUP is a command line utility used to find the IP address of a domain or host. NSLOOKUP lists the server and IP address used to query the domain, the query domain or host name, and its IP address. NSLOOKUP is useful when trying to resolve DNS problems. If you get an error message, then there is a local DNS problem. To verify your results, you can run the same query from a different DNS server. This is done in the NSLOOKUP command by adding the different DNS server's address after the domain. The TraceRT utility is similar to the ping utility, except that it follows, or traces, the route a data packet takes to its destination, instead of just tracking start and end points of a connection. TraceRT lists where a data packet was sent from, where it was sent to, how many times it was transferred, transfer point locations on the network, and the time limit it took for each step of the route. TraceRT helps you discover where issues are happening on the network and whether network traffic is flowing properly. Be aware that firewalls affect TraceRT tests, often providing a request timeout message. Netstat, short for Network Statistics, is a command utility that shows if a server's email and file sharing ports are open and connecting to other devices. Netstat list of connections, protocol, local address, foreign address, and current state. Netstat is useful when you want to find where a problem is in a network. It identifies errors and provides robust diagnostics information that can be used in further troubleshooting. In this video, you learn that ipconfig lists the device's IP address, subnet mask, and default gateway. Ping checks to see if data can be sent and received. NSLOOKUP shows the IP address of a domain. TraceRT traces the route a data packet takes to get to a destination. Netstat shows if a server's email and file sharing ports are open and connecting to other devices. Welcome to Types of Local Storage Devices. After watching this video, you will be able to list the difference between RAM and ROM, identify the different types of storage drives, and explain the differences between storage drives. Random access memory, or RAM, and read-only memory, or ROM, are computer hardware chips that store data. RAM, or volatile, cache, or temporary memory, fetches data at a high speed, only stores data for a short time, and automatically deletes data if the device is shut off. ROM, or non-volatile memory, fetches data at slower speeds, stores larger amounts of data for as long as needed, and keeps data even if the device is shut off. RAM is used for copy-paste, opening programs, and background processes. ROM is used for computer booting and process initialization. A hard drive or hard disk drive, also called HD or HDD, is a storage drive made of spinning magnetic plates and a read-write head that reads or writes data. HDDs are known for having a large storage capacity, speeds up to 200 megabytes per second, and a tendency to overheat. HDDs were the standard PC storage for decades. They are best for large archival activities. A solid-state drive, or SSD, is the fastest storage option. It has no moving parts, doesn't need power to retain data, and can read, write, and fetch faster than any HDD, up to 7,000 megabytes per second, as opposed to 200 megabytes per second with HDDs. SSDs are the new standard for PC storage. They are small, fast, and durable but also expensive, with limited capacity, and they can fail suddenly. SSDs are best for activities that require speed, like browsing online or editing large files. Solid-state hybrid drives, or SSHDs, 
integrate the speed of an SSD and the capacity of an HDD into a single device. It decides what to store in solid state versus hard disk based on user activity. SSHDs are faster than HDDs, offer better performance than HDDs, cost less than pure SSDs, and have higher capacities than SSDs. Hard drives and solid-state hybrid drives are sometimes referred to as spinning drives because they use spinning plates to read, write, and fetch data. Optical disk drives, or ODDs, read, write, and store data on optical disks like DVDs, CDs, and BDs, or Blu-ray discs. Optical disk drives use a laser to reflect light off a disk's surface so it can read the reflected light. The process is reversed when writing data to a disk. Optical disk drives are also called CD drives, DVD drives, BD drives, disk drives, and optical drives. Optical drives are best for reading large media files stored on disks. Flash drives store data on solid-state drives. Less energy is needed to run flash drives as they don't have moving parts that require cooling. High-end versions deduplicate and compress data to save space. Flash drives are small, fast, and inexpensive to run, but they have smaller capacity than hard disk drives and are expensive to purchase. Flash comes in multiple form factors, including USB thumb drives and digital memory cards. Flash is best for activities that require speed, like browsing online or editing files. In this video, you learned that RAM is used for fast, short-term computer memory, and ROM is used for slower, longer-term computer memory. SSDs are faster and more efficient than HDDs. Hybrid drives offer the speeds of SSDs with the high capacity of HDDs. And optical drives can read or write to disks like CDs and Blu-rays. Welcome to Local Storage with Multiple Drives. After watching this video, you will be able to list the difference between SSHDs and hybrid disk arrays, define ephemeral storage, and explain how RAID works. Hybrid disk arrays physically combine multiple SSD and HDD devices into an array of drives working together to achieve the fast and easy performance of solid state and the lower costs and higher capacities of hard disk. Hybrid disk arrays are small, fast, have lower setup costs than pure flash, but they also have performance concerns and are complex to manage and maintain. Hybrid disk arrays are best when you want both fast speeds and high capacity. Direct Attached Storage, or DAS, is one or more storage units within an external enclosure that is directly attached to the computer accessing it. A DAS can contain hard drives, solid-state drives, and optical disk drives. DAS is best for small to medium networks with moderately high storage needs. External drives are portable DAS that connect to your computer via USB. In DAS units and other storage devices, you can configure storage settings to be ephemeral or persistent. Ephemeral storage deletes saved data on restart. It resets things back to their original state, even if settings, updates, and files are adjusted and saved. It is used in things like application demos and OS restarts in computer labs. Persistent storage keeps saved data on restart it behaves like the storage you're used to in your everyday computer. It is used in things like personal computers and network archives. Most storage drives are configured to use persistent storage. A redundant array of independent disks, or RAID, spreads data across multiple storage drives working in parallel. RAID 0, or striping, splits data into storage units called blocks and stores those across two or more drives in an array. RAID 0 is fast, has 100% usable disk capacity, but not fault tolerant. If one drive fails, all data is lost. RAID 0 is popular with gamers and photographers who need to save large amounts of data quickly. 
RAID 1, or mirroring, copies and stores data twice across two or more drives. RAID 1 cuts space to 50% usable capacity. And if one drive fails, no data is lost. RAID 10 combines RAID 0 and RAID 1. It stripes or spreads data across drives that are part of the array. RAID 10 is fast, fault tolerant, and if three drives fail, all data is lost. RAID 5, or striping with parity, is the most common form of RAID. It splits data into blocks and stores those across three or more drives. If data loss occurs, the computer will recalculate the lost data using error checking tags, known as parity bits, that it has stored across the drives. RAID 5 is fast, fault tolerant, and if one drive fails, no data is lost. RAID devices can use SSDs, HDDs, and hybrid drives. Companies choose RAID devices for their durability and performance. Multiple drive failure is rare, but it happens. Maintaining RAID devices, keeping spare drives handy in case of drive failure, and having a backup routine will make data loss nearly impossible. In this video, you learned that hybrid disk arrays combine SSDs and HDDs for fast performance, high capacity, and low costs. DAS are external storage drives directly attached to a computer for additional storage capacity or if you need a different storage interface. Ephemeral storage deletes saved data on restart. Persistent storage keeps saved data on restart. And RAID devices use multiple drives in different configurations to prevent data loss. Welcome to Troubleshooting Storage Issues. After watching this video, you will be able to describe common causes of storage failures, explain the troubleshooting steps for various storage types, investigate and resolve slow performance. Disk failure or hard drive failure can be caused by wear and tear over time, faulty manufacturing, or power loss, especially when the disk is reading or writing. Here are some symptoms of disk failure. With read, write, failure, you get an error message when you open or save a file. Blue Screen of Death, or BSOD, is a system stop error caused by a severe read-write failure. A bad sectors error means that part of a disk is unreliable and needs to be fixed. Constant LED activity, or disk thrashing, may indicate insufficient RAM, with data moving back and forth between RAM and the hard disk. A clicking or grinding noise is a sign of a problem. When you see these symptoms, Replace the disk to avoid data loss. The Check Disk tool and the Smart program are used to monitor and troubleshoot disk health. Smart, or Self-Monitoring Analysis and Reporting Technology, can be set to send an alert when a disk is unreliable. Check Disk tools find bad sectors and fix symptom errors. A Check Disk Run Test, Check Disk Slash R, locates bad sectors each time it is run. You can use Check Disk Fix, Check disk slash F to fix file system errors, but it won't find bad sectors. Additional diagnostic programs are available from software and hardware vendors or may come prepackaged with certain systems. When a computer fails to boot, the first step is to check for lights and sounds associated with power up. If these don't come on, check to see if the device is plugged in. If the device powers up but still does not boot, check the drive configuration to ensure that Firmware system setup has the correct boot sequence, and no removable disks are present. Data cables are connected to the drive correctly and free from damage. Motherboard port is not disabled by system setup. If the drive configuration is fine, it may be a file system error. Use the Windows setup disk to boot into the recovery environment and enter C colon in the command prompt. If it says invalid media type, try the boot rec tool or reformat the disk erases all data. If it says invalid drive specification, check the partition structure with disk part. Errors like invalid drive specification or OSS not found indicate boot errors. Boot errors are caused by disk corruption, incorrect OS installation, or viruses. To resolve, try your antivirus software's boot disk option to detect potential viruses. 
Then, use the antivirus software's recovery disk option, if available. If the problem persists, boot with the original product disk and choose Repair. Try Startup Repair first, or use the command prompt to Try Fixing MBR, Try Fixing Boot Sector, or to try correcting missing installations in the boot configuration database. Then, restart. For computers that won't boot, you can try to recover files by removing the hard drive and connecting it to another computer. External enclosure kits let you secure the removed drive and connect it to other computers using a USB cable. If possible, inspect and recover the drive's files via Windows Disk Management or use Check Disk to restore fragments of corrupted files, but keep in mind that third-party file recovery software may work better. Disk performance can slow if a disk is older, too full, or its files are not optimized for fast access. To improve performance, defragment the drive for faster file access. Add RAM. Upgrade to a solid-state drive or hybrid drive. Remove files and applications. Or add additional drive space. Optical drives are laser-based and don't physically touch disks. Here are some useful optical drive tips. Cleaning kits can often resolve common read-write errors. CD-ROM drives cannot read DVD-ROM disks. Third-party software is available for DVD and Blu-ray disk support. Writable disks have recommended write speeds that affect quality and vary depending on the brand. When the OS is too slow for the optical drive's write process, buffer underrun, Errors occur. To fix this issue, use the latest CD and DVD writers. Burn at a lower write speed. Close all other applications when burning. Or copy data to the hard drive instead of to the disk. Here are some common RAID troubleshooting steps. If a RAID array is not detected at setup or boot, ensure RAID controller drivers are installed and verify status. If the configuration tool is unavailable, the controller may have failed. If a RAID disk fails, you will get an alert. If the RAID array supports redundant drives and hot swapping, just insert a new drive and then rebuild the array with the configuration tool. Performance is impacted during the RAID array rebuilding process as it commonly involves large data transfers. Take care to only remove the failed disk. Removing a healthy disk can also cause a RAID array to fail. If too many disks fail, use backup and recovery solutions. A non-redundant RAID failure, like RAID 0, means both disk and data are lost. If the controller fails, install a new controller or import the disks into another system. In this video, you learn that disk failure is caused by faulty manufacturing, wear and tear over time, or power loss. Disk integrity is checked with check disk and smart. In boot failure, first, check for power up, lights and sounds, then drive configuration, space, RAM, or new drives improves performance. Fast write speeds cause optical drive errors. Rebuilding a RAID array slows performance. Removing a healthy disk can cause RAID failure. Welcome to Types of Hosted Storage and Sharing. After watching this video, you will be able to explain how storage as a service works, describe what a repository is and how it's used, and list the benefits of Active Directory. Storage as a service, or STOS, is when companies sell network storage space to customers. This saves their customers from having to purchase and maintain network equipment. Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, Box and Amazon Drive are all examples of storage as a service. Most email today is stored in the cloud. Companies store your data, emails, and attachments in their data centers. The same is true for social media storage. Companies store your photos, videos, and messages in their data centers. Security and data retention policies vary. Gmail will recover deleted email for 30 days before permanent removal. Facebook deletes after 90 days, but keeps certain user data indefinitely. A work group or home group is a group of computers on a Soho network, typically without a server. To share files and folders, users set them to public. Data is stored on the user device that created it. 
the added points of failure create higher risk of data loss. Newer cloud solutions provide the same features more securely. Work groups and home groups are less common. Home groups have been removed from Windows 10 altogether. A repository is a network location that lets users store, manage, track, collaborate on, and control changes to their code. Repositories save every draft and users can roll things back if problems occur. This can save software developers months of time. Examples of repositories include GitHub and Docker Hub. Active Directory is a Microsoft technology that manages domain elements such as users and computers. It organizes domain structure, grants network access, and connects to external domains. It can be managed remotely from multiple locations. Active Directory Domain Services, or ADDS, are the core services behind Active Directory. ADDS stores centralized data and manages communication and search, authenticates users so they can access encrypted content, manages single sign-on user authentication, and limits content access via encryption. Network drives are installed on a network and shared with selected users. They offer the same data storage and services as a standard disk drive. Network drives can be located anywhere. They can be in the same room as a network user or thousands of miles away. Network drives appear alongside local drives. Network drives can be installed on computers, servers, NAS units, or portable devices. File and printer sharing is part of the Microsoft Network service. It allows computers on the network to access shared files and printers. Network drives appear alongside local drives or are accessed via a web browser. Network printers appear in the printer options pop-up. In this video, you learned that Storage as a Service, or STAS, allows users to benefit from a robust network infrastructure without having to first build and maintain it. Software developers use repositories to store and collaborate on code and have all drafts saved in case they need to revert to an earlier version. Active Directory organizes domain and network elements and manages access to content. And network file and print sharing provides common central resources to users on a network. Welcome to Network Storage Types. After watching this video, you will be able to explain what a SAN does, explain what a NAS does, and list the differences between NAS and SAN. Network storage is digital storage that all users on a network can access. Small networks might rely on a single device for the storage needs of one to five people. Large networks, like the internet, must rely on hundreds of data centers full of servers. A storage area network, or SAN, combines servers, storage systems, switches, software, and services to provide secure, robust data transfers. SANs have better application performance, are central and consolidated, are off-site so data is protected and ready for recovery, and include simple, centralized management of connections and settings. A network-attached storage, or NAS device, is a local file server. It acts as a hard drive for all devices on a local network. NAS devices provide convenient sharing across network devices, better performance through RAID configuration, remote access, and they work when the internet is down. A NAS is a connected storage device that is local to the network it serves. A SAN is a storage system that involves many devices and connections across multiple sites. NAS devices are attached to a single site. Less expensive, easier to manage, they appear as a network-attached drive, use Ethernet, do not scale, and have a single point of failure. SANs can span multiple sites, are more expensive, harder to manage, they appear as a local drive, use fiber, are easily scalable, and are fault tolerant. In this video, you learned that NAS is a local device that acts as a file server for all devices on a local network. 
a SAN is a complete networking system that enables efficient and secure storage. And NAS and SAN are different because NAS is local to its network, while a SAN is a storage system that spans multiple offsite locations and involves many devices, servers, and connections. Welcome to Cloud-Based Storage Devices. After watching this video, you will be able to explain how file, block, and object storage differ, identify the three types of storage gateways, and list which storage is best for large backups. Cloud storage is when files and applications are stored and engaged with via the internet. Cloud companies manage data centers around the world to keep applications functioning properly and user data stored securely. Multiple cloud offerings have different features depending on each user's needs. The public cloud provides off-site storage for internet users. The private cloud provides collaboration and access to private network users. And the hybrid cloud is a mix of both. It provides public sharing and restricted private areas via cloud storage and cloud-hosted apps. Cloud companies use multiple data storage types, depending on how often they need to access different data and the volume of that data. File storage saves all data in a single file and is organized by a hierarchical path of folders and subfolders. File storage uses app extensions like .jpg or .doc or .mp3. File storage is familiar and easy for most users, has user-level customization, is expensive, and is hard to manage at larger scales. Block storage splits data into fixed blocks and stores them with unique identifiers. Blocks can be stored in different environments, like one block in Linux and the rest in Windows. When a block is retrieved, it's reassembled with associated blocks to recreate the original data. Block storage is the default storage for data that is frequently updated is fast, reliable, and easy to change, has no metadata, is not searchable, and is expensive, and it's often used in databases and email servers. Object storage divides data into self-contained units stored at the same level. There are no subdirectories like in file storage. Object storage uses metadata for fast searching. Each object has a unique number. It requires an API to access and manage objects is a good choice for large amounts of unstructured data, and is an important storage option for AI, machine learning, and big data analytics. A storage gateway is a service that connects on-premises devices with cloud storage. There are three types of storage gateways. A file gateway is a file server in the cloud that stores data files using the S3, NFS, and SMB protocols. S3 or Simple Storage Service Protocol, enables the storage of block data in categories called buckets. NFS, or Network File System Protocol, enables server-to-server -server file sharing. And SMB, or Server Message Block, enables file and print sharing for network users. A tape gateway is a backup server in the cloud. It uses the S3, Glacier and Glacier Deep Archive protocols to store virtual tape backups. Glacier and Glacier Deep Archive protocols enable secure and durable cloud archive storage at a lower cost than other storage solutions. Glacier features instant archive retrieval, where Glacier Deep Archive features 12 to 48 hour data retrieval. A volume gateway uses the Internet Small Computer System Interface, or iSCSI protocol, which enables on-premises applications to transfer block data to cloud storage over TCP IP networks. Volume gateways have two modes, cached and stored. Stored mode creates S3 backups of all locally stored content for recovery purposes. Cached mode is just like stored mode, except it only keeps frequently used data on-premises, which requires much less infrastructure. Archival storage moves data out of regular production file areas into long-term storage. Archival storage can be easily accessed and brought back into regular use. 
It can be done with tape drives, which are best for large backups, flash storage, hard drives, and cloud solutions. It is low cost and high capacity. Backups are copies of files, operating systems, settings, and more that are stored in a separate location in case of disk failure or data loss. Snapshots do the same thing as backups, but are usually used in storage arrays, or SANs, at an enterprise level and are more focused on capturing a point in time. All snapshots start off with a full backup. A full backup or snapshot copies everything on a disk selected for backup. A differential backup or snapshot copies only the files that changed since the last full backup. An incremental backup or snapshot copies only the files that changed since any backup. They can be automated or manual. If you delete the original instance of the data, only manual backups are retained. With important data, it is best to keep three backups or snapshots saved locally and in the cloud. Sometimes data can get corrupted. Backups and snapshots should be tested periodically to ensure they are still able to restore the data. In this video, you learned that object storage is used in AI and machine learning because it's good for large amounts of unstructured data. Block storage is used in databases and email servers because it's fast, reliable, and easy to change. The three types of storage gateway are file, tape, and volume. Tape drives are best for large data backups, and the three types of backups are full, differential, and incremental. Welcome to the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate. Did you know that industries worldwide depend more on technology now than ever before? That's because more people are using technology in their everyday lives, including working remotely, taking online classes, and even having health checkups with a doctor via webcam. With a worldwide increase in demand for technology comes an increase in need for user support for all technology-related needs. Who will provide technical support to individuals, companies, and organizations? Professionals who are knowledgeable in the fundamentals of computer hardware, operating systems, software, networking, storage, cybersecurity, and cloud computing. According to the most recent U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics report, about 70,400 computer support jobs are posted annually in the U.S. alone, and job growth in the computer support industry is projected to increase 9% through 2030. At the time of this course publication, the median U.S. computer support specialist salary is $57,910 U.S. dollars annually, and per hour pay is almost $28 U.S. dollars. Technical support jobs are also a great way to start on your path to a high-paying career in information technology. This certificate consists of several engaging and informative courses designed to introduce you to the fundamentals of technical support as well as information technology fundamentals. Additionally, this professional certificate can help you prepare for the CompTIA IT Fundamentals Certification Exam. This is a beginner level certificate, which means that anyone, even if you're new to IT, can take this course. You don't need prior experience in IT or technical support. No college degree is required. All you need to get started with this certificate is a willingness to learn and a basic computer literacy to take online courses through your web browser or mobile app. The courses in this certificate will introduce you to the essential parts of IT. You will learn about hardware, software, networking and cybersecurity, cloud computing, ticketing systems, and careers and pathways in IT. Throughout the courses, you'll hear from IT insiders as they share their experiences and what they've learned as they've progressed through their careers. Some of the experts you'll hear from are Aditya Pundir, an IT manager, Michelle Sanchez, an instructional designer who started in Help Desk, Mike Schwartz, who works in IT support, and Amy Taylor, an enterprise support technician. You will learn in this course through guided instructional videos that walk you through key concepts with essential need-to-know facts. Interactive exercises will reinforce what you've learned in videos. Insider viewpoints allow you to learn from professionals working in many fields of IT. And practice assessments and graded assessments will help you gauge your knowledge and prove what you've learned. 
Upon completing all of the courses, you'll learn a shareable badge and the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate. Why do you need a professional certificate? A professional certificate is beneficial for you because it's proof of your knowledge and accomplishments. The IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate has been specifically created to focus on the core knowledge you will need to possess to succeed in technical support and beyond. The courses work together to familiarize you with the elements of IT, introduce you to hardware and software, help you build your IT skills, and provide you with hands-on labs to practice using what you've learned in the course. When you've completed the courses in the certificate, you will receive a professional certificate so that you can share your hard work and accomplishment with potential employers and your professional network. One of the many benefits of the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate is that all of the courses are online and ready to start when you're ready to take them. The courses have flexible schedules, meaning you can complete the course at whatever time is most convenient for you and at your own pace, even if you have only two to three hours a week to spare. Or you could even complete the entire professional certificate in as little as three months if you spend five or more hours per week on the courses. Financial aid is available for those who qualify. So, if you are not sure this program is right for you, you can try a free 7-day trial or you can audit the courses. These options give you the opportunity to sample the content and determine if the courses are right for you. And remember that we're here for your success. If you have any questions about the courses or the professional certificate, just ask. So, what are you waiting for? Let's get started. Welcome to the IBM Technical Support Professional Certificate Overview of Courses. This certificate includes introductory courses on technical support, hardware and operating systems, software, programming and databases, networking and storage, cybersecurity essentials, and cloud computing. The certificate also includes the final course, Technical Support Case Studies and Capstone, to apply your knowledge and skills. The course, Introduction to Technical Support, describes many support essentials, including the roles and responsibilities of technical support professionals, career pathways and progressions in information technology or IT, support tools, ticketing systems, technical skills, and soft skills, all of which are needed to succeed in IT support. In Introduction to Hardware and Operating Systems, you'll learn about internal hardware computer components, including motherboard components, central processing units or CPUs, hard drives, and expansion slots. You'll also learn the essentials of basic workstation setup, commonly used operating system settings, screen capture commands, and effective troubleshooting practices. In the Introduction to Software Programming and Databases course, you'll learn about software, web browsers, software development, programming languages, and database management. In Introduction to Networking and Storage, you'll learn how to diagnose and repair basic networking and security problems. You'll also learn about network types and standards, wired and wireless connections, and common network storage and network sharing options. In Introduction to Cybersecurity Essentials, you'll learn about the fundamentals of cybersecurity. You'll also learn how to recognize common security threats and risks, examine the characteristics of cyber attacks, and explore methods for securing and managing confidential information. In the course Introduction to Cloud Computing, you'll discover the many elements of cloud computing and how cloud computing is changing the world of technology. You will identify various cloud service models, deployment models, and key components of cloud infrastructure. You'll also learn about cloud security, monitoring, emerging trends, and job roles in the cloud industry. And finally, in the Technical Support Case Studies and Capstone, you will apply your knowledge and skills to practical IT support scenarios. You will also complete a final exam designed to prepare you for the CompTIA IT Fundamentals Certification Exam. Are you ready to begin your journey toward becoming a technical support professional? Start on your first course today.
Welcome to Security Threats, Confidentiality, Integrity, and Availability. After watching this video, you will be able to explain what the CIA triad is, list concerns related to the CIA triad, and define common regulatory standards and penalties. A comprehensive security program must include confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These are known as the CIA triad. Confidentiality means that data is protected from unauthorized access. Integrity means that data is protected from unauthorized changes. And availability means that you have access to your data whenever you need it. When confidential data is exposed beyond the intended audience, it causes risk. Confidential information is kept secret to prevent identity theft, compromised accounts and systems, legal concerns, damage to reputation, and other severe consequences. To determine if data should be confidential, ask, who is authorized? Do confidentiality regulations apply? Are there conditions for when data can be accessed? What would the impact of disclosure be? Is the data valuable? Cybercriminals are always after sensitive information or personal data. To keep confidential data secure, control data access and use security tools like encryption and multi-factor authentication, or MFA. Data is one of the most valuable assets a company can have, but it is not static. It can be transferred to other systems, altered and updated multiple times. Data integrity guarantees that data is accurate, complete, and consistent. It covers data in storage, during processing, and in transit. Without data integrity, loss, corruption, or compromise can cause significant damage and financial loss for both businesses and customers. The two main types of data integrity are physical and logical. Physical data integrity is the collection of actions and fail-safes that protect the physical systems that store and process the data. Logical data integrity are the checks and protocols that protect data from human error and hackers. These confirm that data is correct and accurate as it is used in different ways within an organization. Data availability means that authorized users have immediate and reliable access to their data. This includes granting access to authorized users with passwords and security questions. Some of the most fundamental threats to availability are non-malicious, including hardware failures, unscheduled software downtime, and network bandwidth issues. Malicious attacks against availability include various forms of sabotage intended to cause harm to an organization by denying users access to the information system. One such example would be a DOS, or denial of service attack, where a website or server is targeted with so much traffic that it overwhelms that system, degrading performance until the server is unable to respond. To protect against these threats, systems that require high availability, 99.999% uptime, have network monitoring, redundant hardware, and backup servers ready to take over. If the primary system is compromised, business continuity and customer access can be maintained. There are regulatory standards, contracts, and local laws that companies and organizations must follow to secure and maintain data. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, regulates the use and disclosure of protected health information in America. And the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, regulates digital privacy for all countries in the European Union. Fines and penalties for non-compliance help companies keep data safe, secure, accurate, and private. In this video, you learned that the CIA triad is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Breaches and data loss can result in financial losses for both consumers and companies. Regulations like HIPAA and GDPR help to keep data safe, secure, accurate, and private. And non-compliance or repeated violations of privacy regulations can result in hefty fines and penalties.
Welcome to Security Threats, Security and Information Privacy. After watching this video, you will be able to define intellectual property, explain how to turn data into information, and list the different types of confidential information. An information asset is information or data that is of value. Examples include patient records, customer information, and intellectual property. Information assets can exist physically, on paper, disks, or other media, or they can exist electronically, in databases and files. Data analytics is when raw data, like values or facts, are used to create meaningful information. Data is the raw values and facts, usually collected by automated systems. For example, page visits, link clicks, monthly sales. Information is a summary of the raw data. For example, positive or negative results that happen after some specific change. Insights are conclusions based on the results of information analysis. Meaningful business decisions are based on insights. For example, if a positive trend occurs after store hours are changed, the right business decision would be to maintain those new hours. Intellectual property, or IP, refers to creations of the mind and generally are not tangible. It's protected by copyright, trademark, and patent law. Industrial designs, trade secrets, and research discoveries are all examples of IP. Even some employee knowledge is considered intellectual property. Companies use a legally binding document called a non-disclosure agreement, or an NDA, to prevent the sharing of sensitive information. Digital products are non-tangible assets a company owns. Examples include software, online music, online courses, ebooks or audiobooks, and web elements like WordPress or Shopify themes. A company must protect digital products from piracy and reverse engineering. Source codes, licenses, and activation keys also need protection from hackers and insider threats. Digital Rights Management, or DRM, is code added directly to files that helps prevent digital assets from being copied or pirated, but there are tools that can remove DRM code. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, makes it illegal to bypass copy protections or to develop technology that helps bypass copy protections. Data-driven business decisions help companies respond to real events. For example, sales and marketing data helps identify trends and customer interests, and production and fulfillment data helps identify productivity issues in areas like manufacturing, billing systems, transportation, and more. Getting the right information is key to data-driven business decisions. Data capture is the collection of data from multiple sources and the secure storage of it in relational databases or, more commonly, semi-structured data warehouses. Data may be captured by server logs showing where customers browse, IoT sensors in home appliances and business technology, and customer and employee surveys or rating systems. Data correlation is when raw data points are analyzed to find connections or links. For example, Netflix uses tools that compare searches, views, and ratings so they can predict which movies and shows will be successful on their platform. AI and machine learning algorithms automate parts of the analysis. Meaningful reporting is the presentation of analyzed information in ways that help people further analyze and interpret. Reporting tools use captured and correlated data to provide charts, keyword search, and graphs that help companies achieve business insights. Confidential information is information that must be kept secret. Employees are trained to recognize and deal with confidential information so that it remains secure. Companies rank information and files by how sensitive each one is. Each company ranks their information differently, but there are four main types of confidential information that should be universally protected. Personally Identifiable Information, or PII, 
is any information that can be used to identify someone, like government ID numbers, birth dates, addresses, and phone numbers. Company confidential information is any information that is used to run a company, like intellectual property, product designs, procedures, plans, employee records, and financial data. Customer confidential information is information customers or partners provide to companies, which includes PII, and also things like purchase histories and credit card information. Protected health information, or PHI, is any information added to a person's medical record during diagnosis or treatment that can be used to identify them, like PII, medical history, prescription lists, photos, and more. Examples of careless data handling include things like entering a customer's credit card information into an unencrypted database, leaving a patient's medical file unattended at the front desk, or letting a work friend borrow your password to download files because they forgot theirs. Properly handling confidentiality means restricting access to only those who need the information, not allowing unauthorized views or copies, storing information securely with encryption, firewalls, permissions, and more, destroying any file copies that are no longer needed, not just discarding them getting explicit consent before processing or storing information, including a disclosure about how long it will be kept, and ensuring employees create strong passwords that they do not write down or share and that they change those passwords regularly. In this video, you learned that when raw data is refined, it becomes information. Intellectual property, or IP, includes designs, trade secrets, research discoveries, and even employee knowledge. Digital products are non-tangible assets that a company owns, like software, ebooks, or web elements. Data-driven business decisions are based on capturing data, correlating it, and then using it to create meaningful reports. And the classes of data that companies and organizations must protect are Personally Identifiable Information, or PII, Company Confidential Information, Customer Confidential Information, and Protected Health Information, or PHI. Welcome to Security Threats. Threats and Breaches After watching this video, you will be able to identify the different types of security threats, list examples of security threats, and explain the difference between a worm and a trojan. Weak security policies can lead to physical threats, tampering, or the theft of hardware. Only trusted, authorized personnel should have physical access to information systems and only for the specific systems they are responsible for. It's much easier to steal data directly from a laptop or server than it is to remotely hack into a complex network. To keep hardware safe from physical threats, tampering, and theft, lock it in a secure area with card readers on doors to limit access. Use robust surveillance on the inside and outside of the premises, and keep these maintained, updated, and tested. Hardware failure or destruction can occur during power outages, fires, and natural disasters like earthquakes, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, and electrical storms. Environmental conditions such as humidity and mold also pose risks. Keep hardware safe with a well-maintained infrastructure that includes fire suppression systems, backup power, and a properly functioning HVAC system to prevent humidity and mold. Ultimately, none of these strategies will work without a detailed plan for what to do if disaster strikes or a system is breached. Regular planning and run-throughs of mock disaster and attack scenarios will help refine the process and identify security weaknesses. Unpatched systems, misconfigured firewalls, weak cybersecurity, and weak physical security are just a few ways that data threats occur. Data leaks are the accidental exposure of confidential or sensitive data through a security vulnerability. Data breaches are when a data leak is caused intentionally by a cybercriminal. 
These occur when social engineering or phishing attacks trick employees into leaking sensitive credentials or information. Data dumps are when cybercriminals dump stolen data onto the dark web for monetary gain. A data dump might include PII, PHI, bank account numbers, PINs, social security numbers, and more. Other cybercriminals buy and use data dumps for things like identity theft and password attacks. Dumpster diving is the act of physically searching through a literal dumpster to find something valuable. A company's trash might contain lists of customer names, phone numbers, contact information, business plans, product designs, or an access code written on a post-it note. Tech companies require document shredding and device destruction as a normal part of business because these can be stolen from the trash to harvest data that can be used for identity theft and data breaches. Or the data could be sold to hackers or a company's competitors. Software threats include theft, exploits, and malware. Software or license theft is the unauthorized copy or use of copyright-protected software. This includes pirating software and counterfeiting activation codes. Exploits are pieces of code that use vulnerabilities in hardware or software to get into a system. Malware-infected websites use exploits to automatically download malware to a system. This is called a drive-by download. Malware is a general term for software designed to compromise computer systems. Malware can cause system slowdowns, odd requests, browser misdirection, and pop-up ads. It can also steal data, record everything you do with or near your device, spam your contacts with infected links, and connect your computer to a network of hijacked computers that are remotely controlled, known as a botnet. Malware can come from attachments, sketchy websites, file downloads, infected USB drives, or links in emails, ads, social media, torrents, and even text messages. Phishing and Remote Desktop Protocol Attacks, or RDP attacks, are the most popular attack vectors for ransomware since they result in a higher success rate. To avoid malware, keep software updated, don't open strange attachments or links, back up your data, use strong antivirus software, and use strong, frequently updated passwords. Malware types include viruses, worms, trojans, exploits, spyware, adware, and ransomware. Computer viruses are programs designed to spread from host to host, just like real viruses. An infected app or file has to be started by a user for a virus to activate. Viruses can turn on a webcam, record keystrokes and site visits, steal data, corrupt files, and hijack email accounts. Let's look at some different types. Program viruses are bits of code that insert themselves into another program. Macroviruses affect Microsoft Office files via the macros they use to automate tasks. Stealth viruses copy themselves to different locations to avoid antivirus scans. Polymorphic viruses change their characteristics to get around cybersecurity defenses. 97% of all malware uses polymorphic viruses. Worms are viruses that start themselves after identifying system weaknesses. They don't rely on apps or files. And unlike viruses, worms can be controlled remotely. And Trojans trick you into installing legitimate-seeming software that includes harmful malware. Spyware collects personal data, login credentials, credit card information, and online activity, and can record using a device's camera or microphone. Adware is software coded into online ads that records your personal data, website visits, and keystrokes to send you personalized ads. Both adware and spyware can be legitimate or malicious. Ransomware locks a system, encrypts its files, and displays a ransom demand. To get the encryption key, you must pay the ransom, or you can regain access by doing a full system restore from a backup. In this video, you learned that hardware must be kept safe from physical damage, tampering, and theft. Hardware is vulnerable to natural disasters, fires, mold, and power outages. Software threats include theft, exploits, and malware. Malware includes viruses, spyware, 
adware, and ransomware. And 97% of all malware includes polymorphic viruses. Welcome to Security Threats, Threat Types. After watching this video, you will be able to list the types of impersonation, explain password cracking, and identify a DOS attack. Impersonation is when a hacker sets up a public Wi-Fi network that seems legitimate. Once a user connects, login credentials, session information, and PII can be intercepted. Another type of impersonation is when a hacker sets up a fake website that looks and feels exactly like a real website, such as a well-known bank or other high-profile site. They may send fake email or text links, known as phishing, to trick you into visiting the fake site so they can steal your credentials to the real site and install malware on your device. A third type of impersonation is when a hacker pretends to be someone else so they can steal data or take over systems. This is also called social engineering. Impersonation attacks can be used individually or in combination with each other. Hackers use snooping attacks to intercept data between devices. These attacks can reveal logins, credit card numbers, intellectual property, and more. Snooping attack types include eavesdropping, man in the middle, and replay. Some hackers can even use a computer monitor's electromagnetic fields to reconstruct what it displays. Snooping is common on open, unsecured networks and can be difficult to trace. Eavesdropping, or packet-sniffing attacks, occur on wireless, wired, and phone connections. A packet sniffer is a tool that intercepts everything transmitted on a network. Anything your device sends on an unencrypted network can be viewed with a packet sniffer. This allows hackers an opportunity to intercept, alter, or delete data transmitted between devices. If a network is encrypted, packet sniffers will only be able to see things like the origin and destination of a packet, but not the data inside it. Staying off public Wi-Fi or using encryption with a VPN or cellular connection helps prevent eavesdropping attacks. A man-in-the-middle attack is a form of eavesdropping. It has a victim, a receipt point, and an attacker. The victim and receipt point are unaware the attacker is listening in. Man-in-the-middle attacks can be physical or logical. In a physical man-in-the-middle attack, the attacker is physically near the victim, like the same public Wi-Fi network or a network they set up themselves as a trap. The attacker sniffs the unencrypted network traffic to gain access to everything the victim is doing online so they can steal information. In a logical man-in-the-middle attack, the attacker sends emails or texts with fake links that direct victims to sites that steal their data and install malware. If a fake email warned about a bank account problem, the victim might click the link and try to log in. This gives the attacker control of their bank account and installs malware on the victim's computer. Other man-in-the-middle attacks include spoofing, hijacking, and theft of browser cookies. A replay attack is a type of man-in-the-middle attack, which intercepts and retransmits data. Replay attacks are also known as repeat or playback attacks. Replay attacks involve trusted entities and require an access token. Trusted entities are users or websites that get an access token or security key after verifying that they are who they say they are. For example, connecting to your bank or your work network on a network registered device. Hackers get access tokens by sniffing network traffic between trusted entities. Once they find an access token, they can hijack the session and use the token to impersonate the trusted entities. After that, the hacker can intercept and modify any information sent or access private accounts as if they were the account holder. Password cracking is getting a correct password in an unauthorized way. Brute force attacks submit as many passwords as possible, hoping one will work. Dictionary attacks use words pulled from dictionaries or newspapers to crack passwords. 
and rainbow attacks use words from an original password hash to generate all other possible passwords. Hashing is when an algorithm transforms an input string, like your password, into a smaller fixed-length output string, or hash, that is saved to a file. A hash is like a digital fingerprint. Passwords are hashed with a scrambling algorithm. If a password hash is determined, attackers can use it to determine other passwords that were scrambled in the same way. That can be over 90% of unknown passwords in some cases. Unauthorized information alteration threatens the integrity of any process or outcome based on that information, including financial records, vote totals, health records, news stories, and more. Tools that fight unauthorized information alteration include File Integrity Monitoring, or FIM, which audits sensitive files and folders to ensure all activity is authorized, and Relational Database Management Systems, or RDBMSs. An RDBMS is a database that records user access and data changes. RDBMS is safer than a spreadsheet program. To preserve data integrity, security plans must prevent unauthorized user access, prevent unauthorized data changes by authorized users, and use error checking and data validation. A denial of service, or DOS, attack floods a network with so much traffic that it crashes. DOS attack victims are typically high profile, like government sites, banks, or social media sites. Sometimes, DOS attacks are used to distract from other attacks happening at the same time. Common DOS attack types include buffer overflow, when a website gets more internet traffic than it can handle. ICMP flood, when diagnostic pings are sent to every computer on a network. Each computer pings every other computer, and so on, until the network crashes. And SYN flood when a rapid series of incomplete connection requests floods a website until the server crashes. A distributed denial of service, or DDoS attack, is when a DOS attack is made with a large collection of compromised, malware-infected computers, known as a botnet. DDoS attacks give attackers the following advantages. It's harder to identify a DDoS attack's origin, which makes it harder to shut down. And DDoS attacks are far more devastating than DOS attacks, since hundreds or thousands of computers are used instead of just one. There are methods available to defend against DOS and DDoS, but they continue to be a real threat. In this video, you learned that impersonation includes public Wi-Fi traps, fake sites, and social engineering. Eavesdropping is also called packet sniffing. Man-in-the-middle attacks can be physical or logical. Replay attacks require trusted entity access tokens. A hash is a smaller saved code that is used to store scrambled passwords. To preserve data integrity, security plans must prevent unauthorized access and changes. And DOS and DDoS attacks flood a network with so much traffic that it crashes. Welcome to Security Threats, Password Management Techniques. After watching this video, you will be able to explore password management best practices, identify strong and weak passwords, and explain the difference between SFA, 2FA, and MFA. Strong passwords and an effective password strategy are essential to online security. People tend to use the same passwords across personal and business accounts, but weak or stolen passwords account for more than 80% of company data breaches. Each online account should have a unique password, especially corporate accounts. And employee training should exist to explain why password management and data security is so important. A password policy is a set of rules that provide guidance on using strong passwords. Password policies should require a minimum length of 12 characters, a mix of upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters, a unique password for each account or device, including personal devices used for work, 
a mandatory password change every 6 to 12 months, employee training on cyber attacks, and notification to employees that the company will never ask for passwords. Password policies should insist that employees should never reuse or recycle passwords, never share passwords, not even with the CEO, never write passwords down, and never store passwords in a digital file. Hackers can guess 1 trillion passwords per second. Passwords often have quotes from movies, songs, or books. But hackers already have online databases full of these quotes and lists of dictionary words, encyclopedia entries, and more. For stronger security, use 12 characters minimum. Avoid names, places, dictionary words, or PII. Use upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters. Avoid using LEET, or symbols for letters. Hackers already know about it. For example, writing the word password using the number 4 instead of the letter A or the dollar sign instead of the letter S. Use random characters and use a passphrase, which is 12 or more random words. Here's what strong passwords look like. Organizations should never ask customers or employees for their passwords. When employees know that their company would never ask for passwords, they are less likely to fall for impersonation and phishing attacks. Don't share your password with anyone, not even your boss or the IT department. IT staff have admin rights. Any work they do can be done on their own logins. Companies must teach employees the risks of password reuse and take steps to stop it. Password reuse means using the same username and password for all your accounts. Using common passwords like 12345 or the word password. Using the same password but with a different username. Hackers can easily link previously used passwords to people, and they can spray common passwords at online accounts. Password expiration is when a password is set to expire after a specific amount of time. In the past, employees typically had to change their passwords every 90 days. But this inspired weak and reused passwords. Longer intervals help employees use less risky behavior. Password expiration does make sense, but not once it starts to negatively affect security. Single Factor Authentication, or SFA, is when you enter one credential to log in. Username and password is the most common form. Single-factor authentication is not safe from keystroke loggers, malware that captures everything typed on a device, phishing, or data breach information sold on the dark web. With single-factor authentication, anyone who has your username and password can do whatever they want to with your account or data. Two-factor authentication, or 2FA, is when you enter two credentials to log in. Two-factor authentication is usually hardware-based with the most common form being a security key that plugs into a USB port. 2FA devices are the best defense you can have against phishing and hijacking and are very easy to set up. Newer versions use NFC, so the key only has to be near the device instead of plugged in. Multi-factor authentication, or MFA, is quickly becoming the industry standard for effective security. It's an extra layer of protection that companies and organizations are using to keep cyber criminals out of their systems. When you're trying to access a resource or device that's using MFA, you need to provide more than just the correct password to get in. MFA offers the following extra protection over SFA. Risk of a breach occurring is significantly reduced. MFA factors can't be captured by keystroke loggers. You're in full control over which factors you provide – phone, email, text, security questions, or some combination of all of them – and significantly reduced risk from phishing. It's important to understand that multi-factor authentication is not 100% fail-proof. As hackers realize that the number of organizations using MFA is steadily on the rise, they continue to look for ways to circumvent it or to exploit the vulnerabilities which inevitably exist in these types of solutions. Identification factors are pieces of information that only you and an authentication service know. They are something you know, like your password or PIN, 
answers to security questions, or one-time password or OTP code. Something you have, like a phone or email to receive OTP codes, a phone app that can generate OTP codes, or a device plugged into your phone or computer. And something about you, like your fingerprints, retinas, face, or voice. Biometric scans use these to authenticate you online or unlock a door to a secured area. Single Sign-On, or SSO, verifies users for connected accounts or apps so they only have to log in once. Businesses use SSO to simplify and speed up access to resources. IT departments set up single sign-on with vendors like Office 365 or Salesforce.com, so employees are automatically logged in when they sign into their work networks. This lets employees continue working without having to remember multiple passwords. Password managers generate strong, unique passwords for every online account you create and remember each of them for you. They can analyze your stored passwords and warn you if any are too weak or if any have been reused on other sites. They use powerful encryption on all stored passwords to keep them safe. Once set up, you have to remember the one password for the password manager. In this video, you learned that 2FA is when a physical device must be plugged in before login. MFA is when multiple authentication methods are used to log in. SSO verifies a user across connected accounts. Password managers create strong, unique passwords and remember them for you. And strong passwords are long, random, secret, and never reused. Welcome to Security Threats, Access Control, Authorization, and Authentication. After watching this video, you will be able to define each authentication factor, explain how digital accounting is used, and identify the four methods of non-repudiation. There are three processes involved in logging into a network or account. Access control, limiting or granting access to different areas based on user status. Authorization, giving permission to access a computer, network, app, or account. And authentication, proving it's you with a password or other credentials. Access control prevents unauthorized viewing, modification, or copying of data. IT staff use access control to restrict what users can do, which resources they have access to, and what functions they are allowed to perform. Access is granted using the rule of least privilege, where access is only granted to resources that a user needs to fulfill their role. Role-based access control, or RBAC, follows a company's org chart. Different customer and employee roles are set up as groups on a network, and then those groups are granted certain permissions. When a new user joins the network, they are assigned to the group that fits their role. They will have the lowest level of permissions they need to do their job. Authorization is when you have permission to access a location or do an action. Before you can access an account or system, you need authorization. Access control must be set up before any authorization is granted to maintain data security. And authorization must be set up for your user account before you're able to log in. Once you are authorized, you can then use authentication to log in. Authentication is the act of confirming the identity of a user. Authentication involves two steps entering the correct login information, and confirming that it is really you. Authentication factors used to confirm identity include something you know, like a username, password, PIN, or answers to security questions. Something you have, like a mobile device, security key, or security badge. And something you are, biometrics like facial recognition or a fingerprint, iris, or voice scan. Authentication methods include single factor, or SFA, two factor, or 2FA, multi factor, or MFA, and single sign on, or SSO. SSO lets you log in to multiple applications and platforms with one login. 
2FA and MFA are the most secure ways to log in because they require at least two authentication factors. Access control sets boundaries, authorization gives access, and authentication confirms identity. In the security field, it's important to know the right balance between the three A's. Strictly applying role-based permissions groups won't secure data if those groups all have the same authorization levels. The same is true if groups have properly set permissions but are not properly applied by administrators. Using strong passwords and MFA won't secure data if all groups have the same permissions. The same problem exists if groups have properly set permissions but passwords are weak. Using strong passwords and MFA won't secure data if all users are assigned to the same group. The same problem exists if administrators assign users to the proper groups but passwords are weak. Best practice should require strong authentication, strong authorization, and strong access control. Digital accounting is used in troubleshooting, security analysis, forensics, and hacking. Logs. Most software and systems generate audit logs. Audit logs capture log file events, which can show who did what and how the system behaved. Tracking. Websites can track your OS, browser version, installed extensions, screen resolution, installed fonts, time zone, language, and how long you spent on a site and what you did there. Cookies. A cookie is code used to track, personalize, and save information about your browsing session. Cookies can also be used to ban you from a website if you've violated any of its conditions for use. Browsing history is a list of recently visited websites. Anyone with access to your device can see what sites you visited. Attackers use browsing history to learn where they might impersonate their victims, and companies use it to see which sites you go to on your work computer. Non-repudiation is when you can't deny being in a specific location. It guarantees that a message sent between two parties is genuine, like a digital signature. It includes video, clear recordings of a person entering, leaving, or occupying a space. Biometrics. Fingerprint or iris scans can confirm whether a person physically accessed a device, network, or area. Signature. When a signature is used in conjunction with a hardware token, it becomes a digital signature. This authenticates the signer. And receipt. A digital receipt proves that a message was sent from one party to another. In this video, you learned that Role-Based Access Control, or RBAC, uses network groups with different permissions levels. The methods of authentication are single-factor, two-factor, and multi-factor. Authentication factors are something you know, something you have, something you are, and somewhere you are. Logs, tracking, cookies, and browsing history are used to troubleshoot and to uncover user activity on devices and non-repudiation uses video, biometrics, signature, and receipt. Welcome to Security Threats, Hardening Devices. After watching this video, you will be able to evaluate methods to secure and harden devices, identify device and system vulnerabilities, and determine best practices for common security threats. Hardening is the process of securing a device to minimize vulnerabilities. You can harden devices by disabling unneeded device features, regularly updating device firmware, OS, and software, and using firewalls, VPN, and anti-malware. The more layers of security you use, the safer your data and devices will be. To protect your applications and OSs, turn on auto-updates for PCs, phones, tablets, and routers. Outdated systems are huge targets for hackers. In business, updates are tested first. If they pass, they are pushed to production servers. To make sure your apps, OSs, and drivers are secure, 
only install from app stores, authorized resellers, and manufacturers, and check software for a digital signature from its manufacturer. Patches are updates to apps and OSs that fix security weaknesses. Companies regularly release patches alongside system improvement updates to make sure that their customers are safe from new threats. But patches are a response to known threats, meaning the threat has already happened to someone. To prevent unknown threats, also use multi-factor authentication, virtual private networks, and strong passwords. Firmware is software that tells hardware how to behave. Security firmware protects devices and data from malware and tampering. BIOS passwords, also firmware passwords. BIOS, or Basic Input-Output System, is firmware that boots up Windows and Linux PCs, runs hardware checks, and starts the OS. The OS won't start without the password, or if the checks find a problem. Secure Boot, UEFI, or Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, is newer and a more advanced boot firmware than BIOS. Secure Boot is a feature of UEFI. It confirms an OS manufacturer's digital signature, which prevents malware from taking control during boot up. TPM, TPM, or Trusted Platform Module, is a chip that stores and manages encryption keys. TPM chips won't start a device or unencrypt data if tampering is detected. Drive encryption. Drive encryption scrambles a drive's data so it's unreadable. Outdated firmware leaves devices vulnerable. Make sure your PCs, phones, networking hardware, and even your cars have firmware that is up to date. Encryption is one of the most powerful tools you can use to harden a device. It uses algorithms to encode plain text into unreadable ciphertext. Only the encryption key can decode it. Encryption is used at the network layer for data traveling across networks. It can also be done locally to hard drives, phones, and even thumb drives so that lost device data remains unreadable. Device lock adds device security. For example, heavy bolted-in hardware is physically difficult to take especially if it's behind a locked door. Laptops are harder to take when they're bound to a desk with a steel cable and padlock. And even though mobile devices are easy to lose, digital locks keep their data inaccessible. Disabling features and ports when not in use reduces the ways a hacker can gain access. For example, Auto Run allows inserted drives and disks to run or play automatically. An infected drive could install malware automatically. Bluetooth allows connections and data transfers between devices. If a hacker gains access, they can use it to steal data and install malware. NFC transfers data across devices with a tap or a bump. It's usually used for payments or sharing contacts. It has a much shorter range than Bluetooth and has zero security protections aside from its limited range. Disabling unused computer ports also reduces the ways a hacker can gain access. However, some of the most vulnerable ports have to be open to ensure functionality and connectivity. For example, port 443 manages secure web traffic. Port 22 is used for secure server connections. And port 80 manages standard web traffic. When features and ports are not being used, disabling them hardens them against attack. Apps that harden are affordable, reliable, and provide helpful configuration suggestions. Examples include antivirus, anti-malware, anti-spyware, software firewalls, and VPNs. Maintaining these apps, especially on smartphones, helps keep attackers out of your devices. Firewalls harden devices by keeping unwanted visitors out of your system and off your network. There are software firewalls and hardware firewalls. They monitor connections and block harmful traffic based on preset rules. For example, schools and businesses use firewalls to block social media sites, age-inappropriate content, and certain types of downloads. VPNs encrypt the traffic coming out of your device.
Even if a hacker is capturing your data, they won't be able to read it or decrypt it. VPNs and firewalls range in cost. Some are free. Public Wi-Fi is convenient, but it's unencrypted and doesn't require passwords. Hackers can easily intercept and steal your identity, drain your accounts, and scam your contacts. Secured Wi-Fi provided by your ISP or the network at your job is much safer to use. These have very strong encryption. If you can't avoid public Wi-Fi, use a VPN on all your devices. Only visit HTTPS sites that are well known. Use your phone as a hotspot, as cellular networks are encrypted. Disable automatic Wi-Fi connection settings. And don't access personal or financial information on public Wi-Fi. Default usernames and passwords are essential to tech support, software installation, and device configuration. They also pose serious risks. They're easily found online in help guides or user manuals. They have admin-level privileges, they hide who's using them, and they're usually left unchanged. It's common for hackers to use them to break into apps, devices, OSs, databases, and BIOS. To close security loopholes, disable built-in accounts if possible, change all default passwords, use strong passwords, and check documentation for default, backdoor, and hidden accounts. In this video, you learned that apps and OSs should be regularly updated. Patches protect against known threats. Outdated firmware leaves devices vulnerable. Encryption encodes plain text into ciphertext. Disabling features and ports reduces attacks. Firewalls block traffic. VPNs encrypt traffic. Anyone can see what you do on public Wi-Fi. And hacking a device is easy with default passwords. Welcome to Security Threats, Validation and Device Usage. After watching this video, you will be able to explore device use best practices, identify reputable driver and firmware sources, and list the do's and don'ts of keeping your devices safe. To reduce security risks, always be sure to get your software, cloud services, device drivers, and firmware updates from legitimate sources, like vendor app stores like the Windows Store and Google Play Store, authorized resellers like Best Buy and Costco, original equipment manufacturers or OEMs like Dell and Samsung, and software manufacturers like Adobe and Microsoft. If you're downloading purchased software from a website, check the URL to ensure it begins with HTTPS. Click the lock icon in the URL bar to see if the certificate is still current and who owns it. Avoid pirated software torrents. They're loaded with malware. Avoid software from untrusted sources. And avoid jailbreaking or rooting your phone. Non-approved apps are untested and could contain malware. Original equipment manufacturers, or OEMs, provide drivers and firmware updates on their websites. Dell, HP, Samsung, Nikon, NVIDIA, and more all provide downloads for device drivers and firmware updates for the products they build and sell. Avoid third-party sites that claim to host drivers for the latest devices. These may be malware traps. There are some third-party sites that host legitimate obsolete drivers for obsolete hardware that a manufacturer no longer supports. But use these sites with care. Research them and check forum reviews to ensure they aren't malicious. Device driver software should also be digitally signed by the vendor, and the vendor's certificate should be trusted by your computer. Uninstall software that you don't use or don't want. New devices may come preloaded with unwanted trial software, commonly referred to as bloatware. Aging bloatware is soon outdated and may have vulnerabilities. The same is true for software you no longer use. If you need an app in the future, download it from the software manufacturer's website to ensure it is legitimate and up-to-date. Then enable automatic updates to keep the application safe. 
new attacks and malware are released onto the internet daily. This makes anti-malware and VPN services a must for all your devices. Microsoft's Windows Defender protects your computer against viruses and malware free of charge. It also integrates with the built-in firewall that comes with the Windows operating system and is enabled by default. However, Windows Defender does not perform VPN functions. Some third-party antivirus software, such as McAfee, Bitdefender, or Norton, can be purchased for a reasonable cost if that is your preference. They may disable Windows Defender and Windows Firewall during their installation process, which is completely normal. Many reputable antivirus companies provide malicious software removal tools for free, including Microsoft. They always have the latest virus signatures and are very effective. Just pick the one you like, download, and scan. It will automatically remove any malware it finds. If the tool doesn't resolve your issues, you may need a PC technician who can assist you further. Prevent malware infection with safe computer usage and browsing techniques. Don't visit questionable websites or HTTP sites. Don't download from file sharing sites as they have loads of viruses. Don't insert used or unknown disks, storage, or USB devices into your computer. And don't click links or file attachments from emails or messages, even if you know the sender. Do use good anti-malware software on all of your devices and keep them up to date. Do use up-to-date firewall and VPN software on any devices you go online with. Do visit encrypted HTTPS sites. Do use OEM or authorized reseller sites when downloading software. And do reduce accounts that have elevated privileges, like admin, super user, or root roles. In this video, you learned that apps, device drivers, and firmware should come from reputable sources. Rooting or jailbreaking makes devices vulnerable. Apps from file sharing sites are loaded with malware. Old apps and bloatware leave devices vulnerable. Malicious file removal tools are available for free from reputable antivirus companies. And automatic updates in antivirus, firewall, and VPN software keep devices safe. Welcome to Security Threats, Encryption Concepts. After watching this video, you will be able to explore encryption and its common uses, list use cases for symmetric and asymmetric encryption, and explain how cryptographic hashing works. Encryption is the act of taking readable text and scrambling it so it can only be read by a recipient that has the decryption key. Data that has not been encrypted is called plain text because it's readable. Algorithms used to scramble plain text are called ciphers. Encrypted plain text is called ciphertext. An encryption key is a series of random, unique numbers combined with very powerful algorithms that are used to encrypt or scramble your data before you send it. The person on the receiving end has a decryption key that's used to decrypt or unscramble the data so it's in a readable or usable format. In some industries, data encryption is a mandatory requirement. This includes student records, medical records, and consumer data. Many OSs have encryption built in. For those that don't, third-party encryption software is available. Data at rest refers to data that resides on a storage device. The files aren't open or being transmitted anywhere. Data at rest can be encrypted at the file level, storage device level, and cloud level. Encryption at the file level lets you encrypt all your files on a storage device, or just a select few. Disks and drives can be encrypted in two ways, using software to perform the encryption or enabling hardware-based encryption like BitLocker. Data at rest is less vulnerable, but it's not immune from attacks. Using updated firewalls, VPNs, and anti-malware helps keep your data safe. Data in motion, or data in transit, refers to data that is actively moving between two devices, meaning two computers, a mobile device and a mail server, 
or your computer and your bank's online website. Any website that uses HTTPS in its prefix is using encryption. However, hackers can compromise encrypted sites with social engineering, man-in-the-middle attacks, and password cracking. And they can create their own encrypted HTTPS sites that install malware. Data in motion is especially at risk for interception attacks, like man-in-the-middle. Using end-to-end -end encryption means that the data being transmitted and received is safe, even if it's intercepted by a hacker. They won't be able to decrypt your data. Data traversing through a virtual private network, or a VPN, is automatically encrypted, but is not always end-to-end. -end. Symmetric encryption, also called single-key or private-key encryption, is when a single key is used between parties to encrypt and decrypt data. With only one key, symmetric encryption uses less memory, which is great for quickly and securely processing larger amounts of data. That's why it is often used to protect the main data exchange in a session. But it's harder to keep a single key secret, especially if it needs to be broadly distributed. If this key is intercepted by a hacker, then they can decrypt your messages, hack your account, and steal or tamper with your data. 3DES and CAST are examples of symmetric encryption technologies. Asymmetric encryption, also called public key cryptography, uses a public key and a private key. Asymmetric encryption takes longer because it is more complex. It is used for smaller amounts of data. It is safe to widely share the public key for encryption or decryption because only the secret key can undo the public key's action. Uses include authentication, digital certificates, digital signatures, and key exchange, where a symmetric encryption key is shared only to the intended recipients. The RSA cipher is used in most asymmetric encryption. Public key infrastructure, or PKI, is when a user is validated with a digital certificate by a certificate authority, or CA. The digital certificate has a public encryption key that encrypts data. If the data recipient trusts the CA that issued the digital certificate, they use a private key to decrypt the data. Digital certificates are used in smart card authentication. The smart card has a public-private key pair. It presents a digital certificate, including the public key, to the server it's trying to access. If the server trusts the CA that issued the digital certificate, it will use the public key to send an encrypted request. Only the smart card's private key can decrypt the request, which means only the smart card owner can send the correct response. For digital signatures, the process is reversed. The sender sends an encrypted signature and a public decryption key to a recipient. If the recipient can decrypt the signature with the public key, that proves the sender signed it because they must have performed the encryption with the private key. A cryptographic hash is a short string of numbers and letters created by running a password or file through an algorithm. A single password and a full library will have different cryptographic hashes, but each will have the same number of characters. If any data is altered or removed from a password or file, its cryptographic hash will be different. If the cryptographic hash of a secure email is different after being sent across a network, the recipient knows the message has been tampered with. When you create a password, it's converted into a cryptographic hash. On your next login, it's converted again. If the stored hash and the new hash match, the system lets you in. Cryptographic hashes save space, authenticate data, and keep information secure. In this video, you learned that encryption scrambles plain text into ciphertext so the data cannot be read. Encryption needs keys to encrypt and decrypt data. Data at rest is data that resides in storage. Data in motion is data that is actively being transmitted and received. Symmetric encryption uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt data. And asymmetric encryption encrypts with a public key and decrypts with a private key. Welcome to Security Threats. 
Managing Email and Spam. After watching this video, you will be able to define spam, identify phishing scams, and list ways to reduce spam. Email management is classifying email messages and deciding whether they should be saved or deleted. It can help you prioritize emails, save you time, and increase your productivity. For well-managed email, keep your inbox clean. Use folders and subfolders to organize your email by category. Use rules or filters to automatically move certain emails into folders. Unsubscribe from email lists. And turn off email notifications on your computer to keep distractions at a minimum. But what about spam or junk mail? Most email apps and servers block spam and junk mail, but some still gets through. You can configure your email settings to include additional filters. Mail routed to the junk folder is automatically deleted after a set number of days. Spam is email that's unwanted and often unsolicited. Some spam is harmless, but it can be dangerous when scammers use it to commit phishing attacks or fraud against you. Your company and web-based email services filter out spam at the email server level and block domains known for sending spam. But there is more you can do on your own to help reduce it. Don't give out your email address. Use throwaway accounts. Configure your phone and PC OS settings to block spam. And use a full-featured desktop mail app like Microsoft Outlook. It lets you block email from a sender or domain and create rules to delete spam automatically. Note that you can unsubscribe from mailing lists, but this just validates your email address, which may result in more spam. Hackers use email and messaging to commit fraud. They steal usernames and passwords, bank account information, social security numbers, and more. This is called phishing. Phishing attacks are common because they work. Rule number one in phishing attacks is don't click any links and never open attachments. Phishing attackers do their best to make it look like the email or message came from a friend or family member or someone official, like your bank, the government, or a large company. The story is always the same. They want you to feel fear, greed, or a sense of urgency, so you're more likely to make a rush decision. For example, they are alerting you to suspicious activities or logins on your account. They say there's some problems with your account information or your payment hasn't been received and provide a link for you to click and update your payment information. They say your account has been breached and offer a link for you to reset your username and password. They say you're entitled to a refund. You simply click the link they provide and enter your personal information. They offer prizes or other free items, but you must respond ASAP to get the deal. Or they demand you pay a fake invoice to avoid fines or jail time. Phishing emails usually have typos and grammatical errors. Make sure to inspect the text, logos, and URLs to see if they look wrong or are misspelled. Close the email, then visit the genuine website of the impersonated company. Manually enter the URL so you get to the right site. Let them know about the phishing attack so they can report it to the fraud department. In this video, you learned that spam is email that is unwanted, unsolicited, and comes from people you do not know. Hackers use phishing attacks because they're highly effective. Phishing uses feelings of fear or urgency to trick you into giving up your personal information. Phishing emails have lots of typos and fake links. And links or attachments may install malware. Welcome to Safe Browsing Practices Application Ecosystem Security. After watching this video, you will be able to identify app and software security concerns, explain how apps and software are compromised, and list the types of data hackers look for. Mobile apps are designed to be functional and easy to use, but they are not always the most secure. Weak passwords, Malware or poorly designed apps can compromise a device, letting hackers access texts, contact lists, personal and business files, and other valuable information. 
For better security, use strong passwords, only install App Store approved apps, and use multi factor authentication. Multi factor authentication, or MFA, is a setting that requires you to fill in a code sent to your email or phone to prove that a login attempt came from you. Strong passwords are long, difficult to guess, and have a mix of numbers, letters, symbols, and capitalizations. For example, the phrase, Johnny Appleseed loves apples, would be a very strong password, especially if it included a mix of numbers and symbols. Some users remove device restrictions so they can make changes and install non-approved apps. This is called rooting on Android phones and jailbreaking on Apple phones. This adds functionality, but also adds a vulnerability. It is harder to root or jailbreak newer model phones, and there is less reason for it with updated features and app selections. To ensure a basic level of security, Apple and Google restrict certain device activities and remove apps from their app stores if they don't meet security standards. Desktop software can be used to open any file stored locally or in the cloud. Cybercriminals can access and take over software, files, data, and online accounts via PCs that don't have strong passwords, PCs left in unsecured physical locations, and via unsecured browsing sessions on non-HTTPS websites. IT departments push out security patches and updates on a regular basis to keep operating system and app software secure against known vulnerabilities. But patches and updates alone aren't enough. Here are some steps you can take to be more secure. Use strong passwords, store PCs in a physically secure location, and lock them when not in use. Use good antivirus, anti-malware, and VPN software, and enable automatic updates. And only browse HTTPS websites and keep software properly configured and updated. These habits make devices harder to hack, which keeps your data protected, as cybercriminals will simply move on to easier targets. Business software automates transactions, mines sales data, manages resource and supply chain information, and more. Hackers target businesses with ransomware, zero-day attacks, or other cyber attacks to steal sensitive data so they can sell or exploit it. This can cost millions and be devastating to consumers, businesses, organizations, and governments. In today's remote work world, businesses maintain employee education to ensure security best practices are followed and they use strong tools to prevent, detect, and respond to vulnerabilities and threats. To protect corporate files, systems, and resources, businesses must limit access. The ability to share files within an organization or business-to-business -business is important. When email or USB drives aren't an option, organizations may choose internal network sharing on company-owned hardware for sharing, storage, and collaboration. Or they may turn to the cloud for a solution, like the enterprise versions of Box, OneDrive, or Google Drive. Whichever solution is used, employees must be taught how to properly secure corporate data. A careless worker who clicks on a phishing email or fails to abide by corporate policy can expose a company to unnecessary risk. Company data should only be shared on a need-to-know basis. Insider theft of data and intellectual property is common. Strict access control helps avoid it. But file sharing should be practical. If a company makes it too difficult, employees will find a way around it. For example, consumer-level cloud storage and sharing freeware. Security isn't as robust in those solutions. If there's a breach, hackers can steal passwords and reuse them to gain access to company networks. It's important to remember that you're only as secure as your weakest link. That's why there are so many ways to configure network sharing. Whether it's on-premises, in the cloud, or stored in an unauthorized freeware account, having a plan ahead of time to deal with these potential situations will help companies avoid the worst. In this video, you learned 
Strong passwords, antivirus, malware software, VPN, and updates are used to secure apps and devices. Hackers target apps to mine for sensitive data, intellectual property, trade secrets, and financial data. Businesses use multi-factor authentication to protect data, information, and consumer trust. And multiple layers of security are required to keep devices and their data secure. Welcome to Safe Browsing Practices, Public Browsing Risks. After watching this video, you will be able to list the security concerns of public browsing, identify public browsing risks, and list the types of data hackers steal from public networks. Free and open networks are available in many places. Airports, coffee shops, hotels, and even fast food restaurants will offer their guests access to public Wi-Fi. These networks are not encrypted. Your device may warn you about this when you're trying to connect to one of them. Unsecure networks invite eavesdroppers to view everything you send and receive on that network. They can potentially install malware on your device or hijack your session if your device is not protected. Public connections are free to use, but that doesn't mean there isn't a cost involved. The provider might track everything you do on the Wi-Fi connection, then sell your data to advertisers or other interested parties. If a hacker gets access to your device via public Wi-Fi, they have free reign over everything on it and can even obtain the credentials to your banking or other websites you may have logged into. Travelers may connect to public Wi-Fi to check email, download files, and review work information. Most businesses have security measures to reduce the risk of connecting over Wi-Fi, but there are still risks when using a public connection. Session hijacking is when an attacker intercepts and hijacks your connection. For example, they can take over a connection while you're logged into your bank and transfer funds to an outside account. Shoulder surfing is when an attacker sits strategically in public areas to try to see usernames and passwords bank account pins, and other essential information. To stay safe, use a mobile hotspot or cellular connection. If public Wi-Fi is the only option, be sure to use firewalls, strong passwords, antivirus and malware software, and VPNs. Most social network sites operate with secure HTTP or HTTPS, but that doesn't mean they are safe. The best way to protect yourself is to make sure the social networking sites you visit are safe before sharing any information. Learn about their privacy and security settings and use them. Be careful with the type of information you share on social networking sites. Not everyone is friendly, and cybercriminals will do just about anything to get someone's personal information. Avoid clicking suspicious links, emails, tweets, posts, and online advertising. These are often how cyber criminals try to steal your personal information or hijack accounts. If it looks suspicious, delete it. Use strong passwords, as they will make it more difficult to break into your device if it is lost or stolen. And as always, keep your software and devices current. Use the latest security software, web browsers, and operating systems. And encrypt with VPN. Use a mobile hotspot or cellular connection instead of public Wi-Fi. Instant messaging systems are typically not designed with security features in place. Senders are not authenticated, and chats can be hijacked and users impersonated. Information sent over chat is often in plain text. That makes it easy to intercept and exploit especially over public Wi-Fi connections. Never reveal sensitive data over chat. Files sent by chat are not scanned by computing devices. Avoid file transfers and links, even if they appear to be from someone you know. These are the easiest ways for hackers to plant viruses, spyware, keystroke loggers, phishing scams, spam over instant messaging, or SPIM, and a variety of worms. Instant messaging apps should always have encryption and automatic updates on. A simple search can tell you if an instant messaging app uses encryption. 
and how to access security settings. Websites relying on the HTTP protocol are not secure, especially when visited over public Wi-Fi. Everything that you send and receive is in plain text. It makes you an easy target for cybercriminals. Secure HTTP, or HTTPS protocol, provides an encrypted connection between you and the sites that use it. Most commercial websites, social networking sites, or sites that offer a customer login use HTTPS. How do you know a website you're visiting is using secure HTTP? The easiest way to tell is to see if the URL starts with HTTP or HTTPS. Or you can look for a lock icon in your browser's URL window. Clicking the lock shows who owns the digital certificate that proves the server is who it says it is, and if any cookies are in use. It can also open browser security settings so that you can make adjustments as needed. It's important to remember that HTTPS only provides a secure connection between you and the web server. A site can use HTTPS and still try to scam users or be compromised in some way. In this video, you learned that your data can be tracked and sold to other parties when using public Wi-Fi. Public Wi-Fi is unencrypted and your public data can easily be intercepted and read by hackers. Social networking sites and instant messaging are vulnerable to cyber threats. HTTPS sites are identified by their URL prefix and by the lock icon in the URL window. An HTTPS provides an encrypted connection but doesn't guarantee that the site is safe. Welcome to Safe Browsing Practices, Plugins, Extensions, and Toolbars. After watching this video, you will be able to configure a browser for a secure browsing experience, identify secure and insecure websites, and explain how to manage plugins, extensions, and toolbars. In today's remote and cloud-based world, the browser has become an important tool in our daily lives. Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Mozilla Firefox, and Apple Safari are the most common. Browsers are often pre-installed, but are not typically set up in the most secure way. The internet has many risks, so it is vital to configure and maintain browser security so you can protect against those risks. Security zones are a feature of older browsers. They block or allow websites and confine them to different zones, such as the local network, internet, or intranet. For each zone, you could apply different security levels. For example, medium, high, or custom. Security zones can also be configured to allow ActiveX and Java for added website interactivity or functionality, but this can introduce risk. Modern browsers do not use zones but older web apps may require you to enable ActiveX in order to run properly. Browser add-ons have evolved over the years. Toolbars were designed to add functionality to the browser, like spell check, autofill, yellow pages, and dictionaries. But most toolbars were considered nuisanceware. Some would show sponsored results instead of what you originally searched for, or they'd impede system performance. Some even installed malware, tracked browsing habits, and collected user data. Toolbars used to be forcibly installed on user devices during software installation processes. Fortunately, toolbars are a thing of the past. Plugins are site-specific browser add-ons that you click on to install. They are not supported in today's modern browsers in favor of extensions. A browser extension is a small piece of source code that adds a function or feature to a browser. Ad blockers and in-browser PDF readers are extensions. Since extensions are given special authorizations within the browser, they are attractive targets for attackers. Cookies are text files with small pieces of data. When you visit a site, the server creates a cookie and saves it on your browser to track you. 
cookies let websites remember your logins, shopping carts, and more. This creates an easier, more personalized online experience. Most cookies are safe, but some are designed to track without consent. Even legitimate cookies can be harmful if you get hacked. Let's look at some different types. Session cookies are used only for one session. They are stored in RAM and are automatically deleted when the browsing session ends. Persistent cookies remain on a computer indefinitely, but some have expiration dates. Authentication cookies save logins, usernames, and passwords, so you don't have to remember them. Tracking cookies track multiple visits to the same site over time. Online stores use these to see how you shop and send targeted ads. First-party cookies are from the site you are on. These are safer on reputable sites. Third-party cookies are from sites you are not on. These track you across the web. Ads can generate cookies even if you never click on them. Zombie cookies are third-party cookies that don't follow normal cookie protocols. They can store their code directly on your device to recreate themselves even after deletion. They are extremely difficult to remove. Websites may also use zombie cookies to ban specific users. Security certificates, or Secure Sockets Layer, or SSL certificates, authenticate a website's identity and enable an encrypted connection between a web server and a browser. SSL certificates come from organizations called Root Certificate Stores, or Certificates of Authority, commonly called ACA. The major Root Certificate Stores are Apple, Microsoft, Mozilla, and Google. Which CA your device uses depends on the operating system it's running. When you browse a website using HTTPS, you're trusting the CA to validate the information submitted by the business who has requested an SSL certificate. Businesses need SSL security certificates for their websites so they can keep user data secure, verify their ownership of the site, prevent attackers from creating fake versions of their site, and to convey trust to users. They also need them if they want to have an HTTPS web address. When you see a lock icon in the address bar of a URL you visited, then you know that website is using HTTPS. Because browsers are a favorite target for hackers, keeping them updated is very important. Browsers, by default, automatically update themselves. The updates are installed and applied when you restart your browser. If your desktop or laptop is part of a corporate network, your IT department may be managing the configuration and manually applying updates to the browsers installed on your system. On mobile devices, you may enable or disable updates occurring over metered or cellular connections and apply them upon the restart of your browser. Updating over a cellular connection can incur charges. Otherwise, they will update automatically when connected to Wi-Fi. In this video, you learned that hackers target browsers because they are the gateway between your device and the outside world. Updating browsers and properly managing cookies and extensions helps keep your data secure. SSL security certificates and certificates of authority prove a website is who it says it is. An HTTPS can guarantee an encrypted connection, but cannot guarantee that a site is not compromised. Welcome to Security Threats, Safe Browsing Techniques. After watching this video, you will be able to explain what a cache is for, identify safe websites, and list adware risks. Autofill, or autocomplete, remembers and fills in specific information, like passwords or addresses in a web browser. Without it, you'd have to repeatedly fill in passwords and form fields manually. This can get tedious, especially on mobile keyboards. You can configure autofill categories, such as passwords, payment data, and addresses in your browser settings. When sharing devices with friends and family, set up guest accounts with different browser settings and configure syncing so that autofill is only applied to the devices and browsers you want. A browser cache is a storage area that holds downloaded web pages you've visited. 
Cached pages load immediately. If a page has changed since the last cache, it is downloaded, displayed, and cached again. Over time, very large caches cause sluggish performance. A browser history is a list of every page you've visited and for how long. Browser histories help you find sites you visited, but they can also be used against you by family, hackers, or law enforcement. Use browser settings to clear history and cache and to set cache disk space and expiration dates. Private browsing doesn't save browsing history, cookies, site data, or form data. With private browsing, you appear as a new or unknown user on the sites you visit. Other people who use the device won't see your history. Cookies and site data are remembered while browsing, but deleted when you exit the browser. But private browsing activity isn't hidden from your employer or school or your Internet Service Provider or ISP. The bookmarks you create will be kept and downloaded files are saved to your downloads folder, which may be visible to other users. Malicious websites mimic real websites to trick users into entering login or payment data and can install malware that gathers personal information or takes over a device. Their URLs might use a zero instead of an O or a capital I instead of a lowercase l. Their site pages often have typos or designs that don't match the legitimate site they are mimicking. If you accidentally visit and enter information into a malicious website, exit the site, run antivirus and anti-malware, change your password, and, if needed, ask your bank for a new card. Identifying safe websites is more important than ever. Let's review some safety tips. Use the Whois Lookup tool to see who owns a site. Missing contact information is a red flag. Look for reviews. Reddit and other social forums list scam sites and sites with security risks. Only visit HTTPS sites or your activity could be visible to online predators. Check the trust seal or security certificate information and inspect URLs and site design to avoid malicious websites. Adware is malware that displays unwanted ads. Often bundled with apps, it activates on install. Adware can collect data, track online activity, or link out to malicious websites with viruses. It can also cause sluggish system performance or crashes, changes to your browser's homepage, the appearance of new extensions, toolbars, or software, and web pages not displaying properly. Pop-up ads and the sudden appearance of unfamiliar apps are the most common way to recognize adware. The aim of redirection is to point you towards certain types of advertising or dangerous code. Redirection is usually caused by adware or malware. This includes toolbars, or browser extensions that show alternate search results loaded with ads, malware that sabotages searches or typed-in URLs, and hacked website servers that redirect anyone who visits. Any connected device can be exploited, especially mobile phones, since they don't usually have antivirus software and other safeguards. To avoid hijacking software and redirects, set automatic updates for your browser, OS, and security tools, and run regular system scans. Search engines use algorithms to detect harmful sites. Browsers use those results to warn users. These sites may contain malware, malicious code, phishing scams, or be hacked in some other way. If your browser tells you a site is unsafe, avoid that site. In this video, you learned that autofill keeps password, payment, and address data. Caches store downloaded web pages for fast loading. Private browsing deletes cookies, history, and cache. Safe websites use HTTPS, trust seals, and reviews. Adware can collect data, track online activity, link to malicious sites, and slow system performance. 
and search engine algorithms detect dangerous sites. Welcome to Security Threats, Virtual Private Networks. After watching this video, you will be able to list the different VPN connection types, explain the pros and cons of hardware and software VPNs, and identify network hardware that can be used to create VPNs. A virtual private network, or VPN, is an encrypted tunnel set up between two or more sites. All traffic in the tunnel is unreadable and useless to anyone who might try to intercept the traffic. VPN traffic is encrypted at the originating site and decrypted at the receiving site. VPNs make it much more difficult for hackers to make eavesdropping attacks, man-in-the-middle attacks, and replay attacks. This is especially useful if public Wi-Fi is your only connection option. VPNs can be hardware-based or software-based. Site-to-site -site VPN is when two sites connect across an existing internet connection with a VPN device. Each site's internal network traffic is unencrypted. Traffic that needs to traverse the internet is encrypted by the origination site's VPN and then decrypted by the receiving site's VPN device, which then routes the traffic to its intended recipient. Host-to-site VPN is when a remote user needs to connect securely to a site. The host device uses VPN software while the site uses a VPN device or software to protect its internal network. Traffic that needs to traverse the internet is encrypted by the sender's VPN and then decrypted by the receiver's VPN, which then receives the traffic if the host is the receiver or routes it to its intended recipient if the site is the receiver. Host-to-host -host VPN is when two remote users need to connect securely to each other. This is a user-to-user -user or device-to-device -device interaction that doesn't require a complex encryption solution. Both host devices use VPN software. Traffic that needs to traverse the internet is encrypted by the sender's VPN and then decrypted by the receiver's VPN. VPN hardware devices are devices specifically designed to create VPNs or network devices with added VPN functionality. They include VPN concentrators, routers, and firewalls. Internet Protocol Security, or IPsec, is a suite of network standards and protocols that use cryptography to protect data traveling over the Internet. The core protocols for the IPsec suite are the IPsec Authentication Header, or AH protocol, which authenticates the sender and both IP addresses, and the Encapsulating Security Payload, or ESP protocol, which encrypts data and authenticates data and senders. IPsec has two modes, tunnel mode and transport mode. In tunnel mode, the entire data packet is wrapped in a new packet, encrypted, and given a new header. Tunnel mode is common in site-to-site -site VPN. In transport mode, the IP header of the original data packet is left unencrypted. Only the content of the data packet is encrypted. Transport mode is common in host-to-site VPN. The IPsec suite uses many components to support data security. These include Security Associations, or SA, Internet Key Exchange, or ICE, encryption and hashing algorithms, and anti-replay protection. IPsec authenticates data to ensure integrity and encrypts data to ensure confidentiality. It also protects against replay attacks and enables secure encryption key exchanges. In this video, you learned that a VPN is an encrypted tunnel set up between two sites. Site-to-site -site VPNs connect two sites. Host-to-site -site VPNs connect a device to a site. Host-to-host -host VPNs connect two devices. VPN concentrators, routers, and firewalls can provide secure VPN connections. The IPsec suite has two modes, tunnel and transport. And the core IPsec protocols are Authentication Header, or AH, and Encapsulating Security Payload, or ESP. Welcome to Introduction to Cloud Computing, 
the first in the series of four courses designed to give you the foundational skills you need to be a cloud practitioner. Today, cloud represents a huge market, one that is continuing to grow at an unprecedented scale. Enormous computational power, once considered a prerogative of large enterprises, is now available at the fingertips of even the smallest of businesses and individual developers, thanks to cloud. Moreover, the cloud makes all this computational power highly affordable with pay-as-you-go economics. If you look at some of the key emerging technologies of our times, such as artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, blockchain and analytics, all of these technologies work with massive amounts of data and need huge storage space and computational power in order to work, making cloud possibly the only viable platform for these technologies. This course will introduce you to the core concepts of cloud computing, from its essential characteristics to the different service and deployment models, cloud architecture, security and monitoring, emerging technologies supported by the cloud, and career opportunities available in the domain. The course is designed for everyone. It doesn't matter if you have a background in cloud technologies, whether you're an IT person looking to upskill or explore this domain, a fresh graduate looking to make a career in cloud technologies, or an IT decision maker, this course will equip you with what you need to get started. With just the public cloud service market expected to grow to $331.2 billion by 2022, it's a great time to be in the cloud computing industry. Today, there are more open positions in cloud than the number of skilled people available, and the sheer growth of the cloud market makes it an exciting and dependable career prospect for the coming times. So congratulations on embarking on this exciting journey, and good luck! Cloud computing, also referred to as the cloud, is the delivery of on-demand computing resources, everything from applications to data centers over the internet on a pay-for-use basis. To get a common understanding of cloud computing, let's start with the U.S. National Institute of Standard and Technology, NIST's, definition of cloud computing. NIST defines cloud computing as a model for enabling convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. Examples of computing resources include networks, servers, storage, applications, and services. This cloud model is composed of five essential characteristics, three deployment models, and three service models. Let's start with understanding the five essential characteristics of the cloud, which include on-demand self-service, broad network access, resource pooling, rapid elasticity, and measured service. On-demand self-service, the first characteristic, means that you get access to cloud resources, such as the processing power, storage, and network you need using a simple interface without requiring human interaction with each service provider. The second characteristic, broad network access, means that cloud computing resources can be accessed via the network through standard mechanisms and platforms such as mobile phones, tablets, laptops, and workstations. The third characteristic, resource pooling, is what gives cloud providers economies of scale, which they pass on to their customers, making cloud cost efficient. Using a multi-tenant model, computing resources are pooled to serve multiple consumers. Cloud resources are dynamically assigned and reassigned according to demand, without customers needing to concern themselves with the physical location of these resources. Rapid elasticity the fourth characteristic implies that you can access more resources when you need them and scale back when you don't, because resources are elastically provisioned and released. And the fifth characteristic, measured service, means that you only pay for what you use or reserve as you go. If you're not using resources, you're not paying. Resource usage is monitored, measured, and reported transparently based on utilization. As we see, 
Cloud computing is really about utilizing technology as a service, leveraging remote systems on demand over the open internet, scaling up, scaling back, and paying for what you use. It is a revolution in that it has changed the way the world consumes compute services by making them more cost efficient while also making organizations more agile in responding to changes in their markets. As I mentioned earlier in this talk, the cloud model is composed of five essential characteristics, three deployment models and three service models. We just went over the five essential characteristics. While we will go into greater depth of the deployment and the service models in the later videos, let me leave you with a brief overview of these models. There are three types of cloud deployment models, public, private, and hybrid. Public cloud is when you leverage cloud services over the open internet on hardware owned by the cloud provider, but its usage is shared by other companies. Private cloud means that the cloud infrastructure is provisioned for exclusive use by a single organization. It could run on-premises or it could be owned, managed, and operated by a service provider. And when you use a mix of both public and private clouds working together seamlessly, that is classified as the hybrid model. Now let's look at the three service models that are based on the three layers in a computing stack, infrastructure, platform, and applications. These cloud computing models are aptly referred to as infrastructure as a service, IaaS, platform as a service, PaaS, and software as a service, SaaS. In an infrastructure as a service model, you get access to infrastructure and physical computing resources such as servers, networking, storage, and data center space without the need to manage or operate them. In a platform as a service model, you get access to the platform, that is, hardware and software tools, usually those needed to develop and deploy applications to users over the internet. Software as a Service is a software licensing and delivery model in which software and applications are centrally hosted and licensed on a subscription basis, and sometimes also referred to as on-demand software. In the next training, we will go over some of the key evolutions that bring us to what cloud computing is today. Cloud computing is an evolution of technology over time. The concept of cloud computing dates to the 1950s when large-scale mainframes with high volume processing power became available. In order to make efficient use of the computing power of mainframes, the practice of time sharing or resource pooling evolved. Using dumb terminals, whose sole purpose was to facilitate access to the mainframes, multiple users were able to access the same data storage layer and CPU power from any terminal. In the 1970s, with the release of an operating system called Virtual Machine, or VM, it became possible for mainframes to have multiple virtual systems, or virtual machines, on a single physical node. The Virtual Machine Operating System evolved the 1950s application of shared access of a mainframe by allowing multiple distinct compute environments to exist on the same physical hardware. Each virtual machine hosted guest operating systems that behaved as though they had their own memory, CPU, and hard drives, even though these were shared resources. Virtualization thus became a technology driver and a huge catalyst for some of the biggest evolutions in communications and computing. Even 20 years ago, physical hardware was quite expensive. With the internet becoming more accessible and the need to make hardware costs more viable, servers were virtualized into sharing hosting environments, virtual private servers, and virtual dedicated servers, using the same types of functionality provided by the virtual machine operating system. So, for example, if a company needed X number of physical systems to run their applications, 
they could take one physical node and split it into multiple virtual systems. This was enabled by hypervisors. A hypervisor is a small software layer that enables multiple operating systems to run alongside each other, sharing the same physical computing resources. A hypervisor also separates the virtual machines logically, assigning each its own slice of the underlying computing power, memory, and storage, preventing the virtual machines from interfering with each other. If, for example, one operating system suffers a crash or a security compromise, the others can keep working. As technologies and hypervisors improved and were able to share and deliver resources reliably, some companies decided to make the cloud's benefits accessible to users who didn't have an abundance of physical servers to create their own cloud computing infrastructure. Since the servers were already online, the process of spinning up a new instance was instantaneous. Users could now order cloud resources they needed from a larger pool of available resources, and they could pay for them on a per-use basis, also known as pay-as-you-go. This pay-as-you-go, or utility computing model, became one of the key drivers behind cloud computing taking off. The pay-per-use model allowed companies and even individual developers to pay for the computing resources as and when they used them, just like units of electricity. This allowed them to switch to a more cash flow friendly OpEx model from a CapEx model. This model appealed to all sizes of companies, those who had little or no hardware, and even those that had lots of hardware. Because now, instead of making huge capital expenditures in hardware, they could pay for compute resources as and when needed. It also allowed them to scale their workloads during usage peaks and scale down when usage subsided. And this gave rise to modern day cloud computing. The impact of the evolution of the cloud has been immense. In the next training, we will go over some key considerations for cloud adoption. Every organization's transformation journey is unique, and therefore every organization's cloud adoption strategy is also unique to them. Agility, flexibility, and competitiveness are key drivers for moving to the cloud, provided it is done without creating business disruption or issues related to security, compliance, and performance. Let's look at some key considerations that organizations can use as a guide while working through their cloud strategy. The first consideration is infrastructure and workloads. The cost of building and operating data centers can become astronomical. On the other hand, low initial costs and pay-as-you-go attributes of cloud computing can add up to significant cost savings. Also, a point to consider is that not all workloads may be ready for the cloud as is. The second consideration is around software as a service and development platforms. Organizations need to consider if paying for application access is a more viable option than purchasing off-the-shelf software and subsequently investing in upgrades. Organizations need to consider speed and productivity what it means for them to get a new application up and running in X hours on the cloud versus a couple of weeks or even months on traditional platforms, and the person hour cost efficiencies they gain from using cloud dashboards, real-time statistics, and active analytics. Lastly, organizations need to consider the impact of making a wrong decision, their risk exposure. Is it riskier, for example, for them to invest in the hardware and software or rent by the hour? Is it safer for them to work on a 12-month plan to build, write, test, and release the code if they're uncertain about adoption? And is it better for them to try something new, paying as you go, rather than making long-term decisions based on little or no trial or adoption? Let's look at some of the benefits of cloud adoption categorized broadly into flexibility, efficiency, and strategic value. Cloud gives us flexibility. Users can scale back or scale up services to fit their needs, customize applications, and access cloud services from anywhere with an internet connection. 
cloud infrastructure scales on demand to support fluctuating workloads. Organizations can determine their level of control with as-a-service options. Users can select from a menu of pre-built tools and features to build a solution that fits their specific needs. And virtual private clouds, encryption, and API keys help keep data secure. Cloud also brings great efficiency. Enterprise users can get applications to market quickly without worrying about underlying infrastructure costs or its maintenance. Cloud-based applications and data are accessible from virtually any internet-connected device. Hardware failures do not result in data loss because of networked backups. Cloud computing uses remote resources, saving organizations the cost of servers and other equipment and paying on use basis. Cloud services gives enterprises a competitive advantage by providing the most innovative technologies available while managing the underlying infrastructure, thus enabling organizations to focus on their priorities. While cloud brings great opportunity, it also introduces challenges for business leaders and IT departments. Some of these perceived risks include data security, associated with loss or unavailability of data, causing businesses disruption, governance and sovereignty issues, legal, regulatory, and compliance issues, lack of standardization in how the constantly evolving technologies integrate and interoperate, choosing the right deployment and service models to serve specific needs, partnering with the right cloud service providers, concerns related to business continuity and disaster recovery. Organizations can no longer think of cloud adoption as something that is to be looked at in the future. With the right cloud adoption strategies, technologies, services, and service providers, these risks can be mitigated. In the next training, we're going to look at some of the key cloud service providers of our times and the services they offer. Let's look at some numbers and predictions that help us see the scale cloud is predicted to achieve in the coming years. Gartner predicts the worldwide public cloud service market to grow from 182.4 billion in 2018 to 331.2 billion in 2022, attaining a compound annual growth rate, or CAGR, of 12.6%. Spending on infrastructure as a service to increase from 30.5 billion in 2018 to 76.6 billion in 2022, growing 27.5% in a year. Platform as a service spending to grow from 15.6 billion in 2018 to 31.8 billion in 2022, growing 21.8% in a year. With software investments shifting from cloud first to cloud only, Spending on software as a service is expected to grow from 80 billion in 2018 to 143.7 billion in 2022. What is clear is that cloud is accelerating faster than predicted, adoption is high, and revenues are soaring. The question for businesses today is no longer if they need to adopt the cloud, rather what their cloud adoption strategy should be to best serve their businesses and customers. Keeping up with this technological wave and driving it forward are the cloud service providers with a wide range of services. We will now talk about some of the major cloud service providers in an alphabetical order. Alibaba Cloud, also known as Aliyun, while relatively new, is the largest Chinese cloud computing service provider. Aliyun provides a comprehensive suite of global cloud computing services to power not just their customers' online businesses, but also the Alibaba Group's own e-commerce ecosystem. It offers a host of products and services, such as compute, network, storage, security, monitoring and managing, communication, analytics, IoT, application development, data migration, web hosting, and more. One of the first to enter the cloud computing race, Amazon Web Services, or AWS Cloud, 
offers an extensive range of infrastructure and platform services to individuals, companies, and governments on a metered pay-as-you-go basis. The Amazon Cloud provides a wide range of products, services, and solutions ranging from compute, DevOps, data, analytics, IoT, machine learning, networking, content delivery, robotics, serverless computing, and much more. Google Cloud Platform, or GCP, is a suite of cloud computing services providing infrastructure, platform, and serverless computing environments. Google also uses GCP internally for their end-user products such as Google Search and YouTube. Google Cloud includes G Suite with products for communication, productivity, collaboration, storage, and more. The Google App Engine is a platform for developing and hosting web applications in Google Managed Data Centers, automatically allocating and deallocating resources to handle demand. IBM Cloud is a full-stack cloud platform that spans public, private, and hybrid environments with products and services covering compute, network, storage, management, security, DevOps, and databases. Some of their prominent offerings include their bare metal servers, VMware, cloud packs for application modernization, virtual private cloud, and the suite of emerging technologies such as AI, IoT, blockchain, data, and analytics. With the acquisition of Red Hat, IBM is also positioning itself as the leading hybrid cloud provider of our times. Microsoft Azure is a flexible cloud platform for building, testing, deploying, and managing applications and services through Microsoft managed data centers. With its data centers spread out in many regions, Azure provides a global reach with a local presence. It provides software, platform, and infrastructure services supporting Microsoft-specific and third-party languages, tools, and frameworks. Oracle Cloud is primarily known for software as a service and database as a service, also known as the Oracle Data Cloud. Oracle's software as a service offering includes wide-ranging applications such as ERP, SCM, HCM, marketing, sales, and CX running in the cloud. And the Oracle Data Cloud provides one of the largest cloud-based data management platforms, helping customers personalize their online, offline, and mobile marketing campaigns for targeted audiences. Oracle Cloud also provides some cloud infrastructure and platform services. Salesforce specializes in their software as a service offering that focuses on customer relationship management, supporting businesses to better connect with their customers, partners, and potential customers. Salesforce offers multiple cloud services, such as Sales Cloud, Service Cloud, and Marketing Cloud, helping customers track analytics in real time, customer success and support, customer complaints, even listening in to customers across social platforms to automatically route them to appropriate agents for resolution. SAP is known for enterprise software and applications such as ERP, CRM, HR, and finance running in the cloud. There is also a SAP cloud platform for building and extending business applications with rapid innovation cycles in a secure cloud computing environment managed by SAP. In the next video, we're going to look at the business case for cloud computing. Cloud adoption is no longer a thing of the future. From a single individual to a global multi-billion dollar enterprise, anybody can access the computing capacity they need on the cloud. The lag time from decision to value is no longer a journey of years with high upfront capital. Cloud makes it possible for businesses to experiment, fail, and learn much faster than ever before with low risk exposure. Businesses today have greater freedom to change course than to live with the consequences of expensive decisions taken in the past. According to an IBM Institute for Business Value study, more than three quarters of enterprises today are using cloud computing to expand into new industries. 
74% have adopted cloud to improve customer experience, and 71% use cloud to create enhanced products and services while simultaneously downsizing legacy systems and reducing costs. To remain competitive, businesses need to be able to respond quickly to marketplace changes, use analytics to understand customer experience, and apply that understanding to adapt their products and services based on what they learn. Product life cycles have shortened and barriers to entry have become lower. Cognitively enabled workflows, applied exponential technologies such as AI, automation, IoT, and blockchain, applications that span new and legacy solutions, and open, hybrid, and secure multi-cloud infrastructures are today's enablers for growth, agility, and innovation. The power, scalability, flexibility, and pay-as-you-go economics of cloud has made it the underpinning foundation for digital transformation. The International Data Corporation, IDC, predicts that by 2025, the total amount of digital data created worldwide will rise to 163 zettabytes, where one zettabyte is equivalent to a trillion gigabytes. And 30% of this data will be real-time information. Considering the unprecedented amounts of data being produced daily and the ability to make data-driven decisions crucial to any business, cloud computing becomes essential for businesses to succeed, sustain, and compete in today's markets. A cloud strategy, more than just an IT strategy, is the core component of any business strategy today. Businesses that haven't already or are not currently integrating cloud into their business strategy run the risk of lacking the speed, agility, innovation, and decision-making capacities needed to be competitive, as also their ability to respond to digital disruption. In the next video, we'll look at some case studies that demonstrate the impact businesses have created by adopting cloud. In this video, we will look at how some of the leading businesses have transformed the way they work to provide better customer service, remove barriers to innovation, achieve enterprise scale, and accelerate growth using cloud technologies. Although the case studies we'll look at are curated from IBM Cloud, similar stories with dramatic impact to business can be found across the spectrum of companies utilizing other cloud service providers as well. Better customer service. In the highly competitive airline industry, customer experience is a major point of differentiation, and digital channels are increasingly important. To become more responsive to customer needs, American Airlines needed a new technology platform and a new approach to development that would help it deliver digital self-service tools and customer value more rapidly across its enterprise. The airline recognized the opportunity to remove the constraints of their existing customer-facing applications based on monolithic code into cloud-native-based microservices architecture on the cloud. The results? Faster development and release of new apps, improved operational reliability, productivity, and end customer response times, cost savings by avoiding existing upgrade costs via migration to the IBM Cloud. Removing Barriers to Innovation As a lean organization with a self-imposed limit on headcount, Ubank excels at finding innovative ways to meet demands. Continually challenged to find more efficient ways to operate, Ubank's IT team explored a Platform-as-a-Service, or PaaS, cloud development model. Their need was to give more control to their developers, reduce the need for additional resources, faster speed to market, and removing barriers in going from an idea to production. Ubank launched new initiatives in an IBM Cloud Platform environment, including a virtual assistant that incorporates IBM Watson technology to support the bank's online home loan application. The results? Faster time to market made possible through the Cloud Platform framework that streamlines development and empowers product teams foster greater innovation with cloud-based development resources that are quick, 
easy and cost-effective to deploy, more efficient operations, demand for enterprise scale. Since its inception in 2008, Bitly has journeyed from a startup that offered intelligent link shortening technology adopted by users to compress lengthy URLs for social media posts to an enterprise product. Seeking an agile, cost-effective IT infrastructure to support this transition, Bitly started planning for cloud migration. Their need was to have a cloud-based model with pay-as-you-go pricing, the ability to scale up and down, a more global presence, and the ability to geo-distribute into more POPs. And they wanted it to be low risk. Bitly migrated to an IBM cloud environment, establishing a scalable hosting platform for low latency delivery to enterprise customers around the world. The results, 25 billion data-infused links migrated from one hosting site to cloud infrastructure with data center locations worldwide. 1 billion user interaction data sets stored and managed in a flexible, cost-effective cloud object storage environment. Transformed IT operations to scale for growth, control costs, and focus valuable resources on new product development. Accelerating growth. Financial traders demand extreme speed and availability from trading systems. Profitability depends on split-second decisions. As a leading online broker for Forex, commodities, equities, cryptocurrencies, indices, and other financial instruments, Active Trades enables investors to buy and sell on numerous financial markets. Investors need reliable access to accurate market information, combined with the ability to move rapidly to execute trades. As its client base grew, Active Trades wanted to cut latency, accelerate execution, and streamline the delivery of new functions. Active Trades migrated three major trading systems from on premise infrastructure to IBM Cloud for VMware solutions, backed by data storage, networking, and security offerings on the IBM Cloud. The results up to three times performance boost, helping clients seize fleeting opportunities for profit. Security rich cloud platform with ultra high availability protects client investments hours, not days, to fire up new resources for faster response to emerging requirements. In the next video, we'll look at some of the emerging technologies that are available on the cloud and the opportunities they bring to businesses. In this new era, technologies such as Internet of Things, Big Data, Artificial Intelligence, and Blockchain are disrupting existing business models and industries while creating unprecedented opportunities for businesses to differentiate themselves and create value for their clients. The power, scale, dynamic nature, and economics of the cloud resources make cloud computing a key enabler for adoption and evolution of these emerging technologies. In this video, we will look at how the Internet of Things, or IoT, powered by cloud, is making a big difference for businesses today. The Internet of Things, or IoT, is a giant network of connected things and people that have changed much of how we live our daily lives, from the way we drive to how we make purchases, monitoring our personal health, and even how we get energy for our homes. Smart devices and sensors are continuously tracking and collecting data. For example, a smart building could have thousands of sensors measuring all kinds of data related to thermal, optical, structural, and environmental stimuli. An unprecedented amount of data is being generated, putting a tremendous strain on the Internet. That is where the cloud comes in. By connecting the IoT device user to the cloud, be it for device registration, device identity, storing data, or accessing enterprise data. Data collected through IoT devices is stored and processed on the cloud. Since IoT devices can be in a state of motion, the cloud serves as a collection point in closest proximity, 
minimizing the latency in reporting up the data points and providing a response back to the IoT application. So from IoT platforms running entirely on the cloud, to the interfaces used by customers to interact with these devices, to the back-end analytics platforms, cloud computing supports and enables IoT. Cloud service providers also offer specialized IoT services designed to help speed up the development of IoT solutions. Let's look at a case study that demonstrates the use of the IoT on the cloud to combat the poaching of endangered rhinos at Wellgivanden by making poaching predictable. China has become one of the, the key species that is becoming endangered due to, to poaching throughout Africa, but now especially in South Africa. Up until now, uh, poachers have been increasing in numbers and they've become more militarized with weapons. And So of course, we've had to do the same. This is not sustainable. The only way to do this better is to bring in technology and things that they do not have. This endangered species is getting help from some unexpected friends, the zebra and antelope. They're wearing IoT sensors connected to the IBM cloud. When poachers enter the area, the animals run for it, which alerts rangers who can track their motions and help stop them before any harm is done. It's a smart way to help increase the rhino population and turn the poachers into the endangered species. In the next video, we're going to look at how artificial intelligence on the cloud is impacting businesses. Making sense of the endless streams of data is where artificial intelligence, or AI, comes in. Many of the applications where we apply AI today simply wouldn't have been possible without the scalable, on-demand computing offered by the cloud. There is a three-way relationship between AI, IoT, and cloud. Just as AI consumes the data produced by IoT devices, the IoT device's behavior can be dictated based on responses from AI. For example, smart assistants. A common type of IoT device continues to learn about the user's preferences as usage grows, such as songs they like, their home temperature settings, preferred meal times, and over time, they anticipate their actions based on the user's past history. So what we see is a symbiotic relationship between IoT, AI, and cloud. IoT delivers the data, AI powers the insights, and both these emerging technologies leverage cloud scalability and processing power to provide value to individuals and businesses alike. Let's look at how the United States Tennis Association, USTA, is using AI on the cloud to deliver unique digital experiences to millions of fans around the world. For two weeks at the end of every summer, tennis fans around the world turn their eyes to New York City and the US Open. Hundreds of thousands on site and millions more online. But where you see tennis, IBM sees data. The scores and statistics, the sights, the sounds. IBM integrates and analyzes the data flowing from the court and delivers unique digital experiences to more than 10 million tennis fans around the world. And we do it all in the IBM Cloud. The IBM Cloud is the digital foundation of the US Open. It scales rapidly to meet a 5,000% increase in web traffic, and it delivers a consistent experience to our fans all around the globe. And with Watson on the IBM Cloud, we can engage fans in unique ways, year after year. Slam Tracker analyzes more than 26 million historical data points. It gives fans deep insight into featured matches, and it can see the momentum of a match shifting in real time. AI Highlights uses Watson to process thousands of hours of US Open video. It can hear the cheers of the crowd, it can see a player celebrating, and it knows what makes a great tennis highlight. And this year, 
we're putting the power of AI highlights into the hands of U.S. players and coaches. Watson is analyzing match video so coaches can quickly find the footage they need to guide the development of their players. And if you need to know where to park, find a good burger, or grab the latest U.S. Open gear, you can find the answers with the guest information feature in the U.S. Open app and mobile web using Watson. We work with IBM because they keep us on the cutting edge of the fan experience. They help us to adopt the latest technology, like cloud and AI. And they bring data to life in a way that's accessible and engaging for our fans. In the next video, we're going to look at how blockchain and analytics on the cloud are impacting businesses. Blockchain is a secure, distributed, open technology that can help speed up processes, lower costs, and build transparency and traceability in transactional applications. It is an immutable network allowing members to view only those transactions that are relevant to them. The more open, diverse, and distributed the network, the stronger the trust and transparency in the data and transactions. 85% of businesses today rely on multiple clouds to meet their IT needs, with more than 70% using more than three. These businesses need to be able to move applications and data across multiple clouds easily and securely, leading to the emerging demand to build and manage business applications such as blockchain for the multi-cloud environment. Blockchain and AI, much like IoT and AI, powered by the cloud, also have a three-way relationship. Where blockchain technology provides the trusted, decentralized source of truth, AI powers the analytics and decision-making from the data collected, and cloud provides globally distributed, scalable, and cost-efficient computing resources to support both the unprecedented amounts of data being collected and the processing power required to draw insights from this data. Blockchain serves to make AI more understandable by recording the data and variables that go into a decision made in an AI algorithm, leading to greater trust and transparency in the conclusions and decisions made by these algorithms. Let's look at how blockchain on the cloud is helping farmers reduce waste at times of recall by building traceability and transparency in the food supply chain. For farmers here, this is our life's work. You know, 60% of the nation's lettuce is grown right here in Salinas. When it comes down to how plants are looked at, I really relate back to how humans are raised and, and nurtured. I want to make sure that everything is safe before it leaves the ranch. But when a recall happens, perfectly good food goes to waste. You have to take all product off your shelf, no matter what age, no matter where it came from. It takes resources to grow those things. Then now we're actually eating into our future food supply. But we've got a way around that. Blockchain technology on the IBM cloud, we're able to track our product within seconds, giving the consumers instant access where the product came from in case there's any recall. So we don't have to take all the food off the shelves. Having that instant access allows you to reduce the waste. There's a lot of starving people in this world. A nice wedge. I want to be the generation that fixes that. Is Daddy let it? Yeah, it is. Analytics technologies on the cloud leverage the flexibility, scalability, and computing resources available on the cloud. From tracking trends on social media to predict future events, to analyzing data to build machine learning models that can be deployed in cognitive applications, Cloud provides the integrated environment that is required to leverage data for continuous improvement and accelerated business growth. Let's look at how Kone has invested in cloud and IoT technologies to power a data analytics and predictive maintenance solution for city infrastructure used by more than 1 billion people daily. At Kone, we, we manufacture elevators, escalators, auto walks, and doors. 
all of these devices are streams of, of data that we are collecting. In order to process those streams, we need a scalable way of handle the amount of data that is coming in. And that's where Cloud Function fits in perfectly. We handle that data with event-driven architecture. We use functions to persist that data and to generate further events on that data that are then utilized and consumed by applications and our customers and users. In our analytics platform, we analyze the, the set of data and we generate value predictive in a sense that we can predict the failure rate to a certain percentage that is about to happen in the future for our equipment. And this allows us to perform predictive maintenance. And this is kind of the whole concept that we have behind our 24-7 connected services, which is a promise to our customers that the equipment is connected to the cloud and we are monitoring it. And that's where we generate the real value for our customers from a maintenance perspective. At the moment, we use almost all aspects of the IBM cloud. We use storage from the cloud, we use cloud function, we use messaging services, we use IoT services. So a number of services are already in use in platform and that use will only grow as our digital footprint in the, in the industry grows. In our introductory cloud video, we briefly talked about the three service models available on the cloud, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Before we dive into the details of each of these service models in the subsequent videos, let's get started with a quick overview of these models. Hi, I'm Tessa Rhodes, and I'm a designer on IBM Cloud. So let's start with the foundation here with IaaS. IaaS is a set of compute, networking, and storage resources that have been virtualized by a vendor so that a user can access and configure them any way they want. In design, we have a concept of talking about users called personas. And the persona for IaaS is a system admin, or an IT admin. Let's jump up to the top with software as a service. That's the easy one. Software as a service is just software that you don't have to install on your machine and you don't have to manually update. And so the user for software as a service could be anyone. In fact, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, then you're a user of software as a service. It's usually charged um, on a subscription model rather than a one-time license fee. Then that brings us to platform as a service. PaaS takes advantage of all the virtualized resources from IaaS and then just abstracts them away so the user doesn't have to worry about managing any of those virtualized resources. The user for PaaS is not a system admin, usually. Um, it's usually a dev. In IBM, we call this dev Jane. That's the name of our persona. And so this whole metaphor, the pyramid metaphor, is meant to indicate that as you move down, you're increasing complexity in terms of the, your knowledge and, and management of infrastructure resources, and you're increasing the ease of use. Another metaphor I use when I'm talking to the designers on my team about PaaS is having to do with a car. So in this metaphor, IaaS is like leasing a car. So if you've ever leased a car, you probably did a lot of research and you care about the specs of the car and their performance. You care about the color of the car, what kind of car it is, and you're the one driving and you're paying for it. You're also paying for the gas and any tolls or maintenance. Um, with platform as a service, in this metaphor, that's more like renting a car. So say you're on vacation and you just got off the air airport and you're going to pick up your rental car. You don't really care what color it is. Uh, you don't really even care about the specs of it, but you're still driving and you're paying for the gas and any tolls you go through. Software as a service is again the easiest one. That one's more like getting a taxi or an Uber. So with a taxi or an Uber, you don't care at all about what kind of car it is, what color it is, and in fact, you're not even the one driving or paying for gas or any tolls, because that's baked into the price. So let's see what it means in terms of cloud computing and its three service models. 
With IAAS, the cloud provider manages the physical resources, data centers, cooling, power, network and security, as well as computing resources that include servers and storage. With PAAS, the provider, in addition to the computing resources, also manages the platform infrastructure, which includes the operating systems, development tools, databases, and business analytics. In the SAAS model, in addition to the infrastructure and the platform resources, the provider also hosts and manages the applications and data. In the next video, we'll take a closer look at infrastructure as a service, its features, benefits, and some use cases. In this video, we will discuss the infrastructure as a service model in more detail. Infrastructure as a service, commonly referred to as IaaS or simply IaaS, is a form of cloud computing that delivers fundamental compute, network, and storage resources to consumers on demand over the internet on a pay-as-you-go basis. The cloud provider hosts the infrastructure components traditionally present in an on-premises data center as well as the virtualization or hypervisor layer. In an IaaS cloud environment, customers can create or provision virtual machines, or VMs, in their choice of region and zone available from the cloud provider. These VMs typically come pre-installed the customer's choice of operating system. The customers can then deploy middleware, install applications, and run workloads on these VMs. They can also create storage for their workloads and backups. Cloud providers often provide customers the ability to track and monitor the performance and usage of their cloud services and manage disaster recovery. Let's look at the key components of cloud infrastructure. Physical data centers. IaaS providers manage large data centers that contain the physical machines required to power the various layers of abstraction on top of them. In most IaaS models, end users do not interact directly with the physical infrastructure, but experience it as a service provided to them. Compute. IaaS providers manage the hypervisors and end users programmatically provision virtual instances with desired amounts of compute, memory, and storage resources. Cloud compute typically comes with supporting services like auto-scaling and load balancing that provide scalability and high performance. Network. Users get access to networking resources on the cloud through virtualization or programmatically through APIs. Storage. There are three types of cloud data storage, object, file, and block storage. Object storage is the most common mode of storage in the cloud, given that it is highly distributed and resilient. IaaS supports a wide array of use cases. We'll look at some typical use cases here. Organizations today are using cloud infrastructure services to enable their teams to set up test and development environments faster, helping create new applications more quickly. By abstracting the low-level components, cloud infrastructure is helping developers focus more on business logic than infrastructure management. Business continuity and disaster recovery require a significant amount of technology and staff investments. IaaS is helping organizations reduce this cost and make applications and data accessible as usual during a disaster or outage. Organizations are using cloud infrastructure to deploy their web applications faster and also scale infrastructure up and down as demand fluctuates. Organizations are leveraging the high-performance computing capabilities of cloud infrastructure to solve complex problems involving millions of variables and calculations, such as climate and weather predictions and financial modeling. Mining massive data sets to locate valuable patterns, trends, and associations requires a huge amount of processing power. Cloud infrastructure not only provides the required high-performance computing, but also makes it economically viable. While there are some concerns regarding the lack of transparency in the cloud infrastructure's configuration and management, and dependency on a third party for workload availability and performance, infrastructure as a service is the fastest growing cloud model today. 
In the next video, we will look at Platform as a Service model, its features, benefits, and some use cases. Platform as a Service, commonly referred to as PaaS or simply PaaS, is a cloud computing model that provides customers a complete platform to develop, deploy, manage, and run applications created by them or acquired from a third party. The PaaS provider hosts everything – servers, networks, storage, operating system, application runtimes, APIs, middleware, databases, and other tools at their data center. The provider also takes responsibility for the installation, configuration, and operation of the application infrastructure, leaving the user responsible for only the application code and its maintenance. Customers pay for this service on a usage basis and purchase resources on demand. With IaaS, the cloud provider offers access to raw computing resources, such as servers, storage, and networking, while the user is responsible for the platform and application software. With PaaS, or PaaS, the cloud service provider delivers and manages the entire platform infrastructure, abstracting users from the lower-level details of the environment. Let's look at some essential characteristics of Platform as a Service, or PaaS. PaaS clouds are distinguished by the high level of abstraction they provide to the users, eliminating the complexity of deploying applications, configuring infrastructure, and provisioning and configuring supporting technologies like load balancers and databases. PaaS clouds provide services and APIs that help simplify the job of developers in delivering elastically scalable and highly available cloud applications. These services typically include a variety of capabilities, such as APIs for distributed caching, queuing, and messaging, file and data storage, workload management, user identity, and analytics, thus eliminating the need to integrate disparate components. The PaaS runtime environment executes end-user code according to policies set by the application owner and cloud provider. Many of the PaaS offerings provide developers with rapid deployment mechanisms, or push-and-run mechanism, for deploying and running applications. PaaS offerings support a range of application infrastructure, or middleware, capabilities, such as application servers, database management systems, business analytics servers, mobile backend services, integration services, business process management systems, rules engines, and complex event processing systems. Such an application infrastructure assists developers by reducing the amount of code that must be written while expanding the application's functional capabilities. The most important use case for PaaS is strategic. Build, test, deploy, enhance, and scale applications rapidly and cost-effectively. Let's look at some more use cases for PaaS. API development and management. Organizations are using PaaS to develop, run, manage, and secure APIs and microservices, which are loosely coupled, independently deployable components and services. Internet of Things, or IoT. PaaS clouds support a broad range of application environments, programming languages, and tools used for IoT deployments. Business analytics or intelligence. PaaS tools allow organizations to analyze their data to find business insights that enable more informed business decisions and predictions. Business process management or BPM. Organizations are using the PaaS cloud to access BPM platform delivered as a service. Master Data Management, or MDM. Organizations are leveraging the PaaS cloud to provide a single point of reference for critical business data, such as information about customer transactions and analytical data to support decision making. Let's look at some advantages of using PaaS. Scalability, made possible because of the rapid allocation and deallocation of resources with a pay-as-you-use model offered by PaaS. 
the APIs, support services, and middleware capabilities that Pass Clouds provide assist developers in focusing their efforts on application development and testing, resulting in faster time to market for their products and services. Middleware capabilities also reduce the amount of code that need to be written while expanding the application's functional capabilities. Greater agility and innovation, because using PaaS platforms means that you can experiment with multiple operating systems, languages, and tools without having to invest in these resources. You can evaluate and prototype ideas with very low risk exposure, resulting in faster, easier, less risky adoption of a wider range of resources. Some of the key PaaS offerings available in the market today include AWS Elastic Beanstalk, Cloud Foundry, IBM Cloud Packs, Windows Azure, Red Hat OpenShift, Magento Commerce Cloud, Force.com, and Apache Stratos. Past clouds do come with some risks. Risks that all cloud offerings have in general, such as information security threats and dependency on the service provider's infrastructure. Services can get impacted when a service provider's infrastructure experiences downtime. Customers also don't have any direct control over the changes that may take place when a provider makes changes in its strategy, service offerings, or tools. But the benefits can far outweigh these risks. PaaS continues to experience strong growth and is predicted to become the prevailing platform delivery model moving forward. In the next video, we will look at software as a service model, its features, benefits, and some use cases. Software as a Service, or SaaS, is a cloud offering that provides users with access to a service provider's cloud-based software. SaaS providers maintain the servers, databases, and code that constitute an application. They also manage access to the application, including security, availability, and performance. Applications reside on a remote cloud network and users use these applications without having to maintain and update the infrastructure. Core business processes supported by SaaS today include email and collaboration via offerings such as Microsoft's Office 365 and Google's Gmail, customer relationship management via services such as NetSuite CRM and Salesforce, human resource management, via services from Workday and SAP SuccessFactors, financial management, billing collaboration, and many more. According to Forrester Research, SaaS has overtaken on-premises solutions in categories such as human capital management, HCM, customer relationship management, CRM, and collaboration. Solutions once available with several different deployment options are now SaaS only. Let's look at key characteristics of software as a service. SaaS clouds have a multi-tenant architecture. Infrastructure and code are maintained centrally and accessed by all users. SaaS makes it easy for users to manage privileges, monitor data use, and ensure everyone sees the same information at the same time. Security, compliance, and maintenance are all part of the offering. Users can customize applications to fit their business processes with point-and-click ease. Users can customize the UI to work with their branding guidelines. They can modify data fields and enable or disable features within the business process. These customizations are preserved through upgrades. Users pay for the use of the service via a subscription model. The use of resources can be scaled easily depending on service needs. Key benefits of adopting SaaS. Businesses can directly procure solutions without upfront capital and assistance from IT, greatly reducing the time from decision to value from months to days. SaaS greatly increases workforce productivity and efficiency. 
Users can access code business apps from wherever they are. They can also buy and deploy apps in minutes, reducing the typical obstacles enterprises have to test the products they might use. Using SaaS applications, individuals and small enterprises can spread out their software costs over time. Let's look at some use cases for SaaS. Organizations are moving to SaaS for their core business needs as part of their strategic transformation to reduce on-premises IT infrastructure and reduce capital expenditure. Organizations are leveraging SaaS to avoid the need for ongoing upgrades, maintenance, and patching done traditionally by internal IT resources. Applications run reliably with minimal input, for example, email servers and office collaboration and productivity tools. Organizations are increasingly opting for SaaS e-commerce platforms to manage their websites, marketing, sales, and operations. With SaaS, organizations are able to take advantage of the resilience and business continuity of the cloud provider. Enterprises are now developing SaaS integration platforms, or SIPs, for building additional SaaS applications moving SaaS beyond standalone software functionality to a platform for mission-critical applications. SaaS does evoke some concerns as well, primary among them being data ownership and data safety. Security is an important consideration when you're allowing a third party to maintain business-critical data. An application access relies on a good internet connection. If you're not connected, you cannot access the apps but the benefits far outweigh the concerns, with SaaS making up the largest segment of the cloud market today. In our introductory cloud video, we briefly mentioned the three deployment models for cloud, in this video, we will discuss the public cloud deployment model in more detail. Deployment models indicate where the infrastructure resides, who owns and manages it, and how cloud resources and services are made available to users. The three cloud deployment models include public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid cloud. In a public cloud model, users get access to servers, storage, network, security, and applications as services delivered by cloud service providers over the internet. Using web consoles and APIs, users can provision the resources and services they need. The cloud provider owns, manages, provisions, and maintains the infrastructure, renting it out to the customers either for subscription charge or usage-based fee. Users don't own the servers their applications run on or storage their data consumes or manage the operations of the servers or even determine how the platforms are maintained. In very much the same way that we consume and pay for utilities, such as water, electricity, or gas in our everyday lives, we don't own any of these cloud resources. We make an agreement with the service provider, use the resources, and pay for what we use within a certain period. Public clouds offer significant cost savings as the provider bears all the capital, operational, and maintenance expenses for the infrastructure and the facilities they are hosted in. It makes scalability as easy as requesting more capacity. However, with a public cloud, the user does not have any control over the computing environment and is subject to the performance and security of the cloud provider's infrastructure. There are several public cloud providers in the market today, such as Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, IBM Cloud, Google Cloud Platform, and Alibaba Cloud. While all providers include a common set of core services, such as servers, storage, network, security, and databases, they also offer a wide spectrum of niche services with varied payment options. Let's talk about some of the characteristics of a public cloud. A public cloud is a virtualized, multi-tenant architecture enabling tenants or users to share computing resources, residing outside their firewalls. The cloud provider's pool of resources, including infrastructure, platforms, and software, are not dedicated for use by a single tenant or organization. Resources are distributed on an as-needed basis offered through a variety of subscription and pay-as-you-go models. 
Public clouds have significant benefits. We'll go over some of these benefits here. Vast, on-demand resources are available, allowing applications to respond seamlessly to fluctuations in demand. Considering the large number of users that share the centralized cloud resources on demand, the public cloud offers the most significant economies of scale. The sheer number of server and network resources available on the public cloud means that a public cloud is highly reliable. If one physical component fails, the service still runs unaffected on the remaining available components. It's also important to note some concerns users have regarding public clouds, key among them being security and data sovereignty compliance. Security issues such as data breaches, data loss, account hijacking, insufficient due diligence, and system and application vulnerability seem to be some of the fears users continue to have concerning security in the public cloud. With data being stored in different locations and accessed across national borders, it has become increasingly critical for companies to be compliant with data sovereignty regulations governing the storage, transfer, and security of data. A service provider's ability to not just keep up with the regulations, but also the interpretation of these regulations is a concern shared by many businesses. Let's look at some common use cases for public cloud. Organizations are increasingly opting to access cloud-based applications and platforms so their teams can focus on building and testing applications and reducing time to market for their products and services. Businesses with fluctuating capacity and resourcing needs are opting for the public cloud. Organizations are using public cloud computing resources to build secondary infrastructures for disaster recovery, data protection, and business continuity. More and more organizations are using cloud storage and data management services for greater accessibility, easy distribution, and backing up of their data. IT departments are outsourcing the management of less critical and standardized business platforms and applications to public cloud providers. In the next video, we will look at the private cloud model, its features, benefits, and some use cases. The National Institute of Standards and Technology defines private cloud as cloud infrastructure provisioned for exclusive use by a single organization comprising multiple consumers, such as the business units within the organization. It may be owned, managed, and operated by the organization, a third party, or some combination of them, and it may exist on or off premises. Private cloud platforms can be implemented internally or externally. When the platform is provisioned over an organization's internal infrastructure, it runs on-premises and is owned, managed, and operated by the organization. When it is provisioned over a cloud provider's infrastructure, it is owned, managed, and operated by the service provider. This external private cloud offering that resides on a cloud service provider's infrastructure is called a virtual private cloud, or VPC. A VPC is a public cloud offering that lets an organization establish its own private and secure cloud-like computing environment in a logically isolated part of a shared public cloud. Using a VPC, organizations can leverage the dynamic scalability, high availability, and lower cost of ownership of a public cloud while having the infrastructure and security tailored to the organization's unique needs. Virtual private clouds are offered by most public cloud providers, such as IBM and Amazon. A private cloud is a virtualized environment modeled to bring in the benefits of a public cloud platform without the perceived disadvantages of an open and shared public platform. Users of a private cloud, such as developers and business units in an organization, still get to leverage benefits such as economies of scale, granular scale, operational efficiencies, and user self-service, while exercising full control over access, security, and compliances specific to their organization and business. Private clouds provide you with one, the ability to leverage the value of cloud computing using systems that are directly managed or under perceived control of the organization's internal IT. 
Two, the ability to better utilize internal computing resources, such as the organization's existing investments in hardware and software, thereby reducing costs. Three, better scalability through virtualization and cloud bursting, that is, leveraging public cloud instances for a period of time but returning to the private cloud when the surge is met. Four, controlled access and greater security measures customized to specific organizational needs. Five, the ability to expand and provision things in a relatively short amount of time, providing greater agility. Organizations may choose to opt for private cloud because of various reasons. Because their applications provide a unique competitive advantage, there are security and regulatory concerns, or because their data is highly sensitive and subject to strict industry or governmental regulations. Let's look at some common use cases for a private cloud. One, a private cloud is an opportunity for organizations to modernize and unify their in-house and legacy applications. Moving these applications from their dedicated hardware to the cloud also allows them to leverage the power of the compute resources and multiple services available on the cloud. Two, using the private cloud, organizations are integrating data and application services from their existing applications with public cloud services. This allows them to leverage their private cloud's compute capability for the larger jobs while pulling data into an application on a private cloud to leverage public cloud services, essentially opening their data centers to work with cloud services. Three. Application portability is a key feature of cloud platforms. Using the private cloud gives organizations the ability to build applications anywhere and move them anywhere without having to compromise security and compliance in the process. Four, some of the key reasons that may prevent an organization from moving to a public cloud include security and regulatory concerns and data sensitivity. A private cloud offers these organizations the benefits of on-demand enterprise resources while exercising full control over critical security and compliance issues from within the environment of their dedicated cloud. In the next video, we will look at the hybrid cloud model, its features, benefits, and some use cases. Hybrid cloud is a computing environment that connects an organization's on-premise private cloud and third-party public cloud into a single, flexible infrastructure for running the organization's applications and workloads. The mix of public and private cloud resources gives organizations the flexibility to choose the optimal cloud for each application or workload. Workloads move freely between the two clouds as needs change. Organizations can choose to run the sensitive, highly regulated, and mission-critical applications or workloads with reasonably constant performance and capacity requirements on private cloud infrastructure, while deploying the less sensitive and more dynamic workloads on the public cloud. With proper integration and orchestration between the public and private clouds, you can leverage both clouds for the same workload. For example, you can leverage additional public cloud capacity to accommodate a spike in demand for a private cloud application, also known as cloud bursting. The key tenets of a hybrid cloud are interoperability, scalability, and portability. Hybrid cloud is interoperable, which means that the public and private cloud services can understand each other's APIs, configuration, data formats, and forms of authentication and authorization. When there is a spike in demand, a workload running on the private cloud can leverage the additional public cloud capacity, making it scalable. A hybrid cloud is also portable. Since you're no longer locked in with a specific vendor, you can move applications and data not just between on-premise and cloud systems, but also between cloud service providers. Hybrid is about taking the best of both worlds. There are two common types of hybrid clouds, hybrid monocloud and hybrid multi-cloud. A hybrid monocloud is a hybrid cloud with one cloud provider, while a hybrid multi-cloud is an open standards-based stack that can be deployed on any public cloud infrastructure. The difference lies in the flexibility that the hybrid multi-cloud offers organizations 
to move workloads and environments from one vendor to another. There is also a variant of hybrid multi-cloud called the composite multi-cloud, which makes this flexibility even more granular as it distributes single applications across multiple providers, allowing you to move application components across cloud services and vendors as needed. Hybrid Cloud offers significant benefits in areas of security and compliance, scalability and resilience, resource optimization, and cost saving. A hybrid cloud lets organizations deploy highly regulated or sensitive workloads in a private cloud while running the less sensitive workloads on a public cloud. Using a hybrid cloud, you can scale up quickly inexpensively and even automatically using the public cloud infrastructure, all without impacting the other workloads running on your private cloud. Because you're not locked in with a specific vendor and also don't have to make either or decisions between the different cloud models, you can make the most cost efficient use of your infrastructure budget. You can maintain workloads where they are most efficient, spin up environments using pay as you go in public cloud, and rapidly adopt new tools as you need them. A typical organization will have a range of applications and workloads spread across private, public, and traditional IT environments. This represents a range of opportunities for optimization via a hybrid cloud approach. Let's look at some increasingly common hybrid cloud use cases. Software as a service integration. Through hybrid integration, organizations are connecting software-as-a-service applications available in the public cloud to their existing public cloud, private cloud, and traditional IT applications to deliver new solutions. Data and AI integration. Organizations today are creating richer and more personal experiences by combining new data sources on the public cloud such as weather, social, the Internet of Things, CRM, and ERP, with existing data and analytics, machine learning, and AI capabilities. Enhancing legacy apps. An increasing number of organizations are using public cloud services to upgrade their user experience of their on-premises applications and deploy them globally to new devices, while incrementally modernizing their core business systems. VMware migration. More and more organizations are lifting and shifting their on-premises virtualized workloads to a public cloud without conversion or modification to reduce their on-premises data center footprint and position themselves to scale without added capital expense. Hybrid cloud is a concept that's been around for quite some time, but we're finding that it's becoming increasingly used to architect and modernize existing or legacy applications. According to research, we found that 75% uh, of non-cloud applications will be moving to the cloud in the next three years. This goes to say that if you're not already thinking about your hybrid cloud strategy, you may be falling behind. After choosing the cloud service model and the cloud type offered by vendors, customers need to plan the infrastructure architecture. The infrastructure layer is the foundation of the cloud. This layer consists of physical resources that are housed by regions, zones, and data centers. A cloud provider's IT environment is typically distributed across regions around the world. A cloud region is a geographic area or location where a cloud provider's infrastructure is clustered and may have names like NA South or US East. The cloud regions are isolated from each other so that if one region was impacted by a natural disaster, like an earthquake, the cloud operations in other regions would keep running. Each cloud region can have multiple zones, or availability zones, or AZ for short, which are typically distinct data centers with their own power, cooling, and networking resources. These zones can have names like DAL09 or US East 1. The isolation of zones improves the cloud's overall fault tolerance, decreases latency, and avoids creating a single shared point of failure. 
the availability zones and data centers within them are connected to other AZs and regions, private data centers and the internet using very high bandwidth network connectivity. A cloud data center is a huge room or warehouse containing cloud infrastructure. These data centers contain pods and racks or standardized containers of computing resources, such as servers, as well as storage and networking equipment, virtually everything that a physical IT environment has. Computing resources. Cloud providers offer several compute options, virtual servers, bare metal servers, and serverless computing resources. Most of the servers in a cloud data center run hypervisors to create virtual servers or virtual machines, also called VMs for short, that are software-based computers based on virtualization technologies. Other servers in the racks are bare metal servers that are physical servers that aren't virtualized. Customers can provision VMs and bare metal servers as and when they need them and run their workloads on them. Cloud users can also run their workloads on serverless computing resources, which are an abstraction layer on top of virtual machines. We will talk about all three compute options in greater detail in subsequent videos. Storage. Information and data can consist of files, code, documents, images, videos, backups, snapshots, and databases, and can be stored in many different types of storage options on the cloud. Bare metal servers and virtual servers are provisioned with default storage in local drives. Since these cloud servers can be provisioned and decommissioned by customers on demand and freed up for use by other users, any information stored in a local drive can be lost when you delete or decommission a cloud server. However, there are other storage options available on the cloud to persist data that you can choose depending on factors like how important your data is, how quickly you want to be able to access it, how often you access it, and how secure you need it to be. These additional storage options include block storage, file storage, and object storage. Block and file storage modes are commonly used in traditional data centers, but often struggle with scale, performance, and distributed characteristics of cloud. Object storage is the most common mode of storage in the cloud, as it's both highly distributed and resilient. We will examine object storage and the other storage options in more detail in later videos. Networking. Networking infrastructure in a cloud data center includes traditional networking hardware like routers and switches. But more importantly, for users in the cloud, the cloud providers have software-defined networking, or SDN, options where certain networking resources are virtualized or made available programmatically through APIs. This allows for easier networking provisioning, configuration, and management on the cloud. When servers in the cloud are provisioned, you need to set up their public and private network interfaces. The public network interfaces, as the name suggests, connect the servers to the public internet, where the private ones provide connectivity to your other cloud resources and help keep them secure. As in the physical IT world, network interfaces in the cloud need to have IP addresses and subnets either assigned automatically or configured. In a cloud environment, it is even more important to configure which network traffic and users can access your resources, which can be done by setting up security groups and access control lists, or ACLs. For further security and isolation of your resources in the cloud, most cloud providers provide virtual local area networks, or VLANs, virtual private clouds, VPCs, and virtual private networks, VPNs. Some of the traditional hardware appliances, such as firewalls, load balancers, gateways, and traffic analyzers can also be virtualized and made available as services in the cloud. Another networking capability provided by the cloud providers is content delivery networks, or CDNs, that distribute content to multiple points throughout the world so users accessing the content can access it more quickly by getting it from a point nearest to them. We will learn more about some of these cloud networking options and terminology in subsequent videos. Cloud infrastructure Structure is constantly advancing and improving. In the next video, we will explain virtualization and virtual machines.
Hi, my name is Kaylee Bovey with the IBM Cloud team, and today we're going to be talking about virtualization. As you know, virtualization is a fairly old technology, but it's still super relevant to building your cloud computing strategy today. So first off, what is virtualization? Simply put, virtualization is the process of creating a software-based or virtual version of something, whether that be compute, storage, networking, servers, or applications. And what makes virtualization feasible is something called the hypervisor. So we're gonna write that here. And what a hypervisor is, is it's simply a piece of software that runs above the physical server or host. And there are a couple different types of hypervisors out there. Um, and what they do is essentially pull the resources from the physical server and allocate them to your virtual environments. There are two main types of hypervisors out there, one being type one, very simple to remember, and two, you guessed it, type two. So let's start with type one. A type one hypervisor is a hypervisor that is installed directly on top of the physical server. They're also called bare metal hypervisors. So we'll write that up here, just so you can remember. Um, these are um, the most frequently typed of used hypervisors and they're most secure, they lower the latency, and these are the ones that you'll see in the market the most. Some examples would be VMware ESXi or Microsoft Hyper-V or even open source KVM. The other type of hypervisor is a type two hypervisor over here. Um, and what makes these different is that there is a layer of host OS that sits between the physical server and the hypervisor. So by that nature, they are also called hosted. These are a lot less frequent. Um, they're mostly used for end user virtualization. And you might see some in the market that are called like um, Oracle, VirtualBox, or VMware Workstation. Um, again, they're a lot less frequent. They're a bit more, um, they have a higher latency than a type one hypervisor. So once you have your hypervisor installed, you can build virtual environments or virtual machines, or simply put VMs. So let's spin up some environments. So what makes a VM a VM? A VM is simply a software-based computer. They run like a physical computer. They have an operating system and applications, um, and they're completely independent of one another. But you can run multiple of them on a hypervisor. And the hypervisor manages the resources that are allocated to these virtual environments from the physical server. So because they're independent, you can run different operating systems on different virtual machines. So you could run Windows here, or Linux here, or Unix here, for example. And because they're independent, they're also extremely portable. You can move a virtual machine from one hypervisor to another hypervisor on a completely different machine um, almost as instantaneously, um, which gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of portability within your environment. So looking at all of this, this is the core of virtualization as a process. So let's talk about a couple key benefits that you wanna take away from this. One, cost savings. When you think about this and the fact that you can run multiple virtual environments from one piece of infrastructure means that you can drastically reduce your physical infrastructure footprint. Um, this is consolidation at its core and the fact that you don't have to maintain nearly as many servers um, run as much electricity, save on maintenance costs, means that you save on your bottom line at the end of the day. Number two would be agility and speed. So like I said, spinning up a virtual machine is relatively easy and quick. Um, a lot more simple than provisioning an entire new environment um, for your developers if, you, if they say they want to spin up a new environment so that they can run a dev test scenario, whatever it might be. Virtualization makes that process a lot simpler and quicker. And three, lowers your downtime. So let's say that this host goes out unexpectedly. The fact that you can move virtual machines from one hypervisor to another on a different physical server means that you have a great backup plan in place, right? So if this host goes down, you can simply move your VMs very quickly to another hypervisor on a machine that is working. 
Virtualization and VMs are at the center of cloud computing and provide many benefits. In the next video, we will discuss the types of virtual machines. Virtual machines, or VMs, are also known as virtual servers, or virtual instances, or simply instances, depending on the cloud provider. The various cloud providers make VMs available in a variety of configurations and deployment options to serve different use cases. When you create a virtual server in the cloud, you specify the region and zone or data center you want the server to be provisioned in and the operating system you want on it. You can choose between shared, that is, a multi-tenant VMs, or dedicated, that is, a single-tenant VMs. You can also choose between hourly or monthly billing and select storage and networking options for the virtual server. Now let's look at a few different types of VMs that can be provisioned in the cloud. Shared or public cloud VMs are provider-managed multi-tenant deployments that can be provisioned on demand with predefined sizes. Being multi-tenant means that the underlying physical server is virtualized and is shared across other tenants or users. To satisfy different workloads, cloud providers offer predefined sizes and configurations ranging from a single virtual core and a small amount of RAM to multiple virtual cores and much larger amounts of RAM. For example, there can be configurations for compute-intensive workloads, memory-intensive workloads, or high-performance I.O. Rather than pick from only predefined sizes, some providers also offer custom configurations that allow users to define the number of cores and RAM and local storage characteristics. Public VMs are usually priced by the hour, or in some cases, even seconds, and configurations start as low as pennies per hour. Some providers also let you get monthly VMs, which can result in some cost savings if you know you will run the VM for at least a month, but if you decide to decommission the VM in the middle of the month, you will still be charged for the full month. Transient or spot VMs take advantage of unused capacity in a cloud data center. Cloud providers make this unused capacity available to users at a much lower cost than regular VMs of similar sizes. Although the transient VMs are available at a huge discount, the cloud provider can choose to deprovision them at any time and reclaim the resources for provisioning regular, higher-priced VMs. Because you run the risk of losing these VMs when capacity in the data center decreases, these VMs are great for non-production workloads such as testing and developing applications. They are also useful for running stateless workloads, testing scalability, or running big data and high-performance computing workloads at a low cost. Reserved virtual server instances allow you to reserve capacity and guarantee resources for future deployments. You reserve desired amount of virtual server capacity, provision instances from that capacity when you need them, and choose a term, such as one year or three years, for your reserved capacity. You're guaranteed this capacity within the data center of your choice for the life of the contract term. By committing to a longer term, you can also lower your costs compared to hourly or monthly instances. This can be useful when you know you require at least a certain level of cloud capacity for a specific duration. If you exceed your reserved capacity, you can always choose to supplement your unplanned usage and capacity requirements with hourly or monthly VMs. Note, however, that not all predefined VM families or configurations may be available as reserved. Dedicated hosts offer single tenant isolation. This means that only your VMs run on a given host so they can make exclusive use of full capacity and resources of the underlying hardware. When provisioning a dedicated host, you need to specify the data center and pod in which you want your host placed. You then assign instances or virtual machines to a specific host. This allows for maximum control over workload placement. 
Dedicated hosts are typically used for meeting compliance and regulatory requirements or meet specific licensing terms. Virtualization and VMs are at the center of cloud computing and provide many benefits. In the next video, we will discuss bare metal servers, what they are, and what they provide. A bare metal server is a single tenant dedicated physical server. In other words, it's dedicated to a single customer. The cloud provider actually takes the physical server and plugs it into a rack in a data center for customers. The cloud provider manages the server up to the operating system, or OS, which means if anything goes wrong with the hardware or rack connection, they will fix or replace it and then reboot the server. The customer is responsible for administering and managing everything else on the server. Bare metal servers are either pre-configured by the cloud provider to meet workload packages, or they can be custom configured as per customer specifications. This includes the processors, RAM, hard drives, specialized components, and the OS. Customers can also install their own OS and can install certain hypervisors that aren't available from the cloud provider, and thus create their own virtual machines and farms. With bare metal servers, you can also add GPUs, which are designed for accelerating scientific computation, data analytics, and rendering professional-grade virtualized graphics. Because bare metal servers are physical machines, they take longer to provision than virtual servers. Pre-configured builds of bare metal can take 20 to 40 minutes to provision, and custom builds can take around 3 or 4 hours. But these provisioning times can vary by cloud provider. As bare metal servers are dedicated for use by a single client at any given time, they tend to be more expensive than similarly sized virtual machines. Also note that unlike virtual servers, not all cloud providers provide bare metal servers. Since bare metal servers are fully customizable, they can do what a customer wants in the most demanding environments. Bare metal servers are dedicated and intended for long-term, high-performance use in highly secure and isolated environments. Clients have full access and control of bare metal servers because there's no hypervisor required. As there is no sharing underlying server hardware with other customers, bare metal servers fulfill the demanding needs of high-performance computing, or HPC, and data-intense applications that require minimal latency-related delays. These servers also excel in big data analytics applications and GPU-intensive solutions. Some workload examples that bare metal servers satisfy are ERP, CRM, AI, deep learning, and virtualization. If you use any applications that require high degrees of security control or apps that you've typically run in an on-premises environment, then a bare metal server is a good alternative in the cloud. When comparing bare metal servers to virtual servers, some of the most important considerations are found in customer need. Bare metal servers work best for CPU and I.O. intensive workloads, excel with highest performance and security, satisfy strict compliance requirements, and offer complete flexibility, control, and transparency, but come with added management and operational overhead whereas virtual servers are rapidly provisioned, provide an elastic and scalable environment, and are low cost to use. However, since they share underlying hardware with other virtual servers, they can be limited in throughput and performance. As cloud environments gain greater adoption and digital data invites rapidly increasing cybersecurity threats, building secure networks on the cloud is crucial. Let's look at how we can build a secure cloud networking presence. As one might expect, the notion of building a cloud network is not much different from deploying a network in an on-premises data center. 
The main difference stems from the fact that in the cloud, we use logical instances of networking elements as opposed to physical devices. For example, Network Interface Controllers, or NICs, would be represented by vNICs in cloud environments. In the cloud, networking functions are delivered as a service rather than in the form of rack-mounted devices. To create a network in the cloud, one starts by defining the size of the network or the IP address range that establishes the boundaries or the cloud network. Cloud networks are deployed in networking spaces that are logically separated segments of the networks using options, including Virtual Private Cloud, or VPC, that in turn can be divided into smaller segments called subnets. Logically segmented cloud networks are private carve-out of the cloud that offer customers the security of private clouds and the scalability of public clouds. Cloud resources, such as VMs or Virtual Server Instances (VSIs), storage, network connectivity, and load balancers are deployed into subnets. Using subnets allows users to deploy enterprise applications using the same multi-tier concepts used in on-premises environments. Subnets are also the main area where security is implemented in the cloud. Every subnet is protected by Access Control Lists, or ACLs, that serve as a subnet-level firewall. Within the subnet, one could create security groups that provide security at the instance level, such as VSIs. Once you build a subnet, then it is time to add some VSIs and storage to it so that you could run your applications. Let's say you have a three-tier application that requires web access VSIs, application tier VSIs, and back-end database VSIs. In this case, we would place the web-facing VSIs into one security group, the application VSIs in a second security group, while the database VSIs in a third security group. It goes without saying that the web-facing VSIs need internet access. A public gateway instance is added to the network to enable users access to the application in the internet tier. While public gateways are great for internet access to the cloud, enterprises are interested in extending their own on-premises resources to the cloud by securely connecting them using virtual private networks, or VPNs. When building many subnets and deploying several workloads, it becomes necessary to ensure that applications continue to be responsive. That is achieved with load balancers that ensure availability of bandwidth for the different applications. Enterprises with hybrid cloud environment find using dedicated high-speed connections between clouds and on-premise resources is a more secured and more efficient way than public connectivity solutions. Some cloud service providers offer such connectivity, such as IBM Cloud and its direct link solution that enables extending on-premises resources to the cloud as needed. Building a cloud network entails creating a set of logical constructs that deliver networking functionality that is akin to the data center networks that all IT professionals have come to rely on for securing their environments and ensuring high-performing business applications. In the next video, we'll look at containerization technology and why containers have become a de facto element of cloud-native computing. Containers are an executable unit of software in which application code is packaged, along with its libraries and dependencies, in common ways so that it can be run anywhere, whether it be on desktop, traditional IT, or the cloud. Containers are small, fast, and portable, and unlike virtual machines, they do not need to include a guest OS in every instance and can, instead, simply leverage the features and resources of the host OS. In the rest of this video, we will see how container-based technology really works. Hi, everyone. My name is Cy Venom, and I'm a developer advocate with IBM. Today, I want to talk about containerization. Whenever I mention containers, most people tend to default to something like Docker or even Kubernetes these days. But container technology has actually been around for quite some time. 
It's actually back in 2008 that uh, the Linux kernel introduced C groups or control groups that basically paved the way for all of the different container technologies we see today. So that includes Docker, but also things like Cloud Foundry, as well as Rocket and other container runtimes out there. Let's get started with an example. And uh, we'll say that I'm a developer and I've created a Node.js application. And I want to push it uh, into production. We'll take two different form factors to kind of explain the advantages of containerization. So let's say that first we'll talk about VMs, and then we'll talk about containers. So first things first, let's introduce some of the things that we've got here. So we've got the hardware itself, which is a big box. Um, we've got the guest, or rather the host operating system, as well as the hypervisor. The hypervisor is actually what allows us to spin up VMs. Already, we've uh, let's take a look at this shared pool of resources with the host OS and the hypervisor. We can assume that some of these resources have already been consumed. Next, let's go ahead and take this JS application and push it in. And to do that, I need a Linux VM. So let's go ahead and sketch out that Linux VM. And in this VM, there's a few things to note here. So we've got another operating system in addition to the host OS, it's going to be the guest OS, as well as some binaries and libraries. So that's one of the things about Linux VMs that even though we're working with a really lightweight application, to create that Linux VM, we have to put that guest OS in there in a set of binaries and libraries. And so that really bloats it out. In fact, you know, I think the smallest Node.js VM that I've seen out there is 400 uh, plus megabytes, whereas the, the, the Node.js runtime and app itself would be you know, under 15. Um, so we've got that, we've, and, and we go ahead and let's push that JS application into it. And just by doing that alone, we're gonna consume a set of resources. Next, let's think about scaling this out, right? So we'll create two additional copies of it. And you'll notice that even though it's the exact same application, we have to use and deploy that, uh, that separate guest OS and libraries every time. And so we'll do that three times. And by doing that, essentially we can assume that for this particular hardware, we've consumed all of the, all of the resources. And there's another thing that I haven't mentioned here, but this JS application, I developed it on my MacBook. So when I pushed it into production to get it going on the VM, I noticed that there were some issues and incompatibilities. This is the, the kind of foundation of this big he said, she said issue where things might be working on your local machine and work great, but when you try to push it into production, things start to break. And this really gets in the way of doing agile DevOps and continuous integration and delivery. That's solved when you use something like containers. There's a three-step process when kind of doing anything container-related and, and pushing uh, or creating containers. And it almost always starts with, first, some sort of a manifest. So something that describes the container itself. So um, in the Docker world, this would be something like a Docker file. In Cloud Foundry, this would be a manifest YAML. Next, what you'll do is create the actual image itself. So for the image, uh, you know, and again, uh, if you're working with something like Docker, that could be something um, that would be a Docker image. If you're working with Rocket, it would be an ACI or application container image. You know, so re regardless of, of the different containerization technologies, this process stays the same. And the last thing you end up with is an actual container itself you know, that contains all of the runtimes and libraries and binaries needed to run an application. That application runs on a very similar setup to the VMs, but what we've got on this side is, you know, again, a host operating system. But the difference here, instead of a hypervisor, we're gonna have something like a runtime engine. So um, if you're using Docker, this would be uh, the Docker engine. And, you know, different, different containerization technologies would have a different engine. Regardless, it's something that runs those containers. Again, we've got this shared pool of resources, so we can assume that that alone consumes some set of resources. Next, let's think about actually containerizing this technology. So we talked about the three-step process. We create some, you know, a Docker file, we build out the image, we push it to a registry and we have our container and we can start pushing this out as containers. The great thing is these are gonna be much more lightweight. So deploying out multiple containers since um, 
you don't have to worry about a guest OS this time. You really just have the libraries as well as the, the application itself. So we've scaled that out three times. And because we don't have to duplicate all of those uh, operating system dependencies and create bloated VMs, we actually will use less resources. So let's use a different color here. And uh, scaling that out three times, we still have a good amount of resources left. Next, let's say that my coworker decides, hey, for this JS application, let's take advantage of a third party, you know, let's say a cognitive API to do something like image recognition. So, you know, let's say that we've got our third party service and we want to access that using maybe a Python application. So he's created that service that accesses that third party uh, APIs. And with our Node.js application, we want to access that Python app to then access that, that service. If we wanted to do this in VMs, I'm really tempted to basically create a VM out of both the JS application and the Python application, because essentially that would allow me to continue to use the VMs that I have. But that's not truly cloud native, right? Because if I wanted to scale out the, the JS, but not the Python app, I wouldn't be able to if they were running in the same VM. So to do it in a truly cloud native way, essentially I would have to free up some of these resources, basically get rid of one of these VMs, and then deploy the Python application in, in it instead. Um, and you know that's not ideal. But with the container-based approach, what we can do is simply say, since we're modulars, uh, we can say, okay, just deploy one copy of the Python application. So we'll go ahead and do that. There's a different color here. Um, and that consumes a little bit more resources. And then, you know, with those, uh, those remaining resources, the great thing about container technology, that actually becomes shared between all the processes running. In fact, another advantage, if, some, uh, if these container processes aren't actually utilizing the CPU or, or memory, all of those uh, shared resources become accessible for the other uh, containers running within that, um, within that hardware. So with container-based technology, we can truly take advantage of cloud-native-based architectures. So we talked about things like portability of the containers, we talked about how it's easier to scale them out. And then overall, with this kind of three-step process and the way we push containers, it allows for more agile DevOps and continuous integration and delivery. Containers streamline development and deployment of cloud-native applications. In the next lesson, we will cover cloud storage. Cloud storage is where you save data and files in the cloud. Certain storage must be attached to a compute node before the storage can be accessed, whereas other storage types can be directly accessed either through the public internet or a dedicated private network connection. Cloud providers host, secure, manage, and maintain the cloud storage and associated infrastructure to ensure you have access to your data when you need it. Cloud storage services allow you to scale your capacity as you need, so you only pay for what you provision, usually on a per gigabyte basis. The cost of storage will vary by type, but in general, the faster the read-write speed of the storage, the higher the per gigabyte cost. Cloud storage is available in four main types, direct attached, file storage, block storage, and object storage. Direct attached storage, sometimes referred to as local storage, is storage which is presented directly to a cloud-based server and is effectively either within the host server chassis or within the same rack. This storage is fast and normally only used to store a server's operating system, although it can have other use cases. The main two reasons why direct attached storage is not so great for other uses besides to store the operating system is that it's typically ephemeral, meaning that it only lasts as long as the compute resource it's attached to. It cannot be shared with other nodes, and while you can use RAID techniques, it's not as resilient to failure as other types of storage. File storage is typically presented to compute nodes as NFS storage, NFS stands for Network File System and means that the storage is connected to compute nodes over a standard Ethernet network. 
NFS-mounted storage is commonplace, but it tends to be slower than either direct-attached storage or block storage because the data travels over an Ethernet network. It also tends to be lower cost than either direct-attached or block storage. One advantage of file storage is that it can be mounted or used on multiple servers at once. File-based storage is a simple, straightforward approach to data storage and works well for organizing data in a hierarchical folder structure that desktop users are familiar with. Block storage is presented to compute nodes using high-speed fiber connections, which means that read and write speeds are typically much faster and reliable than with file storage, making block storage suitable for use with databases and other applications where disk speed is important. You typically provision block storage in volumes, which can then be mounted onto a compute node, which it then effectively sees as another hard drive. Volumes can normally only be mounted onto one compute node at a time. With both file and block storage, you may also hear the term IOPS, or IOPS. IOPS stands for Input Output Operations Per Second and relates to the speed of the storage, or to put it another way, how quickly data can be read from or written to the storage. We'll cover this in a little more detail in a later video. Persistence is a term that is used when provisioning file or block storage and relates to what happens to the storage once the compute node it is attached to is terminated. If the storage is set to persist, then it will not be deleted along with the compute node, meaning that it and its data are preserved and available to mount onto another compute node, though you will continue to pay for the storage. You can also, in some cases, set the storage so that it is automatically deleted with the compute node that it is mounted onto. In this case, as we know, it becomes ephemeral storage. Here, you will also stop paying for the storage, but you will lose any data unless it is backed up somewhere. There are several ways to back up data in the cloud, but one way to back up both file and block storage is to take a snapshot. As the term implies, this is a point-in-time image of the storage. Snapshots are usually fast to create. They don't actually write any data, rather they create metadata, don't require downtime, and subsequent snapshots record only changes to the data. They are great for returning storage to the way it was at a particular snapshot, though note they cannot be used to recover individual files. The fourth kind of storage is object storage. This is a different type of storage in so much as it's not attached to a compute node, rather it is accessed via an API. Of all the storage types, object storage is by far the cheapest and also the slowest in terms of read and write speeds, but it is infinite in size to the end user. Unlike file and block storage, where you provision a certain storage capacity and it fills up over time, with object storage, you can keep adding files to it and it never fills up. You just pay for what you use. This makes object storage a fantastic repository for all sorts of unstructured data types, large and small, including documents, videos, logs, backups, data from IoT, application binaries, and virtual machine images. In the following videos, there will be more detailed information on the different types of storage. In this video, we're going to talk about file storage in greater detail. Like direct attached storage, file storage must be attached to a compute node before it can be accessed and have data stored on it. However, File storage can be less expensive, more resilient to failure, and involve lesser disk management and maintenance for you as the user to do, as compared to direct attached storage. You can also provision much larger amounts of file storage and present it as a disk to a server. File storage is mounted from remote storage appliances. That is, the physical disks are contained in a separate specialized piece of hardware, and they are then connected to the compute node via the underlying infrastructure in the data center. These storage appliances are not only extremely resilient to failure, the data is also far more secure in them as these storage appliances offer services such as encryption in transit and encryption at rest. These appliances are all managed by the service provider. 
file storage is mounted to compute nodes via an Ethernet network, the same kind of network that you might receive email or browse the internet over, although this Ethernet network is normally dedicated to the task. This means it can sometimes be referred to as network attached storage, network file storage, or simply NFS. One of the issues with Ethernet networks is that their speed can vary. The more loaded an Ethernet network is, the more likely it becomes that its speed or bandwidth will be affected. Of course, cloud providers build their storage networks to handle very high volumes of traffic, but even so, consistent speed cannot be guaranteed. Therefore, file storage tends to be used for workloads where consistently high network speeds are not a requirement. In terms of workloads, file storage can typically be mounted onto more than one compute node at a time, where the mounted disk or volume looks just like another drive on the compute node. The ability for file storage to be mounted to multiple compute nodes at a time make it an ideal solution where some sort of common storage is required. For example, a departmental file share, a landing zone for incoming files that need to be processed by an application, or a repository of files that a web service might access. In these applications, the potential variance in the speed of the connecting network is not really an issue. Of course, where cost is an issue, you can use file storage for other applications, such as databases, but the trade-off is speed. When you provision file storage, one consideration you need to take into account is the IOPS capacity of the storage. IOPS stands for Input Output Operations Per Second and refers to the speed at which the disks can write and read data. Note, this is not the speed of the network between the storage and the compute node. The higher the IOPS value, the faster the speed of the underlying disk. A higher IOPS will also normally cost more. Understanding IOPS is important because if the IOPS value is too low for your application, the storage can become a bottleneck and cause your application to run slowly. Alternately, if the IOPS is too high, you will probably be paying more than you need to for your storage. For example, a file share may be mounted on 30 different compute nodes and an application writes and requests data to and from that share 60 times per minute. You can average that out to one operation per second. With this simple example, you can see that each application has different IOPS requirements. In the next video, we're going to talk about block storage and how it compares with file storage and when you would typically use one over the other. In this video, we will discuss block storage and how it compares to file storage in the cloud. Block storage breaks files into chunks or blocks of data and stores each block separately under a unique address. Like direct attached storage and file storage, block storage also must be attached to a compute node before it can be utilized for your workloads. Block storage, like file storage, can be mounted from remote storage appliances, making it extremely resilient to failure and keeping data far more secure in them on account of encryption in transit and encryption at rest services available on these appliances. Block storage is mounted as a volume to compute nodes using a dedicated network of fibers through which signals move at the speed of light. These fiber optic networks are more expensive to build than the Ethernet ones which deliver file storage, which is one reason why block storage tends to have a higher price point. However, since the traffic is moving faster and with speed consistency, they are perfect for workloads that need low latency storage to work effectively. In terms of workloads, it is important to note that unlike file storage, which can be mounted onto 80 compute nodes or more, block storage is normally mounted onto only one compute node at a time. Since these disks run at a consistent high speed, they are perfect for workloads that need consistently fast storage, such as databases and mail servers. Block storage is not suitable for workloads where there needs to be some level of disk sharing between compute nodes. For block storage, as it is for file storage, you need to take the IOPS capacity of the storage into account. 
Most cloud providers will allow you to specify IOPS characteristics when you provision storage and in some cases adjust the IOPS of your storage as you need. So if the requirements or usage behavior of an application changes, you can adjust accordingly. So, to summarize the commonalities and differences between these two storage types, lock and file storage is taken from appliances which are maintained by the service provider. Both are normally highly available and resilient and will often include data encryption at rest and in transit. File storage is attached to a compute node using an Ethernet network, so it is sometimes called network attached or NFS storage. File storage is very reliable, but the speed of the connecting network can vary based on load. Block storage is attached via a high-speed fiber network, which is very reliable and consistent. File storage can be attached to multiple compute nodes at once. Block storage can only be attached to one node at a time. File storage is a good choice where file shares are required, where workloads do not require lightning-fast connectivity to storage, or where cost is a factor. Block storage is a good choice when supporting an application that needs consistent fast access to disk, such as databases. Remember to consider the IOPS requirements of the application when provisioning either file or block storage. In the next video, we'll start to look at object storage. In this video, we're going to start to understand what object storage is, how data is stored in object storage, and how it differs from the more traditional storage types such as file and block storage. The first thing to note about object storage is that you do not connect it to a particular compute node in order to use it. Instead, you provision an object storage service instance and use an API, or Application Program Interface, to upload, download, and manage your data. This means you can directly use object storage with anything that you can call an API and you don't need an underlying compute node. The second thing to note about object storage is that it's less expensive than other cloud storage options. Its per gigabyte cost is typically a couple of US cents per month, and in some cases, even less, depending on the storage tier used. More on storage tiers later. The third and possibly most important thing to note about object storage is that it's effectively infinite. With file and block storage, you specify the size of the storage you want in gigabytes or terabytes and then pay a fee based on the size you provisioned. With object storage, you just consume the storage you need and pay per gigabyte cost for what you use. You can keep uploading files and the storage will never run out. So when would you use object storage? Well, object storage is great for storing large amounts of unstructured data. By unstructured, this means that the data is not stored in any kind of hierarchical folder or directory structure. Object storage uses buckets, and objects are stored within these buckets in a structurally flat way. A bucket is a bit like a folder, in the sense that you can give them meaningful names and of course have different buckets for different object types, but you cannot place a bucket within a bucket. When an object is placed in a bucket, it also has some metadata, data about the data, added to it, such as an object ID. This metadata helps applications to both locate and access the object, as well as provide information on the time that the data was stored or last accessed. When you create a bucket, you don't need to provide or define any sizing information. The bucket will just hold the data that you place inside it and the service provider ensures that there is sufficient storage capacity available. Buckets can hold as little as a few bytes of data, right up to multiple petabytes, and you can build up the amount of data stored as slowly or quickly as you like, as well as shrink it back down again. The service provider also takes care of resilience and making sure that the object storage solution is highly available. Some cloud providers offer different types of buckets within different levels of resilience. For example, they offer buckets which are resilient, but the data is only stored in one data center. 
This is a good option where data needs to reside in a particular geographical location or in situations where high availability is less of an issue. They will then offer buckets which are highly available across regions where the data is stored multiple times in different data centers or zones in the same region or even in multiple regions. These options usually cost more, but they provide both the highest level of resilience as well as availability for your data. Object storage has a very flat storage structure, which we'll explain in the next lesson. This data can be anything from text files to audio files and video files, from IoT data to virtual machine images, from backup files to data archives. Pretty much any data which is static and where fast read and write speeds are not necessary would make a good fit for object storage. Object storage would, however, not be suitable for running operating systems, nor applications such as databases or anything else where the contents of the files changes. So, to summarize what we have learned in this lesson, object storage is used to store files, or objects, which are static. The data that you can store using object storage can be anything from text files to audio and video files, from IoT data to virtual machine images, from backup files to data archives. You cannot run operating systems or other applications, such as databases, using object storage. Objects are stored in buckets. You can have multiple buckets, but you cannot place buckets within buckets. You do not need to specify a size for a bucket. You can just use as little or as much space as you need. Many providers offer different types of buckets with different charges for each. Some are based on resilience and availability, while others are based on the frequency at which the objects inside are accessed. In the next video, we'll be diving into object storage data tiers and object storage APIs. In this video, we're going to look more closely at object storage data tiers and object storage APIs. Object storage buckets also have storage tiers or classes associated with them, and these tiers are based on how frequently the data is accessed. A standard tier bucket is where you would store objects that are frequently accessed. This tier tends to have the highest per gigabyte cost associated with it. A vault or archive tier is where you might store documents that are only accessed perhaps only once or twice a month or less, and this will be offered at a lower storage cost, whereas there may also be cold vault tier where you would store data that is typically accessed only once or twice a year. This storage often costs just a fraction of a US cent per gigabyte per month. Often, you can also set up automatic archiving rules for your data, meaning that if an object isn't accessed for a period of time, it will automatically be moved to a cheaper storage tier. The rule uses some of the object's metadata to determine when it should be archived. Note that object storage does not come with IOPS options. Object storage tends to be very slow in comparison with file or block storage, where downloads typically take seconds, if not longer, to complete. Where providers offer cold vault buckets, data retrieval from these tiers can sometimes even take hours because the storage is kept offline. If your application needs fast access to files, then object storage may not be a good option. We've mentioned that object storage is priced per gigabyte used, but there can also be other costs related to retrieval of the data. These costs are similarly low, but access charges can be higher for data that is in a vault or cold vault tiers, so it is important to ensure that the data is in the correct tier based on its frequency of access. Object storage does not need to be attached to a compute node for you to access it. Rather, you access object storage through an Application Program Interface, or API. The most common API for object storage is called the S3 API, which is a standard based on the S3 object storage offered by AWS. Many providers offer APIs to their object storage, which is S3 compatible, which is useful because it means developers can write code which is able to access multiple vendors' object storage. The API itself is an HTTP-based RESTful API or RESTful web service. The API call allows applications to manage object storage and buckets as well as put, upload, or get 
download objects to and from them. Object storage is not just for new applications, but can be used to meet requirements for existing ones. It can also be used as an effective solution for backup and disaster recovery as a replacement for off-site tape-based solutions, reducing the time to restore data. Many backup packages now include the ability to backup data up into the cloud using object storage. Object storage is more efficient than tape backup solutions, which require tapes that need to be physically loaded into and removed from tape drives and moved off-site for geographical redundancy. So, to summarize what we have learned in this lesson, object storage has different tiers, with different charges for each. Some are based on the frequency at which the objects inside are accessed. Object storage is priced per gigabyte of storage used per month, plus some charges for data retrieval. Object storage is much cheaper than file or block storage. Object storage is very slow in comparison with file and block storage. You can often create rules which allow the automatic archiving of objects to cheaper tiers when they are infrequently accessed. Object storage is accessed using an API. Many object storage providers have an S3 compatible API, which means developers can create code that will work against multiple vendor object storage solutions. Object storage in the cloud offers an effective backup and disaster recovery solution. In the next video, we will be covering Content Delivery Network, or CDN, which is driven by object storage. A Content Delivery Network, or CDN, is a distributed server network that delivers temporarily stored, or cached, copies of website content to users, based on the user's geographic location. A CDN stores this content in distributed locations and reduces the distance between your website visitors and your website server. In the rest of the video, we'll learn more about content delivery networks. Hi, I'm Ryan Sumner. I'm a Chief Network Architect with IBM Cloud, and today I'm going to help you answer what is a content delivery network. So in short, a Content Delivery Network, or CDN, is a service that accelerates internet content delivery. So in other words, the main benefit of a CDN is that it makes your website faster. So before I get into describing to you how it accomplishes that and some of the other benefits, first I want to talk to you about uh, some of the challenges that we have where we have users all around the world, but we don't have servers all around the world and the experience that those users have due to that dynamic. So I've got a simple diagram here showing a server hosted down in Dallas. This is my website. And then I have users all around the world. So in Sydney, I might have five. In London, I've got five. New York, I might have 10. LA, I might have 10. So I've got 30 users around the world that are accessing my server and my website down in Dallas. So let's you know, kind of follow a set of these users in their journey. Now let's look at their users down in Sydney. They make a request to the website. They've got an 8,600 mile hike to Dallas and then an 8,600 mile hike back. The amount of time that that takes is usually measured in, measured in milliseconds and just that round trip might be about 170 milliseconds. For our users up in London, that might be about 100 milliseconds. Our users in, in, in New York City can probably experience about a 40, 40 millisecond uh, round trip time, and over in LA, about 30. So as you can see, the further you're away, the, the longer it takes, ultimately, the slower the website will be for you. So this is where the, the CDN comes into play, and this is how it actually accomplishes the, um, the increase in speed, which is by reducing the amount of distance between the user and the content, or the server providing the content. So what it does by doing that is, is it places these content delivery ne network endpoints in as many locations around the world as possible, and in our case, we're going to assume we've got one in just about every location where our users exist. So um, now when the user in Sydney or London or New York City or LAA tries to access some content, 
it's first retrieved by the content delivery network service and then distributed around the world. So we have a single request down to the Dallas server. It's now then distributed all around the world. And our users in London now, instead of going all the way to Dallas, they're able to retrieve that content directly from their closest geographical location, drastically reducing the amount of time that it takes to retrieve that content. So as you can see here, it's very basic how a CDN is able to provide the benefits of, um, uh, to the end user by reducing the amount of time that it takes to deliver the service. But what you're not seeing here is an indirect benefit is the reduction in the amount of traffic that actually hits the Dallas server. So the indirect benefit is that you actually see a, um, a reduction in the load or a reduction in the amount of capacity that you need in Dallas to serve all these users. So another indirect benefit, because of there's this much less validity and so much, you know, so much less stuff happening in Dallas, because all these users aren't having to make, this, make these trips, and I'm also not having to communicate with, with users so far away, the Dallas environment may also see an increase in uptime. And then lastly, because the users are not really directly communicating with the servers down in Dallas, you have the indirect benefit of an increase in security through obscurity. So it's pretty basic to understand how a CDN works um, in the end to provide a better benefit to the end user. Hybrid cloud, as we covered in the previous lesson, is a computing environment that connects an organization's on-premise, private cloud, and third-party public cloud into a single infrastructure for running the organization's applications. Multi-cloud is a cloud adoption strategy that embraces a mix of cloud models from different service providers, public, private, and managed, across infrastructure, platform, or software services. For example, a business may consume email as a service from one provider, a CRM application from another, and infrastructure from yet another provider. So essentially, a hybrid multi-cloud implies you are able to leverage the, the best of cloud models and services across different service providers and have your applications and workloads working seamlessly across multiple different clouds. In this video, we will look at some use cases for why a business may want to use a hybrid multi-cloud approach. In this video, I want to touch on a few of those use cases for why a business may want to use hybrid or multi-cloud. Let's start with the basic one, cloud scaling. Now, most of us are probably familiar with this. It's one of the main reasons for adopting the cloud. Now, let's say we have a flower delivery service that is able to hit a certain bottom line of users. They have on-premise infrastructure, and it can hit a certain amount of user load. So visualizing this here throughout uh, a calendar year, you can imagine that their load maybe goes up and down and responds to specific holidays. Now, to hit those peaks, they could scale up their on-premise architecture, but that's met with upfront costs and costs of upkeep. Now instead, what they'll instead do is take advantage of cloud. That allows them to scale up in response to that load and then automatically deprovision resources when they no longer need them. Now this concept is kind of general to cloud computing, not just hybrid or multi-cloud. But that brings me to my next topic. And here we're going to be talking about how it can be used to build a composite cloud. So essentially, this is going to be applications that are spread across multiple cloud environments. So back to the flower delivery service, let's say they have on-premise architecture that allows them to run three major components of their app. So let's say they have the web UI, uh, they have some billing APIs, as well as a rewards framework. Now, let's say that this service is actually based in EU and their European customers are happy. 
but for their North American or American customers, spe uh, specifically around you know, Veterans Day or Thanksgiving, they're noticing that the system is bogging down. And so they decide to take advantage of a hybrid cloud or multi-cloud architecture by composing their application across multiple cloud environments. So they'll take advantage of data centers in America, and essentially they've identified that although the rewards framework can stay on-prem in their European side, they want to move the billing and the UI capabilities over. So they'll move just those two to a cloud platform of their choice in a North American or American data center. This kind of allows them to scale up portions in response to, say, American holidays while keeping their EU portions individually scaled. So in this example, the flower delivery service is able to take advantage of scaling at a global level by using the hybrid or multi-cloud architecture. Next, let's talk about the airline or travel industry. So, we can first start with an example of modernization. Now, in the past, we've seen that you know, reservation systems may have been difficult to work with or you might have had to call in, but almost all, all the airline companies now have a mobile application. So most of the time, and we've actually found that it's about, um, in general, not just in the travel industry, but 80% of all enterprise applications are actually still on-prem. And that's likely the case in this industry as well. So in this specific example, let's say they have a reservation system that's running on-prem. But to create new experiences for their end users, let's say they've created a mobile application. That mobile app, of course, has a mobile backend that's maybe running in a public cloud. And that, in turn, works with the reservation service. So again, the mobile app can hit the mobile backend, and that, in turn, works with the reservation capabilities. So in this case, they've modernized and new user experiences are possible. But let's take that a step further. Now a source for a lot of dissatisfaction for users is whenever their flights are delayed. So when a flight is delayed, they may have to rebook new flights. The solution is almost always the same. The traveler wants to get to his destination in the easiest way possible. So what airline industries have been doing is take advantage of the cloud to create maybe a recommendation feature. So it allows them to book new flights as soon as a delay is recommended or as soon as a delay is incurred. And that's gonna connect up to that mobile backend service, allowing users to be able to book flights through their phone the second a flight is delayed. This not only improves the bottom line for the airline industry, but leads to happier users. So that's one way the modernization has been done. Next, let's take it even a step further and talk about data and AI. For data and AI, the airline industry has been taking advantage of lots of historical data. So over the decades that a company has been around, let's say they have historical data of when um, unplanned maintenance has happened on, on their airline. In fact, 30% of all delay time in the, in the airline industry is actually when unplanned maintenance happens. So by taking advantage of, let's say, machine learning or AI capabilities, they could hook into all of the legacy data that they have, large volumes, and connect them up to machine learning and AI capabilities. This allows airline industries to take advantage of predictive analytics and get insights before errors or uh, before the unplanned maintenance ever occurs. This again improves their bottom line, leading to happier users and a more efficient airline industry. Now, today we talked about four major use cases for hybrid and multi-cloud platforms. So cloud scaling and composite cloud in the uh, flower delivery service, as well as modernized and data and AI for the airline industry. Another reason for adopting hybrid multi-cloud strategy is to prevent lock-in to a specific vendor's cloud platform and having flexibility of being able to move workloads from one cloud platform to another as the need arises. In the next video, we will understand what a microservices architecture is, its features, benefits, and use cases. Microservices architecture is an approach in which a single application is composed of many loosely coupled and independently deployable smaller components or services. 
These services typically have their own stack running on their own containers. They communicate with one another over a combination of APIs, event streaming, and message brokers. For a business, what this means is that application components can be developed and updated more efficiently by multiple developers working independently. Teams can use different stacks and runtime environments for different components. Components facing too much load can be scaled independently, reducing the waste and cost associated with having to scale entire applications. In this video, we'll look at how microservices have shaped application development and also look at a use case that illustrates microservices in action. The way developers work to build applications is changing. In the past, software was built as large monolithic applications where a team of developers would take months to construct a large application built on a common code base. These developers would write every part of the application from start to finish. Now, after decades of software development, there are vast amounts of code already out there that developers can use as the base of an application, meaning they no longer have to create every line of code from scratch. Cloud development platforms provide developers with an ecosystem of code that can be easily and securely integrated into applications. Now, instead of building one huge application on one team, developers break into small, independent teams where they write smaller amounts of code called microservices. Microservices break down large applications into their core functions. For example, search, recommendations, customer ratings, or product catalogs. Each is developed independently of one another, yet work together on the cloud development platform to create a functioning application. A container is the distribution method for each microservice, meaning it delivers the code where it needs to go. Containers are plug and play, so if one microservice isn't working for an application, developers can take it out and put in a different one without disrupting how the rest of the app functions. Check out microservices in action with Ron. Ron is a soccer fan who uses an online streaming media service called Dream Game. Last night, he missed watching his team play their crucial semi-final match. Luckily, he can watch the match tonight on Dream Game. When he logs in, he sees the most popular content among all Dream Game users. After some searching, he finds the match he's looking for. What he would really like is to find his game with one click. Luckily, the Dream Game development team is using microservices to develop a better user experience for viewers like Ron. The first microservice is a content catalog, housing the millions of games that Dream Game offers. The small team of developers organizes each piece of content with metadata that describes them. This metadata feeds into a second microservice, the search function, which ensures that Ron's search results are captured and compared to the Dream Game catalog. The third microservice, Recommendations, captures data about the most popular content among all Dream Game users. This is what generates the homepage that Ron saw when he first logged in. These three microservices are all in their separate containers, ready to join the application. But before they can work together, they have to find one another. They do this by using something called Service Discovery, which creates a roadmap for these and many other microservices to communicate. When microservices find each other, they communicate using an application programming interface or an API. So when Ron searches for his favorite soccer team, the search microservice is communicating to the content catalog in an API about what Ron is looking for. Now back to the goal at hand, to get Ron to his soccer game with just one click. The development team working on the recommendations microservice is updating the code, adding an analytics algorithm Using analytics, the recommendations microservice will compare Ron's viewing history and preferences to popular content among other users, including soccer fans and viewers in Ron's geographical region and demographic. Since the developers didn't need to create the code from scratch, they are able to deploy this new functionality in a matter of days. These updates happen behind the scenes as the rest of the microservice containers function normally. The next time Ron checks Dream Game, instead of just seeing the most popular or newest content, he sees a personalized playlist that will continue to refine itself as the system learns more about his viewing habits and preferences. The result? Ron finds his favorite team's latest game right away. The microservice approach lets developers quickly innovate applications in parallel and lets users like Ron focus on the things that really interest them. And when those interests are changing and growing faster every day, microservices help businesses keep up and grow with their customers. 
In the next video, we will talk about serverless computing, its features, benefits, and some use cases. Serverless is an approach to computing that offloads responsibility for common infrastructure management tasks, such as scaling, scheduling, patching, and provisioning application stacks to cloud providers, allowing developers to focus their time and effort on the code and business logic specific to their applications or process. Serverless doesn't mean there are no servers, only that the management of the underlying physical or virtual servers is removed from their users. The serverless computing environment allocates resources as needed for the applications. Let's look at some key attributes that distinguish serverless computing from other compute models. The serverless model requires no provisioning of servers, installation of application stacks and software, or operation of the infrastructure by the developer. Serverless computing runs code only on demand on a per-request basis, scaling transparently with the number of requests being served. Serverless enables end users to pay only for resources being used, never paying for idle capacity, which is unlike virtual servers on the cloud, where end users pay for VMs as long as they are running, even if idle. Effectively, serverless abstracts the infrastructure away from developers. Code is executed as individual functions where each function runs inside a stateless container. No prior execution context is required to serve a request. And with each new request, a new instance of the function is invoked. Let's look at a scenario. You could, for example, have a serverless platform between the front end of your website and your storage layer running individual functions. The serverless app could be translating text files and storing it in a cloud-based storage service. Using the front end of your website, you send text files to a serverless app. The app creates translations in different languages, and then stores these translated files in a cloud storage, and sends you their links back to you. Some of the key serverless computing services today include IBM Cloud Functions, which is based on Apache OpenWhisk, AWS Lambda, and Microsoft Azure functions. It is important to note that serverless may not be the best fit for all applications or scenarios. You need to evaluate application characteristics and ensure that the application is aligned to serverless architecture patterns. Applications that qualify for a serverless architecture include some of the following characteristics. Short running stateless functions, seconds or minutes, seasonal workloads with varying off-peak and peaks, production volumetric data that shows too much idle time, event-based processing or asynchronous request processing for implementing use cases, microservices that can be built as functions that are stateless. Serverless architectures are well-suited for use cases around data and event processing, IoT, microservices, and mobile backends. Given its inherent and automatic scaling, rapid provisioning, and a pricing model that does not change for idle time, supporting microservices architecture has become one of the most common use cases of serverless computing today. Serverless is well-suited to working with structured text, audio, image, and video data around tasks such as data enrichment, transformation, validation and cleansing, PDF processing, audio normalization, thumbnail generation, and video transcoding. Parallel tasks such as data search and processing and genome processing are also well-suited to be run on a serverless runtime. Serverless is also well-suited for working with all sorts of data stream ingestions, including business data streams, IoT sensor data, log data, and financial market data. And finally, let's look at some challenges worth considering about serverless. Serverless workloads are designed to scale up and down in response to workload. But for workloads characterized by long running processes, managing a traditional server environment might be simpler and more cost-effective. 
The serverless application architecture can be vendor dependent, and so there is a potential for vendor lock-in, particularly involving platform capabilities such as authentication, scaling, monitoring, or configuration management. Because serverless architectures scale up and down in response to workload, they also sometimes need to start up from zero to serve a new request. For certain applications, this delay isn't much of an impact, but for something like a low latency financial application, this delay wouldn't be acceptable. Simply put, a cloud-native application is an application developed from the outset to work only in the cloud environment, or an existing app that has been refactored and reconfigured with cloud-native principles. A cloud-native application consists of microservices working together as a whole to comprise an application, yet each can be independently scaled and iterated through automation and orchestration processes. These microservices are often packaged in containers, which are executable units of software in which the application code is packaged along with its libraries and dependencies so that it can be run from anywhere. The independence enables frequent, iterative improvement of cloud-native applications without disrupting the experience of end-users. Cloud-native applications are unlike traditional or monolithic applications that are built out of one huge piece of software. Applications that tightly couple the user interface, business logic layer, and data layer. Let's take the example of how a cloud-native application might be used on a travel website. Each topic covered by the site, flights, hotels, cars, specials, is its own microservice. Each microservice may roll out new features independent of the other microservices. Specials and discounts can also scale out independently. While the travel site is presented to customers as a whole, each microservice remains independent and can be scaled or updated as needed without affecting other services. Whether creating a new cloud-native application or modernizing an existing application, developers adhere to a consistent set of development principles. Follow the microservices architecture approach by breaking applications down to single-function microservices. Rely on containers for maximum flexibility, scalability, and portability. Adopt agile methods that speed the creation and improvement process through quick iterative updates based on user feedback. In this video, we'll take a closer look at the key concepts of Cloud Native, its benefits, and use cases. Hi, I'm Andrea Crawford, and I'm with IBM Cloud. So today we're gonna to talk about cloud native apps. In the heritage world, we have our lumpy monolithic apps. And in the new world, we have our microservices living on the cloud. If we take a look at this diagram here, we see we have cloud infrastructure. This is your private, your public, and your enterprise infrastructure. Cloud native apps apply to hybrid and multi-cloud situations. We also have our scheduling and orchestration layer. This layer is all about control planes like our Kubernetes. We also have our application and data services layer. This layer is all about backing services and being able to integrate our application code with existing services that may be available on other clouds or even on-premise. We have our application runtimes. These are what were traditionally or conventionally known as middleware. And over here, well, that's where we have our cloud native apps. This is the sweet spot right up here. So our application code is actually designed, built, and delivered very differently for cloud native than it would be for conventional monolithic lumpy apps over here. So let's talk a little bit about why cloud native apps can actually leverage benefits like 
enabling innovation, business agility, and most importantly, from a technology perspective, the commoditization of this solution stack over here. So as time has progressed and technologies have matured and emerged, a lot of the services are actually being refactored lower down in this stack. This means that core services are starting to have a lower center of gravity, freeing up innovation at this level over here. So what are our use cases for when to build a cloud native app? Star everything. Everything that lives in the cloud should have a cloud native app design and approach. This means our application code needs to be instrumented with things like standardized logging, standardized events, and being able to match those logging and events to a standard catalog that multiple microservices and cloud native apps can use. The last thing we want to do is have our development squads have to figure out what their log and event messages should be. Let's standardize that because we want to be able to commoditize that as well. We also need to have things like distributed tracing. When we get over into the microservices world over here, we have a lot of moving parts. This means we're going to need to leverage services core to the system like load balancing, service discovery, and routing. These are the kinds of things that are commoditized in this layer here with things like Istio and with the emergence of newer projects like Knative. And so, if we were to recognize the benefits for cloud native apps and to sum it all up, we are all about enterprise and engineering at scale. In the next video, we'll take a look at DevOps. Development teams need to design, develop, deliver, and run software as reliably and efficiently as possible. Operations teams need to identify and resolve problems as soon as possible by monitoring, predicting failure, managing the environment, and fixing issues. Combining development and operations with the ability to monitor and analyze and optimize bottlenecks gives us DevOps a collaborative approach where business owners and the development, operations, and quality assurance teams collaborate to continuously deliver software. A DevOps approach applies agile and lean thinking principles to all stakeholders in an organization who develop, operate, or benefit from the business's software systems, including customers, suppliers, partners. By extending lean principles across the software supply chain, DevOps capabilities improve productivity through accelerated customer feedback cycles, unified measurements and collaboration across an enterprise, and reduced overhead, duplication, and rework. Using the DevOps approach, developers can produce software in short iterations on a continuous delivery schedule of new features and bug fixes in rapid cycles and businesses can seize market opportunities and reduce time to include customer feedback in their products. The DevOps process involves continuous delivery, which is about delivering small, well-designed, high-quality increments of software to customers, continuous integration, creating packaged builds of the code changes released as immutable images, where immutable implies that when modifications are needed, the entire component is replaced with an upgraded version continuous deployment, which involves progressing each new packaged build through the deployment lifecycle as rapidly as possible, continuous monitoring, with tools that help developers understand the performance and availability of their applications even before they are deployed to production, delivery pipeline, which is an automated sequence of steps that involves the stages of ideation, coding, building, deploying, managing, and continuous improvement, which loops back to the ideation phase in the delivery pipeline. While DevOps can apply to applications anywhere, there is especially a compelling case for DevOps when it comes to cloud-ready and cloud-native applications. 
With its near limitless compute power and available data and application services, cloud computing platforms come with their own risks and challenges. DevOps tools, practices, and processes are helping tackle some of the complexities and challenges posed by the cloud and allowing solutions to be delivered quickly and reliably. Let's look at some core capabilities that DevOps provides to help building and running applications in the cloud a lot more manageable. DevOps best practices make it possible to programmatically provision servers, build middleware, install application code, and fully automate the installation process in a way that is documented, repeatable, verifiable, and traceable. Application deployments often involve considerable complexity. The DevOps practices of continuous integration and continuous deployment help create a fully automated deployment pipeline, which is important all through the application development lifecycle. Cloud-native applications form a complex, distributed system with multiple moving parts, independent tech stacks, and rapid release cycles. DevOps principles are essential to define how people work together to build, deploy, and manage applications in a cloud-native approach. With the DevOps best practices of automated provisioning and continuous deployment, developers, quality professionals, and other stakeholders can test in low-cost, production-like test environments that were previously not available, enhancing both productivity and quality. When systems are compromised or struggling to recover from natural disasters, DevOps best practices make it possible to rebuild these systems quickly and reliably. DevOps provides a powerful set of principles, practices, and tools to realize the full potential of cloud-native computing, as well as for modernizing existing applications to leverage cloud benefits. In the next video, we'll learn about application modernization. Many organizations have huge investments in existing applications that are often siloed in legacy systems and are very difficult and expensive to update and maintain. Modernizing these applications can unlock great benefits for these organizations, such as accelerating their digital transformations, enabling them to take advantage of new technologies and services, and becoming more responsive to their customers' needs and changing market dynamics. Cloud computing is one of the three main ingredients in application modernization. In the rest of this video, we will see how and what else application modernization entails. Hi, I'm Eric Minnick with IBM Cloud, and I want to talk about application modernization and three huge transformations that have been going on together. Um, so we've got three things going on, they're interrelated, and this is what we're seeing, this change in how we're doing architecture, infrastructure, and our ways of working, how we deliver. And if we go back in time a little bit, you know, we saw applications that were very monolithic, uh, they were running on physical servers, and we used waterfall style development where we'd have long plans and we'd say, okay, this is going to be our planning phase or development phase or testing phase. And we could plan out a year as a, a project. Uh, and, and that's really what we've gone away from. So if we look at how most organizations are working today, um, architecturally, they've got some sort of distributed architecture. Um, it's usually related to like a service-oriented architecture, the, the big buzzwords a, a few years ago. Um, but it's some sort of distributed architecture. We have a bunch of web services, they're talking to each other, we've got some databases on the back end, um, and then some front ends that kind of go through all that. On an infrastructure level, uh, they're running on some sort of a virtual machine, right? So we said, we could probably do better than having to order a new server every time we have a new service. Let's virtualize this stuff. And we need a little more density along the way. And from a, a way of working, you know, agile development, pretty normal. And then trying to figure out a little bit of what happens downstream. So this kind of takes us up to 
where a lot of teams are today, um, but not really where they're going. And so if we look at kind of that next phase, uh, we're taking another pass at this service-oriented architecture and really shrinking the sizes of the services, taking advantage of the more dynamic infrastructure we have. Um, and we're calling these now microservices, right? Microservices. So we've got a microservice architecture. So very small, very focused services moving away from a lot of the heavyweight XML-based communication we saw in SOA um, towards more REST-based communication, things like that. But same idea, let's keep breaking into smaller and smaller pieces. We have uh, more independence of what we ship, uh, more rigor in saying this service needs to be independent from another service so I can change these things by themselves. On the infrastructure side, um, Cloud. Cloud's pretty popular. And this could be public cloud. This could also be private cloud. I, I'm painting uh, with a very broad brush when I say cloud here. And then from a delivery and a, a way of working, um, we could say that DevOps is, is really key. And I, I would include in this approaches like site reliability engineering, SRE. Um, more the, the ways of working we have today. Now, that, that's fine and interesting, but what do these things have to do with each other? Um, and I'd argue that what we're really seeing is modernization in how the applications um, are delivered and how they're built, uh, what they are. Um, and while you could walk into any large enterprise today and you'll find someone who says, we are going through a cloud trans uh, transformation. And you'll often find someone who says, yes, I'm in charge of leading the DevOps transformation. And you'll walk into enterprise architecture and they'll say, yes, we are pushing microservice architectures. I individuals think that they're going through three separate transformations, but they're really tied, right? If I'm doing microservices, right, and I have new microservices all the time, and in order to get a new microservice up and running, I'm over here and I have to order a new physical server and then rack and stack it a couple months later. I'm not gonna get any time to market benefits. Um, the resilience benefits that I'm gonna normally look for from microservices are gonna be modest at best. Right? Microservices want cloud infrastructure. You wanna be able to say, I've got a new microservice, let me put it in a container and just run that container right now and scale that dynamically. Similarly, cloud really likes running microservices. Right? The benefits of being able to dynamically scale are really cool when you have a lot of small things that you might need few of or a lot of. It's not as interesting when I've got a monolith that, that isn't even distributed. How do I scale that? I get a bigger cloud server? And then all of this is kind of baking in this idea of speed and resiliency. And DevOps brings that together, right? The developers who have always wanted speed, the operations people who've always wanted that resiliency, they're going to be programming that cloud, right? The programmable infrastructure the cloud provides needs operations people who understand resiliency, but bring some of that development skill in. And to really take advantage of these new infrastructures, the, the new architectures, you need these new ways of working. And you also are gonna say, if this is gonna give me time to market benefits, I can't be back here and say, yeah, no, we've got a, a one year project plan that we're just gonna execute. I need to be able to be more agile and adapt in my planning and my responsiveness to the business. I need to better um, wire up my applications so they can be more easily monitored and, and more resilient. So we have to have the application in a way that it knows when one of these services is failing and we can spin up another. So this is really, uh, for me, fascinating. 
that you walk into these organizations everywhere and they're undergoing these three different transformations, but they're always doing them together. And when they don't, it doesn't quite work. So you've got these three transformations going on at once. And you'll hear us talk a lot about application modernization, right? Um, see that written across the top here. And when I think of application modernization, I think it's just this. It's this transformation right here. Going from these kind of monoliths or service-oriented architectures to microservices, adopting cloud, modernizing our ways of working towards DevOps and SRE, that's AppMod, right? And it's a really exciting time and it's really great when you're able to go after it in a holistic fashion. Hi, I'm Nataraj Nagaratnam, and I'm from IBM Cloud. Traditionally, when you deploy an application, you have the entire data center, the servers that you run, you're responsible for all of it. In the cloud model, that's a shared responsibility between you and the cloud provider. In a shared responsibility model, you need to rethink security on what your responsibility is and what cloud provider's responsibility is. Let's take platform as a service as an example. When you look at PaaS, you are building applications, uh, migrating data to the cloud, and building applications running on, on the cloud. So you're responsible for securing the applications, the workload, and the data, while the cloud provider is responsible for managing the security of the platform so that it's compliant, it's secured from the perspective of network, the uh, platform on down in terms of managing the containers, the runtime, and the isolation so that you have your own space within the platform. Whereas if you are adopting and migrating workloads to the cloud and you're using infrastructure as a service, then the cloud provider manages hypervisor on down if you are using virtual servers. Or if you are using bare metal, then you can completely control everything on up from the operating system, the virtual servers that you run, and the data you bring it on. So it's very important to understand the adoption model, whether you're consuming IaaS, or PaaS, or if you're consuming SaaS, where the cloud provider manages all the applications and the security of it, and you worry about the data that you bring in and plan accordingly. So that's a very important thing because it's part of understanding your responsibility in ultimately managing the risk and compliance of the workloads and the data that you bring to cloud. Now, let's talk about architecture. When you build applications and migrate applications and modernize your apps, let's start with data. With all the risk that you deal with, and the kind of data matters. Is it confidential data? Is it public data or sensitive data that may deal with private information? Consider all those factors and make a secure design around what your data security architecture should be. Make sure you have data at rest encryption so that the data is always encrypted, whether you use a database as a service, object store as a service, or other ways to store data like block storage. Encryption is for amateurs. If you think about key management, that's for professionals. So having more control of your keys provide you the ability in the context of shared responsibility model that you own your data, you have complete control of your data. So as you think about key management, make sure you have an approach to think about if you're bringing confidential data, you want to bring your own keys. Maybe sensitive data, you want to keep your own keys. So that how much control of the keys you have and the hardware security module in which the key processing, the encryption, decryption operations happen more control you have, more responsibility that you can take on. So encryption at data at rest, data in motion as it comes from services to data stores or applications so that as you think about data coming all the way, your requests and API requests coming all the way, data in motion. And in the new world, 
we need to start thinking about when the application is actually processing the data, there is going to be data in its memory. So you can actually start to protect data using hardware-based technologies where you can protect in-memory um, data as well. So that when it is in use and in memory by the applications, you can protect it. So take a holistic approach to data protection at rest, in motion, in use, with full control of your keys. It can be bring your own keys, or even better, push the boundary with keep your own keys. The application that serves the data, it's not only about which application needs to have access. Make sure the data access is on a only a need by need basis. Do not open up your data services to the whole world, be it network access or everybody to access the data. Make sure you exactly know which applications need to access or which users need to access the data to run your cloud applications. From an application viewpoint, Make sure there are no vulnerabilities in your application. So scan your applications. So I have an AppSec application security approach so that you can do dynamic scanning or static scanning of your application before you deploy it into the production. And in a cloud native environment, you're deploying container images. So you can scan your images. You can scan it for vulnerabilities before you deploy and set your policy so that you only have secured images in production anytime. And if there is any vulnerability in the new world, you don't need to patch these systems. You just spin up a new container and off you go. So that's the beauty of a cloud native approach that you have security built in in every step. So at a container level and the applications uh, that serves the business logic, you can start to protect it. Then when you look at the users, coming in, you want to manage access in terms of who the user is and what from where they are coming from. So identity, you need to make sure who the user is or which service it is based on the identity of those services or users so that you can make access control to your application or data. And also from the perspective of network access, you want to make sure only authorized users can get in, and if there are um, intruders out there, you can make sure you can set it up so that they are prevented from accessing your application and your uh, data in the cloud, be it through web application firewalling, network access control, or denial of service, distributed denial of service protection, and have intelligence built into these network protection as well. So both identity, and network. In essence, you are protecting your data. You need to manage access to your apps and the workload and the data that you have deployed on the cloud. In the next video, we will look at security monitoring and DevOps security. a continuous security monitoring so that you know at any point whether you're compliant to your policies, you can watch out for threats that you need to manage. Having an approach and set of tools to manage security and compliance posture is very important. So gaining insights about your posture, compliance, and threats. So from your deployment environment, you can garner information. It can be security events, audit logs, flow logs from network or system that can be fed in so that you can figure out what your posture and complaints and threats are. And not only it's important for you to gain insight, you need to have actionable intelligence so that you can start to remediate. You may figure out there's a vulnerability, a container image that you have deployed is vulnerable, so you can re-spin the container, so you can remediate and spin up a new container. There may be a particular access from a network that seems to be coming in from a suspicious network um, IP address, so you can block that. So ability to gain visibility and insights and having that insights and turn it into actionable intelligence and remediate is very important. So let's talk about DevOps. DevOps is about development and operations. 
traditionally we think about okay there's an application team that is doing the design and architecture who are building code and then you throw it over the wall for the enterprise security team to secure it and manage it that should be rethought fundamentally it's not just about dev and ops but security need to be a forethought not an afterthought so it should become sec dev ops approach to your the way you build manage and run your applications so you need to embed security into the entire life cycle what we call shift left not only you manage security but shift left through the entire process you need to have a secure design so as you plan as you design and say what kind of data am i going to put what level of classification what kind of applications am i building is it container based is it uh, a workload that i'm migrating take that into account and what integrations you need to do so that you can plan it and architect it then as you build it embed security as part of the process so that you have security aware applications for example you may want to encrypt data if it is sensitive data you may want to encrypt the data from your applications before even you store into a data store so secure build and you manage security as part of sec devops as you have secure design and architecture you pass on that and build secure applications and deploy and manage security in a continuous fashion and then you have a closed loop so that whatever you find you may need to remediate or rearchitect your application or reimplement certain things as threats landscape evolve in the next video we will look at identity and access management According to the 2019 Cloud Security Report by Cybersecurity Insiders, the top cloud security concern of cybersecurity professionals is data loss and leakage. Unauthorized access through misuse of employee credentials and improper access controls is the single biggest perceived vulnerability to cloud security, followed by insecure interfaces and APIs. In this video, we will look at how identity and access management, also known as access control, works as the first line of defense allowing you to authenticate and authorize users and provide user-specific access to cloud resources, services, and applications. A comprehensive security strategy needs to encompass the security needs of a wide audience, including organizational users, internet and social-based users, third-party business partner organizations, and vendors. There are three main types of users, administrative users, developer users, and application users. Administrative users include cloud platform administrators, operators, and managers, roles that typically create, update, and delete application and service instances, and also need insight into their team members' activities. An attacker on an administrative account can steal data from production database service instances, deploy malicious applications inside the customer's domain, or even deface or destroy existing applications. Developer users include cloud application developers, platform developers, and application publishers. Developer users are authorized to read sensitive information and to create, update, and delete applications. The third type of user is the application user. These are the users of the cloud-hosted applications. Let's look at the key components of identity and access management and how they work. Authentication, or the identity service, enables applications deployed to the cloud to authenticate users at an application level, based on a range of identity providers such as the cloud directory, social identity providers such as Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, enterprise-hosted identity provider, and cloud-hosted identity provider. Sometimes API keys, or unique identifiers, are passed into an API to identify the calling application or user. Multi-factor authentication is used to combat identity theft by adding an additional layer of authentication for application users, such as single-use passwords or PINs, certificates, 
tokens, risk-based authentication, such as changes in the user's location, past activity, and preferences. Cloud directory services are used to securely manage user profiles and their associated credentials and password policy inside a cloud environment. A directory service within a cloud means that applications hosted on the cloud do not need to use their own user repository. Reporting helps provide a user-centric view of access to resources or a resource-centric view of access by users. Reports typically give information about which users have access to which resources, which users have changes in access rights, which access is being exploited by each user, and under which conditions. Audit and Compliance is a critical service within Identity and Access Management Framework, both for cloud provider and cloud consumer. Auditors use these processes to validate implemented controls against an organization's security policy, industry compliance, and risk policies, and to report deviations. User and service access management capability enables cloud application and service owners to provision and deprovision customer, partner, and vendor user profiles with minimal human interaction. This streamlines access control based on the role, organization, and access policies defined by the owner. User accounts of administrators or developers give access to sensitive information. In order to mitigate the risks of these accounts being hacked into, you require maximum control over the whole life cycle of these users. Some of the controls that can help secure these sensitive accounts include provisioning users by specifying roles on resources for each user, password policies that control the usage of special characters, minimum password lengths, and other similar settings, multi-factor authentication like time-based one-time passwords, and immediate deprovisioning of access when users leave or change roles. Cloud providers offer identity access and management services, typically including the ability to create access groups, add users to access groups, and manage access for existing users. An access group is a group of users and service IDs created so that the same access can be assigned to all entities within the group with one or more access policies. Access policies define how users, service IDs, and access groups in the account are given permission to access account resources. Policies include a subject, which can be users, service IDs, or access groups, a target, which is the resource or provision service offering to which you want to provide access, and role, which defines the actions allowed on the target of the policy, that is, the resource to which the access is being granted. Access groups provide a more streamlined access assignment process as compared to assigning individual access to each user and help reduce the number of policies in an account. In this video, we learned how identity and access management work as the first line of defense to secure the cloud. In the next video, we will learn about cloud encryption. Given the concerns around data security and privacy, especially in public cloud environments, encryption plays a key role and is often referred to as the last line of defense in a layered security model. This protection not only encrypts data, but also provides robust data access control, key management, and certificate management. In this video, we will take a closer look at cloud encryption. Encryption is defined as scrambling data in a way that makes it illegible. There are two parts to an encryption system, the encryption algorithm and the decryption key. The encryption algorithm defines the rules by which data will be transformed so that it becomes illegible. And the decryption key defines how the encrypted data will be transformed back to legible data. Encryption ensures that only authorized users have access to sensitive data, and when accessed or intercepted without authorization, data is unreadable and meaningless. 
Cloud providers offer various cloud encryption services. This could be limited encryption of data that is identified as sensitive or end-to-end -end encryption of all data uploaded to the cloud. Data is encrypted upon receipt and encryption keys are passed to the customers to decrypt data when needed. Keys need to be managed securely. If you lose your keys, you will not be able to read your data. Data needs protection in three states, at rest, in transit, and when it is in use. Encryption at rest protects data while it is physically stored in a database or the storage layer. Depending on the application and business requirements, there could be multiple options for encrypting data at rest, such as encryption for block and file storage, built-in encryption in object storage, and database encryption services. Encryption in transit protects data while it is transmitted from one location to another. Encryption in transit includes encrypting the data before transmission, authenticating endpoints, and decrypting and verifying data on arrival. Secure Sockets Layer, or SSL, and Transport Layer Security, TLS, are commonly used protocols for encryption in transit. They are not only used when accessing websites securely, but also for data moving between servers and services within the cloud. Encryption in use protects data when it is in use in memory for computations. It allows computations to be performed on encrypted text without needing to decrypt the data. Cloud storage encryption could be server-side or client-side. Server-side encryption occurs after cloud storage receives your data, but before the data is written to disk and stored. For server-side encryption, you can either create and manage your own encryption keys, known as customer-supplied encryption keys, or you can generate and manage your encryption keys using key management services offered by the cloud storage provider, known as customer-managed encryption keys. Client-side encryption occurs before data is sent to cloud storage. This way, users can utilize encryption keys and algorithms that are not visible to the cloud provider, making it virtually impossible for cloud providers to decrypt hosted data. Given that a majority of enterprises today operate in multi-cloud environments, there is a need to implement a singular data protection strategy across an enterprise on-premise, hybrid, and multi-cloud deployments. Some cloud providers offer multi-cloud data encryption services with a range of features such as data access management, integrated key management, and sophisticated encryption that combine to deliver the scalability and flexibility to help protect the most sensitive workloads across the enterprise, regardless of where the data resides. Using a multi-cloud data encryption console, you can define and manage access policies, create, rotate, and manage encryption keys, and aggregate access logs. Encryption does not eliminate data security risk. It separates the security risk from the data itself by moving security to the encryption keys. These keys need to be managed and protected against threats in order to keep the data secure. Key management services offered by some cloud providers help perform lifecycle management for encryption keys that are used in cloud services or customer-built applications. They enable customers to encrypt sensitive data at rest and to easily create and manage the entire lifecycle of cryptographic keys that are used to encrypt data. Since the keys remain in possession of the customer, the data is protected from cloud service providers as well as from other users. Some of the best practices for encryption key management include storing encryption keys separately from the encrypted data, taking key backups off-site and auditing them regularly, refreshing the keys periodically, implementing multi-factor authentication for both the master and recovery keys. In the next video, we will learn about cloud monitoring and its benefits. Cloud-based deployments can be complex. Monitoring performance across an entire stack of applications and services can be time-consuming and draining on internal resources. This is where cloud monitoring solutions come in. Cloud monitoring solutions assess data, application, and infrastructure behaviors for performance, resource allocation, network availability, compliance, and security risks and threats. 
Cloud monitoring is not just about automated tools. It includes the strategies, practices, and processes that need to be in place for analyzing, tracking, and managing cloud-based services and applications. It also serves to provide actionable insights that can help improve availability and user experience. Cloud monitoring helps to accelerate the diagnosis and resolution of performance incidences, control the cost of your monitoring infrastructure, mitigate the impact of abnormal situations with proactive notifications, get critical Kubernetes and container insights for dynamic microservice monitoring, troubleshoot your application and infrastructure. Cloud monitoring solutions are designed to give organizations visibility and control over their entire cloud-based infrastructure. They provide data in real time with round-the-clock monitoring of virtual machines, services, databases, and applications, multi-layer visibility into application, user, and file access behavior across all cloud-based applications and services, advanced reporting and auditing capabilities for ensuring regulatory standards are being met, large-scale performance monitoring integrations across multi-cloud and hybrid cloud environments. One way to categorize cloud monitoring tools solutions is to break them down into infrastructure, database, and application performance monitoring. Infrastructure monitoring tools help identify minor and large-scale hardware failures and security gaps so that the developers and administrators can take corrective action before problems affect user experience. Database monitoring tools help track processes, queries, and availability of services to ensure the accuracy and reliability of database management systems. Application Performance Monitoring, or APM, measures application availability and performance, providing tools needed to troubleshoot issues in an application's environment. APM solutions help improve user experience, meet application and user service level agreements, or SLAs, minimize downtime, and lower overall operational costs. To get the most benefit from your cloud-based deployments, you can follow some standard cloud monitoring best practices. Leverage end-user experience monitoring solutions to capture the performance of an application from the point of view of its end users. These solutions monitor user journeys to track parameters such as application response time and frequency of use under varied conditions. These insights will help you to improve customer experience significantly. Consider moving all aspects of your infrastructure, whether in private, public, or hybrid clouds, under one unified monitoring platform. This can help you to manage all your KPIs in one place with complete visibility into performance optimization. Use monitoring tools that can help you track the usage and cost of your cloud resources and services. Increase cloud monitoring automation. This can help you gain significant operational efficiencies. Simulate outages and breach scenarios to evaluate how well your monitoring tools capture and alert against failures. Cloud monitoring needs to be a priority for organizations looking to leverage the benefits of cloud technologies. It will help you manage and optimize your cloud resources for cost and performance and create better customer experiences. In this video, we will look at some case studies that demonstrate the use of cloud computing in real business scenarios and the ensuing impact on these businesses and the customers they serve. The weather company's mission is to map the atmosphere of the earth and based on that generate the most accurate and hyper-local forecast uh, which can be served out to all our consumers and devices, which number in millions across the globe. Weather is unpredictable, and we need to be able to spin up and spin down as fast as weather happens. Our normal day-to-day -day load is 30 million unique users, and when we peak into severe weather, that can go north of 100 million across our products. So we generate forecasts on demand, and our forecast on demand system is responsible for generating forecasts uh, at a resolution of one square kilometer grid. We deliver forecasts on demand um, to the tune of 250 billion per day. On the back side of, of that is our API platform, and that system operates at the scale of about 150,000 requests per second. 
If our products don't work and don't work fast, people's lives are in danger. Imagine a hurricane is approaching east coast of the United States. As it is approaching the coast, usage of my weather data goes up tremendously. It can go up from anywhere from two times to five times. It took us six months to migrate into IBM Kubernetes from our previous um, provider. And what we've noticed is some real efficiencies with DevOps. It's reduced our workflow and pipeline by about 80%. With the latest hurricane, we were able to scale with IBM Cloud very easily, very seamlessly. IBM's Kubernetes service allows us to scale as fast as the weather happens. As we migrated our web platform to IBM Cloud Kubernetes services, one of the biggest advantages is that this is a managed service. Which allows our team not to have to babysit our system, enables them to do other work. With the migration to IBM Cloud Kubernetes, we've gained the ability to have automation security baked in. Um, this was a feature in the component that was very manual for us in the past. IBM's security team proactively now notifies us of any security vulnerabilities. The, the tools and the investment that the company's made gives us capabilities that we would have never had before. Um, it gets us very excited and it gives our developers and engineers opportunities to build new things that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. The global reach that IBM and the IBM Cloud together with our technology, with our capabilities for forecasting, give us the ability to extend our products and services to keep people safe all over the world. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard, Captain speaking. Pretty much anticipating non-time arrival. In the scenario where there's a flight cancellation or some other off-schedule operation, we've had a system where we find new seats and flights availability for those customers. But I think oftentimes customers didn't necessarily know that that was the best option for them. What we wanted to do was create a system where they could actually see alternate options. The goal was to facilitate a better experience for our customers on how to get to their destination in an automated fashion on the channel of their choice. In our business, hurricanes, storms, other natural events impact our customers on a fairly regular basis. What happened, and this is a true story, the hurricanes hit and everybody said, this is ridiculous. Our customers were being impacted by the hurricanes immediately. Why are we mitigating risk of a traditional rollout when we have the power of the cloud. And this is exactly the scenario that our customers need this capability. I think people will now realize that these kind of activities and integration are much easier when we can use cloud technology. And especially microservices, we can break problems into much smaller problems. And those get much easier to wrap your head around and develop. This is the technology that we need to be adopting now in order to keep pace with our customer expectations. What I loved about my job at Cementos Pacas Mayo is that it challenges me every single day. Technology moves so agile that I have to keep up with it. And what I love is that the company is also on that same road, driving towards its digital transformations. Our customers are now demanding quicker time to market and also a more broad portfolio of products. We need to keep up and deliver like the best service and the best products that they can get in the least amount of time. We implemented SAP S4HANA on IBM Cloud since it brings us uh, a cost-effective infrastructure and also it's quite scalable. Semetos Pacasmayo is now turning from a product-driven company to a service-driven company. The accounting area now has real insights on real time of our financial statements that they didn't used to have and also on our supply chain area, uh, especially on the procurement. They now have the dashboard that helps them take decisions right on time. My name is Mukesh Sharma, and uh, I'm the senior manager of IT at Welch Food. Welch started as an organization 150 years ago, and pretty fast it became the national bank. We're owned by the farmers, it's a co-op, and we value the sweat equity our farmers put into it. So that's what drives us every day, that our farmers are working out on the farms, and we are working here to make sure the organization gives the best benefit of each dollar spent back to them. Welch's IT is the heart of the business. All the manufacturing systems, any manufacturing data which comes in through different processing, ERP systems, and you name it. 
So we started this journey with the private cloud. And then at the same time, we have started the process of asking ourselves on any new application request, can it be run in the public cloud? The approach we have taken is slowly and steadily start to move these non-mission critical systems, which can be done better by somebody else, let them run outside, let them spend time on it while we spend time on our core values. Liquid Power is a company that sells products that when you inject them into crude oil or gasoline pipelines, it changes the flow characteristics to such a point that you can either one, increase the flow of those fluids, or secondly, use less energy to actually push the fluids down the pipeline. We needed to become a standalone company under Berkshire Hathaway. Without any experience in running our own infrastructure, or SAP, we had to come up with the solution that was best for our business to operate as a standalone company. So there were many decisions we had to make. Do we go cloud? Do we stay on premise? How do we create our own infrastructure and back office? And what's the best decision for us, not only today and now, but in the future going forward? So I talked to some CIOs and IT professionals. If you had a blank sheet of paper, what would you do? Cloud or go on premise? Without a doubt, all of them say cloud. This whole process and the migration to the cloud is giving what we believe is a competitive advantage. And what I really love about having IBM with SAP on the cloud is it's scalable. We can do it much faster and uh, change in a much faster time period than we could otherwise. Cloud computing is a key part of an enterprise's digital transformation strategy. As more and more companies are moving critical business processes and applications to a mix of cloud infrastructures, qualified cloud computing professionals are in high demand. According to Gartner's report on the cloud services industry, from a market size of 182.4 billion USD in 2018 to a projected market size of 331.2 billion USD in 2022, the market size and growth of the cloud services industry is at nearly three times the growth of overall IT services. That is the scale at which the cloud market is growing. Employer demand is outpacing the number of qualified candidates available. Gartner Talent Neuron's database of more than 1 billion unique job listings scores the hiring scale for jobs requiring cloud computing skills at 78, which means that employers are finding it difficult to get the right applicants for open positions in cloud technologies. There are many specialization areas within this domain. Here's a look at some of the common roles available currently. Cloud developers or cloud software engineers work through all phases of the software development lifecycle, writing, testing, and maintaining the code. They work with the front and back end of applications, as well as platforms and systems that their applications run on. Cloud developers need to have a mix of technical skills, business knowledge, and experience with at least one of the major cloud providers. Technical skills for a cloud developer would typically include knowledge of data structures, distributed systems, operating systems, and algorithms, experience with databases, proficiency in commonly used web application development languages such as Python, JavaScript, Java, HTML, and CSS. Cloud integration specialists are responsible for integrating new cloud services, applications, and infrastructure into the organization's portfolio of internal systems and existing cloud services. These specialists assess the implications and trade-offs between different solutions as they relate to the integration between external and internal systems, optimize integration and user experience, and ensure that performance standards adhere to service-level agreements set with the enterprise. Cloud data engineers are responsible for designing, developing, and deploying scalable data pipelines and data services. They look at integrating new data management technologies and software engineering tools into existing infrastructure. Their responsibilities include understanding existing systems to recommend automated integration of disparate data sets, collaborating with data scientists and researchers to develop predictive models and proofs of concept, promoting best practices that enable teams to accelerate their consumption and understanding of data. 
improving overall efficiency by introducing new engineering processes and tools. Cloud security engineers provide expertise around the systems and processes needed to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of an organization's systems and application data. They determine security requirements, plan, implement, and test security systems, perform threat simulations to detect possible risks, recommend innovative technologies that will enhance the security of cloud-based environments. Cloud security engineers need to have deep knowledge of cloud platforms and services, software design patterns, and DevOps tools and methodologies. Cloud DevOps engineers collaborate with development and operations teams to create reliable and rapid release pipelines for software and updates. This may typically involve creating custom automation tools, building and maintaining configuration and deployment frameworks, tracking design bugs, and automating the debugging process for developers, maintaining and deploying web-based applications, monitoring security systems, measuring performance against expected business outcomes. Containerization expertise is increasingly a must-have for DevOps engineers. Cloud solutions architects work to translate business requirements into application architecture and design. Some of the technical skills required for a cloud architect role include deep knowledge of cloud platforms and services, deep understanding of software design patterns, knowledge of DevOps tools and methodologies, good understanding of networking, a high-level understanding of key security concepts. Solution architects work closely with cloud developers, networking specialists, security engineers, integration specialists, and DevOps engineers to architect and design solutions. There are several resources available for learning cloud technologies in a variety of delivery methods, including instructor-led courses, self-paced online courses, online videos, books, and also technology-focused community forums. Many cloud providers have dedicated learning portals with extensive resources available on the complete range of cloud technologies and services they provide. They offer learning paths, which make resources available as per specific career roles, hands-on learning labs with interactive learning resources that can be filtered by role, level, or product, free trials on their suite of products and services, Welcome to IT Technical Support Case Studies and Capstone. Congratulations on completing all the courses in the Technical Support Professional Certificate Program. Now you get to show what you've learned and apply it to the types of situations that tech support specialists confront daily. This course has two main sections. During this course, you will first work through a series of technical support case studies that require hands-on work to resolve. Each module will include practice case studies and one graded case study. The case studies cover topics from the previous courses. And after you complete the case studies, you will demonstrate your preparedness for the CompTIA ITF Plus exam by taking a mock version of it. Your exam will include the same number and types of questions as the CompTIA's exam and cover the same topics. Fortunately, you have been studying these topics throughout this professional certificate program, and you will review many of them by completing the case studies. Module 1 draws from the Introduction to Hardware and Operating Systems course. Its case studies cover topics such as computer hardware, peripherals, connectivity, performance, and operating systems. Module 2 draws from the Introduction to Software, Programming, and Databases course. Its case studies cover topics such as browser versions, browser security, software updates, and database fundamentals. Module 3 draws from the Introduction to Networking and Storage course. Its case studies cover topics such as servers, VPNs, firewalls, Soho networks, and hosted storage. Module 4 draws from the Introduction to Cybersecurity Essentials course. Its case studies cover topics such as intellectual property, information privacy, password management, multi-factor authentication, cyber threats, and safe browsing. And Module 5 draws from the Introduction to Cloud Computing course. 
Its case studies cover topics such as cloud service models, cloud deployment models, VPCs, IAM, and cloud storage. The case studies throughout each module will also require you to apply your knowledge of technical support basics. These basics include, but are not limited to, levels of support and escalation, ticketing systems and other support tools and systems, and communication and customer service skills essential for effective technical support. In addition to applying your knowledge to realistic situations, you'll demonstrate your preparedness for the CompTIA ITF Plus exam by taking a mock version of it. Like the real exam, the mock exam covers topics you have been studying throughout this professional certificate program, and you will have reviewed many of them by completing the case studies. Your mock exam will include the same number and types of questions as CompTIA's exam and cover the same topics. And when you successfully complete all the courses in this program, you'll receive dual credentials, a professional certificate to showcase your job readiness to potential employers, and an IBM digital badge to help your profile stand out. Oh, and after successfully finishing this course, you will receive a 30% discount voucher for the CompTIA ITF Plus certification exam and access to other study materials. We are excited to have you join us and hope you enjoy the course. Good luck and let's get started.